Hi, I'm Jennifer Youngblood. I'm excited for you to listen to the audiobook of False Identity. Back when my mom and I were co-writing together, we never could have imagined the tremendous response we would get from False Identity. This one is dear to my heart. I love the combination of love, hope, and spine-tingling suspense. The video that goes along with the audiobook is of Salt Lake City, Utah and the surrounding valley where the book takes place. My goal is to put all of my audiobooks on YouTube where you'll be able to listen to them for free. Please take a second and subscribe to my channel to help make this possible. I hope you love the book as much as I loved writing it. False Identity Written by Jennifer Youngblood and Sandra Poole Narrated by Majel Connery Prologue Two Days Before Christmas The cool metal in his hands was a welcome contrast to the hot thoughts swirling in his head. He turned it over and over, noticing how lightweight it was. He rolled open the chamber and checked to make sure the bullet was there, and then had to bite back the bile rising in his throat. Images came unbidden to his mind. Sick children lying in hospital beds, their tearful mothers never leaving their sides. He thought of his own mother, how disappointed she would be if she could see him now, God rest her soul. He would give his healthy body to one of those sick kids if he could, but unfortunately it didn't work that way. His mind flitted to other things, driving to work in traffic, getting a soda from the vending machine at lunch, trying to pretend it was just another day, knowing all the while that it would be his last. He tried to imagine his co-workers when they heard the news. There would be confusion and pinched expressions. To come to think of it, he has been a little sad, they would say after the fact. Isn't that what everybody says when they learn that someone they know has taken their own life? Then again, he never was the same afterwards, so withdrawn so angry. His hands began to shake, and then cool precision took over. It would all be over soon. He wondered if it would hurt too terribly. With any luck, he wouldn't feel a thing. He lifted the pistol to his temple. His hand started shaking again. Oh God, please forgive me, he mumbled. The doorbell rang. He swallowed hard, cocked the pistol. The doorbell rang again. He cursed and closed his eyes tight, willing himself to shut out all outside distractions. The doorbell rang a third time. This time, it was followed by a hard knock. He let his hand fall to his side. He was sweating profusely now and didn't know whether to laugh or cry. He couldn't remember the last time he'd had a visitor. He disengaged the pistol before placing it on his bedside table and then went to answer the door. Whoever it was had better have a good explanation. He threw open the door ready to jump down somebody's throat, but no one was there. He was baffled at first, but then he looked down and saw the large box wrapped in red Christmas paper. He looked past the box and out into the night to where the sidewalk and street were empty. Who are you? He yelled into the darkness. No answer. He stood looking at the box for one long minute before picking it up and taking it inside, where he deposited it in the middle of the living room floor. He examined the package and was disappointed to learn that there weren't any tags identifying the giver. There were various containers of Christmas cookies, nuts, popcorn, fruit, a large ham, a can of cranberry sauce, and a plastic container of stuffing. Underneath the food, he was surprised to see a winter coat, wool scarf, and matching hat. Someone had gone to a lot of trouble. The absurdity of the situation struck him as funny in light of the pistol resting on his bedside table. He could see the headlines now. Man shoots himself after receiving anonymous Christmas gift. If he went into the bedroom and finished what he'd begun right now, whoever had left this might feel responsible. As much as he wanted it all to be over, he couldn't leave this dangling. 
He cursed and then kicked the now empty box across the room. Wait, there was something else still inside. He walked over and looked. A present, the size of a shoebox, was hidden underneath the tissue paper so that he'd not been able to see it before. Whereas the other items had been placed unwrapped in the box, this one was done in silver paper with an elaborate bow tied around it. He turned it over, examining it before carefully shaking it. The contents moved from side to side. He went to the couch and sat looking at the box on his lap, wondering again who it was from. He removed the bow, tore off the wrapping, and opened the box. When he saw what was inside, he was more confused than ever. It was a star made out of various sizes of cut glass that shimmered when he held it up to the light. Judging by the cone that was attached, it was meant to go on top of a Christmas tree. One of the points of the star was broken, no doubt caused from when he'd kicked it across the room. He was about to put the star back into the box when he saw the envelope underneath. His heart picked up a notch. It had his name on it. Until this point, he'd been thinking that some do-gooder had randomly picked his house to do a charitable deed. But whoever this was knew his name. He opened the envelope and began to read. We hope this package finds you well. We wanted to give you a few small items to let you know that you're in our thoughts and prayers this Christmas season. But most importantly, we wanted to share the gift of the Christmas star with you. It has special significance in our home, and we hope it'll mean something to you. On that most important of all nights, in an event never to be forgotten, the star was placed to point the way to the greatest gift the world was ever given. A babe lying in a manger. A mother kneeling by his side. Some call it the North Star, but there are those who know its real name, the Christmas Star, given on that special night to light the way for all to see. If you ever lose your way, look up to the Christmas Star, your friend in the night, the one that will give you sight. You'll never stray too far to catch sight of the star. If you look to it long enough, it will lend you strength to be that flicker in the night, guiding those around you. So be fixed like the star and remember who you are. No matter where you roam, it will always guide you home. All you have to do is believe, and its peace from you will never leave. A curious expression settled over his features, and he stared at the star and the paper as if they were alien relics from another planet. He felt something, something he'd not felt in a very long time, and it hurt. A single tear rolled down his cheek before landing on the paper. Memories from Christmas's past rushed through his mind, sipping hot cocoa by a cozy fire, the fragrant smell of citrus and peppermint, the glow of friendship and warmth, the comfort of family. How dare these people, whoever they were, barge into his business with some drivel about a star? A searing rage cut through him. He crumbled up the paper and threw it across the room. Then he took the star and hurled it against the wall where it splintered into unrecognizable pieces. Having nothing else left on which to vent his anger, he fell to the floor and wept. Chapter One One Year Later Chansey raked her bangs away from her face with the side of her forefinger and put the last tray of Christmas cookie ornaments into the oven. She'd intended to skip the tradition this year, but when she told the kids, Travis had almost burst into tears. That was one of Dad's favorite things to do, he exclaimed. She turned to the counter and caught a glimpse of one of last year's ornaments that had fallen out of the box. Tender emotions lingering just below the surface overflowed, sending tears streaming down her face. She picked up the ornament and examined it with shaky hands. Her breath came in short bursts, and she could feel an attack coming on. 
Experience had taught her that the harder she fought it, the worse it got, so she concentrated on letting the air fill her lungs. Breathe, Chansey. Breathe, Chansey. In through the mouth, out through the nose. She'd promised herself that she wouldn't do this. It was all she could do to put on a happy face while doing normal tasks. Reliving old memories would do her in for sure. Even as she thought the words, the memories flowed like water gushing out of a faucet, and there didn't seem to be a cutoff switch. Was it just last Christmas that they'd spent the holidays together? It seemed like a lifetime ago. A lifetime divided between when Max was here and then after. Everything had been so different last Christmas, so normal. If she'd known it was going to be their last Christmas with Max, she would have savored the small moments and would have spent less time shopping and fretting over the senseless details and more time on the things that mattered. She would have spent time doing the things that Max had wanted them to do together as a family. Max had always insisted on helping her and the kids make salt dough ornaments, even though she argued that it was cheaper and easier to just buy ornaments. His hands were so big, they always laughed at his clumsy attempts to paint bells and glue sprinkles on stars. Susie especially had given her dad a hard time last Christmas when he dropped the bell ornament she was now holding in her hand and broke off the top. Daddy, you ruined it, Susie said, her eyes wide. Max laughed and ruffled her hair. No, Princess, it's not ruined. We just gave it some personality. Oh, Daddy... A look of disgust came over her rosy face as she held up the ornament she was working on for his inspection. Look, mine's not broken, she said with a touch of pride. He reached for it. Well, I can fix that. Her eyes went wide like she couldn't believe he'd had the audacity to suggest such a thing. No! She jerked it back and squealed. Max laughed and started tickling Susie, which of course led to a tickling fest with him chasing her around the room and her giggling with glee. How she missed the sound of Max's easy laughter. It was one of the things she'd loved most about him. It had been a long time since they'd had laughter in the house. Too long. She sat down on the bar stool, cupping the dough bell in her palm as if it were a precious stone. Their first Christmas without Max. She felt a twinge of horror, thinking about future Christmases, all strung together in a long black line that stretched so far in the distance that she couldn't see the end of it. The wind howled outside, sounding lonely and shrill. She'd been so caught up in the memories that she hadn't realized how dark it had become. She looked out the window to where black, sooty clouds were gathering. She shivered and glanced at the clock on the microwave. The kids were due home from school in 20 minutes or so. She had a fleeting thought that maybe she should check on Jill. But then again, Jill would never let anything like a simple snowstorm get in her way. Her younger sister by three years, Jill was the mother of four children. Three girls and the caboose, Taylor, who was rowdier than all of his sisters put together. Logic would dictate that Chansey as the older sister, would be the one who looked after Jill, but that was not the case. Jill had come to her rescue too many times to count, particularly after Max's death. The wind picked up again, causing the windows to rattle. Chansey walked over and looked up at the sky, allowing herself to get lost in the swirling clouds above. It had been a day like today when Max died. February 16th, just two days after Valentine's Day. Max had taken his Cessna on a business trip to Denver and was on his way back to Salt Lake City when something went wrong. His plane went down, and he was killed. It was a few hours later when Jill found Chansey, huddled in a fetal position and rocking back and forth near the base of the kitchen cabinets. Chansey didn't remember much about the rest of February, or March for that matter. Jill took things in her capable hands and somehow managed to stitch some normalcy back into their lives. As a matter of fact, she'd been living off of borrowed Jill power all year long. She only hoped it would last long enough to get her through Christmas. Mom, we're home! Travis's voice echoed through the foyer. 
Chansey put the ornament on the counter. She stood, grabbed a napkin, and blew her nose. I'm in here, she called, grabbing a sponge from the sink where she commenced scrubbing an imaginary spot on the immaculate kitchen counter. Travis burst through the door and slung his overstuffed backpack on the desk in the kitchen. Woohoo! School's out for the holidays! Chansey forced a smile and punched her fist through the air. All right. He rushed past her and opened the fridge. I'm starved. If only she had a dollar for every time she heard that. At 14, Travis was a bottomless pit when it came to food. He was tall and lanky like his dad but had a smattering of freckles across his nose like her. It wouldn't be long before he looked exactly like Max, with the same brown, compassionate eyes and unruly dark hair. What you been up to? Chansey wiped her hands on a dish towel. I thought I'd get a head start on baking the salt dough ornaments. He shrugged. Cool. Where's Susie? She's coming. He rolled his eyes. She and Taylor were fighting over some Lego toy and Aunt Jill's given them both a good talking to. Chansey shook her head. Is Jill coming in? Nah, Danielle's late for piano lessons. He pulled out the milk and took a long swig out of the carton. Chansey put her hands on her hips. Travis Maxwell Hamilton! He gave her a sheepish grin. Sorry, Mom. She took the carton from him but couldn't help but grin, and Travis saw her. She reached for a glass and poured the milk while he retrieved a plate from the cabinet and piled on three pieces of leftover pizza from the night before and put it in the microwave. You're going to ruin your appetite, she said, knowing that was impossible these days. Nah, he kissed her on the cheek. Love you, Mom. He glanced around the room and she knew he was looking for the boxes he'd painstakingly searched out and dragged in this past week. Where'd the boxes go? Did you put them in the garage? Those two that I found are perfect. I mean, we may have to all work together to drag them to the doorsteps. Even you and Susie will have to get out of the car and help with these, but that's okay. Susie came bounding into the room with all of the exuberance of a normal six-year-old. Chansey gave her a big hug and ruffled the top of her hair. How was school today, Suze? Great! Miss Perkins let us eat donuts and watch up instead of doing our math. And then I got this bag of Santa pencils. She waved it in the air and grinned at the amazement of it all. Hey, speaking of the boxes, when are we going to do Ding Dong Ditch? Travis said, polishing off a piece of pizza. Chansey swallowed hard, hearing the question she'd dreaded since the start of the holidays. Ding Dong Ditch was a tradition that Max had started. He'd given it that silly name, and it had stuck. Every year, they would scout out one or two needy families and decide what to get them. They would cut off the tops of large cardboard boxes and cover the remaining sides with Christmas wrapping paper before loading them full of the goods. Then, they would haul the boxes to the designated doorsteps, ring the doorbell, and run like mad. In the old days, Chansey accompanied Max and Travis, but after Susie was born, she would sit in the car with her. It had been rewarding enough to hear the breathless excitement in Travis's voice as he filled her in on the details of the escapade. I don't think we're going to do it this year, she said quietly. What? Travis's jaw went slack and he turned to face her. Mom! It won't be Christmas if we don't do Ding Dong Ditch. You know what Dad always said. We can't have Christmas until we've helped other people. The longing on Travis's face was almost enough to make her change her mind. But she just couldn't. Not this year. It was too much. Too many painful memories. She shook her head. Travis, please, I just don't think I can do it now that your dad's gone. Tears filled his eyes. She reached for him, but he balled his hands into fists and turned away from her. She touched him on the back. Honey, don't act this way. What's wrong with Travis? Susie said. Travis spun around and faced her. What's wrong with me? He yelled, his voice hoarse with emotion. It's not me. I'm the only one who has any sense in this frickin' house. 
Susie's eyes went wide, and then she started to cry. Control your voice, Chancy ordered. Travis smirked and then took the plate of pizza and dumped the remaining piece in the garbage. Son, if you would just try to understand. It's you who doesn't understand, Mom. You just don't get it. What are we supposed to do? Stop living because Dad's gone? Tears blurred her vision. Oh, Travis, I... He stormed out the back door, slamming it behind him before she could get out the rest. Travis didn't know how long he'd walked blindly down the sidewalks. His one thought was to get as far away from his mother and the situation as he possibly could. He glanced up at the dark, smoky clouds that looked like their bottoms were about to split open. It was funny how a few weeks could make such a difference in the weather. A puff of cold wind shot a chill through him and he pulled the hood of his sweatshirt over his head. He should have worn a coat. He hadn't meant to get so angry. It just came out before he could call it back. If only he could make his mom understand how he felt. He'd always heard that time was the great healer, but it wasn't true. With each passing month, the hurt seemed to grow larger, a black canyon that was too deep to cross. Why couldn't she understand? He had to keep doing the things they would have done together if Dad were here or he might forget him. At first, the image of his dad had been right there in his mind, but now sometimes it was a little fuzzy. He kept a picture by his bed so that he could study it, fixating his dad's features in his mind. How could his mom have forgotten so quickly? Ever since she'd started dating Jake, things had changed. His mom met Jake at a singles activity at church, and while she'd been leery about going out with him, Aunt Jill insisted that dating might help the family overcome their grief. But Travis had no intention of getting over his grief, nor did he intend to accept Jake. Tears stung his cheeks, and he brushed them aside, glad that it was now sleeting so that nobody would know he'd been crying. On and on he trudged, welcoming the cold air that was swirling around him. In the cold, he couldn't feel the hurt as much. Ten minutes later, the sleet was now mixed with snow. Normally he loved the snow and how it blanketed everything in white, but now all he could think about was that his hands were starting to throb. He shoved them deep into his pockets and shivered. It was coming down harder now. Time to turn back. A trash bag landed on his foot and he kicked it out of the way. For the first time, he glanced around at the buildings surrounding him. Most were abandoned, but the ones that were occupied had bars over the windows. He could see a neon sign from a liquor store flashing in the distance through the snow. Empty beer cans and trash littered the sidewalk. He'd been so absorbed in his thoughts that he hadn't realized that he'd gotten into the bad part of town. His pulse quickened, and he started walking faster. The sky was darker now. Why hadn't he thought to bring his cell phone? Several yards ahead, he could see a figure leaning against a garbage can. He guessed from the ragged clothes and the way that he was hunched over that he was a homeless man. His first impulse was to run, but he kept walking at the same pace, keeping his eyes fixed straight ahead. Think about how Dad treated homeless people, he ordered himself. What would Dad do in this situation? What would Dad do? He was almost past him. Almost past. Evening, he said, his voice sounding squeaky and out of place. The man didn't answer, and Travis wasn't even sure that he'd heard him. The sound of crunching ice sent his heart jumping into his throat. The man was coming up behind him. He turned and looked through the snow and didn't take a breath until he saw that the man was still where he'd been, huddled against the garbage can. He looked frantically around, trying to figure out where the sound had come from. Seeing no one, he quickened his pace to a jog and rounded the corner, trying to put as much space between himself and the man as possible. The figure came at him so fast that he didn't see anything until it hit him full force. He fell to the ground, stunned. Three boys a few years older than he surrounded him. One of them caught hold of the front of his sweatshirt and yanked him to his feet. What do we have here? he said, jerking Travis's hood off of his head. 
Travis looked wildly at the boys encircling him. Tommy Hilfiger, a boy said, pointing to the sweatshirt. Rich kid. Wonder if he's got any money. Before Travis could react, they were on top of him, grabbing in his pockets for a wallet. One of the boys cursed. Nothing. He ain't got nothing. A peculiar glint shone in the eyes of the leader. It made Travis's blood run cold. That's all right, boys. We'll just take it out of his hide. They all laughed. A rush of adrenaline surged through Travis, and he kicked the boy closest to him as hard as he could in the groin. The boy went down, giving Travis the precious seconds he needed to bolt. He took off running down an alley with the boys close on his heels as he skidded on the slick pavement and dodged mounds of garbage. He let out a cry when he saw the tall metal fence stretched across the opening at the end. He glanced back. They were only a few steps behind. He rushed at the fence and started climbing, but one of the boys caught his foot. He kicked, making contact with the boy's face. Blood squirted from the boy's nose, forming black spots against the snow. You're gonna pay for that! Get him! He screamed, holding his nose. Travis climbed higher, but there was no way over the thick rope of rusted barbed wire at the top. He made a split-second decision to jump to the ground and try to outrun them, but the boys were faster. Before he could regain his balance, the heaviest of the three boys was on top of him. The blow to Travis's nose was debilitating, sending pain shooting through his face, and then he felt the warm liquid flowing out. He tried his best to shield his face from the onslaught, but it was no use. And then, just like that, it stopped. Dazed, Travis tried to get his bearings. The boy was off him, and there was another voice, the deep baritone voice of a man. Take your hands off him now. We don't want no trouble, the leader said, backing away. A minute later, they turned and ran. Travis sat up, his head spinning, his hands went to his nose. You okay? He looked up to see whom his rescuer was and was startled to learn that it was that homeless man he'd seen huddled against the garbage can. The next thing he knew, the man was helping him to his feet. Then Travis got a good look at him. He was big, well over six feet tall, and his clothes were ragged. A layer of stubble covered his jaw, and his eyes were hidden in shadows. Son, what are you doing in this area? Travis gingerly touched his nose which was still bleeding. His voice quivered. Wrong turn. He looked around, suddenly conscious of the fact that he was in a dark alley with a homeless man. Th thank you, he stammered. No thanks necessary. Just stay out of this area. It's not safe this time of the evening, especially when you're alone. The man turned and started walking away. Travis would never know what made him call the man back. Hey! He stopped and turned. Travis blurted out the first thing that came to his mind. You hungry? He started searching through his pocket for some change and then realized how ridiculous that was. If those vultures that attacked him hadn't found anything, then there obviously wasn't anything there. A deep furrow formed between the man's brows. You don't need to be letting anybody in this area know you have money. That's a good way to get yourself killed. Travis took his hand out of his pocket and looked around nervously. Well, are you hungry? He asked again. Yeah, I'm hungry, the man admitted. Come on, my mom has plenty of food. I don't think your mom would appreciate you showing up with me. Where does your mother live? Travis motioned. Follow me. Chansey glanced out the window for the fiftieth time, keenly aware of the large amount of snow accumulating on the windowsill. Travis had been gone for over an hour, and she was beginning to panic. 
She'd tried texting and calling repeatedly, and then heard the ringing coming from his bedroom. That's when she discovered his phone, laying on the bed. She would give him 15 more minutes before calling Jake and the police. The scent of roast cooking in the crockpot filled the kitchen and made her stomach growl. She remembered she hadn't eaten lunch. I'm hungry, Mommy, Susie said. I know, honey. Chancy absently smoothed down Susie's long, silky hair. We'll eat as soon as Travis gets back, I promise. The man hesitated at the edge of Travis's yard and stared at the large craftsman-style house situated on the corner lot on one of the more prominent streets of the avenues. Lights from the house reflected a golden hue on the snow-covered yard. He could see into the home to where a slender blonde was hugging a little girl. An overwhelming emptiness enveloped him. It had been a long time since he'd allowed that sense of loss to invade his senses. But standing here, looking at the woman hugging her young daughter was almost more than he could take. You go on in, son, he said, pulling the flimsy coat around him to block out the cold wind. I've got to go. No, please, the boy pleaded. Mom will want to thank you. Thank him? That's hardly the reaction he would expect from the attractive blonde in the window. No, she'd take one look at him and want to have him arrested. Look, you're a good kid, but I've got to go. The words came out gruffer than he'd meant for them to, and he was surprised to see that the boy looked crestfallen. He figured that the boy had used the excuse of food in order to entice him to walk him home as a bodyguard. Surely he couldn't be serious about inviting him in. You're home now, kid, he said a little softer, stealing one more glance at the window. He shook his head and turned to leave, but the boy caught hold of his thin coat. Please, sir, it would mean a lot. Sir? That's not a word he heard very often on the streets. He couldn't help but smile at the reference. He willed himself to step away before he changed his mind. He wanted to feel the warmth of the house, the sound of laughter, the Christmas spirit that he so longed for every year at this time. I don't belong here, he said quietly. You go on in. No one will bother you now. Just for a few minutes, please, the boy begged again. It's dinner time, and Mom always makes extra... We always feed lots of people during Christmas. He raised an eyebrow. People like me? He saw the hesitation on the boy's face. Well, sure. Do you know anybody that needs feeding more than homeless people? The man chuckled. He shook his head. Good night. This time he did turn away, but it was too late. The door flew open and the woman from the window rushed down the stairs and nearly tackled the boy. Travis, I've been so worried, Chancy said breathlessly. Then she got a look at his face and the blood on his sweatshirt. What happened to you? I got attacked, she gasped. But this man saved me. Chancy looked to where Travis was gesturing, as if seeing the man for the first time. He could tell from the look on her face that she was shocked by his shabby appearance, but she did a good job of recovering. She looked back at the boy for affirmation. I was attacked by some thugs, and this man saved me. I told him that we would give him something to eat. He's homeless, Mom, he added quietly so that only she could hear. She grasped the boy's arms and looked up into his eyes. I was so worried. I tried to call, but you didn't take your phone. Don't you ever do anything like this again. I won't, he mumbled. She gave him a fierce hug before turning to the man and extending her hand. Thank you for helping Travis. The man was surprised that a woman like her would offer her hand to him. She was strikingly beautiful, with honey blonde hair that framed her face in soft waves. Her eyes were green, with specks of gold in them, 
and her prominent cheekbones added an air of sophistication to her appearance. She was about five feet five inches tall, and he suspected that underneath the oversized sweater was a nice figure. The faint freckles on her nose gave her an innocent, girlish quality. He took her hand in his, careful not to squeeze too hard. The warmth of her was gone all too soon when she removed her hand. Nice to meet you. I just wanted to get your boy home safely. I'll be leaving now. No! You need to stay and have something to eat. Tell him, Mom! The man could see the indecision on her face as she looked back and forth between her son and him. An awkward silence passed before she seemed to make up her mind. Travis is right. We can't let you go without giving you something to eat. Won't you join us for dinner, Mr... It's Gabe. Gabe Jones. She turned and started walking up the steps. Come on in, she said over her shoulder. He hesitated until the boy, Travis, tugged at his coat. Come on! Why in the world did she invite a complete stranger, a homeless man, into her home? Talk about a lapse in judgment. Come on in and have a seat in the kitchen, Chancy heard herself say. Travis will get your coat. Travis moved to comply, and she felt a wave of compassion when she saw the holes in the man's flannel shirt. Then she got a good look at Travis in the light. His appearance was even more unsettling than it had been outside. Oh, son, what did those boys do to you? She moved to touch him, but he jerked away. Mom, don't. It hurts. You should put some ice on that, Gabe said, causing Chancy and Travis to look at him in surprise, like they couldn't believe a man like him could contribute to the conversation. Good idea, Chancy said, reaching for a dish towel. She opened the freezer door and started filling the towel with ice. She pulled out a chair. Sit down, here, she said, pressing the towel gently to Travis's nose. Susie, who'd been watching TV, heard the commotion and came running into the kitchen. She stopped short when she saw the man. She wrinkled her nose. Your clothes are dirty and you need a bath. Chancy's eyes went wide. Susie! She looked at the man, horrified. I'm so sorry. It's okay, he said, looking down at his clothes. This is my daughter, Susie. Hi, Susie. I'm Gabe. Rather than replying, Susie went and buried herself behind her mom. Susie's a little shy around strangers, Chancy explained. Especially tall, dirty strangers, he said. She didn't know how to answer that. Why had she let this man in her home? Why? My name is Chancy, she blurted. He smiled. Nice to meet you, Chancy. Please, have a seat. He pulled out a chair and sat down at the table across from Travis. Come on, Suze, let's get dinner on the table, she said. I want to watch the rest of Dora. Susie skipped back into the living room. Chancy put the roast onto a platter and spooned the gravy over it. She couldn't help but glance at the man while she worked. What was his name? Gabe. Yes, that was it. He was a big man, tall, with lean muscles like Max. His jeans and boots were worn, but not nearly as dirty as the flannel shirt and thin all-weather coat that Travis had taken from him. In another setting, she might have thought him handsome, with his strong jaw and startling blue eyes. But seeing such a man reduced to his condition was heartbreaking. She wondered what had happened to make him choose a life of homelessness. It was a choice, wasn't it? A fear seized her. Was he crazy? She knew from working at the soup kitchen that most homeless people had mental problems, and she'd let him into her house. For some reason, an image of Max flooded her mind at that moment. Max had taught her not to judge. This man didn't seem crazy. In fact, he seemed perfectly at ease, 
more so than most normal people she knew. Gabe was asking Travis about his school, and Travis was talking. Really talking. How long had it been since that happened? She scooped the potatoes into a bowl and added a serving spoon before reaching for the bowl of green peas. She wiped her hands on a dish towel. Now she just had to set the table and they could eat. Dinner's almost ready, she announced. Travis, you might want to go and clean yourself up before we eat. Good idea, Travis said. Gabe scooted back his chair and stood. Could I wash my hands? Sure, I'll show you where the restroom is. She led him down the hall. A few minutes later, the four were seated at the table. Chansey looked at Travis. Would you say the prayer? He nodded and bowed his head. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and for our warm home and for this food. We're also thankful for Gabe and how he helped me this evening. Please bless him that he'll be warm and safe this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Gabe said quietly, and Chansey could tell that Travis's prayer had moved him. It was so cold outside, she couldn't imagine what it must be like to live on the streets, not to have a warm place to go. They passed around the bowls and filled their plates. In that small moment, they were simply two adults and two children sitting around a table and having dinner. Chansey almost forgot she was entertaining a homeless man. She looked across the table. Where are you from, Gabe? Idaho. How did you end up here? Travis asked, popping half a roll into his mouth. I came here for a job, he said stiffly. They waited for him to say more, but he didn't. It was obvious that he didn't want to talk about himself. Does Santa Claus know that you're here? Susie asked, her eyes going wide. Gabe reached for his napkin and spread it over his lap. Santa Claus always knows where you are. A lump formed in Chansey's throat. Those were the same words that Max always said. My daddy used to say that. Susie answered quietly, as if she could read her mother's mind. Silence settled over them, and she wondered if Gabe could feel the tension. Gabe turned to Susie. What's Santa bringing you for Christmas? Excitement brimmed in her eyes. A new Barbie, some Barbie clothes, and a Barbie van, she shouted. And the van's gonna be pink. What about you? Gabe asked Travis, just as the timer on the stove beeped. What was that? Susie asked. The Christmas ornaments. I almost forgot about them. Excuse me. Chansey hurried to the stove and put on an oven mitt. She raked them onto a cooling rack and returned to the table. You bake Christmas ornaments? Gabe asked incredulously. Chansey nodded. It's a tradition. They're made from flour, salt, and a little water. The trick is to cook them a long, long time. And we paint them, Susie added enthusiastically. Everyone laughed. Travis took a sip of milk from his glass. My dad started it when I was little. Then he got too busy and Mom kept making them. Gabe smiled. My mother used to bake gingerbread cookies for me and my brother when I was a boy. My dad loved cookies, Travis said quietly, looking at Gabe. Chansey could tell from the admiration on Travis's face where this conversation was headed. A wave of panic nearly engulfed her. Inhale deeply, she told herself. The last thing she wanted was for her children to tell this man that their dad was dead. She had to get him out of their house before they invited him to spend the night or move in. She'd never seen them take up with anyone as quickly as they had him. Then again, he wasn't a threat to Travis like Jake was. Travis was worried that Jake would try to replace his father. But this man was a passing face, like the person you make small talk with at the airport but then never see again. My daddy's name was Maxwell Hamilton III. Susie shoved a carrot in her mouth. He's dead, she said matter-of-factly. 
Chansey nearly choked on her potatoes, and Travis looked like he wanted to strangle his little sister. Chansey looked across the table and saw the surprise written on Gabe's face. It was evident that Susie's outburst had made him uncomfortable. Um, it's getting late. She stood and placed her napkin beside her plate. I... He nodded. You're right. It's time for me to go. I'll get your coat, she said. She just handed it to him when the doorbell rang. The doorbell! Susie shouted, running to open it. Mom, it's Jake! She chimed, leading him into the kitchen. Chancy bit her lower lip as she watched Jake's expression harden when he saw Gabe. What's going on here? Jake, this is Gabe. She fought wildly to remember his last name. Jones, he supplied. He helped Travis get away from some boys that were trying to rob him tonight, so we invited him to dinner. The words came out in a rush, the way they always did when she got nervous. Jake's expression didn't change as he shifted his attention to Travis. And just where were these boys? About six blocks east of the soup kitchen, Travis volunteered. What were you doing over there? Jake continued to focus all of his attention on Travis. Before Travis could answer, Gabe stepped forward and extended his hand to Jake. Chancy noticed he was at least four inches taller and probably outweighed Jake by 25 or 30 pounds. Jake ignored Gabe's hand and kept his eyes glued on Travis. You shouldn't worry your mom by going over there. You know that's a bad area. Travis nodded and lowered his head. Gabe's hand fell to his side, making Chansey keenly aware that Jake had refused to shake it. She wondered what it had cost Gabe to break out of his barrier to actually make the gesture to shake hands. She could tell that he'd been surprised when she extended her hand to him. How long had it been since this poor man had enjoyed normal human interaction? For Jake not to reciprocate had to be a slap in the face. Thanks for dinner, Gabe said. For the second time that night, Chansey extended her hand to Gabe and he grasped it in his. Was it her imagination, or had she felt some sort of connection when they touched? You're welcome, and thanks for helping Travis. He nodded, his eyes briefly meeting hers before locking on Jake's. The two men stood for a moment, sizing each other up. Then he headed down the hall and out into the night. When the door closed behind Gabe, Jake gave Chansey a curious look. What was that all about? Her eyes sparked. You didn't have to be so rude. He raked a hand through his sandy hair. What are you talking about? Gabe! He tried to shake your hand and you ignored it. How dare you come into my house and berate my guest? Jake threw his hands in the air. Your guest? For goodness sakes, Chansey, what were you thinking? He could have robbed and killed you and the kids and no one would have been the wiser. Her face reddened. Just because he's homeless doesn't mean he's a criminal. He was a nice man. He helped Travis. Yeah, and then followed him home. Now he knows you're here alone with two kids. Chansey caught a glimpse of Travis and Susie in her peripheral vision, running up the stairs toward their rooms. No one could clear a room faster than Jake. She chastised herself for the thought. That wasn't fair. The kids would warm up to Jake once they got to know him better. She cleared the table and started loading the dishwasher while he watched her. When she finished, she turned to face him. No one told him we're here alone, she said defensively. Did he ask you where your husband is? Jake demanded. He didn't have to ask because Susie blurted it out. No, he didn't ask. Emotional exhaustion was beginning to set in. It's getting late. We'll talk about this some other time. He bridged the distance between them and put his arms around her. Look, I'm sorry. I worry about you, and it was a shock to come in and see a strange, dirty man in your kitchen. She leaned her head against his chest. I know, it was a crazy thing to do. 
one thing led to another. If he hadn't been there, I don't even want to think about what might have happened to Travis. Tears stung her eyes, and Jake lifted her chin so that he could see her face. He tenderly wiped the tears from her cheeks. Please don't do anything crazy like that again, okay? She nodded. For all of his shortcomings, Jake made her feel safe. The snow started again when Gabe stepped out into the cold December night. He pulled his flimsy coat tighter and allowed himself one more glance at the house with its warmth spilling like a beacon across the snow-covered yard before heading back in the direction he'd come. The night seemed colder than before, and he fought off the shiver that was seeping into his bones. He shook his head. Maxwell Hamilton III. He certainly hadn't expected that. He allowed his mind to drift back to when he had a family. The dinner had been excellent, and it felt good to have a full stomach, especially on a night like tonight. Still, it had been a long time since he'd interacted with a family, and he wasn't prepared for the onslaught of memories it had unleashed. Memories that had almost destroyed him. He'd fought too hard to put distance between himself and the past to let it overtake him now. He hadn't meant to tell Chansey his real first name, but it slipped out before he could call it back. The ache that welled in his gut was as familiar as it was cutting, and he smothered it by forcing his mind to think about other things. He focused instead on the acrid look the man had given him when he walked in and saw him in the kitchen. Gabe was used to people treating him like smelly garbage on account of his appearance. But somehow the sting was greater tonight in comparison to Chansey and her warm acceptance. She'd been leery at first, which was understandable, he conceded. But once she got past his outward appearance, she'd treated him like a normal human being. That man, Jake, was he her boyfriend? A pang of jealousy shot through him, making him chuckle. The woman meant nothing to him. What did he care what the man was to her? The man... There was something familiar about him. Gabe searched his memory, trying to find a connection. It was a curse he had of never forgetting a face. The snowflakes were getting bigger, reminding him of swarming bees. Swarming cold bees. He quickened his step, hoping to get where he was going before the storm got worse. Chapter 2 Chansey looked out the window to see her next-door neighbor, Janet Marsh, tucking her hair into her hat and stomping through the snow and up the icy sidewalk. She'd have to remind Travis to shovel the snow and put some more salt on the driveway and front steps leading up to the porch. They were supposed to get more snow this weekend and if they didn't clear the ice now, they'd have a mess on their hands. The doorbell sounded, and Chansey ran to get the door. Hey, Janet, come in and I'll make you some hot chocolate. Chansey motioned her in, but Janet stopped in the foyer and removed her wet boots. You don't have to do that. Yes, I do. I'll track snow and mud all over your clean floor if I don't. She followed Chansey into the kitchen. Every time I come in here, this place is spotless. I don't know how you do it. Chansey could have told her that the house was spick and span because cleaning was the only thing that kept her mind occupied. Otherwise, the memories were too painful. But she simply smiled. Janet pointed. Yum! Cookies! May I? She was about to take one before Chansey stopped her. No, those are salt dough ornaments. Oh, they're beautiful. Janet picked up a snowman, inspected it, and then laughed. They look just like cookies, but I suppose they wouldn't exactly taste the same now, would they? Not hardly. We decorate with them every year. We're decorating the tree tonight. Janet walked to the den to take a peek. What a beautiful tree. I just love live trees. Me too. Chansey handed her a cup of hot chocolate. She took a sip and set her cup on the counter. I can't stay. I'm on my way to CVS to pick up a prescription for Ted. He's in bed with a sinus infection. I'm so sorry. 
Janet made a face. Yeah, you and me both. Ted's an awful patient. Get this and get that. I'm too cold, too hot, she mimicked. Heaven forbid if he ever really gets sick. She groaned. Men can't live with them and can't live without them. Her eyes went wide as she realized what she'd just said. An awkward silence passed as Chansey looked down at the floor. What she would give to have Max here, grumpy or not. Janet didn't realize how lucky she was. Janet started adjusting her coat. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you about the robbery on our street last night. What? Chansey leaned in closer. Someone disabled the alarm system in the Crane's house last night while they were at a Christmas party and helped themselves to her jewelry and some expensive Christmas presents. You're kidding. What time did it take place? Janet shook her head. Sometime between 9 and 11.30. All they found were tracks made by some large boots. She picked up the cup and took a sip of hot chocolate. Chancy swallowed hard. Are you sure? Yeah, why? Janet peered over the rim of her cup. No reason. It's just terrible when something like that happens this time of the year. Chancy shook her head while trying to remember what time it was when Gabe left her house. Travis threw up his hand in front of his eyes to shield them from the sun reflecting off the snow. As bright as it was out here, he would have thought it would be warmer. He'd been shoveling snow for over thirty minutes and he hadn't even made a dent. He pulled his wool hat down over his ears to protect them from the cold air. He was glad he'd convinced his mom to let him stay home while she took Susie to dance class and then shopping afterwards. He was planning on inviting Brent and Todd over to play the Xbox after he finished his chores. Forty-five minutes later, he was finally finished. He was leaning against the shovel and admiring his work when he saw a familiar face walking toward him. For a second, he thought his eyes were playing tricks on him, but no, it was the same brown coat and boots. This time, however, he was wearing a black knit hat. Travis went to wave but lost his balance and had to fight to keep himself from slipping backwards on the ice. Hey, Gabe! he shouted. Gabe raised a hand in recognition. What you doing in this neighborhood? Just looking for work. He motioned at the shoveled snow. Looks like I got here a little late, or I would have helped you. Travis glanced at his handiwork. Yeah, that would have been nice. Gabe tipped his fingers in a farewell gesture and started walking away. See you later. Hey, Travis yelled after him. He turned. I know some work you can do. I don't have any money, but Mom still has plenty of leftovers. Gabe smiled. What do you have in mind? Mom's going to be so surprised, Travis said, handing the hammer up the ladder to Gabe. The two had worked side by side for the better part of an hour and were now on the last wreath. Why don't we just keep this our little secret? Gabe looked down at Travis while working. You gotta be kidding. This is the first thing Mom's gonna see when she pulls into the driveway. She asked Jake to come over and put them up for her, but he said he didn't have time. I see. Gabe adjusted the wreath so that the tendrils of the bow hung down straight. He climbed down from the ladder and carried it back to the garage while Travis followed in his footsteps, holding the hammer. Travis shuffled his foot back and forth in the snow, making a trough. I'm glad I saw you in the neighborhood this afternoon. Gabe nodded. Me too, but now I have to go. What about those leftovers I told you about? Gabe hesitated like he was considering his options. Travis, what happened to your dad? He finally said. Travis rocked back, the question catching him off guard. I can tell you really miss him. He hated the moisture that formed in his eyes and looked away to hide it. He died, and then he left it at that. No explanation. Gabe put a hand on his shoulder. I'm sorry. Travis nodded. I really... He cleared his throat to rid it of the frog that was choking his words and then tried again. I miss him a lot. I know you do, son. He turned to leave. 
You remind me of him, Travis blurted. Gabe stopped, turned, and looked at Travis. Judging by the compassion emanating from his kind eyes, Travis got the impression that somehow he understood, really understood, on a level that few people could. Before Travis realized what he was doing, he threw his arms around Gabe and hugged him. It was obvious that the gesture caught Gabe off guard from the way he stumbled back. Thankfully, he was able to brace himself before they both went toppling. Realizing what he'd done, Travis pulled away, embarrassed. Time will help, I promise, Gabe said gruffly. Travis shrugged. He'd heard that a million times from well-meaning people. The words rang hollow like the wind stinging his nose. Gabe gave him an appraising look. I have one more question. Is Jake your mom's boyfriend? Travis's face darkened. Yeah, I guess so, but I don't like him. Gabe frowned. Why not? Travis considered the question. There wasn't anything he could pinpoint specifically other than the petty things. It was just a feeling. Being around Jake was like watching one of those movies where the monsters are wearing masks that make them look like everyday normal people. You try to turn really fast to catch them off guard so that you'll be able to see when the mask slips, but it was no use where Jake was concerned. His mask was fixed with super glue, and there was no separating it. But he couldn't tell Gabe this because he would think that he was crazy or something. I don't know. He just makes me mad because he tries to tell me and Susie what to do. Travis looked up at Gabe. You're probably going to tell me that I should give him a chance. Is that what your mom tells you? What everybody tells me. And then he did something remarkable. He didn't try and lecture Travis at all, but rather pulled his coat tighter around him and began walking down the driveway toward the street. Good to see you again. But the leftovers... He waved the comment away. Some other time. The snow had started again by the time Chansey finished shopping and picked Susie up from dance lessons. Christmas lights and candles shined from almost every house in the neighborhood, making the street look like a Hallmark Christmas card. For a split second, Chansey thought she was on the wrong street when she saw the giant wreaths over the windows and front door. She smiled. Jake must have changed his mind. Travis! she yelled, dropping her keys on the foyer table. Hey, Mom! He stood at the top of the stairs, looking down at her and Susie. Honey, when did Jake put up the wreaths? Travis ran down the stairs. It wasn't Jake, Mom. It was Gabe. Her eyes widened, and she wasn't sure she'd heard him correctly. Gabe? The homeless man? He nodded, oblivious to the worried expression on her face. Hey, Susie, do you want to play a game with me? He nudged her arm playfully. Travis, what was Gabe doing here? Chansey said. He was in the neighborhood looking for work, so I asked him to help us. He spoke the words so casually that he might have been talking about inviting a neighbor over instead of some homeless man. You what? She stood with her hand on her hip. I invited him to have leftovers, but he said he had to go. You know you're forbidden to have strangers here while I'm gone, her voice rose. He's not a stranger, he's my friend. Chansey had to approach this delicately. The last thing she wanted was a repeat of the other night where Travis ran out. She removed her coat and scarf and hung them in the coat closet. You didn't venture into the bad part of town, the words hung heavy in the air. Travis blew out a breath. I'm not stupid, okay? I didn't mean to go there to begin with. I certainly wouldn't go back. She relaxed, realizing for the first time that a part of her had been worried that Travis's ending up in the bad part of town might have stemmed from some perverse desire to follow in his father's footsteps. Max was always trying to help those in need regardless of how scary they appeared to be. So, Gabe came here? She tried hard to keep her voice neutral, all the while remembering her earlier conversation with Janet. 
Yeah, I was shoveling snow and I saw him walking down the sidewalk. Travis didn't offer any more information. Sometimes it was so frustrating, trying to drag things out of him. And you asked him to help put up the wreaths? He rolled his eyes, letting her know that he was tired of the Inquisition. He said he was looking for work, so I told him he could help us for leftovers. Gosh, Mom, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Oh, honey, how like his father he was. She didn't know whether to throw her arms around him or cry. It could be a big deal. You can't just keep inviting people like that into our home. It's not safe. I thought you'd be happy. Travis bit his bottom lip, and she could tell that he was withdrawing into himself. She debated about whether or not to tell him about the break-in at the Crane's house the night before. There was no use in adding more worry to their already strained lives. I am happy, honey, she finally said. Just promise you won't do anything like that again without asking first, okay? Sure, he said, frowning at her. It was nights like tonight that drove Chansey crazy. She put on her red Christmas pajamas and thick wool socks to stave off the cold. She'd almost left the socks off but knew it would only be a matter of time before she'd be up looking for them. So she went ahead and put them on. She never could get her feet warm in the winter. Max had always let her put her cold feet on his legs until they warmed up. Only then would she finally fall asleep. The reflection of the full moon on the snow shined through the windows, lighting up the room. She hugged herself. At least in the darkness, she could pretend Max was in the bed asleep. Tonight, the light stripped all pretenses, revealing the stark truth. She was alone. Crazy that she would be having such thoughts now. It had been nearly a year since the accident, and so much had happened in her life. Until meeting Jake a few months ago, she'd kept Max's robe hanging on the back of the bathroom door and his clothes in the closet. She let out a sigh, not sure how she felt about Jake. Things were moving too fast for her and the kids, especially Travis. Jake's attitude toward her son bothered her. It was as if he felt the need to take on the role of the disciplinarian, which didn't sit well with Travis, or her. Her thoughts drifted back to the night before, when Travis had brought Gabe Jones home with him. Even if Jake were concerned about Gabe's presence, he had no right to give Travis the third degree. It was something they would definitely have to talk about soon. She could only imagine what Jake would say if he found out there was a robbery in the neighborhood around the same time that Gabe had left. After a while, she drifted off to sleep. Sure, you can count on me. Chancy hung up the phone and sat down on a stool next to the counter. She ran her fingers through her hair. It was impossible. She just couldn't get away from it no matter what she did. Why had she not told her no? At least Travis wouldn't be bugging her about doing Christmas stuff, since he and Susie were spending a couple of days with her sister Jill. The doorbell rang. Hey, girly. Janet was standing in the door, wearing a ridiculous-looking sweater that had Rudolph's face plastered on it. There were tiny bells at the tips of the antlers and a red pom-pom for his nose. She was balancing a stock pot on a potholder. Chancy pointed. Are those holly leaves and berries on that potholder? You betcha, Janet said with a laugh. Chancy waved her in. The wind cut through her sweater, sending a shiver down her spine. Oosh, it's cold out there. Good timing. I was just about to call you. They walked toward the kitchen. Janet's love for the holidays was legendary throughout the neighborhood. Even though her two children were grown and had long ago moved away, she insisted on drenching her house in lights and all of the trappings. Her yard looked like a winter wonderland with the life-size blow-up figures of Santa, Frosty the Snowman, reindeer, candy canes, and every other Christmas icon imaginable. Max used to joke with Janet, telling her that she and Ted kept the electric company in business. 
It amazed Chansey that a person would go to such extremes just to celebrate a holiday. Do you swap out your entire house with Christmas decor? Yep, sure do, although Ted's not too sure about this year's addition. Chansey raised an eyebrow. Oh? Janet flashed a wicked grin. A Frosty the Snowman toilet lid. What? Yeah, Ted hates it. He says he doesn't want some bug-eyed snowman eyeing him while he's doing his business. Chansey's eyes went wide. I thought those lids only had the picture on the outside. There was a deviant twinkle in her eyes. Not this one. Special order. Poor Ted. Poor Ted, my eye. If I have to stare at those deer heads that he insists on mounting in my living room, then he can put up with Frosty for a month. You could always put bells on the antlers, Chancy said, biting back a smile and pointing to the Rudolph sweater. Hey, now there's an idea. Janet cocked her head like she was truthfully considering it, and then they both laughed. Chancy pointed. What you got there? Janet placed the pot on the stove. White bean chili. If this doesn't warm your bones, nothing will. Smells divine. Chancy lifted the lid and took a whiff. Where are the kids? Jill's house. Oh, some alone time, huh? Chancy shrugged. Yeah, something like that. She had too much time alone as it was. The only reason she agreed to let the kids go to Jill's was because she couldn't face the thought of going through the motions of doing all of their traditional holiday activities without Max, such as making gingerbread houses, taking treats to the neighbors, and most especially, the ding-dong ditch. Your decorations look great. I can't believe Jake climbed up there and hung that huge wreath below the eave. The only thing that could get Ted up that high would be a prodding stick or slab of ribs. There aren't many husbands that would do that, much less a boyfriend. Chansey let out a sigh. Jake didn't hang the decorations. Janet looked puzzled. Then who? No one important. Chansey threw up her hands. Who is this non-important person that risked his life to decorate your house? It's a long story. I'm listening. Chansey went to the cupboard where she retrieved two bowls and placed them on the counter. She grabbed a ladle and removed the lid. Travis and I had an argument the other day, and he wandered over into the bad part of town. Some boys jumped him. This man came out of nowhere and ran them off. Travis said he saved his life. Wow! A knight in shining armor! Who was he? He said his name is Gabe Jones from Idaho. And? Chansey scooped out a generous amount of chili in each bowl. She went to the drawer and pulled out two spoons. She handed one to Janet, and they sat down at the table and began eating. This is really good. Janet nodded impatiently, waiting for her to continue the story. While Susie and I were gone... Travis ran into him and asked him to help decorate the house as a surprise for me. I suppose he felt comfortable around him because we invited him to have dinner with us the night he saved Travis. That's great, Chansey. Is he handsome? She wrinkled her nose. What kind of question is that? An honest one. Well? Chansey considered the question. The man's attractiveness, or lack thereof, paled in comparison to the other more pressing issues. She was so focused on his lack of bare necessities, his ragged clothes that carried the faint smell of old sweat and a mechanic's garage, his gaunt face covered with stubble and those eyes. She stopped. There was an intelligent light in those fierce blue eyes that seemed incongruent with his condition and there was a kindness in them. That and his size were what reminded her of Max. Yes, he is attractive, sort of, she finally said. Where does he live? That's the problem. I think he's homeless. Janet's jaw dropped, 
and her mortified expression mirrored that of Jake's the other night. You let a homeless man in the house? Not wanting to go into it again, Chancy waved the comment away. He saved Travis. I couldn't leave him out in the cold. Look, I know how you feel about helping people, and goodness knows Max felt the same way. But you have to look out for your kids. Now that Max is not here... Chancy threw down her spoon, causing it to make a loud plink against the bowl. I know. Believe me, I've already gone through this with Jake. I don't need to hear it from you, too. Why does everybody keep treating me like I'm ten? She regretted her outburst the minute the words left her mouth, and the shocked look on Janet's face made it worse. I'm sorry. She combed a hand through her hair. I'm just a little edgy today. Janet put a hand on her arm. You'll get through it, honey, and it'll get easier. Dang those tears. Chancy tried her best to hold them back but couldn't stop one from dribbling down her cheek. She wiped it away in a swift motion. Her throat was now too thick to enjoy the chili, but she took another bite anyway. This is changing the subject, but why were you going to call me? Chancy took a deep breath. Oh, that. I just got a call to come down and help with the soup line. They're shorthanded. In other words, it's an emergency. Are you going? I don't want to. It's so hard to go there without Max. I just don't know if I can do it this year. The sad part is that I can't even use the kids as an excuse, because I sent them off to be with Jill, so I wouldn't have to deal with all of this Christmas stuff. Janet studied her for a minute. I think you should go. What? Yes, it might be the thing you need. You can't hide in this kitchen forever. A smile played on her lips. Besides... This relentless cleaning is making me look bad. Heaven help me if Ted ever comes over here and sees how clean this place is. Chancy just stared off in the distance. That was a joke, honey. You're supposed to laugh. Oh. You have to face it sooner or later. She paused. I'll go with you. Chancy looked at her. Janet hated going to the soup kitchen. She'd told Chancy on many occasions that being in a confined room with all of those homeless people made her too nervous. Really? For you, I'll go. This one time. Under one condition. What? Let's eat this dadgum chili before it gets cold. This time, Chancy did laugh. Thanks, Janet. Chapter 3 the last rays of the afternoon sun were disappearing as Chansey and Janet arrived, shooting pink and blue ribbons across the winter skyline. Chansey pointed. It was just a few blocks over where Travis got attacked. Janet pursed her lips and shook her head. He was lucky that the homeless man was there. Yes, he was. They got out of the car and walked across the street to where the line was backed up several blocks made up mostly of gnarly men wearing the grime of the street like a second set of skin. There was a single dot of pink marring the muted blue and gray line. A little girl, not much older than Susie, was holding a battered doll to her chest with one hand and clutching the hand of the stone-faced woman who was standing beside her. Janet saw the pair at the same instant. She pointed. Look. Yes. I saw them. It's so cold out here. Chancy nodded, knowing where Janet's thoughts were leading. Temperatures were forecasted to plummet into the teens tonight. How would the woman and the little girl survive it? There were a couple of women's shelters within walking distance of the soup kitchen, but every available spot would be filled by now. A pang tugged in the pit of Chancy's stomach partly out of worry for the woman and child, and partly out of being here at this place and not having Max by her side. It was just as hard as she feared it would be. 
A bubble formed in her throat and she swallowed it back down, blinking rapidly to fight the tears. It wouldn't do for her to lose it now. Thankfully, Janet tugged on her arm. Where to? Chancy motioned. Let's go in the side door. We'll find Harriet Dean. She's in charge, and believe me, she won't be hard to spot. What makes you say that? Her jaw began working as she thought of the best way to describe Harriet. In her late fifties, Harriet was something of a wild card. She'd first met her shortly after she applied for a job as a secretary at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. Max always laughed when telling the story. Harriet waltzed in with that huge hair and enough makeup for the entire upper floor. The first thing she said when she walked through the door was, Hey, sugar. Of course, there was no way I could hire her to be my secretary. Then she started telling me how she was a single mom with one son who was studying to be a doctor at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. One thing led to another, and before I knew what was happening, I'd hired her to run the soup kitchen. Max had a soft spot for Harriet. He saw the good in her, despite her outward appearance. Chancy smiled inwardly, knowing how Janet would react when she saw her. Wait till you meet her, Chancy pointed. There. She laughed when she saw Janet's bug-eyed expression. Oh, I see what you mean. They looked up the line of men to where a tall, bleach blonde was standing. Her red, high-topped boots and tight sweater looked ridiculously out of place against the sterile background of the beige tile and gray walls. Don't let her looks fool you. She has a heart of gold. And a chest the size of Texas. Chancy laughed. Come on, and I'll introduce you. As they got closer, Chancy stopped in her tracks. There was a man talking to Harriet. He was standing so that his back was facing them, but there was something in his stance that looked familiar. The broad shoulders, large frame. Her pulse sped up a notch, and she slowed her pace, watching as Harriet handed him something that he took and put into his pocket. What's wrong? Janet said. I think that's the homeless man that came to our house the other night. Really? Janet made a face. I guess it would make sense. Where else is a homeless person going to go? He has to eat. Yeah, you're right. Chancy felt awkward all of a sudden. She looked at the man again, trying to decide if he were Gabe. What would she say to him? Would he expect some sort of payment for putting up the Christmas wreaths? She would gladly pay him, of course. Her face felt flush. By the time they made it across the room to Harriet, the man was gone. Chancy didn't know if it was relief or disappointment she was feeling. A broad smile broke across Harriet's face when she saw them. Oh, good. You're here, she said breathlessly as she wiped her forehead with the back of her hand. It's been crazy. We started out serving taco soup, but we ran out 30 minutes ago. Now we're down to serving canned soup. Chancy glanced around the crowded room. Has it been this busy all day? Yeah. Word got out that we were serving two meals today, and the soup kitchen across town bust a large group over. She looked at Janet. Who's your friend? Chancy did the introductions. Well, Janet, we're glad to have you, too. She handed Janet a can opener. If you'll go over there and open those cans... Then we'll get them on the stove. Chancy, grab an apron. You can help serve. Stop! For a second, Chancy and Janet thought she was talking to them. But then Harriet rushed over to the twenty-something-year-old guy with slicked-back hair and freckles, who was scooping out large handfuls of cheese and plopping it on top of the soup of every man coming through the line. Not so much, she hissed. This has to last us through dinner. She motioned at the never-ending line of mostly men waiting for soup. It took over three hours for the line to dwindle down. Chansey's feet were aching, and the three hours felt like eight. Harriet glanced at the clock. 
We'll stay open another fifteen minutes, and we'll then call it a night. Janet looked at Chancy and mouthed, Thank heavens. I'm exhausted. Me too, Chancy agreed. How Harriet could do this day in and day out was beyond her. Not only was it physically exhausting, but emotionally as well. Every once in a while, one of the men would utter a gruff, Thanks, when Chancy scooped the soup into the bowl. But for the most part... All she got in return for her effort was a vacant stare. It was heartbreaking to see men reduced to tatters, and she always found herself asking the same worn-out question. What had happened to bring them to this point? About halfway through the shift, she found herself searching for Gabe. She wondered if it had been him that Harriet was talking to. She kept thinking back to the night that Travis brought him home. He was well-mannered and conversational, traits that seemed incongruent with his circumstance. But that wasn't what struck her. Rather, it was the kind, intelligent light in his eyes. These men coming through the soup line had flat eyes, devoid of hope. The more men she saw coming through the line, the less sure she was that it was Gabe she'd seen earlier. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief when Harriet finally closed and locked the door. Okay, time for cleanup. Janet looked horrified. Cleanup? Chancy blew out a breath. As tired as she was, there was no way she could leave Harriet with all of this. There had been two other women in the serving line when they arrived, but as soon as they saw Chancy and Janet, they left, explaining that they'd been there since lunch. That left Harriet, the two of them, and the freckle-faced boy that couldn't do anything right to save his life. Okay, let's work fast so we can get out of here before midnight, Chancy said. Janet mumbled something under her breath, and Chancy knew better than to ask her what she'd said. When everything was done, Harriet gave them the okay to leave. You guys were such a lifesaver tonight. She gave Chansey a hug. Thanks so much. Max would be so proud of you for coming down here. I know it wasn't easy. Chansey nodded, fighting back tears. They were putting on their coats when Chansey remembered that she'd not asked about Gabe. She turned to Harriet. You were talking to a man when we came in. Harriet's expression was blank. A man? Yeah, tall, Dark hair. I believe he was wearing a brown coat. Honey, there were so many men in here today that I couldn't pick a one of them out of a lineup if my life depended on it. He's kind of athletic looking with really blue eyes. Harriet shook her head. I try to avoid having too many conversations with the men. It keeps things simpler that way. You were talking to this man. Gabe? Gabe Jones? No, I don't know anyone by that name. Was he homeless? Yes, but I didn't see him get anything to eat. Do you know this man? Is there a specific reason you're asking about him? Heat flooded Chansey's face. Oh no, I just thought I recognized him. He helped Travis out the other day and I wanted to tell him thanks. Harriet gave her a skeptical look. Okay. I guess you'll just have to come back and help out again. We have our share of regulars. He'll probably come again. You handed him something, Chansey blurted. Now Janet was looking at her funny as well, probably wondering why she cared so much about some homeless man. He was wearing a brown coat, she repeated. Harriet removed her apron and spread her hands in defeat. Sorry, don't know him. Okay, let's call it a night, folks. I'm exhausted. Janet grabbed Chansey's arm. So are we. Let's head home. When they got back in the car, Chansey realized that she'd left her phone in the console. A wave of anxiety rolled over her when she saw that she'd missed seven calls. She quickly scrolled through the missed calls. Ever since they'd lost Max... Travis tended to go into a panic when he couldn't reach her on the phone for an extended period of time, which was ironic, 
considering that he was always forgetting to take his phone with him. Teenagers. She'd intended to put the phone in her pocket when they arrived at the soup kitchen, but had forgotten. She let out a sigh of relief when she saw that the kids hadn't called. All seven calls were from Jake. Is everything okay? Janet said. Yeah, I was afraid the kids were trying to get in touch with me, but it was only Jake. Janet leaned over to get a look at the phone. Seven missed calls in three hours? She raised an eyebrow. Things between you two must be more serious than I thought. The last thing Chansey wanted to do was to discuss her relationship with Jake. She wasn't sure where things were going with him, but it made her feel uncomfortable that he'd called seven times in the last three hours. Maybe it was time to slow things down a bit. Maybe you should call him back, Janet prompted. It might be something important. Chansey shrugged. I'll call him back when I get home. I'm too tired right now. But what if it's an emergency? I'll call him later, Chansey said with more bite in her voice than she'd intended. She saw the stricken look on Janet's face. I'm sorry, she offered. I guess going to the soup kitchen took more out of me than I realized. Janet nodded in understanding. You and Max did a great thing when you started that kitchen. It just kills me to think about all of those needy people and that mother and child we saw. She paused, and even in the dark, Chansey could tell that she was trying to get a hold of her emotions. I just can't imagine what it must be like to lose everything and be reduced to those conditions. That poor woman with the little girl thanked me three times for the soup. A bowl of soup is a small pittance to offer. I disagree. You just don't know what a bowl of soup or any other small act of kindness can do for a person, Janet countered. Chansey swallowed the lump building in her throat. Now you're starting to sound like Max. Janet chuckled. Max always was a smart one. Yes, he was, Chansey agreed, gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. She wondered if the hurt would ever stop. Everyone said that grief would become easier over time. But going back to the soup kitchen today brought it all back full force. Tonight, the hurt felt as fresh as it had the moment she lost him. The soup kitchen was their baby, even though it was Chansey who first came up with the idea. They were walking around Temple Square, looking at the lights, but kept seeing homeless people begging for money. Every time Chansey and Max went to Temple Square, they took along small bills to hand out to those in need. But Chansey didn't feel it was enough. We should start a soup kitchen, she told Max. You're always looking for ways to shelter your inheritance. Think of all the good you could do with that. Max thought for a minute. A soup kitchen, huh? She smiled up at him. Yep. I think it's great that your foundation helps people around the world, but what about the people here in our own backyard? They need help, too. He gave her an appraising look. Chance? I believe you're onto something. I'll have my lawyers look into it. It might have been Chancey's idea to start the kitchen, but it was Max who made it a reality. Like everything else he did, he put his heart and soul into it. Not only did he fund the kitchen but he also made it a point to volunteer there at least a couple of days each month. They turned onto their street. Thanks for inviting me to come along, Janet said. Chansey laughed. I'm sure I'll hear about this one for some time. I know going there is not your favorite thing to do. Yes, I suppose I've made my feelings clear on that account, she paused. But I was wrong. I needed that. I can't think of a better way to start off this holiday season. I mean that. Chansey was touched by Janet's sincerity and her friendship. You're welcome, she said quietly. They pulled into Chansey's driveway. Janet pointed to the car parked along the curb. Who's that? Jake. Janet's mouth formed a tight O. Oh. I guess you should have called him back. Look. He's sitting on the front porch, in the cold. 
Chansey just shook her head. She was mentally and physically drained, and she didn't feel like dealing with Jake tonight. I can come in with you, she offered. But Chansey could hear the weariness in her voice. They pulled into the garage. No, it's okay. She gave Janet a hug. Thanks for everything. They got out of the car, and Janet gave her a farewell wave before casting a furtive glance at Jake, who'd come around to the garage. Hey, Chansey said, giving him a tired smile. He glanced at his watch. Where have you been? It's almost ten o'clock. The soup kitchen, downtown. He shoved his hands into his pockets. Have you stopped answering your calls? Chansey could see his strained expression in the moonlight. The last thing she needed right now was a possessive man in her life. I left my phone in the car while I was at the soup kitchen. Jake, what's going on? What do you mean, what's going on? I just stopped by to check on you and the kids. She let out a sigh and walked around him to unlock the door. She went into the house with him following behind. You didn't even say hello before you started asking me questions. I appreciate your concern, but my kids are fine and so am I. Are you home alone? Jake, did you hear what I said? Listen to yourself. We've only been dating a few months. It's none of your business whether or not I'm home alone. She flipped on the lights. You're right. I guess I'm just paranoid about that man Travis brought home. Well, you can relax. He's gone. Where are the kids? He asked again, but this time more gently. At Jill's. He reached for her hand. I can always stay here with you tonight. She couldn't hide the shocked expression that came over her face and saw his eyes narrow a hint. I don't think that's a good idea, she said, withdrawing her hand from his. I'm really tired tonight, she amended. Going to the soup kitchen took more out of me than I realized. She retrieved a glass from the cabinet and filled it with water. She could feel his eyes studying her. Okay, he finally said. If you're sure, you'll be okay. I'll be fine. Is the alarm set? You know that robbery took place just a couple of streets from here. The alarm is set. If anyone comes within a mile of this house, it'll go off and half the cops in town will be here in a matter of seconds. He gave her a seductive smile. I don't have to go into work tomorrow until three. We could make some hot chocolate and put on one of those old black and white movies you love. She felt herself soften. It was good that Jake cared so much. That sounds wonderful, but I'm so tired. Could I take a rain check? She could sense his disappointment, but he was trying hard not to show it. He gave her a slight smile and ran a hand through his hair. Okay, another time. I'll call you tomorrow, okay? Her eyes met his, and she wanted to tell him that she just needed time to sort out her feelings. Going to the soup kitchen today had made her feel close to Max, and she wasn't ready to give that up. She wanted to hold it to herself, to remember what it was like to be married to her best friend in the world. Okay, was all she said as she walked him to the front door, where he gave her a peck on the cheek. Good night. He started out the door, but then stopped. By the way, the Christmas decorations look great. Sorry you had to hire a service to put them up. I meant to get over here, but I ran out of time. Things are crazy right now at the job site with all of the construction deadlines. That's okay, she said, wondering what his reaction would be if she told him that it was Gabe who put them up. She locked the door behind him and watched him drive away. When he was gone... She leaned against the door and glanced around the empty house. Without warning, she slumped down and started to cry. Chapter 4 Chansey sat up in bed, her heart racing. She'd been in a sound sleep until the noise awoke her. Her eyes strained against the darkness and she listened. Her heart nearly stopped when she heard the sound again. 
someone was walking downstairs. She jumped out of bed and fumbled to get to her cell phone, but then realized that she'd left it charging on the kitchen table downstairs. Her first thought was for the children, but then she realized with a stab of relief that they weren't there. Thank heavens they were at Jill's. The moon was casting eerie shadows across the bedroom as she made her way quietly to the door, wondering if she could gather the courage to look into the hallway. Dizziness enveloped her, and she could feel her legs going numb. Not now. The last thing she needed was another panic attack. She forced herself to breathe in and out slowly. Surprisingly, it helped. A minute later, she felt more in control, but there was no time to celebrate the small victory. She stole over to the door and paused on the threshold, stopping to listen. But all she could hear was her own pulse hammering in her ear. Was it better to stay here and hide, or to try and get to the phone? She uttered a silent prayer for help and then decided that it would be better to get downstairs. She took another deep breath, trying to remain calm. She went to the edge of the door and peered out at the hallway. The coast was clear. She was thankful that she'd left the light on in the stairwell. As quietly as she could, she inched her way down the hallway, pausing to grab the heavy crystal vase resting on the table. She clutched it in her hand, ready to use it as a weapon if necessary. Another sound caused her to flinch. Please, help me, she prayed. It took every effort she could muster to slow her breathing and continue on. One by one, she walked down the steps, her breath catching in her throat. The foyer was clear. She peered into the living room. Clear. She made her way across the room toward the kitchen. Clutching the vase, she peered into the kitchen. It was also clear. She inched her way in, looking in all directions. There was her phone, just where she'd left it. She flipped on the lights and looked around, expecting to find some sort of evidence of an intruder. Seeing nothing out of place, she went for the phone, all the while wondering if she should call 911. Those sounds she'd heard. Had she only imagined them? She could call Janet and Ted. Even as the thought entered her head, she glanced at the clock. 3.25 a.m. A shiver ran down her spine, and she realized that she was covered in a layer of sweat. A sound at the back door sent her heart back into her throat. She let out a scream and backed into the island, her trembling hands attempting to dial 911. The man was beating on the door. Chancy, open the door, it's me. Tears were streaming down her face. She was about to press the call button. Chancy, it's Jake. Are you okay? Let me in. Jake? She ended the call, opened the door, and rushed into his open arms. I'm so glad you're here, she breathed. He held her in a tight embrace. It took her a moment to realize that the alarm was beeping. He pulled away from her. I'd better disable the alarm before it sends a signal to the alarm company and the police come running. He punched in the code and then turned back to her just in time to see her knees buckle. He caught her in his arms and helped her to a kitchen chair where she sat down. She was shaking all over and couldn't seem to get a good breath. Jake pulled out a chair and sat down beside her. He put an arm on her shoulder. What happened? Someone was in the house. In and out, she told herself. Remember to keep breathing. She put her hand over her chest. It felt tight. What, tonight? Yes, I heard footsteps. Did you check the house? Chancy hugged herself. No, I mean, I came down here to get my phone. I didn't see anyone, and then I saw you at the door. I thought... She let the words dribble off. Oh, man, when you saw me at the door, you must have been scared out of your mind. She bit her bottom lip and nodded. I'm so sorry. I had no idea. The compassion on Jake's face caused fresh tears to well in her eyes. 
I'm going to check the house now. She clutched his arm. But what if someone's still in here? Then they'll have to answer to me, he said, hardening his jaw. Should I call the police? No, let me handle this. He got up from the table, went to the island, and pulled a knife from the drawer. The sight of him holding the butcher knife made her feel dizzy again. She gripped the table for support, her eyes wide. He put a finger to his lips, motioning for her to remain quiet. If I'm not back in five minutes, call the police, he whispered. She clutched her T-shirt in her hands and nodded. It was the longest five minutes of her life, and she felt like she was holding her breath until she saw Jake walk back through the door. I didn't see anyone, he said, putting the knife back into the drawer. She let out a half-sigh, half-cry. Come here, he said, taking her into his arms. He led her to the couch, where they both sat down. He put his arms around her. I was so scared, she said. You're safe now, he began stroking her hair. If you hadn't shown up when you did, I don't know what I would have done. I'm so glad you... She stopped. Jake. Hmm, he murmured into her hair. What were you doing here at three-something in the morning? Was it her imagination, or did she feel him tense? I couldn't sleep, and I was worried about you. First the robbery, and then that man. You don't need to worry about Gabe. He's harmless. Oh, so now you're on a first-name basis? There was an edge to his voice. How do you know he's harmless? I guess I don't know for sure, she admitted, except for the fact that he saved Travis and hung the wreaths. What? Oops. She wasn't going to tell Jake about that. It just slipped out. Travis saw him in the neighborhood and thought he could use the work. Did you ever stop to ask yourself why this man was walking around the neighborhood to begin with? For all we know, he could have been casing the place out. Maybe it was him who was here tonight. She put a hand to her forehead. Do you really think it could have been him? Jake blew out a breath. I honestly don't know what to think. Oh my gosh. I've put my family in danger. She looked at him a wild expression on her face. He could be out there watching us. We've got to call the police. He started rubbing her back. Let's not jump to conclusions here. We're all on edge because of the recent robbery. I didn't see any signs of a forced entry. If someone had entered the house, the alarm would have gone off. Are you saying that I imagined the whole thing? He shook his head. I'm saying that we're both tired. You've been scared out of your mind tonight. I think you need to get some rest. You're not going to leave me here. She glanced at the dark window. Alone. I wouldn't dream of it. I'll stay here as long as you need me to. She leaned into him. Thank you. They turned on the TV, and before long, Chancy started to relax. Just before she drifted off to sleep, it occurred to her that something about tonight's events wasn't right. But before she could determine exactly what that was, exhaustion took over, and she was out. Chapter 5 The next morning, Chansey awoke to the tantalizing smell of bacon wafting through the air. Her stomach growled. She ran her foot over the cool sheets, wondering fleetingly who was cooking. With a start, she shot up in bed and rubbed her eyes as it all came rushing back. She glanced at the clock on the nightstand. 10.40 a.m. What? How had she slept so long? She threw back the covers and jumped out of bed. A shiver raced through her, and she looked down at what she was wearing, a long T-shirt. Despite the cool temperature in the room, Heat rushed over her when she realized that she'd been traipsing around in nothing more than a long t-shirt when Jake came to her rescue last night. She'd fallen asleep on the couch and didn't remember going to bed. 
How had she gotten here? Was she totally losing it? She went to the closet and threw on a robe, and then she caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror. Her hair was all over the place, and she had dark circles under her eyes. Ugh, she groaned. She was brushing her teeth when she heard the knock. In a flurry of motion, she rinsed out her mouth and then grabbed the hand towel. She went back to the bedroom and nearly ran headlong into Jake, who was holding a tray. Good morning, sleepyhead. In a self-conscious gesture, she rubbed down her hair. I'm sorry I overslept. Don't apologize. If anyone ever deserved to sleep in, it's you. Wow, you made me breakfast. He placed the tray on the bed and then started readjusting the covers that she'd thrown off. He fluffed her pillow and then patted a spot for her to sit down. You didn't have to do all of this, she began. The truth was, having Jake here in her bedroom felt like a huge intrusion, but he'd been so kind to her the night before. She sat down on the bed and let him place the tray over her lap. He'd made scrambled eggs, bacon, buttered toast, and sliced oranges. This looks delicious, she said, feeling more self-conscious than hungry. He sat down on the edge of the bed and rubbed his hands together. Go ahead and dig in, he said eagerly. I feel funny eating in front of you. Don't you want something too? She offered him a piece of toast. I can't possibly eat all of this. Nonsense. You must be starving after last night's events. I ate earlier, he motioned. Go ahead. She picked up the fork and began eating all the while wondering how it was that Jake looked so put together while she looked like a ragamuffin. He was wearing a red sweater and khakis with a crisp crease running down the front of each leg. His sandy hair had a razor-straight part down the side and was gelled so that not a hair was out of place. She tried to remember what he was wearing last night. It wasn't a sweater, was it? But when did he have time to change? And did he shower? Here? He seemed to be reading her mind. I ran home and showered while you were asleep. Wow, you've had a busy morning. You must have been up early to have time to go home, shower, and make all of this. Jake, I can't thank you enough for what you did last night. One of these days you're going to get tired of having to come to my rescue. Never. That's what I'm here for. I'll always be here for you. Always? Always was a long time. A wave of lightheadedness hit her. Before last night, she'd managed to keep things in check with Jake, but now he was here, in her bedroom, spending the night and making her breakfast. Things were moving way too fast. He touched her hair, letting a lock curl around his finger. Hey, are you okay? She gave him a weak smile. Yeah, I guess I'm still feeling the after effects. The doorbell rang, followed by a loud, persistent knocking. Chansey glanced at the clock. It's the kids. Jill's bringing them back today. You just relax, Jake said, rising from the bed. I'll let them in. No. She took the tray off of her lap and jumped out of bed. Jake looked surprised by her reaction. I'm sorry, she explained. I don't mean to be rude, but I want to be the one to greet them. He held up his hands. Okay, just trying to help. She touched his arm. I know, and you've been wonderful, but I need to go down and see them. She pulled the robe tighter around herself and rushed to let them in. Susie bounded in the door first. Hi, Mommy, she chimed, running into Chansey's arms. We had so much fun at Aunt Jill's. Taylor and I made gingerbread houses and sugar cookies. Chansey ruffled her hair and gave her a bear hug. I missed you so much. I hope you didn't have too much fun without me. In answer, Susie gave her a huge grin. Travis and Jill came walking in together. Hey, Trav. Chansey caught him by the arm before he could get past her. How was your evening? He shrugged. Okay. Okay. Jill punched him in the arm. Ow. He backed away from her, holding his arm, but he was smiling. Mom, you need to talk to Aunt Jill. 
She's been using me as a punching bag. Jill rolled her eyes. He and Wyatt stayed up half the night playing some new video game. Chansey raised an eyebrow. Now I know the rest of the story. Jill's husband, Wyatt, was like a big kid when it came to video games. Jill was always getting on him about spending too much time playing games rather than doing productive things. He loved having Travis over because it gave him an excuse to stay up late and play. Jill looked her up and down. Are you okay? Chansey nodded. I'll talk to you about it later, she whispered, not wanting to alarm the kids about the intruder. At that moment, Jake came walking down the stairs. Jill did a double take and then gave Chansey a pointed look. Is he... did he spend the night here? Travis's face went a shade darker, and he gave her a disgusted look. Now I know why you wanted the house to yourself, Mom. Travis Maxwell Hamilton, Chansey said. Don't you dare use that tone with me. You don't have a clue what's going on here, she finished, lifting her chin in the air. Good morning, everyone, Jake beamed. He came down and planted a kiss on Chansey's cheek and stood with his arm around her. What did I miss? By this time, Chansey's face was beet red, and Jake's cavalier manner wasn't helping matters. Travis grunted and then jogged up the stairs. I'll be in my room. A minute later, they heard the door slam. Chansey's instinct was to go after him to explain things, but she needed to deal with Jill and Jake first. A headache was pounding its way over the bridge of her nose. Let's go to the kitchen, she said, walking in that direction. Mommy, can I have a drink of water? Susie said, holding onto both of her hands and swinging them back and forth. Sure, she said, extricating herself from Susie's grasp. Chansey went to the cabinet and retrieved a glass and proceeded to fill it with water. She placed it on the table. Susie took a seat and started swinging her legs back and forth. Next, Chansey got some ibuprofen out of the cabinet and wolfed down two tablets with a glass of water. Jill looked at her closely. Are you okay? Jake put a protective arm around her. Chansey had to fight the urge to knock his arm away. The man was smothering her. As gently as she could, she eased away from Jake and took a seat at the table beside Susie, leaving Jill and Jake with no alternative other than to take their seats as well. Someone broke into the house last night. What? Jill exclaimed, her eyes going wide. She put a hand over Chansey's arm. Oh my gosh, what happened? Are you okay? Chansey nodded. Yeah, thanks to Jake. If he hadn't shown up when he did... Jill turned to Jake. What time did all of this happen? Around 3.30 a.m., Chansey said. I was sound asleep and I heard footsteps downstairs. Jill put a hand over her mouth and shook her head. I was going to call 911 but realized that I'd left my phone downstairs charging. The mother hen and Jill came out full force. What do I always tell you about that? You need to keep your phone with you at all times, especially at night. I know, and you're right, but I was so exhausted that I didn't even think about it. I went to the soup kitchen yesterday. Her eyes met Jill's, and Chansey couldn't stop the tears from flowing. Jill started tearing up, too. Oh, my. I didn't know. Oh, Chance. I'm so sorry. What a day you must have had. Chansey nodded. Anyway, Jake showed up in the nick of time, and I asked him to stay here on the couch. It was important to get that tidbit cleared up just in case Jill had any lingering doubts about where Jake had slept the night before. Wow, I'm so glad Jake was here. Jill's face scrunched, and she turned to him. What were you doing coming here at three-something in the morning? I was worried about Chansey, Jake shrugged. Call it a feeling or premonition, but with the robbery just a couple of streets away and that vagrant Travis brought home. A horrified expression came over Jill's face. What vagrant? Mommy, I'm hungry, Susie said. Can I have a cheese sandwich? And I don't want the crusts on it. And I want a glass of milk. 
Okay, baby, I'll get it for you in a minute. But I want it now, Susie wailed, clutching her stomach. I'm so, so, so hungry. Jake slapped the table with his hand, causing Chansey to flinch. Susie, stop making demands on your mother. She's in no condition to be getting you something to eat. Susie's eyes went wide, and her lower lip started to tremble. Chansey and Jill looked at each other in shock. It took about two seconds for Jill's eyes to spark and her nostrils to flare. Jake had waved the red flag and the bull was about to charge. She touched her sister's hand in reassurance, letting her know that she had everything under control. It's okay, baby, she said to Susie, who now had crocodile tears running down her face. She shot a warning look at Jake, letting him know that he'd overstepped his bounds. I don't mind making you something to eat. She arose from the table and went to the fridge to get out the cheese. Jake's face paled, but he didn't say anything. Instead, he glanced at his watch. I need to get to the office. He went to Chansey and gave her a stiff peck on the cheek. I'll be back tonight to check on you. That won't be necessary, Jill inserted before Chansey could answer. We're taking everyone to Temple Square tonight. Afterwards, we're going out for hot chocolate. I'll get Wyatt to come over and check all of the doors and windows. Chansey and the kids will be just fine. Jake gave Chansey a tight smile. It looks like you've got everything under control here. I'll call you later. Let me walk you to the door, Chansey said. He glared at Jill. No, that won't be necessary. I'll call you later. Okay, thanks again, she called after him. Temple Square? Since when were we going to Temple Square? Jill went to the counter and grabbed an apple. She polished it by rubbing it on her shirt. Why not? It'll be fun. She took a bite and began chewing. You know we always go to Temple Square together. I figured tonight was as good of a time as any. And a convenient way to keep Jake from coming back here tonight, right? Jill made a face. I didn't appreciate the way he was talking to Susie and he hovers over you like... like... A mother hen? Chansey finished for her. Hey, that's not fair. I'm your sister. That's my job. I know, and you do an excellent job of looking after me and the kids. Jake means well. He's just a tad overprotective. Ha! Overprotective? I can think of another name for it. Chansey's hands went to her hips. If I'm remembering correctly... Were you not the one that suggested that I start dating? Yeah, I just wanted you to get out and enjoy yourself. I didn't mean for you to pair up with the first frog in the pond. Chansey wagged a finger. Jake's a nice guy, and we're taking things slow. Jill motioned at the robe. Obviously. Hey, nothing happened. I told you I asked him to stay over because I didn't want to be here alone. Look, I know you feel beholden to Jake because he helped you when you needed it most. She twirled her hand, and yada, yada, yada. But we're talking about your life here, sis. Chansey just shook her head. Don't you think it's odd that Jake was coming over here at three in the morning? Yeah, it did seem a little odd at first, but he said he felt like he should. I appreciate someone that follows his gut. I guess, Jill said, but her expression remained unconvinced. If someone broke in, then why didn't the alarm go off? What? The alarm. Did it go off? Chansey thought for a minute. No, it didn't. When I let Jake in the back door, I had to disable the alarm to keep it from sending a signal to the police. Jake came to the back door? She nodded. Why? The thought hadn't occurred to her before. I don't know. I was in the kitchen, about to call 911 when I saw him at the back door. Does he ever use the back door? She cocked her head. I don't think so. That seems a bit odd, don't you think? Goosebumps broke across Chansey's arms, 
and she rubbed them down. I don't know, sis. I'm just so confused right now. She couldn't stop the tears from dribbling down her cheeks. Jill went to her side. Hey, you're gonna get through this. Chansey nodded and sniffed. I mean it, Jill insisted. And I am glad that you're dating. I just don't know if Jake's the right one for you. They can't all be Max, can they? The words tasted bitter coming out of her mouth, and she cringed at the pity she saw in Jill's eyes. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. The good thing is that I don't have to make a decision about Jake today. I don't have to decide today or tomorrow or the next day, Jill finished. You can take all the time you need. They both laughed. Jill glanced at the clock. Okay, I've got to get out of here. Danielle and Taylor have dental appointments this afternoon. We'll pick you guys up at five to go to Temple Square. We're really going? Well, of course we're going. Jill went to Susie and gave her a kiss on the cheek. Be good to your mom, toots. She's had a rough night. Okay, Susie said in a sing-song voice. It wasn't until after Jill left that Chansey remembered what it was that was bothering her the night before. She'd told Jill that she disabled the alarm after she let Jake in. But that's not what happened. Jake was the one that disabled the alarm. How did he know the code? She'd never given it to him. Had she? Chapter 6 Going to Temple Square was just the medicine that Chansey needed to restore a sense of sanity and well-being to her crazy life. Shortly after Jill left, Janet showed up and delivered the bombshell of the day. The Rothbergs, who lived only two doors down from Janet and Ted, got robbed the night before. They took all of Martha's jewelry, Jason's guns, their TVs, electronics, and who knows what else— Chansey couldn't believe what she was hearing. When did this happen? Last night. They'd been away visiting relatives in Park City, and when they came home, they discovered that they'd been robbed. Then, Chansey told Janet about hearing someone in the house, and Janet about went berserk, wanting to know why she'd not called the police. By the time Janet left, Chansey felt like she was on the verge of losing it. To make matters worse, she tried to tell Travis why Jake had spent the night, but her explanation fell on deaf ears. It doesn't matter what I say or think, Mom. You're going to date him anyway, so what difference does it make? The difference is that I love you, Travis, and I want us to discuss things like we used to. Yeah, like when Dad was here? Yes, like when Dad was here. But he's not here, is he? He's not here, and he's not coming back. No. He's not, she said quietly. Travis had turned his back to her and she could tell he was crying. She went to his bed and placed an arm on his shoulder. Just leave me alone, he said. Travis. Mom, just leave me alone, please. His ragged plea nearly split her heart in two. She backed away, stepped out of the room, and carefully shut the door before she herself started crying. There was so much hurt and emptiness dividing them that she didn't know how to bridge the gap. By the time four o'clock rolled around, she was emotionally drained. She thought about calling Jill and canceling, but knew it wouldn't do any good. Over the course of the past year, she'd canceled one too many times for Jill to pay her any mind. No matter what excuse she came up with, Jill would show up anyway and drag them to Temple Square. So she put on her happy face and went. As it turned out, it was the best thing they could have done. When they started out, Travis was stony-faced and withdrawn. But as the evening wore on, he loosened up. By the end, they were all laughing and joking together. There was something magical about Temple Square during Christmas. The lights and nativity scenes brought a sense of peace and purpose to the holidays. Being there made her feel closer to Max, somehow. 
When they returned to Chansey's house, Jill got Wyatt to check all of the doors and windows before they left to go home. If you need anything, anything at all, call me, Jill instructed. And for heaven's sakes, Chance, keep the phone by your bed. All evening, she kept expecting to get a call from Jake, but didn't hear from him, and that made her feel strangely relieved. Maybe he could sense her need for space. As long as he continued to honor that need, then they might have a fighting chance. Only time would tell. It was a long night for Chansey, as every little noise sent her jumping, but she got through it. When she awoke the next morning, she was relieved that the night had finally passed without incident. Jill had offered to let them spend the night at her house, but Chansey feared that if she didn't face her fears head-on, she might never go back to the house. Luckily, she'd faced it and survived. One night down and a lifetime to go. Snow had fallen the night before, blanketing the ground and trees in a comforting stillness. It was a beautiful sight, especially now that the morning sun was shining in a clear blue sky. Buzzing around the kitchen, Chansey found herself doing something she'd not done all season long, humming Christmas carols. Yes, going to Temple Square had been a great experience. The crowning event was walking into the visitor center and sitting in front of the large Christus statue that was set against a majestic backdrop of the planets and stars. The arresting statue, depicting the resurrected Christ with his arms outstretched, was a powerful reminder that help was only a prayer away. Even in the midst of the trauma from the other night, she'd been given help. In that crucial moment when she felt a panic attack coming on, she'd been able to hold herself together. The fact that she could muster enough courage to go downstairs to get to the phone was a miracle. It gave her a sense of strength that she hadn't felt in a very long time. And this morning, she decided to celebrate the good in her life by making the kids strawberry pancakes. As usual, Susie was the first to make it down the stairs, padding across the carpet in her pink princess pajamas and clutching her favorite blanket. She started jumping up and down when she realized that Chansey was making pancakes. Yippee! she exclaimed, turning circles. Let's put on a show for you while I go and wake up Travis, Chansey said, giving her a hug. Okay, Susie said. SpongeBob SquarePants! SpongeBob it is. While many parents were opposed to SpongeBob's whiny manner, Chansey found the show entertaining and witty. The episode where SpongeBob and Patrick were trying to sell chocolate bars was her favorite. She got Susie settled and then went to rouse Travis. Like most teenagers, he would sleep till noon if she let him. Thanks for the pancakes, Mom, Travis said when they'd finished breakfast. You're welcome. Chansey basked in the genuine smile that he gave her. Last night was fun, huh? I love the lights and the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph, Susie said excitedly. Yeah, it was fun, Travis said in that offhanded way that only a teenager can perfect. It was fun being together, Chansey said. Yep, just the three of us, Travis gave her a pointed look. Without Jake... Not sure how to counteract that comment, Chansey remained quiet. Susie scrunched up her nose. But I saw Jake last night. Honey, Jake didn't go with us last night, Chansey began. But I saw him. Chansey looked at Travis for help, but he merely shrugged. I did see him, Susie insisted. Where did you see him? Chansey said. By the pretty water at the temple. What? Chansey knelt beside Susie so that she could look her in the eye. Are you talking about the reflection pool? Susie nodded vigorously. Yeah, the pretty water. She motioned with her hands. That runs down the sides. No, honey, there must be some mistake. Jake wasn't there last night. Yes, he was, Susie said. I saw him by the water and then by the tree with the red lights. 
Chansey ran a hand across her forehead. Hot prickles raced through her. She looked into Susie's eyes. You're not just pretending that you saw him? No! Do you know how we pretend to be princesses sometimes? Yes, Mommy. Were you just pretending to see Jake last night? Susie just sat there. Chancy grasped her by the arm. Susie, tell me. Susie's lower lip started to tremble. I'm sorry, Mommy. I didn't mean to be bad. Oh, honey, you're not being bad. I'm just surprised at what you're telling me. Come here. Chancy took her in her arms and stroked her hair. I'm sorry I raised my voice. I love you. I love you too, Mommy, Susie said, throwing her arms around Chancy's neck. A minute later, she broke away and got out her coloring book and crayons. Chancy watched her choose a page and then take a red crayon out of the box. Susie? She kept her voice as soft as she could. Are you sure you saw Jake last night? She nodded. Where? She asked, trying to see if she would give the same answer twice. By the pretty water and the red tree. By this time, Chansey's heart was racing. She stood, trying to remain calm. Had Jake followed them to Temple Square? If so, why didn't he let them know he was there? Her eyes met Travis's, and she knew that he could tell that she was upset. Mom, do you think Susie was telling the truth? Chancy motioned for Travis to step out of Susie's hearing range. Susie's probably just confused. There were so many people there last night that she could have seen someone that looked like Jake. She could tell from the worried expression on Travis's face that he wasn't buying it. But what if it was him? Is he following us? There was a horrified look on his face. She put her hand on her forehead. I don't think Jake would do something like that. Travis scoffed. Open your eyes, Mom. Susie looked up from her coloring. Keep your voice down. You're scaring Susie. If he's following us around, then we'd all better be scared, Travis hissed. Let's not overreact here. Susie's six. Sometimes she doesn't know the difference between reality and make-believe. The next time I see Jake, I'll ask him. Travis threw his hands in the air. Yeah, like that'll help. He'll just lie about it, Mom. Tears filled his eyes. Why can't you see what's going on here? Chansey's eyes also filled with tears, and she put a hand on his shoulder. Jake has been so good to us. He wouldn't meet her eyes. I promise you that I'll take things slow, okay? I won't get us in a bad situation. She moved into his line of vision so that he would be forced to look at her. Okay? He blew out a breath. Okay. He started walking away, but she grabbed his shirt. Hey, don't leave. We've got to talk about our day. He rolled his eyes but at least he stopped and turned around to face her. She swiped at her tears with the back of her hand. Okay. I've been doing some thinking, and I've decided that it's high time we cleaned out the garage apartment and made it into a game room. Travis gave her a suspicious look. Really? I thought you wanted to wait until after Christmas to tackle that. Yes, I did, initially, but I think it's better to start on it now when we're all home together for the holidays. Are we going to get a foosball table? Yep. He rubbed his hands together. Air hockey and ping pong table? His voice was hopeful. Yep. How about one of those arcade machines that plays all of the old games like Pac-Man, Centipede, Frogger? Chansey held up a hand. Hold on, Tiger. Let's start with the other stuff first and see where we end up. Okay, fair enough. When are we going to get started? How about today? We have the whole day, and I thought tonight we'd order pizza and watch It's a Wonderful Life. I love pizza, Susie said, looking up from the page she was coloring. She searched Travis's face. Does that sound like a plan? Is Jake coming over tonight? He asked carefully. No, it'll be just us. 
The relief she saw on his face nearly froze her heart. What was she going to do about Jake? At least Travis was smiling. It was a tentative smile, but a smile nevertheless. Yeah, I think it's great. Chancy glanced at the clock. Okay, go get your room cleaned up, take out the garbage, and we'll start in the apartment in about an hour. Really? I have to clean my room? Travis said, looking crestfallen. Yep, yeah, but if you get to it fast, it won't take very long. You too, Suze. But I'm coloring. She thrust out her lower lip. Sorry, you'll have to finish it later. You can take it out to the apartment and finish it while Travis and I work. Okay, Mommy. I'll clean up the kitchen while you two work on your rooms. She watched them go up the stairs, conflicting emotions churning within. She was already perplexed about the fact that Jake had somehow known the code to disarm the alarm system, and now this. Susie probably saw someone that looked like Jake, but now that the seed of doubt was planted, there was no dislodging it. That Travis didn't like Jake was no secret, but she'd always attributed it to him not wanting anyone to replace Max. Jake was dependable and attentive, two qualities that were high up on her priority list and he'd been there when she needed someone the most. She shuddered, thinking about that black period of time that nearly destroyed her. Jake had been her saving grace, but he was also possessive. Too possessive? Maybe, she admitted. He had, after all, called her seven times in the few hours she was at the soup kitchen. But he wasn't calling her that often all of the time. That was an isolated event. When she was at her lowest point, she was grateful that Jake was so solicitous. But now that she was starting to stand on her own two feet, he was making her feel smothered. A thought struck her. Maybe she was the one that was changing. Were her doubts about Jake a sign that she was afraid of making a commitment to him? Her marriage to Max had been one of those storybook romances that most people only read about. She knew she'd never love someone else the way she loved him, but Jake was a good man and she cared for him. How much of that affection centered on the obligation she felt because he'd helped her through those months? And was that a bad thing? Love was complex and multifaceted. She blew out a breath and ran a hand through her hair. Trying to make sense out of her feelings was about as futile as trying to pin jello on the wall. She was grateful that she didn't have to make a decision about Jake right away. Their relationship would take its course, and then she would know. She turned her thoughts to the garage apartment. She'd been toying with the idea of fixing it up for a while now, but kept putting off mentioning it to Travis because she knew the minute she did, Travis would pester her until the remodel was complete. Also, Jake had hinted several times that he could move into the apartment— so that he could be around more to help with the kids. He mentioned it again the other night after the break-in. So far, she'd been able to evade the subject without having a direct confrontation with him, but it was only a matter of time before he forced the issue, and she didn't want to deal with that right now. Heaven help her when Jake found out that there'd been another robbery in the neighborhood. Before Max passed... They'd talked about converting the apartment into a game room so that Travis would have a place to bring friends. When Max died, the plans were all but forgotten. Last night, seeing a hint of the old Travis returning made Chansey realize that they needed a project, something they could work on together. And it wasn't as if the two of them had anything better to do. Thanks to her cleaning frenzy, the house was already spotless and Travis spent the majority of his time either hanging out with friends or moping around the house. She would most likely have to call in a contractor after the first of the year to lay down the hardwood flooring that was piled in the middle of the apartment. Max had been letting it season to the room before installing it. There were a few plumbing issues with the bathtub drain and the toilet that wouldn't flush half the time, but Chancy figured they could at least get all of the junk cleared out and maybe the walls painted. It would be a lot of work, but at the moment, it felt good to have a sense of purpose. Her phone buzzed. She looked at it before reluctantly answering. Jake, hi. Yes, we're all doing well. 
They chit-chatted for a few minutes, her dreading all the while the question Jake was working up to. Hey, I was thinking that tonight I could come over and make dinner. Oh, I'm sorry, we would love that, but I promised the kids that we'd have pizza. Okay, I'll stop and pick some up on the way. Her palms were going sweaty. I kind of promised the kids that it would just be us tonight. Silence. I'm sorry, Jake. It's not that I don't want you to come over, but things are a little strained with Travis, and I just thought it would be better if we took things slow for a while. The words gushed out, and she had to pause to get a breath. More silence. Jake? The line was dead. He'd hung up on her. Chapter 7 I can't believe we have this much junk. Chancy stood and looked around at the stacked boxes, filled to the brim with magazines, books, clothes, and who knew what else. They'd been working for two solid hours, and it didn't look like they'd even made a dent. They'd been going through the boxes, sorting out what to keep and what to throw out. She wiped her forehead and blew out a breath. Whose idea was this anyway? Travis chuckled. Throwing in the towel already? He gave her that sideways smile that looked so much like Max. She pushed up her sleeves. Not a chance. Let's get back to work. She pointed. Those bags of garbage are ready to go out to the truck. Maybe if we can get some of the garbage out of here, we can see what we have left to sort through. All of those boxes over there are throwaway, but they're too heavy for us to carry. We'll have to get some men to help us. Their plan was to load the garbage into the back of Max's old pickup truck and then take it to the city dump on Monday. Maybe I can get Jake. The look on Travis's face stopped her. We'll figure something out. Travis flexed his bicep. What, you don't think I can lift them? Chansey arched an eyebrow. Do you really want me to answer that? Travis thrust out his lower lip in a mock pout. I get no respect. Yeah, yeah, Chansey said, and they both laughed. Travis grabbed two bags. See? Strong man. He headed out the door. A few minutes later, he returned. Uh, Mom? Hmm. There's something you gotta see. Is everything okay? Yeah, I just think you need to see this for yourself. She glanced at Susie, who was playing a game on the iPad. Susie, I'm going to run outside with Travis for a minute. I'll be right back. Susie nodded. What's going on? She asked Travis as they walked outside. He gave her a mysterious smile. You'll see. She heard the scraping sound before they rounded the side of the house. Is someone here? Travis motioned. Come on. They came around the front of the house and she stopped. There was a man, bent over, shoveling snow. From the look of the driveway, he'd already scraped it clean and was nearly finished with the sidewalks. He was so intent on his work that he didn't see them at first. But after a moment, he straightened and waved. Chancy wasn't prepared for the jolt that bubbled in her stomach when she realized it was Gabe, the homeless man. Before she could stop him, Travis ran up to greet him. Hey, Gabe! What are you doing here? Gabe looked at Chansey. I was in the neighborhood, and I noticed that your driveway and sidewalks needed shoveling. He smiled. And I just happened to have a shovel. Thanks for your help, Chansey said, taking in Gabe's appearance. He was wearing the same weathered coat that she remembered, but his jeans and boots looked like they were in good shape. His knit hat and black leather gloves also looked to be in good condition. If she didn't know better, she'd think he was just a normal man working outside. You really didn't have to go to all of this trouble, she began. I don't mind. He looked up. The sun's shining, and I have the time. His eyes met hers, and she was struck by how blue they were. What would Jake think if he drove by and saw her talking to Gabe? She didn't know anything about this man, other than the fact that he was big and muscular like Max with startling blue eyes, and a dimple on the right side that only showed when he smiled. There was a fine layer of stubble on his angular jaw, but otherwise he was clean-shaven. 
Hadn't he looked scruffier before? Mom and I are cleaning out the apartment behind our house, Travis said. She shot Travis a warning look. Why did her son feel the need to spill his guts to this man? Let me get some money, she said. Money? Gabe gave her an amused look. For cleaning the driveway and sidewalks, I'd like to pay you something. He just kept looking at her with those piercing blue eyes. I mean, you didn't have to come all the way over here, considering your, your, I mean, considering that you don't have a home of your own. You walked all this way in the cold. Any good person would give you, her cheeks began to burn. Any good person would give me what? Gabe prompted. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I say all the wrong things. I don't know what I'm saying half the time. Travis was looking at her funny. Mom, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. I'll go get some money, she said, turning to go toward the house. We need some help carrying out boxes from our apartment, Travis blurted. Chancy spun around so suddenly she nearly lost her footing. What? You just said you were going to have to hire someone to help us. Travis smiled broadly and pointed to Gabe. I'm sure Gabe doesn't mind. He just said he has plenty of time. I'm sure Gabe doesn't want to help us. Sure I do, Gabe said smoothly. Was that a twinkle she saw in his eye? He seemed to be enjoying her discomfort. She glanced at Travis's eager expression. He was practically holding his breath, waiting for her to give her consent. What was it about Travis and this man? If only he'd show Jake a hundredth as much interest. She could feel the balance swaying in Gabe's direction. There was nothing she could say that could make Travis change his mind. If she sent Gabe away, then Travis would be upset the rest of the day. The last thing she wanted was to create more tension between Travis and her. She looked up at Gabe, trying to decide if she could trust him. His expression was enigmatic, but his eyes were kind, and there was not a trace of impatience in them. It would be nice to have some help moving those boxes, she conceded, if you're sure you don't mind. Not at all. Let me just finish up this sidewalk. Travis can finish it later. I'd prefer if we got those boxes out of the way right now. Okay, show me the way. Chansey had been worried that it would be awkward having Gabe in the apartment, but as it turned out, it was quite the opposite. He and Travis took the heavy boxes out to the pickup truck, talking to each other the entire time. Who knew that Travis could be so conversational? Even Susie liked Gabe. She'd been close on his heels the minute he entered the apartment. It was a wonder that he could work with Susie latching on to him, but Gabe didn't seem to mind. Thanks to Gabe, what she thought would take an entire day was finished in less than an hour. The boxes are all loaded, Travis announced, dusting off his jeans. What's next? Chancy looked around. Well, I suppose we need to take an assessment of everything that needs to be done. Gabe walked over and crouched down beside the wood. Rough-hewn hickory. This will look great in here. I see you've been letting it season. Yes, Max was letting it sit for a while. Her voice trailed off. She'd not meant to talk about Max. Jake hated it when she mentioned him, so she tried not to in his presence. She felt so comfortable around Gabe that she forgot. Max was my father, Travis said. He's dead, Susie interjected. They all looked at Gabe to get his reaction. He nodded in understanding. The look of compassion that he gave Chansey brought tears to her eyes. She looked away, blinking rapidly. Mommy cries a lot, Susie said. Susie, hush! Chansey exclaimed. She looked at Gabe, her face flaming. I'm so sorry. Gabe shrugged. There's no harm in crying. He looked at Chansey, and she felt for a minute that he was seeing into her soul. It's how we deal with the hurt. She gave him a weak smile. I suppose you're right. Later, she would analyze the conversation and realize that he'd used the word we. It's how we deal with the hurt. 
But at the moment, all she could think about was how mortified she was that her innermost feelings were being put on display for a virtual stranger. Before things could get uncomfortable, Gabe pointed up. You have a leak in the ceiling. Yeah, it's been there for a while, but it looks like it's getting worse. What else are you doing to the place? The tub won't drain and the toilet won't flush. Let's have a look. Do you know how to repair houses? Yeah, I used to remodel houses before... He stopped, his jaw working, making Chansey want to know all the more what had driven him to this point. He was obviously very intelligent, charming, and incredibly handsome, she begrudgingly admitted. How hard could it be for a man like that to make his way in the world? Something terrible must have happened, or maybe he was mentally ill. Some psycho that looked perfectly normal on the outside until he snapped. And she'd let him in the house, again. Yes, I know how to fix things, he finally said. Her heart began to race, and she willed herself to get a grip. Of course he wasn't psycho. His eyes were kind. A person with kind eyes couldn't do terrible things. Saying those words to herself made her feel a little better. Mom, are you okay? She realized then that all eyes were on her. Unfortunately, she'd never learned to mask her expressions. Yes, I'm fine, honey. Just getting a little tired, I suppose. She motioned at Gabe. Come on, I'll show you the rest. They were all crowded in the bathroom, looking at the bathtub drain, when Chansey heard Janet. You who? Anybody in here? It's my neighbor, Chansey explained. We're in the back she called. A second later, Janet appeared in the doorway. The look on her face spoke volumes when she saw Gabe leaning over the tub, fiddling with the drain. Chansey suppressed a smile as she watched Janet's eyes take in the expanse of Gabe's chest and how his muscles rippled underneath his shirt when he moved. Her mouth formed a big O, and she looked at Chansey, wide-eyed, waiting for an explanation. Gabe, this is Janet. My neighbor and friend. Gabe nodded to Janet, and she giggled in response. The woman actually giggled. Janet, Gabe's helping us fix up the apartment. When Janet gave her a questioning look, Chansey's face flushed, and then her mouth started moving at warp speed. Gabe was outside this morning shoveling the snow. He's the one that rescued Travis the other night. He's been helping us move boxes, and now he's helping with the apartment. Gabe's a... Gabe's my... She cleared her throat. I mean, Gabe's a... Friend. Gabe inserted. I'm a friend of the family. Janet laughed and turned to Chansey. Why didn't you just say so? Could things get any more embarrassing? She was acting like a silly schoolgirl that got caught kissing in the coat closet. She tossed her hair. What's up? Oh, I was wondering if you and the kids want to come over for dinner tonight. I'm making lasagna, and Ted will only eat a small serving because he says the tomato sauce gives him the burp-ups. Travis started sniggering. The burp-ups? That's funny. Travis, Chansey said. Don't be rude. Then she started laughing, too. Even Gabe had an amused look on his face. Why is everybody laughing? Susie said. Because Janet's being funny. Susie leaned up against Chansey, who put her arms around Susie's neck. We would love to, but I promised the kids we'd order pizza and watch a movie together. Janet made a face. Oh, well, I guess I'll have to wrap up the leftovers and bring them to you tomorrow, then. I don't want all of that lasagna hanging around the house because I'll eat it all myself. We'll always take leftovers, won't we, Travis? You betcha, he said. Okay, I guess I'll leave now. It was nice meeting you, Gabe. I guess we'll see you around? He smiled. Maybe. He turned his attention back to the drain. Janet looked at Chansey and mouthed, Where's Jake? Even though she was attempting to whisper, she said it loud enough for the street over to hear. Chansey glanced at Gabe and thought she saw his shoulders tense, but couldn't tell for sure. Travis, on the other hand, made his feelings on the subject crystal clear. His face turned dark, and he muttered under his breath. 
Travis, you help Gabe with the drain while Susie and I walk Janet to the door. When they got outside the apartment, Janet turned to Chansey. I turn my back for one minute, and the next thing I know you have that man, that gorgeous hunk of a man working on your bathtub. She shot Chansey a look of admiration. And to think I've been worried about you being lonely. All this time I was so afraid you'd end up with that stick-in-the-mud Jake. And you've got, she motioned toward the door, him in there. Shh, he'll hear you. Gabe's not my boyfriend. He's just... A friend, Janet said, repeating Gabe's response from earlier. Her eyes were dancing. You can give me a friend like that any day of the week. It's not like that with Gabe. He's... What? He's the homeless man I told you about. Janet rocked back and started shaking her head back and forth. No, that man I saw in that bathtub is not homeless. He's too gorgeous to be homeless. And he's nice. I know he's nice and gorgeous, but I can assure you that he's homeless. He's the guy that rescued Travis the other night, the one I thought I saw at the soup kitchen. No, if he'd been there, I would have remembered. He had his back to us. Well, what's a homeless man doing working on your bathtub? He showed up here today and started shoveling snow. One thing led to another and now he's working on the apartment. Janet crossed her arms over her chest. I don't think you ought to be letting a homeless man work on your house, even if he is nice, she rolled her eyes, and gorgeous. Travis has really taken to him. He seems harmless enough. Yeah, until he murders you in your sleep. Janet! She put a hand over her mouth. Sorry, that was uncalled for. It's just that with all of these robberies happening right and left... Has there been another one? No, not since the Rothburns, but it's got the whole neighborhood on edge. The last thing we need is some strange homeless man running around shoveling snow. She paused. Of course... Ted would love it if he came to our house and shoveled snow. Did you see Ted out there trying to fire up that new snowblower? That thing took off, backfiring and all, and you'd have thought that Ted was on the wrong end of a bucking mule. Chancy couldn't help but laugh. Janet grew serious. What do you know about Gabe? Not much, she admitted. Only that he helped Travis, and he seems to be around here a lot. Hmm, that's weird that he just happens to be around here. You don't think he has anything to do with the robberies, do you? No, I don't think so. She didn't dare mention that Jake had said the same thing. I just don't think Gabe would do something like that. He has kind eyes. Janet gave her a shrewd look. You like him. What? That's ridiculous. I don't even know him. But you do. I can see it on your face. Does Jake know? Chansey's eyes went wide. There's nothing to know. This whole conversation is ridiculous. Oh, so he doesn't know. No, Chansey admitted. He would freak out if he knew that Gabe was over here working on the apartment. Janet started laughing. And to think I was worried about you sitting at home all by yourself. She shook her head. I'm the one you should feel sorry for. Ted's over there, in his underwear, watching a game and eating Cheetos by the buckets. And he certainly doesn't look like Mr. Handsome in there, I can promise you that. She looked Chansey in the eye. Just promise me you'll take things slow. Figure out who this guy is before you fall too hard. Of course I will. Geez, this is ridiculous. Nothing is going on between me and Gabe. This was sounding strangely like a repeat of the conversation she'd just had with Travis about Jake. Sure it's not, honey. Janet patted her on the hand. You keep telling yourself that. I've got to get home before Ted eats the house. She turned to go and then stopped. Oh, I almost forgot. Can I get Harriet's number from you? Harriet at the soup kitchen? Yep, I think I'd like to volunteer again. She scrunched her nose. Really? I thought you hated that place. Yeah, I did too. But being there, 
helping those people, I guess it gets in your blood. A smile played on Chansey's lips. That's what Max used to say. Max was a smart man. Yes, he was. He certainly was. Janet put a hand on her arm. The right guy's out there. You'll find him. She looked toward the apartment. Who knows? Maybe he's already here. Chansey scoffed. Yeah, right. Janet threw up her hands. Stranger things have happened. Chapter 8 Travis, I don't want you going on the roof, and that's final. Mom, I'm not a baby. I used to go on the roof with Dad all the time. What's the big deal? I'm just going to go up there with Gabe to check out the leak. Chansey rubbed her hand across her forehead. Gabe's eyes met hers for one brief second before he turned away and began pulling out the ladder. It was obvious that he didn't want to get in the middle of an argument between mother and son, and she couldn't blame him. Why did everything have to be so difficult where Travis was concerned? Shortly after she returned from talking to Janet, Gabe told her that he needed some plumbing parts before he could fix the drain in the bathtub and the toilet, so he decided to see how extensive the damage was on the roof. First he'd crawled into the attic space to check it out, and now he was going up on the roof. That was all well and good, but she didn't want Travis up there with him. I know you're not a baby, Travis. I'm just afraid you'll slip. We've had so much ice lately. By this time, Gabe was walking around the back of the house toward the apartment, carrying the ladder with Chansey and Travis following behind. They'd left Susie in the apartment coloring. When they reached the apartment, Gabe propped the ladder against the outer wall and began pushing it into the ground to stabilize it. Mom, Travis begged, let me go up there. I'll be careful, I promise. She blew out a breath. What do you think, Gabe? Is it okay for Travis to go up there with you? Gabe looked surprised that she'd asked his opinion. He looked at Travis. If your mother doesn't feel comfortable, then maybe you shouldn't do it. I need someone to hold the ladder. Can you do that for me? Travis's shoulders fell. He nodded and looked away but not before Chansey caught sight of the tears welling in his eyes. She could tell from his rigid stance that he was trying his best to hold them back. He looked humiliated. Gabe's eyes met Chansey's, and she knew that he thought she ought to let Travis do it. I'll take care of him, Gabe said. She looked at Travis and then up at the roof. Okay, you can go up, but you'd better be super careful. No funny stuff. Travis wiped at his eyes. Okay. Chansey held the ladder while the two of them climbed up, one by one. Gabe seemed perfectly at ease, but she could tell that Travis was nervous. She uttered a silent prayer. Please let him be okay. Please. Ever since Max had passed, she'd been scared to death that something bad was going to happen to one of the children. The decking's bad where the pitches come together. In the valley. Gabe called down. It'll have to be replaced. Can you fix it? Chansey yelled up. Should be able to. The next events happened so quickly that she wasn't sure if she saw him slip first or heard him scream. Travis! Later, she would learn that Travis had lost his footing and fallen backwards. Gabe caught him by the jacket and jerked him forward where he landed face down clutching the shingles. The momentum of Travis falling forward caused Gabe to lose his balance, and he went tumbling the other direction. Luckily, he was able to catch himself from going over the other side of the roof. Travis, are you okay? She yelled up. I'm fine, Mom, but Gabe... Gabe, are you okay? Silence. Gabe! I'm okay, he yelled. Thank heavens, Chansey muttered into the ladder. She saw movement. Stay where you are, Travis. Don't move. I'll come up and help you down. She started up the ladder but stopped when she saw Gabe climbing to Travis's rescue. Together, they made their way off the roof. It wasn't until she saw Travis's feet hit the ground that she went weak in the knees. She grasped the ladder for support, feeling shaky all over. Travis put his arms around her. 
Mom, are you okay? She gave him a weak smile. I'm fine now that you're okay. Yeah, thanks to Gabe. He saved me. Thank you so much. I don't know what I would have done if Travis had fallen. Tears filled her eyes. I'm just glad he's okay, Gabe said, giving her a slight smile. Me too. She took a deep breath in order to calm her nerves, and then she got a good look at Gabe. The palms of his hands were scraped up, but that's not what made her gasp. Oh no! Your leg is hurt! He glanced down. It's just a scratch. A scratch? His jeans were ripped, and she could see an ugly gash at least six inches long running down his thigh. That's not a scratch, it's an open wound. We've got to get you to the doctor. She moved closer to him to inspect the damage. No. His outburst stopped her cold. No, he said a little kinder. I'll be okay. I need to get going anyway. I've already overstayed my welcome. What? All you've done this entire day is help my family. I didn't once offer you anything to drink or eat, and you must be hungry. I haven't even paid you for the work you did. And now your clothes are ruined. I'll be fine he insisted. It was my fault that Travis was on the roof. If we'd listened to you from the get-go, then none of this would have happened. I'm fine. You're the one that needs help, Travis said. Gabe put a hand on Travis's shoulder. It's okay, son. I promise you I'll be fine. I need to get going anyway. He started walking away from them. In that moment, something inside of Chansey shifted as she stood there watching him limp away trying to hold his ripped jeans together with one hand. He'd helped them all day long without a single thought for himself, and once again, he'd come to Travis's aid, this time getting injured in the process. You stop right there, she ordered in a commanding voice that surprised even her. He turned and gave her a quizzical look. You aren't going anywhere until you get a hot shower, clean clothes, and something to eat. She jutted out her chin and looked him in the eye, daring him to disagree. For some strange reason, he started to laugh. This irked her. Why are you laughing? Rather than answering, he looked at Travis. Is she always this bossy? Travis chuckled. This is nothing. Ay, ay, ay. Women. Can't live with them and can't live without them. Travis hooted. What? She glared at them, not liking that she was the butt of their joke. Gabe looked at her, his blue eyes radiating innocence. Chancy, if you wanted me to stay for dinner, all you had to do was ask. There was a ghost of a smile playing on his face, and with his hair tussled and the smudge of dirt running along his jaw, he was so devastatingly handsome that she didn't know which she wanted to do more, slap him or kiss him. Her eyes lingered a moment on his lips. The expression on his face seemed to suggest that he knew what she was thinking. She suddenly felt hot all over. Where had that thought come from? She was losing it. Okay, Travis, go and get Susie from the apartment and I'll take Gabe inside and we'll take a look at his leg. Travis took off, leaving them alone. Chansey was suddenly at a loss for words, so Gabe spoke instead. After you. She started walking and then realized she was going too fast for him. He was hobbling pretty badly, and it made her worried that his injury was worse than she first thought. She led him to the kitchen table, pulled out a chair, and motioned for him to sit. She went to the cabinet and retrieved peroxide, bandages, and neosporin. Let's see how bad this thing is. She knelt beside him and started examining the gash. The sight of blood always made her squeamish. It had been Max who'd bandaged up the cuts on the kids. The cut looked bad to her, bloody and deep. She swallowed hard and offered Gabe a slight smile when she saw that he was staring at her. Hey, are you okay? She chuckled. You're the one with a bleeding wound, and you're worried about me? That's taking chivalry a little too far, don't you think? He glanced down at his leg. I've had worse. She raised an eyebrow, waiting for him to elaborate, but he simply shrugged. 
Susie and Travis entered the room. Ooh, Susie squealed. That's gross. What happened, Gabe? The roof and I had a little argument, and I'm afraid the roof won. Susie wrinkled her nose. What? Travis, could you put in a movie for Susie and go and get me a towel from the bathroom? Chancy said. Sure thing. When Travis gets back with the towel, I'm going to pour peroxide on it so we can see how deep it is. We may have to get you to the doctor. He grabbed her arm and she was startled by the strength of his grip. No doctor, he said firmly. Why was he so vehemently against seeing a doctor? Was it the cost? Surely he must realize that she would cover all of the expenses. Another thought raced through her mind, raising goosebumps over her flesh. Was he running from something? Someone? Or something he'd done? No doctor, he repeated, locking eyes with her as if willing her to agree. Okay, but if I can't take care of it, I'm calling my sister Jill. She's an RN and will be able to help us. He seemed to relax, and she took his reaction as acquiescence. When Travis returned with the towel, she poured the peroxide over the gash as gently as she could, trying not to make a big deal when Gabe flinched. The gash was deep, and she suspected that he would need stitches and maybe some antibiotics. Travis looked on as she worked, trying to blot the wound and bandage it the best she could. He was tapping his foot and cracking his knuckles the way he did whenever he was worried. It'll be okay, she reassured Travis. Then she saw how pale Gabe's face had become. His lips were tight, and she could tell from the way he was clenching his jaw that he was in pain. She stood, went to the cabinet, and retrieved a bottle of ibuprofen. Take two of these, she said, handing him the tablets and a glass of water. He flashed an unassuming smile. Thanks. These ought to do the trick. Let's get you to the couch and we'll prop up your leg on the ottoman. Travis and I can help. Gabe chuckled. I'm hurt. Not an invalid. I can walk. He moved to stand and groaned slightly when he put weight on his injured leg. You get under one arm and I'll get under the other, Chansey instructed. Easy does it. The three of them hobbled to the den where they helped him get settled on the couch. Susie immediately ran up to him and started talking a hundred miles an hour, showing him her favorite toys of the hour. Gabe was a good sport about it, but Chansey could tell that he was having a hard time. Can you play Barbies with me? Susie said. Chansey tussled Susie's hair. Let's give Gabe some space, okay? His legs hurt right now, but he'll get better soon. Wide-eyed. Susie nodded. Okay, she looked at Gabe. You want to watch SpongeBob SquarePants with me? Gabe smiled. Sure. I'm going to order the pizza, and then we'll put in It's a Wonderful Life, okay? Okay, Mommy, Susie said. Listen, I don't want to intrude on your family time, Gabe said, making a motion to rise. Chancy patted him on the arm. You rest. Once the ibuprofen gets in your system, you'll feel better. Try to relax. Maybe I will, but just for a few minutes. He leaned his head back and closed his eyes. She went into the kitchen with Travis following close on her heels. He's hurt pretty bad, Mom, he whispered. I know. What are we going to do? We're going to order pizza, like I said, and watch our movie, but first I'm going to make a call. She picked up the phone. Please let her answer, she prayed. Hello? Jill, thank goodness you answered. I need your help. Chapter 9 It amazed Chansey at how efficiently Jill cleaned the wound and stitched up Gabe's leg. She admired her sister's fortitude and how nothing seemed to faze her. Chancy had been expecting Jill to give her the third degree the minute she saw Gabe on the couch with his leg propped up, trying to stay the blood that was still soaking the bandages a full hour after the accident. To her credit, Jill came in and took charge, going into her nurse mode. The only question she asked was how his leg got cut. If it was metal, then he'll need a tetanus shot, 
she explained. Gabe insisted that he'd slashed it on the wood fascia board that had come loose, and Chansey could only pray that he was telling the truth. A tetanus shot could only be given at the doctor's office, hospital, or health department, and she knew that Gabe wasn't about to go to any of those places. After Jill dressed the wound, she motioned for Chansey to follow her into the kitchen. Then, fearing that their conversation would be overheard, she led Chansey down the hall to the foyer. Okay, spill it. Spill what? Jill looked Chansey in the eye. You know what I'm talking about. She jerked her thumb in the direction of the den. Where did he come from? I hired him to help fix the apartment. He was checking out a leak on the roof. Travis went up with him. She hated the flabbergasted look on Jill's face. This was the moment she'd been dreading ever since Jill stepped foot in the house. What? How could you let Travis go up on a roof that's covered with a sheet of ice? It was against my better judgment, but Gabe assured me that he would look after him. Jill's hands went to her hips. And you trusted some hired man that you barely know to keep an eye on your son? There's a little more to it than that. Chancy pressed her fingers to her pounding forehead. The day's events had culminated into a blurry mess that was growing larger by the minute. What's going on here, Chancy? Jill had spoken the words slowly, as if she were speaking to a child. Not a good sign. Okay, let me start at the beginning. Chancy related how Travis had run out during an argument and how Gabe had saved him. She told Jill about how she'd invited him to dinner as a way of saying thanks, and then how Gabe had put up the wreaths and shoveled the snow. He seems like a dream come true. Yes, he does. For a split second, she considered leaving it at that. But it would only be a matter of time before Jill found out the full story. Better for her to hear it from her rather than Travis or Jake. Chancy chose her next words carefully. Gabe does seem like a great guy, but there's a catch. And? Jill motioned with her hands to speed Chancy up. He's homeless. What? The word exploded out of Jill's mouth and her eyes took on a wild look. Chancy grabbed Jill's arm. Keep your voice down. Do you want the whole house to hear? You hired a homeless man to help you with the apartment? Jill hissed. Chancy could only nod. And invited him into your home for dinner and hired him to work on the apartment, trusted him on the roof with Travis? Hearing the words strung together made Chancy feel irresponsible. Yes, I suppose I did. It was a mistake. I see that now. She shook her head. I thought I was doing something to help someone. Jill took in a deep breath. I know. She ran a hand through her short hair. I know that you did. What are you going to do now? Chancy balled her fists. I don't know. You see what kind of shape he's in. I can't send him out in the cold. Hurt. The wound should heal okay. I can probably get my hands on some antibiotics. He'll be sore as the dickens for a day or so. But if he stays off it... Her voice trailed off, and she looked at Chancy, a horrified expression on her face. He can't stay in the house with you and the kids. Of course not. Did Jill really think she would let a homeless man stay with them? She had to fight the impulse to laugh. He can stay in the apartment for a couple of days. I don't know about that. He could be crazy. Well, what do you suggest? Rather than answering, Jill began chewing on her fingernail. There is no other solution, and you know it. That apartment is just sitting out there, empty, and that poor man needs a roof over his head. Tears pooled in her eyes. Max would have helped him. She bit her trembling lip. Jill put a hand on her shoulder. Of course he would have. We're going to help him, too. We just have to make sure you and the kids are safe in the meantime. She paused and cocked her head, as if she'd just thought of something. What does Jake think about this? Chancy hedged. She began chewing on her fingernail. He... he doesn't know. Jill surprised her by laughing. What? He'll blow a fuse when he sees Gabe. 
Oh, to be a fly on the wall when he gets a load of that virile hunk in there. It irked Chansey that Jill was getting so excited about Jake's discomfort, even though she knew that Jill didn't care for Jake. Jill had always made her feelings crystal clear on that point. Still, she didn't have to revel in it. For your information, Jake has met Gabe. Oh, and how did that go? Chansey scrunched her nose, remembering how Jake refused to shake Gabe's hand. Yep, your expression says it all. Realization dawned on Jill's face. He's the vagrant that Jake was talking about. Yes. She paused, thinking, and then a wicked light came into her eyes. You know, I think you should let Gabe stay in the apartment until he recoups. With all of the break-ins that are going on, it might be nice to have a man around. Even Jake can't argue with that. Chansey's eyes narrowed. Oh, you're an evil woman. Jill laughed. Don't I know it. Her expression grew serious. I'm only a phone call away if you need anything. She gave Chansey a searching look. Any more panic attacks? Thankfully, no. I almost had one the night I heard someone in the house, but I was able to pull out of it before... She couldn't bring herself to finish the sentence, not wanting to dredge up the past. Things had gotten so much better, and she was starting to feel more in control. I'm okay, she said firmly. Good. I know you'll be fine. A surge of emotion welled in Chansey, and she threw her arms around Jill. Thanks for always being there, sis. Love you. They broke away from each other a minute later, and Jill glanced at her watch. I've got to get home and check on Wyatt and the kids. Yep, and I'd better get back into the den before Susie has Gabe dressed in Barbie clothes. They laughed. When Chansey started walking down the hall, Jill stopped her. Hey. Yeah? Did you ever find out why Gabe's homeless? No, not yet, but he seems normal. Not off, like other homeless people I've seen. At least that's the way he appears right now. Chansey nodded. Yeah, exactly. Only time will tell, right? Jill pursed her lips together, a thoughtful expression on her face. I may regret saying this, but I like him. This took Chansey by surprise. Really? Yeah, I liked him from the first minute I started talking to him. He has kind eyes. Yes, he does, Chansey agreed, glad that Jill had noticed it too. Chansey's phone started ringing when they walked into the kitchen. When she saw who was calling, her eyes got big. Oh no, it's Jake, she mouthed. Jill held up her hands, a devilish smile on her face. Don't look at me, you're on your own with this one. By the time Chansey got to bed, her head was spinning. What a day! Even though she was physically exhausted, her mind was going full force, alternating between her worry over Gabe's health and the fact that Jake had gone ballistic when she told him that Gabe was staying in the apartment. He'd ranted and raved for a full twenty minutes, and she'd listened, all the while feeling as though she were removed from the conversation. Thankfully, the pizza man finally came, giving her an excuse to get off the phone. Even though she understood where Jake was coming from, his overprotectiveness was starting to get on her nerves. Gabe was a good man, and he needed her help. She tossed in the bed, punching her pillow in an effort to get comfortable. She'd done the right thing by letting him stay. Hadn't she? Jill didn't realize how much comfort her simple observation had given Chansey. He has kind eyes. Yes, his eyes were kind, and the children loved him. She wondered again what had brought him to the point of homelessness. He was intelligent, able-bodied, very handsome. A tingle shot through her, and she chided herself for dwelling on the superficial. Her attraction to the man, be it real or imagined, had nothing to do with her letting him stay. She was simply doing what Max would have done, helping another human being. Yes, that's all it was. Nothing more. Even as she thought the words, an image of Gabe's witty smile flashed before her, 
and she replayed the moment when he'd teased her about inviting him to dinner. She smiled as she drifted off to sleep. They were on the roof, and she couldn't get to them. She called up, but the air snuffed out the sound. Max said something funny, causing Travis to laugh, and it struck her then how similar they looked. Same unruly hair, same set of the jaw, same carriage of the shoulders. When Max died, they were starting to look similar, but now that Travis was coming into manhood, it was nearly like looking at Max's double. Dead. The word stopped her cold. Dead. Max was dead. She looked up at them again and screamed when Max lost his footing and started tumbling backwards. Time seemed to be suspended, and she saw it all in slow motion. The fear in Max's eyes. The sorrow that he would never be there to hold her again. Never be there to see how much like him Travis had become. Then the scene changed, and she saw Max swinging Susie around and around beside the Christmas tree. Susie squealing with glee, the lights from the tree reflecting softly on her round cheeks. Then the lights went from white to red, red lights flashing. She looked up at Max's beloved Christmas star perched on the tree, the one ornament that was constant, unchanging. The star started sliding, and she moved to grab it, but it slipped from her grasp and fell to the floor, where it shattered into splinters. In the next moment, Max was holding her in his arms. Oh, Max, she breathed. I miss you so much. Why did you have to leave us? I can't do this alone, Max. I just can't. Tears were streaming down her face. Max, talk to me. He simply smiled and started wiping away her tears. Max. Ever so softly, he began stroking her hair. It felt so good to be in his arms. She looked up into his comforting brown eyes. But they were blue. The familiar lines of his face shifted, and it wasn't Max who was holding her but Gabe. She tried to pull away, but he held her tight. Let go of me. I don't know you. You're a stranger. He gave her a half-smile that showed his dimple, and there seemed to be amusement in his eyes as his hand moved to her face. A tingle shot down her spine when he caressed the curve of her jaw. You shouldn't be here. I don't know. She closed her eyes, her breath coming faster under his touch as he traced the outline of her mouth with the tip of his finger. This is wrong. You shouldn't be here. I shouldn't feel this way, Gabe. She sighed when his lips covered hers. Chancy shot up in the bed, her hands clutching the covers. Her heart was flopping like a limp fish, and she felt shaky. Her hands went to her mouth, remembering the dream. She could still feel the tips of his fingers on her lips, his mouth on hers. Heat flooded her, and she wasn't sure if it was desire or embarrassment. She flicked on the lamp and glanced at the clock. 2.45 a.m. Good grief. She raked her hair out of her eyes and swung her legs to the floor. Where had that dream come from? She took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Then she stood and went into the bathroom where she splashed water on her face. A moment later, she returned to her bed and crawled under the covers. It had seemed so real, like Gabe was in the room with her. A sense of unease settled over her, and she took a quick assessment of the bedroom, making sure she was alone. She reached for her phone on the nightstand, right where she left it. Her eyes went to her clothes from yesterday, still strewn over the wingback chair, because she'd been too tired to put them away before going to bed. Everything looked to be in order. It was just a dream, a silly dream. She yawned and was about to turn off the light, when she saw the door, her heart clutched. It was closed. She always left the door open so she could hear the kids if they needed her. Her breath started coming faster. The door was closed. Someone had been in the room. Gabe? Tears came to her eyes and she willed herself to stay calm. Breathe, Chansey. In, out, in, out. She was so tired last night that she could have closed the door. 
Maybe Susie or Travis had gotten up in the middle of the night? Maybe the door had closed on its own? Maybe... Susie's cry sent her jumping out of bed and running down the hall. When she got to the door, Susie met her and threw her arms around her waist. Mommy! Chansey bent down and picked her up. Honey, what's wrong? She smoothed the hair from Susie's face. It's okay, she cooed. I'm here now. She walked into the room and sat down on the bed, holding her in her lap. Susie's cries turned to whimpering, and she placed her head against Chansey's chest. Chansey caressed her hair and murmured, You want to tell me what's wrong? Did you have a bad dream? Susie sniffed and gulped. No. Then what's wrong? A man, she wailed. A whisper of apprehension edged in. A man? You saw a man? Susie had her teeth clamped down on her lower lip and was nodding vigorously. Yes, there was a man in my room. A ribbon of fear encircled Chansey. What? I saw him by the window, Mommy, Susie pointed. He was right there. Chapter 10 Chansey stood on her tiptoes and leaned over the sink, straining to see. There was no movement in the apartment, at least not that she could tell from the kitchen window. When Susie told her she'd seen a man in the house, it sent Chansey into a tailspin, and she could feel the fringes of hysteria clawing their way into the safeguards that she'd so painstakingly constructed over the past several months. There would be no going back to that dark place, she reminded herself. Her kids needed her. She let Susie sleep in the bed with her, and that helped restore a measure of sanity. Focusing on Susie's well-being allowed her to stop focusing on herself and the dream she'd had. It had felt so real. Had someone been in the house? After Susie told her about the man, she had methodically checked every nook and cranny, starting first in Travis's room to make sure he was okay. Her search was fruitless, however, and when she went downstairs, she found the alarm was still set. In her anger, she'd been tempted to march back to the apartment and bang on the door to see if Gabe were asleep. But she decided against it. After all, what good would it do? He would only deny it. She turned her attention back to the stove and flipped over the sausages sizzling in the pan. The night's events had left her feeling famished for some strange reason, so she decided to make waffles, scrambled eggs, and sausage. She reached in the cabinet and retrieved a plate and began piling it full of food. Her plan was to take it to Gabe first thing. That way, she could gauge his reaction. If he looked the least bit suspicious, then she was going to have to make him leave. No bones about it. As much as she wanted to help him, she couldn't, no, wouldn't, put her family at risk. She poured a large tumbler full of orange juice, wrapped up the plate, and grabbed some silverware. Susie and Travis were still sleeping, so she covered up the remainder of the food and headed out. Her phone rang. She glanced down. Jake. She blew out a breath, trying to decide if she should answer it or let it go to voicemail. She let it ring a couple more times. Hello. Hi, Jake. Hey, how are you? Fine, she replied automatically. There was a pause. About last night. Her heart fluttered. Last night? How did he know about last night? Her head started to spin, but she chose her words carefully. What do you mean? On the phone, I'm sorry I overreacted. Oh. The relief she felt was palpable. Yeah, I'm just worried about you with that homeless man there. I know, Jake. But sometimes you can be so... You just come across as so... Controlling. She heard his intake of breath, followed by silence. You don't know anything about this man, Chansey. Jake, I'm not going to go into this with you again. I told you last night that he's staying until he gets well. That's not up for discussion. Even as she spoke the words, she felt like a hypocrite. Had she not just been contemplating making Gabe move? I'm sorry, he finally said. 
I just don't want anything to happen to you or the kids. His plaintive admission was so sincere that she felt herself soften. Jake had been so good to them. He was there when she needed him the most. He'd picked up the pieces, had helped her function again. If it hadn't been for him... Chancy? Yeah? I'd like to come over today and spend some time with you, if that's okay. She could tell that he was trying hard to be agreeable. She glanced at the plate of food she'd made for Gabe and felt guilty for some reason. That would be nice. Why don't you come over for lunch? We'll be working on the apartment all day. It's nothing fancy, but if you don't mind turkey sandwiches. Sounds great. I'll be there at noon. Okay, I'll see you soon. Chancy? Yes? I love you. The words floored her. He'd never told her that before. It was always implied, but they'd never brought it to the surface. There was an awkward silence, and she knew he was waiting for her to respond. Jake, I don't really know. You are so good to me. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. He sounded hurt. Jake, it's just that right now I'm so confused. It's okay. I'll be there at noon. Okay. See you then. After the first knock, she heard movement. She plastered a smile on her face, all the while trying to squelch the butterflies swarming in her stomach. It was only when he opened the door and smiled that her nerves calmed down a notch. His demeanor was the same as it had been yesterday, polite and reserved. If Gabe had been in her room last night, then he was one talented actor, because he wasn't acting strange at all. Gabe hadn't taken her in his arms, kissed her senseless, making her feel things that she thought she'd never feel again. It was a dream. Only a dream. She stepped through the door and tried to observe him without being obvious. He had a boyish quality that was heightened by the fact that his hair was sticking up in all the wrong places. Very endearing. Sleep lines were etched across one cheek, and there was a fine layer of stubble along the lines of his jaw. He was wearing some of Max's pajamas that she'd dug out of a box, and he was still hobbling slightly, but not as much as the night before. I brought you some breakfast. She followed him into the apartment and placed the plate on the counter in the kitchen. When she came back into the living room, he was sitting on the couch. She gave him a tentative look. How did you sleep? He flashed a wry smile and rubbed his jaw. Can't you tell? Yeah, you look about as rough as I felt this morning. She made a mental note to bring him over a razor. He ran a hand through his hair. Yeah, sorry, I'm afraid I'm not much of a morning person. How are you feeling? Still sore, but better. She sat down in the love seat across from him. Those pain pills Jill gave me knocked me out cold. Once my head hit the pillow, I was out. The comment struck her as odd. Was he trying to come up with an alibi? Gabe, last night... His blue eyes met hers, and an image of him with his mouth on hers flashed in her head. Her face warmed, and she had to remind herself that it was only a dream. He was watching her, waiting for her to continue... She shifted in her seat, trying to figure out how much to tell him. Could she trust him? Are you okay? Someone was in my house last night, she blurted. He sat up. What? I wasn't sure at first. I thought there might have been someone in my room. She looked to get his reaction, but his face remained unreadable. I thought I might have dreamed it, but then Susie was crying. I went to her room and she told me she saw a man standing beside the window. He leaned forward. Did you call the police? No, I checked the house, the alarm, everything seemed to be in order. It happened once before. His eyes narrowed and she could tell he was thinking through what she was saying. What do you mean it happened before? She told him about how she'd been alone and heard someone in the house and how Jake came to her rescue. He rubbed a hand across his chin. So last night, 
The alarm was still on when you went downstairs? Yes. Did Travis hear anything? No. She shook her head. At least I don't think so. He slept through the whole thing. He's still asleep, so I'll ask him when he wakes up. But Susie saw someone. It wasn't a question, but a statement. Yes. Tears sprang to her eyes. I don't know what to think. He took a deep breath, and she could see the compassion on his face. Hey, it's going to be okay. Before she realized what was happening, he got up and sat beside her on the love seat. She shook her head. I'm sorry. I shouldn't burden you with my problems. Jake thinks I'm losing my mind, and maybe I am. His jaw hardened. You seem lucid to me. If you say someone was in your house last night, then I think we need to assume that someone was. Really? She looked at him to see if he meant it. She could tell from his expression that he did. His eyes were just as blue as they'd been in her dream. For a split second, she let her gaze linger on his lips, wondering if his mouth would feel the same as she'd dreamt it. Then, horrified at her thoughts, she looked away. How many people know the code to disarm the alarm? What? Have you given your code to anyone? She thought for a minute. Travis and Jill. Anyone else? She shook her head. No, I don't think so. She thought back to the night when Jake came to her rescue. He deactivated the alarm. Oh, Jake knows it too, but that's all. You should change the code. Don't tell anyone about it, except for Travis. Are you insinuating that I can't trust Jake or my own sister? He held up his hands. I'm only trying to help. She blew out a breath. I'm sorry, it's just that my nerves are on edge. Look, I'm not knocking Jake or Jill. Changing your code is simply a precautionary measure. If there weren't any signs of forced entry, then it has to be someone who has access to the code or someone who knows how to bypass the system. You should also consider changing the locks. It went through her mind at that moment that she didn't know this man at all, and he seemed to know an awful lot about home invasions. Here she was, sitting in the apartment alone with him, and he could be anyone. Gabe, what did you do for a living before, you know, before you became... She swallowed hard. Homeless. Their eyes locked, and she detected wariness in them, and something else she couldn't pinpoint. Regret? Grief? He broke the connection by looking away. What makes you think I did anything? How do you know I haven't always been this way? Her eyes went wide. Oh, I guess I didn't think. She stood. I'd better get back to the kids. He touched her hand. Chancy, there are things about me that I'm not proud of. Things I can't talk about. She pulled her hand away. Can't or won't? A chasm was building between them. Gabe... I appreciate all that you've done for my family, and I'm so sorry you got hurt on the roof. I let you stay in the apartment because I didn't want to send you out in the cold with no place to go. But after last night, she hated the tremor in her voice and tried to swallow it down. After last night, she continued, I'm not sure that your being here is such a good thing. His eyes met hers. I didn't break into your house last night. That's what you're asking isn't it? She clenched her hands. I'm sorry, I need to go. He stood. Okay, I'll be out within the hour. He gave her a sad smile. Thanks for breakfast. She watched him hobble toward the kitchen, all the while feeling like a complete heel. Gabe could barely walk, much less break into her house. And what purpose would he have for doing so? All he'd done since coming into their lives was help. And here she was, throwing him out. Stop. I think you need to stay a little longer, until you're better. He turned and searched her face. Are you sure? No, she wasn't sure. She wasn't sure about anything. 
Yeah, she said. I'm sure. He cocked his head, studying her. Okay, he finally said. I'll stay, but only until I get better. Not a minute longer. Jake glared through the kitchen window at the apartment in the back. I can't believe you're letting him stay here. He rested his back against the sink and folded his arms over his chest. Irritation flashed over Chansey. Jake's sulking was tromping on her last nerve. From the moment he walked through the door, he'd been hounding her about Gabe. I still don't understand why you won't let me go and talk to him. I'll handle the situation. If need be, I'll pay for him to get a hotel. A tremor of horror went through her. The last thing she wanted was a confrontation between Jake and Gabe. She blew out an exasperated breath. I've already told you that I'm handling the situation. She fought to keep her voice even. Gabe and I talked about it this morning. As soon as he's able, he'll leave. In the meantime, he's working off his room and board by working on the apartment. Jake's jaw grew hard, making his narrow features look even sharper. Chancy, we don't know anything about him. I don't feel comfortable having him here with you and the kids. It's not safe. If you're not going to make him move, then I'll move in. No, she exploded. She shook her head. No, that's not a good idea. We've talked about this. Travis is already going through a hard enough time. She switched gears. Look, Jake, I understand your concern. I really do. His eyes met hers. Then what's the problem? What was the problem? That was a good question. She could only imagine what Jake's reaction would be if she told him the truth. You see, Gabe has really kind eyes, and I have a good feeling about him, as does Jill, by the way. Also, I had this steamy dream about him where we kissed, and have you looked at him? Talk about a hunk. I haven't been this attracted to a man since Max. No. She certainly couldn't tell him that. She realized Jake was waiting for an answer. What's the problem? He repeated. The problem is that I'm getting tired of you overstepping your bounds. She halfway expected him to react to that remark, but then realized she'd only thought the words. I don't expect you to understand, she said flatly. He lifted an eyebrow. Really? That's all you have to say? It hit her then that she really didn't owe Jake an explanation. After all, it wasn't as if they were married. They were only dating. And at this point, she wasn't even sure how she felt about him. She wasn't sure if she wanted to continue the relationship. She looked him in the eye. I'm a grown woman, Jake. I don't need you to stand over me and make decisions for my family. The words came out sharper than she'd intended, and she winced at the stricken look on his face. For a split second, she was tempted to take back the words, but she was tired of being mowed over. If they were going to have any hope of continuing a relationship, she had to make him realize that she wasn't going to be led around by the nose. She and Max had always made decisions together as equal partners. She'd been so broken when she first met Jake that it was only natural for him to assume that he could control everything. But as more and more time went by, pieces of her old self were returning, and the old Chansey, the real her, wasn't a pushover. Look, Jake. She tried to sound kind. I really appreciate all that you've done for me, but you're overstepping your bounds here. His eyes narrowed, and she saw a strange expression flicker over his face, something akin to malice. It caught her by surprise, sending a chill down her spine. And then, before she could analyze it, the look was gone. She fleetingly wondered if she'd only imagined it. His eyes became pleading, and he touched her arm. I'm not trying to be a jerk, Chancy. I'm simply worried about you. The tone of his voice was kind, solicitous, but she wasn't buying it. Worried or jealous? The words left her mouth, 
before she could call them back. He looked at her like she'd grown a set of horns. Jealous? Of a vagrant? He let out an incredulous laugh. Are you listening to yourself? He shook his head. You're not thinking clearly. It was a stupid thing to say. She knew it, and Jake knew it. But now that she'd said it, she wouldn't give him the satisfaction of backing down. There was too much at stake here. Chancy sensed that this conversation was a pivotal point in their relationship. She jutted out her chin. Are you jealous? The lines around his mouth grew deeper as he gave her a hard smile. Yeah, Chancy, I'm jealous of that pathetic homeless man out there. What's this really about? Max? The moment we start getting close, you put up another wall. His voice became gentle. Think about how wonderful things were the other night when I stayed over. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. Wonderful? You call someone breaking into my house wonderful? I was scared to death. How could you even think? He reached for her hands, grasping them in his. No, I mean after, when I was here. I took care of you. I will always take care of you, Chansey. Why do you keep pushing me away? There was something haunting in his plaintive tone. How had she let things get this far? She felt as if she were awakening from a deep sleep and was seeing things clearly for the first time. It hit her then. She didn't love Jake. Not the way she loved Max. Maybe she would never find someone else like Max. But Jake? Uptight and a perfectionist was the antithesis of Max. It would never work. Why had she not seen it before? She removed her hands from his. I don't think right now is the right time to talk about this. But Chancy. She held up a hand, causing his eyes to narrow into angry slits. He lifted an eyebrow. You know, letting some homeless man mooch off you won't bring Max back. Max is gone. She rocked back, stunned. That was uncalled for. She met his glare full on. If you knew anything about Max, you would also know that Max never judged a man by his appearance. He never would have treated Gabe the way you did the other night. Tears formed in her eyes. I'll not have you insulting Max's memory. Get out. His eyes went wide. What? You heard me. Get out. Tears were spilling down her face. His face went red, and he looked like he wanted to punch something. She gave him a scathing look and moved away from him. Then his expression became worried. Look, Chancy, I was out of line. I shouldn't have said that. He reached for her arm, turning her around to face him. No, you shouldn't have, she spat back, her eyes blazing. Chancy. I'm sorry. His voice became pleading. Give me a chance to make it up to you. She looked at his face and could see the concern emanating from his eyes. Her anger began to ebb slightly. I'm not sure where this is coming from, he continued. You're tired and overwrought. Let me get you a Valium. It'll help you relax. He put an arm around her shoulder and attempted to lead her to a chair, but she resisted. A month ago, and she would have taken that Valium, but not this time. The strength she felt running through her veins was as unexpected as it was reassuring. I don't want a Valium. She was surprised at the surety of her voice. Somehow, in the last couple of days, she'd become stronger. When had the change occurred? Yes, you do. It'll help ease your nerves. He pulled out a chair. Sit down here, and I'll get... Stop it! She jerked away from his grasp. Chancy, you're being unreasonable. He grabbed her arm so forcefully that she yelped in pain. Ouch! You're hurting me. You need to leave. Now. His arms fell to his sides. You don't mean it. His face paled. I want you to leave, she repeated, rubbing the arm that he'd grabbed. You heard her. Jake and Chansey looked toward the door in surprise as Travis entered the room. 
He leaned against the doorframe, his arms folded over his chest. Jake gave him a hard look. Your mother and I are having a private conversation. Yes, and she just asked you to leave, Travis said. His emboldened expression reminded Chansey of Max, and she just stood there, speechless, gaping at him. Fury twisted over Jake's face. It was quickly replaced by a wooden smile. He acknowledged Travis's comment with a slight nod of his head. The man of the house has spoken. He stepped up to Chansey and gave her a peck on the cheek. She fought the urge to repel from his touch. We'll continue our discussion later. She nodded. Jake gave Travis a withering look before leaving the kitchen. A minute later, they heard the door slam. Chansey pulled out a chair and sat down. Her knees felt wobbly. Travis rushed to her side. Mom, are you okay? She gave him a weak smile. I'm fine. She put a hand on his arm. The thought of her teenage son having to come to her rescue made her feel nauseous. You didn't have to jump in. I was handling it. A half-smile formed on his lips as he shrugged. As man of the house, I felt it was my duty. She rewarded him with a genuine smile. He looked her in the eyes. Please tell me he's gone for good. Even as she contemplated what Travis was saying, a wave of sadness covered her. Travis was right. It was over. Jake had been her crutch over the past few months, and while she couldn't continue the relationship, knowing that she didn't love him, ending it meant that she would once again be alone. Was she strong enough now to go it alone? Travis touched her arm. Mom? She gave him a brief smile. It's over. Relief flooded his face. Good. He pulled out a chair and sat down across from her. He retrieved an apple from the fruit bowl in the center of the table. He rubbed it on his shirt and then took a big bite. He was still a boy in so many ways, and yet in others, he seemed wise beyond his years. It took courage to stand up to Jake, and she couldn't help but think that Max would have been proud. She wondered again if Travis's vehement dislike of Jake was owed to the fact that he didn't want him replacing Max. Would he ever be happy with any man other than his father? Mom, I was thinking... He hedged, and she could tell he had something up his sleeve. Yes, she prompted. You haven't made chicken enchiladas in a while. She wondered where this conversation was going but the majority of her attention was still centered on her conversation with Jake. No, but I could, I suppose. He took another bite of the apple. Good. Can you make them tonight? Tonight? Would Jake realize that it was over, or would she have to spell it out for him? Travis nodded. Mom, he prompted a minute later. Are you listening to me? She gave him an automatic smile. Of course. Enchiladas. Can we have them tonight? She shook her head. It wasn't like Travis to request a dish. She gave him a suspicious look. I didn't realize you were so fond of my chicken enchiladas. They're great, Mom. You know how much I love those things. You do? She asked dubiously. Yeah. She thought about it for a minute. She had everything to make them except sour cream. She needed to run to the hardware store to pick up supplies for Gabe, so she could swing by the grocery store afterwards. Chicken enchiladas did sound good, and it would keep her mind off of Jake. Okay, I'll make them. Travis had been sawing away on the apple. He took one final bite before tossing the core into the nearby garbage can, his hands lifting as if he were throwing a basketball into a hoop. Score! Two points. He scooted back his chair, making a loud scraping sound against the floor. Thanks, Mom. He gave her a broad smile and then went to the refrigerator and pulled out two cans of soda. When he saw the questioning look on her face, he explained, I told Gabe I would bring him one. That's nice, she said absently. Travis had requested a meal. That was a first. She rubbed her neck. 
What a strange day this was turning out to be. Well, I'd better get back out there and help Gabe on the apartment. She watched him walk across the kitchen. When he reached the door, he paused. Mom? Yeah? He shifted his feet. I hope you don't mind, but I invited Gabe to have dinner with us tonight. Her eyes went wide. You what? He shrugged and his voice was casual. Too casual. Well, he is back there, helping us. It seems silly for him to eat dinner all by himself. The pieces came together instantly. Travis didn't care a whit about her enchiladas. The little devil was finagling a way to get her to invite Gabe to dinner. She started to tell him no. After all, she still wasn't sure about Gabe. They knew nothing about him. Her rebuttal died on her lips as she looked at Travis's hopeful expression. Okay, she relented, even though it was against her better judgment. Gabe can come for dinner. That's great, he said enthusiastically. See ya. Bye, she called after him. She sat there for a minute, staring at the back door. To think she'd been afraid that Travis might not want another man in her life. She nearly laughed out loud at the irony. Travis didn't care if there was another man as long as that man wasn't Jake. He didn't like the dependable architect types that were strung a little too tight. It seemed that Travis had an affinity for the homeless, rugged types. She sighed and propped her elbow on the table, resting her jaw in the palm of her hand. Susie, who'd been watching a movie, bounded into the kitchen. Mom, can I go back to the apartment? She began jumping up and down excitedly. I want to see Gabe. Chancy rolled her eyes. Not you, too. Yes, she exclaimed. Please, Mom. She gave her best doe-eyed expression, batting her eyelashes. Chancy laughed and tussled Susie's hair. What was it with this guy? It had taken him all of a few days to enchant the entire family, including her, she admitted begrudgingly. Let's make you a sandwich, and then we'll go out back and check on Travis and Gabe. But then I want you to go to the hardware store with me. Afterwards, we'll stop by and pick up a few groceries. We're having chicken enchiladas for dinner. Yippee! Susie said, skipping across the kitchen. Chapter 11 He couldn't believe it. He'd spent months nursing her back to health and putting up with her insolent son, and she'd practically thrown him out of the house. Jake was sitting in his SUV, his fingers drumming on the steering wheel as he looked toward Chansey's house. From this vantage point, he could only see the front of the house. The large trees, shadowing the yard, blocked his view of the side. He'd parked in front of a vacant house that had a real estate sign in front, so as to not arouse suspicion. Frustration raced through his veins as he replayed the conversation with Chansey over and over in his head. She'd been angry at first, but then her anger drained. He would have been able to maintain control of the situation had Travis not intervened. His eyes went hard. That boy was a perpetual thorn in his side. He'd put up with him for Chansey's sake, but there might come a time. His thoughts drifted back to Chansey. She loved him. That much he knew. The night of the break-in, she'd been understandably terrified when she first saw him at the back door but then she'd practically melted into his arms. She looked at him with those adoring eyes, like he was her knight in shining armor. And later, when she'd fallen asleep beside him on the couch, he carried her to bed and placed her underneath the covers, gently stroking her hair. How he'd wanted to hold her in his arms, kiss her slender neck, smother her lips with tender kisses. But he'd only allowed himself to give her a soft kiss on her forehead. His heart skipped a beat as a wave of tenderness rushed over him. I'm here for you, Chansey, he said aloud. A flash of anger covered him as he thought about that filthy homeless guy living in the apartment. Everything had begun to change the moment he came onto the scene. Jake had felt it that first night when he met him in the foyer, which is why he refused to shake the man's hand. Call it a sixth sense. 
but Jake knew there was more to the man than met the eye. Homeless people were downtrodden and vacant. But this man, Jake sensed a peculiar confidence in him. Something was off. The man was obviously attracted to Chansey. He could tell that from those hopeful puppy dog looks he was giving her. Jake clenched his fist. The man was preying on Chansey's vulnerability, and that was something Jake would not allow. She hadn't been herself today. She needed time to sort things out, and he needed time to find out more about this Gabe Jones. A grim smile stole across his face. He would follow his every move, expose him for the charlatan he was certain he was, and then Chansey would realize that everything he was doing was for them. Any means that he had to use would surely justify the end. His heart lifted as he started the engine. He began to hum softly as he pulled away from the curb. Chansey was confused right now, but she would come around. As surely as fate had whispered it in his ear, he'd known from the moment he saw her that Chansey was destined to be his. Would you like another enchilada? Chansey looked across the table at Gabe, who was taking the last bite on his plate. Gabe gave her a crooked smile. I don't think I could eat another bite. He leaned back in his chair. That was absolutely delicious. A feeling of warmth rushed over Chansey. Thank you, she murmured. She'd been enjoying the easy conversation that was taking place between Travis and Gabe. They'd worked side by side all day and had accomplished a lot on the apartment. A pang went through her as she watched them interact. That's how it would have been if Max were here. A feeling of despondency settled over her, and she tried to push it away. Dredging up the past wasn't going to bring Max back. Still, it was difficult. She watched Gabe out of the corner of her eye. His mannerisms were similar to Max's. The same big hands and easy smile. The confident set of the shoulders. But his eyes and hair were different. Max's features had been plainer, but Gabe's... Gabe looked like a walking picture with his clear blue eyes and sculptured nose. She liked the strong, sure curve of his jaw, unlike Jake's jaw, which was softer with a tiny ripple of extra flesh underneath it. Jake's eyes were a dull brown, and his sandy hair was beginning to recede. Jake's medium build and height of about 5 feet 10 inches was average, but compared to Gabe, he looked like a dwarf. She shrugged off the comparison. It was unfair to compare Jake to Gabe. Jake had been kind to her, and she owed him so much. Gabe's eyes met hers, and she could tell from the expression on his face that he knew she'd been watching him. He didn't seem to mind, but rather gave her a half-smile. A heat wave rushed over her. She returned the smile and quickly looked away before he could tell that she was blushing. Mom, can we watch a movie tonight with Gabe? Susie forked a piece of chicken and shoved it into her mouth. That's a great idea, Travis said. We'll pick out a Christmas movie. He looked at Gabe. Have you seen Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger? I haven't. Gabe wiped the corner of his mouth with his napkin. Great, Travis said eagerly. We'll make some popcorn and have hot chocolate. I would love to watch a movie, Gabe said, if it's okay with your mother. Travis frowned. She won't care. He looked at Chansey. You don't, do you? Chansey looked back and forth between Gabe and Travis. She could see the question in Gabe's eyes, but there was no frustration. He seemed to be patiently waiting for her to make a decision. Her heart sped up a notch as she thought of him being in such a cozy proximity with the family. She remembered the dream from the night before. Her hands went clammy. Was she losing her mind? Mom? Travis said impatiently. She forced a smile. Of course, Gabe is welcome to watch a movie with us. Gabe studied her expression. Are you sure? I don't want to intrude. 
An uncomfortable silence settled around the table, and Chansey tried to think of something sensible to say. Susie grabbed his hand and began swinging it back and forth. Yay! Gabe's going to watch a movie with us! This broke the ice, and everyone laughed. Chansey shook her head. Gabe, if you can handle all of the commotion, then you're certainly welcome to join us for a movie. A little commotion never hurt anyone. He gave Susie a big smile. Susie was still holding his hand. Come and let me show you my Barbie house. Travis scoffed. He doesn't want to see your Barbie house. Susie thrust out her lower lip, and she looked like she was about to cry. Sure I do, Gabe said, giving Travis a reproving look. Susie lifted her head. Really? Really. He looked at Travis. And then I want you to show me how to work that Xbox you keep talking about. Travis punched a fist in the air. Yes, he said loudly. First, let's help your mom get these dishes cleared away, Gabe said, standing. Travis made a face. Gabe chuckled and patted him on the back. I figure that since your mom went to the trouble of making this wonderful meal, the least we can do is help her clean off the table. He handed him a fork. You scrape and I'll stack. Chansey watched the exchange, wondering all the while how it would end. If this were Jake, Travis would have stormed off to his room by now. Chansey's jaw nearly dropped when Travis took the fork and began raking the food into the garbage. Susie began grabbing the empty glasses and carrying them to the sink. I'm helping too, Mommy, she chimed. Good girl, Chansey cooed, causing Susie to beam. Gabe's eyes met hers. Thank you, she mouthed. He winked. By the time they settled down to watch the movie, Chansey felt overwhelmingly tired. She knew she should try to make sense of what was happening but it felt good to relax and enjoy the moment. Several times, she and Gabe met each other's glances from across the room. She wasn't prepared for the feelings that stirred within her. She caught herself looking at the way his muscles moved underneath his shirt when he reached for a handful of popcorn. Then she looked at the way his hair curled on his neck, the firm set of his lips, and how the lines around his eyes crinkled when he laughed at the movie. The glow from the Christmas tree lights, coupled with the cheery fire in the fireplace, made her feel safe and warm. She had to keep reminding herself that Gabe wasn't Max. Gabe was a stranger, a homeless man. She wondered again about his past. There are things I can't talk about, he'd said. What things? She was suddenly curious to know. When the movie ended, Chansey and Gabe were the only ones awake. Chansey stood and flipped on the lights. I'd better get those two to bed. I need to get to bed, too. Later, she would wonder what prompted her to be so bold. I'll get the kids to bed. You stay here. I'd like for us to have a talk, she heard herself say. Wariness crept into his eyes, and he looked like he might argue, but finally he nodded. Good she said in a voice that sounded more cheery than she felt. I'll be right back. She roused Travis, telling him to get to bed, and was about to lift Susie when Gabe stopped her. I'll help. But your leg, she protested. It's better. Before she could argue, he lifted Susie. Where to? She motioned for him to follow her up the stairs to Susie's bedroom. He was still walking with a slight limp, she noticed, but he seemed to be getting stronger each day. She pulled back the covers, and he placed Susie on the bed. She tucked the blanket around her and turned off the light. All the while, she was wondering what had prompted her to initiate a conversation with Gabe. Perhaps it started with her earlier conversation with Jake. Perhaps it was because Gabe reminded her so much of Max. But suddenly, she needed to know more about him. Something had happened tonight. Something she couldn't quite put her finger on. But for a tiny moment, she'd felt whole again. 
but before things got out of control, she needed to know more about him. When they got back down the stairs, he sat stiffly in the recliner, and she sat across from him on the couch. She decided to start the conversation off with an easy topic. How's your leg doing? Much better. It looks like you're getting around on it better. Yes, I should be able to get out of your hair within the week. Oh, her eyes went wide. She hadn't meant to insinuate that he had to leave. She waved the comment away. I'm not worried about that. He cocked his head, and she thought she saw a trace of amusement in his eyes. I just thought, considering our last conversation. You're helping us on the apartment. That's worth far more than a few meals and a place to sleep, she inserted quickly. Thank you. She rubbed her hands on her legs. Like I said, I really appreciate all that you're doing for my family, Travis especially. She sought for the right words, but there really was no way to be diplomatic. I know you said there are things about your past that you can't talk about, but I really need to know more about you. The words spilled out between them. He rubbed a hand across his chin. I figured that. Silence settled between them, and she knew it was up to her to pull it out of him. She scooted forward. How did you become homeless? Was that a trace of amusement she saw on his face? It seemed totally out of place, considering the context of what they were discussing. Fear pricked at her. Was he under the delusion that he wasn't homeless? Maybe he was crazy. That night you saved Travis. You were huddled over a fire. She hated to point out the obvious. Judging by your clothes and ragged coat, I just assumed, and Travis thought, the words trailed off. This was proving to be more difficult than she thought. She took a different approach. Tell me about yourself. What happened to you? He pressed his lips together and his eyes took on a faraway look. I was married once to a wonderful woman named Miriam. She was expecting our first child, a boy. His face took on a haunted expression, and she wondered if he were going to say anything else. He shifted in his seat and finally continued. I was a detective on the police force. She hadn't given any thought to what his profession might have been. I was working on a series of robberies, robberies that took place in upscale neighborhoods like this one. Her breath caught, and her heart began to pound. She thought about the recent robberies. A coincidence? It was on the tip of her tongue to ask him about them, but she couldn't bring herself to say the words. I became immersed in the case, started working long hours, staying away for days at a time. Miriam became upset. We had a fight, and she took off in her car. Chansey winced at the pain she saw flicker across his face. In the dim light of the den, his eyes looked like fathomless shadows, but she suspected that if she could see them, they would mirror her own. I went after her, but there was an accident. His voice caught. She was rushed to the hospital, but she and the baby both died. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. Her eyes went moist. Gabe rubbed at his eye and then clasped his hands tightly in his lap. I kind of lost it, went off the radar. His eyes met hers. I denounced everything I ever was, the people we knew. I just wanted to disappear. She knew that feeling well, but unlike him, she had two children to look after and didn't have the luxury of falling apart. The sorrow that settled between them was oppressive, and Chansey regretted that she'd forced him to dredge up the past. After a few minutes, his eyes met hers. Now you know my story. What's yours? He was direct. She had to give him that. For some reason, his directness didn't bother her. There was so much more she wanted to ask him, 
like what he'd been doing all of this time, how he was able to make it on the streets. Then she realized that he was waiting for her to talk about her past. Let's see. What can I tell you about me? I used to teach elementary school. Third grade. He nodded. Impressive. I really loved working with the children, but after I had Travis, I decided that I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Do you miss it? Yeah, sometimes. I may eventually go back to teaching, but right now I'm trying to focus on Travis and Susie. They need me, especially after what happened. To your late husband. She nodded. Yeah. Silence settled between them. He leaned forward. Tell me about him, he implored. The words were spoken simply and kindly. She wasn't used to such candor, but in a way it was refreshing. Max? How could she describe Max in only a few words? When I first met him, he was a bit of a playboy. Gabe looked surprised. She chuckled. I don't mean with other women. He was a sports junkie of sorts. Snowboarding, snow skiing, rock climbing, four-wheeling. You name it and he was doing it. He was in his early twenties, Chansey explained. Gabe nodded in understanding. Anyway, we met in college at the U. A few years later, we were married. Max toned down the sports and we settled down. He was a wonderful husband and father. He was always helping people. Not once did I ever see him turn his back on the needy. Like father, like son. Sounds a lot like Travis, he chuckled, dragging me home so he could feed me a meal. She gave him an appreciative look, grateful that he recognized the merit of her son, as opposed to Jake, who was always finding fault with him. Yes, Travis is so much like Max, and he looks just like him. She looked at him to see if he were getting tired of her droning on about Max. Most men, Jake, had a low tolerance for conversations that were centered on another man, but he seemed to be genuinely interested in what she had to say. Max loved to fly, she chuckled. I remember the first time he got his pilot's license. He was so excited. He would look for reasons to fly. He got this red and white Cessna, he was so proud of that plane. She lapsed into silence. Her eyes connected with his, and he seemed to be urging her to continue. She swallowed. He was flying back from Denver when his plane went down. The investigators attributed the accident to pilot error. She let out a breath. I don't believe it, she said fervently. Max was careful. He knew that plane like the back of his hand. Whatever happened, I just don't believe it was his fault. Sympathy was emanating from his eyes, causing a lump to form in her throat. She swallowed it down. I'll never know for sure because there wasn't a cockpit recorder in the plane. She stared into the flickering fire. Max called me from the small Denver airport just before takeoff. We were laughing and talking about going to dinner that evening. Her voice cracked. One minute, we were talking about dinner, and the next, he was gone. She fought to keep the quiver out of her voice, although her effort did little good. She put a hand to her mouth to stay the emotion, but couldn't stop the tears from streaming down her face. I'm sorry, she sniffed. It's okay. I understand. Their eyes locked, and she realized with a start that he really did understand. The distance between them seemed to shrink, and in that moment she felt a connection with him, a deep connection that can only come when one truly understands the depth of another's sorrow. He offered her a small smile. Aren't we the cheery pair? At first, she was shocked, but then she started laughing. The hurt inside started to break up a little. Finally, she paused and let out a breath, feeling as though she were releasing some of the tension she'd been holding. She looked at the Christmas tree. This is my first Christmas without Max. My third without Miriam. 
How did you get through them? It was a plea of anguish, a plea for help. The same way you will, Chansey, one step at a time. Somehow those words were comforting. Thank you. She glanced at the clock. It was a quarter till midnight. He immediately picked up on the cue and stood. She also stood. Thanks for a nice evening. Yeah. Thanks. Good night, Chansey. I'll see you tomorrow. He touched her arm, and a tingle shot through her. She looked up at him. Good night, Gabe. Chansey locked the door behind Gabe and watched as he walked to the apartment. When he reached the door, he turned and gave her a lopsided smile and wave. Her heart did a somersault, and she waved back. A feeling of warmth shot through her. She'd opened up to Gabe, had told him things, things she'd never told Jake. To come to think of it, Jake never asked her about Max. Anytime they talked about him, it was because she initiated the conversation. Talking to Gabe had felt comfortable, easy. Her mind went back to the dream and how it had felt to have Gabe's lips on hers. Her heart picked up a notch before she willed herself to think of something else. Get a grip, Chansey. The poor man has been through the ringer, to the point to where he turned his back on society and became homeless, and here you are thinking about how handsome he is. She turned and headed for bed, promising herself that she would only think about him for a few more minutes. Tomorrow she would put aside this foolishness and return to her senses. A burning hatred pulsed through Jake as he lowered the binoculars and leaned into the protection of the tree. He could hardly stand it, watching the two of them together. It was bad enough to watch that man with Chansey and the kids, watching a movie, but when the two of them ended up alone in the den and he saw her crying, he could tell that she was confiding in him. Oh, Chansey, how could you have forgotten everything I've done for you? He thought back to their conversation earlier in the day. It wasn't Chansey's fault. She was confused. He could see it in her eyes. And this man, this fraud, was using her kindness to ingratiate himself into her life. He probably already knew everything about her. He knew about the large inheritance she'd received from Max's estate. He knew she could be easily manipulated. He rubbed a hand across his forehead forcing himself to regulate his breathing in order to calm down. His mind raced, searching for a solution. There had to be a way to deal with this. There had been other obstacles in the past that he'd overcome, and he knew that a solution would eventually present itself. He would have to be patient and wait. But first, he needed to patch things up with Chansey. Chapter 12 I'm thinking about breaking things off with Jake. Chansey heard the soft intake of Jill's breath through the phone. Really? What happened? Chansey leaned against the counter and looked out the kitchen window. It had snowed the night before, covering the lawn in a thick blanket of sparkling white. She watched as Travis and Susie worked to build what would soon be a large snowman. They had the bottom circle done and positioned near the road so that their creation would be prominently displayed to all those passing by. She shrugged. Nothing really, I just don't think we're right for each other. Jake's gotten so controlling lately. Jill chuckled. So what's new? He's been controlling from day one. It never seemed to bother you before. Yeah. Chancy began twirling a lock of hair around her finger. I was so consumed with Max's death that I let a lot of things slide. Now that I'm coming to myself, I'm starting to feel differently about things. It's time that I took control of my life, started making my own decisions. The kids need me. Yes, they do, came the quiet reply. Jake's a good friend, and I really appreciate all that he's done, but he doesn't get along with Travis, and that's a big red flag. Amen. Furthermore, I didn't appreciate the way he got on to Susie the other day. Me either. 
You know my feelings about Jake. Yes, you've told me a billion times. She could imagine that Jill was rolling her eyes. How did Jake take the news? A pit formed in her stomach, and she began twisting her hair tighter. Well, it's kind of complicated. Chancy could hear one of Jill's kids crying in the background. You haven't told him yet? Jill's voice rose. Taylor, stop hitting your sister and quit dumping out the Cheerios on the couch. Yes. No. We had an argument yesterday, and I told him to leave. Stop it now. I'm on the phone. For a second, Chancy thought Jill was yelling at her, but then she realized that she was yelling at her kids. Jill turned her attention back to their conversation. Really? She sounded impressed. Yeah, Travis ordered him out of the house. Jill hooted. Wow. Remind me to give him a big hug. Good for him. A swell of pride rose in Chansey's breast. Yeah, he was something. He reminded me so much of Max, standing there, ready to take on the world. Ready to take on Jake the fake. Don't be mean. Jill was constantly making up insulting names for Jake. She was always saying that Jake was tight-laced and much too controlling. Jill's voice became speculative, turning Chansey's radar on full alert. So, how are things going with Gabe? Chansey's eyes went wide, and she tried to keep her voice casual. Fine. Travis and Susie were nearly done rolling the second ball. Fine, Jill prompted. How's his leg? Much better. He's getting around now with only a slight limp. He's still working away on the apartment. I see. The innuendo was loud and clear. What do you see? Travis was attempting to lift the second ball onto the first, but it was too heavy. Jill, I'm going to have to let you go. I've got to go and help. She stopped mid-sentence when she saw Gabe striding across the yard. He said something to Travis that made him laugh. Gabe and Travis both caught hold of the ball and heaved it on top of the other ball. Susie began clapping her hands. What's going on, sis? Are you okay? Yeah. She combed a hand through her hair. Yeah, I'm great. I was just watching Travis and Susie build a snowman, and Gabe is out there helping them. Gabe? He's helping them build a snowman? Chancy watched as Gabe instructed Travis how to roll the third ball. Yep, he's out there helping them. A tinge of awe crept into her voice as she watched Gabe and her children, out there in the snow, having a blast. Travis placed the final ball on top of the other two, and then bent down and formed a snowball. He threw it at Gabe. Gabe made a face, and then bent down and made a snowball of his own. He pelted Travis in the arm. Travis yelped and then retaliated. A moment later, a snowball fight was taking place. They're out there having a snowball fight. Gabe and the kids? Yeah, they're out there having a blast. What's going on over there, Chansey? I told you, a snowball fight. No, I mean, what's really going on? Chansey didn't appreciate the accusing tone in Jill's voice. I don't know what you mean. I mean, what's going on between you and Gabe? She made a face. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't play dumb with me, Chansey. I know you, and I can tell that you're becoming enamored with this homeless guy. Do you not find it coincidental that you're just now working up the courage to break away from Jake? Heat pricked up her neck. What? Don't you see? Jake's been a controlling dipwad from the beginning. The only reason you're recognizing it now is because Gabe's in the picture. The words were a jab to the stomach. That's not true. Chansey looked out the window to where Travis and Susie were tag-teaming Gabe and pummeling him with snowballs. He was lifting his arms in defeat. Travis was laughing. He punched a victory fist in the air. Was her change of heart owed to Gabe? Chansey, we don't know anything about him. Jill sighed in exasperation. He's homeless, for goodness sakes. 
Well, he wasn't always homeless, she shot back. I had a long talk with Gabe last night, and he told me all about his past and the events that led to his present state. Silence came over the phone. Jill, are you there? Pause. So you had a heart-to-heart -heart with him. Her sister could be such a pill sometimes. It wasn't a heart-to-heart, -heart, she snapped. It was a simple conversation. Jill let out an uneasy chuckle. Okay, you don't have to get testy about it. And you don't have to be so accusatory. You're right, I'm sorry. Why don't you start at the beginning and tell me what he said? Chansey blew out a breath. Jill could be so annoying sometimes, always standing over her shoulder like a mother hen. Even so, she'd apologized, and Chansey was itching to talk about it with someone. Okay, it all started when he was a detective on the police force. After she told Jill all that she knew, she waited for a response. When Jill remained silent, she continued. He's a good guy, Jill. He's doing all of that work in the apartment, helping with the kids. She looked out the window. Gabe and Travis were standing side by side, watching as Susie placed the branches in place for the snowman's arms. Even you said he has kind eyes. Yes, I did say that, Jill admitted. Chansey heard a loud bang on Jill's end. Is everything okay? Taylor, I swear, if you don't stop toppling over the chairs, I'm gonna wring your neck. She heard Taylor giggling in the background. Chansey smiled inwardly. Jill's house was like a romper room. She was hot-tempered, always yelling at the kids. But underneath it, she had a heart of gold. She was a cream puff on the inside, and the kids knew it. I swear, that boy's going to be the death of me. Chansey laughed. I should let you go, Jill said. Okay. The back door opened, and Susie stuck her head in. Mom? Yes? Gabe told me to come and ask you to get us a carrot for the snowman's nose, and a hat, and a scarf. Gabe asked her to come and talk to you? Jill said. Okay, honey. I'm on the phone with Aunt Jill, but I'll be right out. I can't wait for you to see our snowman, Susie said, a look of wonderment in her eyes. Gabe said we should name him Mr. Snowman. Jill chuckled. Really? Is that so? Okay, honey. Chansey ushered Susie out the door. Wow, Gabe's fast becoming a member of the family. Chansey scowled. She wasn't going to let Jill's teasing ruin her day. Travis and Susie were having a wonderful time, and if Gabe were somehow responsible, then so be it. Bye, sis. Gotta go find accessories for Mr. Snowman. Bye. Love you. They ended the call. Jill placed her cell phone on the counter and shook her head. The excitement in Chansey's voice was encouraging and worrisome. For months, she'd been hoping and praying that the old Chansey would return. She'd just not expected it to happen like this. She was obviously smitten with Gabe, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing, if he is who he says he is. Jake was a mistake, and Jill was glad that Chansey had finally realized it. But Chansey was fragile, and she couldn't handle another heartbreak. She was only just now starting to recover from losing Max. If Gabe breaks her heart, she'll never get over it. Wyatt walked into the kitchen. He took one look at his wife and stopped in his tracks. You okay? Yeah. You sure? You had a funny look on your face. What if we got going tonight? He grabbed a banana and began peeling it. He broke off the top section and stuffed it in his mouth. Nothing. Why? Good. She looked toward the den. Kids, get your crap cleaned up. We're going to visit Aunt Chansey tonight. Wyatt lifted an eyebrow. And we're visiting her because... She met his gaze, a defiant expression on her face. Do I need a reason to visit my sister? He chuckled and encircled her waist with his free hand. He placed the remainder of the banana on the counter and began tickling her. 
She tried to wiggle out of his grasp, but he held her tight. She started laughing. Stop, she demanded. Finally, he stopped. He held her in his arms and looked down at her. Okay, so why are we going to Chansey's house tonight? I need to check on Gabe's leg. He looked unconvinced. And? And we need to find out more about him. Ah, the truth comes out. Amusement twinkled in his eyes. So Chansey likes this one, does she? Jill frowned. Yeah, it seems that way. She looked up at him. Please, come with me. I need your assessment. He shook his head and smiled down at her. Okay. You talked me into it. Kids, she yelled. Get that pigsty cleaned up, and I'll make some hot chocolate and popcorn for you at Chansey's. I like it when you're bossy, he said, leaning down to kiss her. Chansey grabbed a handful of carrots and placed them on the table next to the hat and scarf while she put on her coat and boots. She stepped out the back door. I have the carrots and other items, she called to them. She gasped as a snowball hit her in the chest. She looked at Travis, who was laughing. Her eyes narrowed. You! She put down the items and formed a snowball from the snow on the handrail of the deck. She threw it at Travis, but it missed him by a mile. Aw, oh, come on, Mom, you can do better than that. She went down the steps and out into the yard where she bent down to make more snowballs. Travis was pelting her all the while. She picked up the snowballs and started throwing them at Travis. Her eyes went wide when she hit Gabe instead. Time seemed to stop as his eyes met hers. She was about to apologize until he made a snowball and threw it at her, hitting her square in the head. She shot him an exaggerated glare and raked the snow out of her hair. Susie squealed in delight. War! Travis shouted as they all scrambled to make more snowballs. A short time later, they placed a carrot on the snowman and stepped back to admire him. They draped a scarf around his neck and topped his head with a straw hat that Chansey had dragged out of the closet. Mr. Snowman, you are one sharp-looking dude, Gabe said. Our snowman is the biggest in the neighborhood, Travis added, a touch of pride in his voice. He's cute, Susie said. I love him. They all laughed. Chansey took a step back and lost her footing when she stepped into a hole. Gabe grabbed her arm to steady her. She wasn't prepared for the jolt that ran through her. She looked up at him in surprise, feeling warm despite the cold. Thank you, she breathed. He nodded. Chansey clasped her hands together. Hey, what you say we go inside and get warm? I'll make some hot chocolate for everyone. I'd better get back to the apartment, Gabe said. Travis looked like he was going to argue, but Chansey beat him to it. Come inside with us for hot chocolate, she looked at him. Won't you? He hesitated, and she thought he might refuse. Disappointment stabbed at her, making her feel foolish for asking him. Hot chocolate would be nice, he said, his eyes never leaving hers. Her breath caught. Good. Travis gave her a funny look. Mom, are you okay? She smiled. I'm great. Let's go inside. A while later, Chansey picked up her phone and looked at it. She drew in a swift breath, not sure what to think. In the two hours she'd spent outside with Gabe and the kids, and then inside making hot chocolate, she'd missed ten calls from Jake, and he hadn't left her a message. Her stomach churned. She had to break it off with him, and something told her that he wasn't going to take it well. She called him back. He answered on the first ring. Chancy. He sounded breathless. I've missed you. I thought I would come over tonight. I'll stop by the pie and grab a couple of pizzas on the way. We can watch a Christmas movie with the kids. Jake, I don't think that's a good idea. Silence came over the phone. Look, I know we both said some things we didn't mean yesterday. I'm really sorry, Chansey. 
His voice broke, and he sounded as though he might be crying. She wondered again how she'd let things go this far. There was no way she could break up with him over the phone. She would have to tell him in person. That would mean seeing him again. Jake, the tone of her voice was kind. We need to talk. Yes, he agreed, exultation in his voice. We do need to talk. I'll be there as soon as I... Not tonight. What? Not tonight, she said firmly. I have other plans. What plans? It doesn't matter. The tone of her voice let him know that it wasn't up for discussion. I see, came the spiteful reply. She could feel his irritation, even through the phone. Her throat became tight. She really didn't want to have to see him again. But under the circumstances... Let's have dinner together tomorrow evening. His mood immediately lifted. Okay, where? How about the Cheesecake Factory at City Creek? She did a mental calculation. She would get Travis to watch Susie, and City Creek was close enough to the house so she could get home quickly if the kids needed her. I'll pick you up at 5.30. No, she blurted. She heard his harsh intake of his breath. No, she said, keeping her voice even. I'll meet you there. There was a long pause. Okay, he finally said. She was about to end the call. Chancy? Yes. I'm really looking forward to having dinner with you tomorrow. Thanks, Jake. I'll see you there. This time, she ended the call before he could say anything else. Jill carefully wrapped the gauze around Gabe's leg and secured it with medical tape. They were in the study. She'd made him take off his jeans so that she could check the wound. Understandably, Gabe wasn't too keen on the idea of stripping down to his boxers, but it wasn't like there was another option. Chancy had asked if Jill needed her help, but Jill declined, assuring her that as a nurse, she'd handled much worse. Jill needed to get Gabe alone so that she could learn more about him. She needed to know what kind of person he really was. After all, just because he reminded Chancy a little of Max on the outside didn't mean he was like him on the inside. Your wound is healing well, she said, assuming her professional voice. I didn't see any infection, and it looks like the stitches are healing nicely. She gave him a brisk smile. The antibiotics seem to be working. You'll be as good as new in a week. Thank you, he began. I really appreciate all that you're doing. No trouble at all. Chancy needed my help. She began placing the bandages, scissors, and gauze into her first aid kit. She could feel his eyes on her, assessing her. When the last items were in place, she turned and gave him a pointed look. My sister has been through a rough time. If he were surprised by her comment, he didn't show it. There was a trace of amusement in his light eyes as he motioned at his pants. You sure know how to catch a guy with his pants down, don't you? May I? The comment completely disarmed her, which was probably his intent. Her jaw went slack, and she chuckled. Go ahead. She turned her back in order to allow him some privacy. Okay, he said a minute later. I'm done. When she turned around, he was sitting in the chair. Good. It would have been harder to have a conversation with him if he were standing, towering over her. She rested against the desk. He obviously had a dry sense of humor, but she wasn't going to allow him to deter her from the objective. As I was saying, Chancy has been through a hard time. He nodded. Yes, she has. I don't want to see her hurt. His eyes widened a smidgen, and she thought she might have seen his jaw tighten but couldn't be sure. There was an enigmatic expression on his chiseled face. Gosh, he was devastatingly handsome. No wonder he had Chancy going weak in the knees. Who wouldn't be affected by him? I would never hurt your sister, he said quietly. Their eyes met, each of them sizing up the other. He looked sincere. Jill liked him, she decided. He was a breath of fresh air compared to the dipwad. 
Her shoulders relaxed a little. Chansey told me today that she wants to break things off with Jake. Gabe looked surprised. Did she tell you? No. She gave him a speculative look. Yeah, I found the timing to be rather peculiar. What do you mean? She's been going out with him for several months now. We all knew he was wrong for her. The guy's a moron. A ghost of a smile flitted over Gabe's mouth. But Chansey never could bring herself to cut him loose. Her eyes met Gabe's. Until now. Even though he tried to hold on to his bland expression, she could tell from the look in his eyes that he was pleased. It struck her then that he was interested in her sister. Jill leaned into him and lowered her voice. Okay, wise guy. You're charming and handsome, I get that. But what I want to know is this. Who are you? Are you really homeless? How could a man like this be living on the streets? She looked at his clear blue eyes. They were kind. He didn't seem angered by her questions. On the contrary, he was patiently enduring her scrutiny with a mildness that surprised her. His mouth moved like he was about to answer, but Wyatt stuck his head in the door. Hun, the movie's starting. Irritation clouded over her. She didn't appreciate being interrupted, especially now, right when she was about to get an answer. Gabe stood. I'll be right there. Wyatt gave her a long look and then nodded. Judging from the expression on his face, it was obvious that he disapproved of her questioning. Regardless of Wyatt's feelings on the subject, she had to find out more about Gabe, for Chansey's sake. Her hand went to her hip. So, are you really homeless? Because you don't act like a homeless person. This time it was Chansey who came to the door. She took one look at the exchange taking place and gave Jill a questioning look. Gabe looked like he was grateful to be rescued. She could only imagine what Jill was saying to the poor man. Come on! The movie's starting and you promised to make everyone some hot chocolate. So I did. Jill let out a dry chuckle and looked at Gabe as if to say, This conversation isn't over. Not by a long shot. Chancy motioned at Gabe's leg. How's the patient? He's doing great. He should be healed enough to go back to his normal life in about a week, Jill said. Chancy gave her little sister a reproving look, which she ignored. Instead, she turned to Gabe and flashed a smile. Nice chatting with you. We'll have to do it again, soon. He smiled and rubbed his neck. Yeah. Gabe, I hope Jill hasn't been beating up on you, Chancy said. Nope, just doing what any good sister would do. Chansey leaned into Jill. What have you been telling him? She hissed. Jill flashed an angelic smile. I don't know what you mean. Before Chansey could react, the doorbell rang. You guys go on in the den and I'll see who's at the door. She went to open it. There stood Janet and Ted. Janet was holding a plate, loaded with cookies and Ted was standing behind her, looking disgruntled. Ted and I saw that a party was going on and decided to join you. She elbowed Ted. Didn't we? Ted rolled his eyes. Yes, this party is much more exciting than the basketball game I was watching. Chancy reached for the cookies. Come in. Here, let me take your coats. We were just about to watch Christmas with the Cranks. Oh, goody, Ted said removing his coat. I can hardly wait. Don't be a buffoon, Ted, Janet warned. Then she winked at Chansey. Chapter 13 Janet looked at the gaunt men in the soup line. They'd been serving for over an hour, and the line was still out the door. Where did all of these people come from? Harriet had gotten everything set up and then left, saying that she had a doctor's appointment. There were only three of them serving, Janet, an older woman named Kay, and Duane. Duane was the 20-year-old, freckle-faced boy she'd met that first time when she came here with Chansey. She'd since learned that a year before, Duane had nearly been homeless. With no home of his own, he was sleeping on the couch of friends and acquaintances. 
his father took off before he was born, and his mother, a druggie, could no longer pay the rent, so they were evicted. Harriet gave Dwayne a full-time job and allowed him to eat his meals at the soup kitchen. With the money he earned, he was able to afford a studio apartment a few blocks from the kitchen. Janet glanced at the clock. The soup kitchen didn't close for another hour, and they were getting low on food. She turned to Dwayne. We need more soup. He wiped his brow and gave her an apologetic look. That's all there is left. What? Janet felt panicked. There was no way they could turn these hungry men away. But what other option did they have? Have you checked the storeroom? Yeah. There are a few cans of beans, but no more soup, he motioned. I just poured the last one in that stockpot about 30 minutes ago. Irritation surfaced. How could they run out of food to serve? Granted, this was a large crowd, but not any larger than the crowd that had gathered the evening she and Chansey helped out. Surely Harriet knew to be prepared in the event they had extra people. How could she have left them high and dry? Duane, take over my spot. I'm going to go to the back and see what else I can find. He shrugged. Okay. Janet left her post and went to the storeroom. She was shocked at how bare the shelves were. To her dismay, she realized that Duane was right. There wasn't any soup or much of anything else. She reached and grabbed a couple of boxes of club crackers, which were on the top shelf. When they ran out of rolls, they could serve crackers with the soup. She left the storeroom and was about to return to the dining hall when she saw the other rooms. There was one just past the storeroom and another across the hall. She wondered, hoped, that there might be food there. She tried the door. It was locked. She tried the other door. Locked. Perplexed, she returned to the dining hall. Kay looked at her, concern etched over her wrinkled face. She cut her eyes at the line of men. We are almost out of soup. What do we do? She whispered. The storeroom was practically empty. Janet held up the boxes of crackers. Except for these. Unless... Duane, do you have a key to the locked doors in the back? Maybe Harriet keeps extra food in those. No, I don't have any key. I've never been in those rooms. Harriet says they're off limits. Off limits? He nodded. That's right. Strange. Strange indeed. Well, what does Harriet do in the event that you run out of food? Do you have her cell number? Maybe we could call her. It won't do you no good. She never answers it when she's out. He shrugged. Besides, we always run out. We serve as many as we can and then turn the rest away. It took a second for his words to sink in. What do you mean, you always run out? How is that possible? Her face twisted in disbelief. Duane used the bottom of his apron to wipe his face. I know it sounds terrible, but that's the way it's been since I got here. Harriet always says that the early bird gets the worm. I guess we don't have enough people donating to the kitchen. She looked at Kay for confirmation, and the grandmother of six nodded her head in agreement. No, that couldn't be right. It was Janet's understanding that the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation was funding the soup kitchen. Something wasn't adding up. You bet your best boots she was going to have a talk with Chansey about it. But now she had to figure out what to do about their current situation. There were three large stockpots. One was half full and the other two only a quarter of the way full. She looked at the faces of the expectant men and it only took her a second to make a decision. She started untying her apron. Only fill the bowls half full and give them each a few crackers when the rolls run out. I'm going to run to the grocery store and pick up more soup. I'll be back. A short while later, Janet returned. To save herself the trouble of hauling the soup in through the front, she decided to park around the back and go in through the door nearest the kitchen. As she pulled her car into an empty space, She was surprised to see Harriet in the parking lot, in a heated discussion with a man wearing a dress shirt and slacks. 
He had a thin face and black hair. She wondered what a man like that was doing here and why he would be arguing with Harriet. Her boyfriend or husband, maybe? No, the man was at least ten years younger than Harriet, and he seemed like the corporate, straight-laced type, with his starched shirt and short haircut. The two were an unlikely pair, and their exchange was anything but friendly. Harriet looked startled to see Janet, but her recovery was quick. She plastered on a smile. Hi, sugar. What you doing back here? We ran out of soup, so I went to the store to get more. Accusation hung heavy in her voice. Harriet gave her gum a good go-round. Yeah, that happens. That sure was good of you to get more, though. I'm late for an appointment, the man muttered. Without saying another word, he hurried to his car, a Mercedes. Janet began unloading the bags. Harriet rushed to her side. Here, let me help. Who was that guy? Oh, him. He's thinking about buying the building across the street and was asking if I knew who owns it. Sure he is, and I'm married to the Pope. Did Harriet think she was a blooming idiot? Whatever it was that she and the man were discussing, it certainly wasn't about some building across the street. He was dressed awfully nice for this part of town. What kind of business is he thinking of opening? Hesitation clouded Harriet's eyes. A pawn shop. The cans were heavier than she thought, and Janet's muscles strained in protest as she went into the building with Harriet close on her heels. She put the bags on the floor of the kitchen and took a deep breath, trying to recover from the physical exertion. She really did need to spend a little more time on the treadmill and less time stuffing her face. A pawn shop? Really? Harriet dumped the bags on the floor. Yes, she said definitively. A pawn shop. She wrinkled her nose. In case you haven't noticed... There aren't a lot of other stores and businesses around here. A look of panic crept into Harriet's eyes. Bingo. She had her, and Harriet knew it. Harriet's shoulders slumped in defeat. Okay. He wasn't here to talk about a pawn shop. Janet gave her a vindicated look. She stood there waiting for an explanation. Harriet glanced over her shoulder leaned in close to Janet, and spoke in a conspiratorial tone. He's my boyfriend. A laugh bubbled up in Janet's throat, and she swallowed it back down. She took in Harriet's bleached hair that was a mile high and the candy apple red lipstick, the tight sweater and leggings, the red high-heeled boots, not to mention the way the woman was noisily chomping on her gum. Janet lifted an eyebrow. Your boyfriend? Yeah, we've been going out for a while now, but I don't want anyone to know. She gave Harriet a skeptical look. It's true. Harriet looked her in the eye. What? You think a man like that wouldn't have anything to do with me? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what she was thinking, but there was no way she was going to admit it. No, I'm not saying that at all. She began removing soup cans from bags and stacking them on the counter. Why the secret? We don't want our children to know. Your children? This was getting stranger by the minute. Yeah. He has two daughters and I have a son. I've been on my own for years, but Drake's recently divorced. Our kids are having a hard time seeing us with other people so we decided to keep it on the down-low while we test out the relationship to see if things will work between us. No sense getting everyone's drawers and a wad for nothing. Janet chuckled despite herself. I hear ya. Harriet trailed her red nails through her hair. Life gets complicated sometimes. Yes, it certainly does. Janet switched gears. Hey, I noticed that the storeroom is practically empty. Are you getting enough food? I thought the soup kitchen was funded by the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. Yes and no. We do receive money from the Foundation for the Utilities 
and the upkeep of the building, payroll, etc., but we depend on donations for the bulk of our food. Oh, I hadn't realized that. She made a mental note to ask Chansey about that. Yep, that's the way it works. Harriet looked at the soup and rolls. Thanks for buying these things. It about kills me when we run out of food, and I have to turn those poor souls away. You're welcome. Yeah, I couldn't stand the thought of it either. She motioned at the food she'd just purchased. Obviously. They laughed. Give me your receipt, and I'll reimburse you for it. No need, Janet said quickly. Harriet gave her an appraising look. Well, aren't you just a dear? Janet chuckled. Try telling my husband that. Janet punched the doorbell a couple of times. When no one answered, she opened the door and stepped inside. Knock, knock, she called. She heard movement as Chansey came around the corner. Oh, hey. Her hair was wet like she'd just gotten out of the shower. Come on in. I'm getting ready to go to dinner with Jake. They went into the kitchen. Janet arched an eyebrow. Jake? Chansey made a face. Yeah, unfortunately. Why Jake? You and that hunk of a handyman you keep hidden out back seemed pretty cozy the other night. I just assumed... Heat rose in Chansey's face, and she wrinkled her nose. I do like him. Her eyes were dancing. Was it that obvious? A smile played on Janet's lips. You were only beaming bright enough for the neighbors across the street to see. She put a hand over her mouth. Oh, no. Janet laughed and made a flourish in the air. I'm teasing. As usual, you were the picture of class, my dear. Chansey grew serious. I like him. I like him, too, Janet said, squeezing her hand. I'm really happy for you. Gabe seems like a great guy. Then she remembered how they'd gotten on this conversation. If you like him so much, then why are you going to dinner with Jake? I'm breaking up with him. I didn't think it was right to tell him over the phone. Janet raised her hands in the air. Hallelujah! Chansey groaned. Not you, too. Everyone keeps saying that. Jake's not a bad person. He's just... Uptight, controlling, and short. He's not that short. He's nearly six feet tall. Just because Ted and Gabe are tall doesn't mean that we get to bag on the shorter men of the world. Janet laughed. You've got me there. She was perched on the edge of a bar stool with her elbows propped on the island. Okay, I could talk to you all day, but you need to get ready, and I did come over here for a reason. What's going on? She told her about the conversation she'd had earlier with Harriet. When she finished, Chansey began shaking her head back and forth. No, that's not correct. The Maxwell Hamilton Foundation funds 100% of the soup kitchen. I know because I helped Max set it up. That's what I thought, Janet said. And you say they've been running out of food nearly every day? Yep. Chansey blew out a breath. Something's wrong. I agree. I think it's time I paid a visit to the Foundation. I want to ask Stockton what in the world is going on. Stockton Sanderson was the CEO and one of Max's closest friends. If anyone knew what was going on with the soup kitchen, it would be Stockton. He'd called her several times over the past few months, asking her to let him know if she or the kids needed anything. And while she appreciated the gesture, she couldn't stand the thought of walking into Max's old office, knowing that he was no longer there. But in light of the current problem... She picked up her cell phone and punched in the familiar number. The Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. How may I direct your call? Stockton Sanderson's office, please. Wait one minute while I transfer your call. Stockton's assistant came on the line. Stockton Sanderson's office. How may I help you? This is Chansey Hamilton. 
she fought to remember his assistant's name. A man in his late thirties? But it was a blank. There was a slight pause. Um, yes, Mrs. Hamilton. Would you like to speak to Stockton? Please. One moment. A few minutes later, she had an appointment to meet with Stockton the following day. She ended the call and looked at Janet. Okay, we'll find out what's going on. Good. Chancy looked at the clock. Now I need to get ready for my date. When Chancy arrived at the Cheesecake Factory, she wasn't surprised to see Jake standing out front, waiting for her. She got the feeling that he'd been pacing back and forth in front of the restaurant. When he saw her, he gave her a stiff smile, followed by a peck on the cheek. It was a simple gesture, but she could tell it was forced. His smile seemed to be fixed into place, and she noticed that his jaw was tight. Maybe he realizes what's coming, she thought. They made small talk in the waiting area until the hostess approached them. Your table is ready. They followed her. Before she realized what was happening, Jake stepped up behind her and put a protective hand on the small of her back, maneuvering her through the restaurant. Her first impulse was to wiggle out of his grasp, but she didn't want to make a scene. It was obvious that the guy wasn't very good at picking up on body language. When they took their seats, the hostess handed them the menus. Your server will be right with you. Jake barely acknowledged that the woman had spoken. He was too busy trying to make eye contact with Chansey. Awkward. Chansey smiled at the hostess. Thank you. Chansey, I... His voice was a caress, and he looked at her with hopeful eyes. She felt sick, thinking about what she was about to do. A guy in his mid-twenties approached the table. Good evening. My name is Steve, and I'll be your server this evening. Can I get your drink order? He began listing the available beverages in a smooth, professional tone. I'll have water with lemon, and she'll have a club soda, Jake said. Also, could you bring us some of your Southwest egg rolls? The server nodded. I'll give you a few minutes to look over the menu while I get your drinks. He moved to leave. Wait a minute, Chansey blurted. The server paused. She gave Jake a frosty look. I don't want club soda. She offered the server an apologetic smile that said, My date's an idiot. Don't pay any attention to him. I would like a strawberry lemonade, please. The server gave her a curt nod. Of course. Why did you do that? Do what? Order for me. He gave her a placating smile. The couple of times we came here, you ordered club soda. I just assumed. He looked wounded. I thought you'd be glad I noticed. I was trying to impress you. I guess it didn't work. No, it didn't. Her shoulders felt tight. I don't need you to order my drink for me, Jake. He held up a hand. Okay, it won't happen again. His eyes met hers and she could tell he was searching her face. Is this about the drink or something else? There was no easy way of doing this, and it was probably better to go ahead and get it over with. Her stomach was tied in knots. The last thing she wanted to do right now was eat. She gave him a tender look, searching for the right words. When we first met, her throat was dry and the words cracked. She cleared her throat and began again. When we first met, I was in a very dark place. He reached for her hand. Jake. It's okay. Whatever it is, you can tell me. His eyes were practically glowing, and he was staring at her like she was Aphrodite. She wished she had an ounce of Jill's candor. It would really come in handy right about now. She took a deep breath and removed her hand from his. She saw his jaw tighten. The server returned with their drinks. She took a sip of the lemonade before continuing. When Max died, my world crumbled. I didn't know how I would survive, much less how I would take care of my kids. Then you came along and helped me get back on my feet. I told you, Chansey, I'll always be there for you. She felt like she would explode. 
Was he really that thick-headed? Could he not see she was trying to break up with him? Jake, I'll never forget the kindness that you gave to me and my family. Of course. The server placed an assortment of bread on the table. Your appetizer will be right out. He removed the pad from his pocket. Have you had a chance to look over the menu? Jake nodded. I know what I want. I'll have the chicken Bellagio. I would like to add a side salad with that. Vinaigrette dressing. And you, miss? What would you like? She'd not had time to look at the menu. She'd not even had time to think about what she wanted. What's your soup of the day? Broccoli cheese? I'll have that. Would you also like a salad? No, just the soup. She gave him a brief smile as she handed him the menu. I'll get this order in and we'll come back to check on you. Jake gave her a questioning look. Only soup? Yes, I'm not very hungry. He helped himself to an egg roll. She also placed one on her plate, although she didn't touch it. She needed to clear the air. As I was saying, I really appreciate everything you've done. She uttered a silent prayer in her mind. Please, help me to tell him without hurting him too badly. Jake, I don't know how to tell you this, but it's over. He looked stupefied. What? I've thought about this a million different ways, but the truth is that you and I are just too different, and the kids... His eyebrows furrowed. What about the kids? He demanded, an edge to his voice. You and Travis don't get along at all. I think it's time I put aside my personal wishes and focused on my kids. That's ridiculous. His face was growing redder by the minute. I'm so tired of tiptoeing around Travis. He needs to grow up and realize. Travis is my first priority, she cut in. And furthermore, I don't like the way you've been treating him. He crumpled his napkin in his fist. Chancy, don't you see? The kids will come around. You have to do what's best for you. I am doing what's best for me. Her voice rose, catching the attention of the couple sitting near them. He rocked back, stricken, hurt washing over his face. Jake, I consider you a good friend, but I don't have romantic feelings for you. No, that's not true. He started shaking his head back and forth. Yes, she countered. It is. I didn't realize it before, but I'm getting my footing and I'm starting to see things clearly. She kept her gaze steady so he would understand that she meant what she was saying. I can't believe this. He gave her a scathing look. Ire pricked up her back, causing her to go stiff. What? I piece you back together, and now that you're on your feet, you dump me. His eyes cut into hers. You're making a big mistake. Her blood ran cold. Had he just threatened her? Fear slithered up her throat as she spoke. I'm sorry you see it that way. I never intended to hurt you. Her eyes grew moist. She moved to stand, but he caught her arm. Don't go, his voice broke. Please, not like this. She sat back down. Remove your hand from my arm. He looked shocked, but tightened his grip on her arm. Now! He made an exaggerated effort of removing his hand. Is that better? She grabbed her purse. I've got to get home and check on the kids. But your dinner? I'm not hungry anymore. She looked across the table at the man she thought she knew. He'd been so kind, so helpful. But there was a dark side to him. A side he tried hard to keep hidden. But she'd caught a glimpse of it when he threatened her. How had she not seen it before? She knew then that she could never be friends with this man. Suddenly she wanted to get as far away from him as possible. He smirked. It's about that homeless guy, isn't it? I saw the way you were looking at him, the way he was looking at you. She let out an incredulous laugh. This is ridiculous. I don't owe you an explanation. I'm a grown woman and I'll do what I please. She looked him in the eye. You stay away from me. 
This time, she stood. The server was bringing the food, and she nearly mowed him over in her attempt to get by. Chancy, she heard Jake call after her. Don't leave like this, please. Humiliation burned through her veins as all eyes in the restaurant looked at her. Without another word, she turned and fled. A headache was pounding across the bridge of her nose by the time Chancy got home. Thankfully, Travis had already put Susie to bed and was watching a movie in his room. She looked down at her phone and realized that she had a message from Jill. Hey, sis. Just wanted to remind you about the Christmas concert tomorrow night in the conference center. Now that Jake's officially out of the picture, you might want to ask Gabe if he would like to go in his stead. Seeing as how we have this extra ticket, she let out a deviant giggle. Let me know. Chancy made a face. I'm glad you find my mixed-up life so amusing, she said out loud. Was the concert tomorrow? She'd completely forgotten about it. Tickets to see the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's Christmas performance were hard to come by. The end of October, Jill had gone onto the website and put them all in the lottery. She'd been ecstatic when she learned that they'd gotten tickets. Then another thought struck her. She didn't have a babysitter for Susie. She'd been planning on asking Janet if she could watch her during the night of the concert, but it had totally slipped her mind. She picked up her phone. Hey, Janet, it's me. I know this is last minute, and if you can't, I'll understand. It was with a sigh of relief that Chancy ended the call. Janet had readily agreed to watch Susie. Thank goodness for Janet. She couldn't believe she'd forgotten about the concert. She'd been so looking forward to it. Where was her brain? Even as the question ran through her mind, she instantly knew the answer. Jake. She kept seeing the look of malice on his face when he told her she was making a big mistake. A shiver ran down her spine. She'd expected him to be upset, but never had she expected him to react so vehemently. To accuse her of using him to get well and then dumping him because of Gabe, that was going too far. It was in that instant that Jill's question came rushing back to her. Why are you just now getting the nerve to break things off with Jake? She filled the teapot. A cup of herbal tea would warm her up. She glanced toward the back apartment. The lights were still on. Was Gabe the underlying factor responsible for her breakup with Jake? She plopped down in a chair. Jake was so controlling and hard to deal with. Thank goodness it was finally over. She jumped when she heard the knock. A thrill ran through her when she saw Gabe standing at the back door. She went to answer it. Hi. Hey. He was wearing a pair of Max's jeans and a long-sleeved charcoal gray shirt. He looked good. She paused only a second before inviting him in. She motioned. Have a seat. I was just about to make myself a cup of herbal tea. Would you like a cup? He shifted from one foot to the other. I don't want to intrude on your evening. She let out a dry chuckle. No intrusion. I can promise you that. He smiled, lightening his features. You talked me into it. She retrieved two cups before going to the pantry and pulling out a box of cinnamon orange tea. She just sat down across from him when the kettle whistle went off. She got up. A few minutes later, she handed him a warm cup. He lifted it to his nose and inhaled appreciatively. Thank you. For some reason, the simple gesture sent warmth rushing over her. She felt a twinge of panic, wondering if they would have anything to talk about, but her fears were quickly put to rest. He looked at her over the rim of his cup. I'd like to start putting down the floors tomorrow, but I'll need a few more supplies. She jumped to action, grabbing a pad and pen from the junk drawer. What do you need? He began calling out various items and she jotted them down. I'll run to the hardware store and pick these things up. She did a mental calculation. She would have to go after her appointment with Stockton. Then she would have to rush home and get Susie ready to go to Janet's, along with her and Travis ready for the concert. 
Thank you. No, thank you. A comfortable silence settled between them, and he leaned back in his chair and stretched out his long legs. A pang went through her. Max used to do the same thing. Are you okay? Yes. Why? You had a funny look on your face. Was she that transparent? She smiled. I'm fine. It has been a rough night. He gave her a long look. I'm sorry. Care to talk about it? Her first reaction was no, but what could it hurt? And besides, she had to find a casual way to invite him to the concert tomorrow night. She took a drink of the herbal tea and then relaxed into the chair. I ended things with Jake tonight. I'm sorry, he said mechanically. Yeah, me too. He looked crestfallen. Really? There was something boyish about the way his lower lip jutted out. She had the urge to push it back in. Gabe liked her. The knowledge sent a tingle shooting through her. A smile played around her lips as her eyes met his. I'm not sorry. Good. She lifted an eyebrow, but it didn't seem to faze him. The corners of his lips lifted slightly in what she could only assume was amusement. So what happened? She let out a breath. What didn't happen? She collected her thoughts. We met at the Cheesecake Factory at City Creek for dinner. I told him that I just want to be friends. His chuckle stopped her short. Oh, no. Not the friend conversation. The comment took her by surprise, and she laughed. It was amazing how comfortable Gabe made her feel. Suddenly the events of the night didn't seem as ominous. She winced. Yeah, he didn't take it well. He shook his head. No, I don't suppose he did. When Max died, her eyes misted and she looked away. Before she realized what was happening, he reached across the table and took her hand. Her breath caught and she couldn't help but compare Gabe's touch to Jake's. Earlier, when Jake took her hand, she felt trapped. But this was different. She liked the largeness of his hand and how it fit over hers. His touch was light, comforting. She looked at him. His expression seemed to be saying that it was okay for her to continue. She could tell him things about her past, and he would understand. When Max died, I fell apart. If Jake hadn't come along when he did, well, I don't know what would have happened. I owe Jake a lot. Do you love him? What? Do you love him? The question was spoken easily enough. Why was the answer so difficult? Her forehead wrinkled in consternation as she wrestled with the question. I care for him, she finally said. Love and caring are two different things, he murmured. He began rubbing circles over the top of her hand with his thumb. A wave of desire started at her neck and melted through to her toes. No, I don't love him, not like that. She became aware of her own breathing and how the blood was pulsing through her veins. Her eyes went to his lips and then to the faint stubble lining his jaw. She never thought she'd feel such feelings again, and they were intoxicating. Like eating a sundae after you've been forced to exist on a diet of bread and water. What happens now? You take me in your arms and kiss me senseless. I don't know, she admitted. He squeezed her hand. We don't have to figure it out tonight. A smile played on her lips. This conversation was reminiscent of the one she had with Jill. Or tomorrow. Or the day after. She was disappointed when he let go of her hand. Then again, it was the sensible thing to do and she respected him for that. There was no need to rush things. She placed both hands around the cup of tea. So, tomorrow night... She licked her lips, feeling a flutter of nervousness not sure how to go about asking a guy out. This was way out of her comfort zone. 
Anyway, Travis and I, along with Jill and her crew, are going to the Christmas concert at the conference center. We have an extra ticket, and I was wondering, um, I mean, if you don't have anything else going... Heat rose in her face, and she felt like a complete idiot. He was homeless and living in her back apartment. Of course he didn't have anything else better to do. His eyes sparkled, and he gave her a quirky grin. Well. Let me check my schedule. He lifted his cup and looked into it, and then back at her. The cup says I'm free. She burst out laughing. Sorry, I'm a little out of practice. It's been a while since I've asked anyone out on a date. Um, well, I don't think I've ever asked anyone on a date before. He cocked his head. A date, huh? Her eyes went wide, and for a split second she thought she'd stepped over the line. But then she realized he was teasing her. A date, he repeated. He gave her a lazy look that sent her heart fluttering. I like the sound of that. He turned up his cup and drank the last of his tea. Thanks for the herbal tea. He gave her an intimate look. And the conversation. He stood, and she followed suit. They put their cups in the sink. Her heart started beating wildly, and she wondered if he might kiss her. But he went to the door. When he reached it, he turned. His expression was thoughtful. Hey, one more question. Yes? Did you say you met Jake at City Creek tonight? Where was this coming from? She'd forgotten all about Jake for a few minutes and didn't want to have to think about him again. Her voice was wary. Yes. Why? He didn't pick you up and drop you off? No. Why? It's probably nothing. Her senses went on full alert. What? Before I came to the back door, I was putting the garbage cans out beside the road. I saw his SUV go by. Fear stabbed at her, making her go weak in the knees. A silver pathfinder? He nodded. Are you sure it was him? He paused, studying her expression. Yeah, I saw his face. He didn't look happy. She felt shaky and could feel a panic attack coming on. Gabe caught her arm. Steady. Take a deep breath. Let it out slowly. He led her to a chair and helped her sit down. He knelt down beside her. Are you okay? Tears brimmed in her eyes. I don't know, she said truthfully. Tonight, when I broke things off, he told me I was making a big mistake. Gabe's eyes went hard. He threatened you? She thought back. Yes. No. She hugged her arms. I don't know. He searched her face. Did you feel threatened when he said it? She nodded slowly. Yes. I saw a side of him tonight that scared me, but he was upset. That's what had been bothering her about the evening, the sick feeling that came over her when she looked into Jake's eyes, the realization that he was not the man she thought he was. Do you think I'm overreacting? Gabe considered the question. His gut reaction was that Chansey was not overreacting. He'd not liked Jake from the get-go, But was that because he snubbed him, or did his aversion come from something more concrete? That he looked familiar bothered Gabe. He kept racking his brain, trying to figure out where he knew him from. No, I don't think you're overreacting. It's always better to be safe than sorry. He knew from past experience on the force that the law was designed to solve crimes after they'd been committed. Unfortunately, There wasn't a whole lot of recourse for someone who simply felt threatened. Jake would have to practically attack her before anyone on the force would or could do anything. It's possible that he drove by tonight in an attempt to take one last look at your home before moving on. She looked hopeful. Yeah, I didn't think about that. I'll keep an eye out for him. His eyes met hers. I won't let anything happen to you or the kids. You have my word. 
She believed him. Thank you, she uttered. It wasn't until later on, after she was in bed, that Chancy thought of something. Jake had accused her of dumping him because of Gabe. I've seen the way he looks at you, he said, the way you look at him. When had Jake seen them together? Was he referring to the night they first met, when Gabe saved Travis? No, that couldn't have been it. Jake had been watching her. Was he the one that broke into the house? The alarm never went off, and Jake knew the code. He could have disarmed it the first time he entered the house, and then armed it when he left. That's the real reason he was at the back door at 3.30 in the morning. He'd been so quick to grab the butcher knife and charge off into the night, looking for the perpetrator. No wonder he'd not been concerned. He knew there was no one out there. And like a petrified sheep, she'd rushed into his arms, had allowed him to spend the night. She moaned as panic raced through her body, swift and paralyzing. Then her mind flitted to that other night, the night when she had the vivid dream about Gabe. She'd felt someone in her room, and then Susie saw a man by the window. Susie had also seen Jake at Temple Square. The room began to swirl, and she pulled the covers tighter around her. Earlier tonight, she'd nearly gone into a panic attack, but thanks to Gabe, she'd been able to get it under control. Now, alone in the dark, the demons that arose out of the shadows were terrifying. Her throat was closing, and she struggled to get a good breath. She knew from experience that she needed to relax and let it pass, but how could she do that, knowing that Jake was out there? Her breath came in shallow gasps, and she felt like she would smother. She lifted a silent plea to heaven. Help me, please. She tried to concentrate on breathing in and out and just as she was on the verge of passing out, her throat relaxed. She gulped in a ragged breath. Her chest expanded, and she felt the blessed air enter her body. Thank you, she whispered, knowing that her prayer had been answered immediately. She was bathed in sweat and began shivering. Hastily, she got up to change clothes. Then the anger took hold. She would not allow Jake to scare her. The fact that Gabe was close by was a huge comfort, and he was watching out for her. She would get Wyatt to come over and change the security code tomorrow. Having decided that, she felt better. And when she climbed into bed, it didn't take her long to fall into a restful sleep. Chapter 14 Gabe pulled his iPhone from the drawer of the dresser where he'd hidden it. He looked at the screen. He'd missed four text messages, three from the same person. It had been a glorious few days, being here with Chansey and the kids. He could almost pretend that he was the simple homeless man Chansey presumed him to be. Jill, on the other hand, had seen straight through the facade. Thankfully, the conversation had been interrupted before things got out of control. He'd never expected to meet someone like Chansey, had thought he was doomed to spend the rest of his life alone. Life was funny that way, hitting you with a surprise when you least expected it. That night he rescued Travis. He'd seen a boy in trouble and then instinct took over. He'd saved him, expecting nothing in return. When Susie let it slip that her dad was Maxwell Hamilton, he'd nearly laughed out loud at the irony. Fate certainly had a sense of humor, that was for sure. He wondered what Chansey would think when she learned the truth. It hurt him to deceive her, but what other choice did he have? He had to let things play out. That's the way it was, and the sooner he accepted it, the better. He'd known the risks from the beginning. His feelings for Chansey were getting in the way, but he was in too deep to give her up, and she needed his help. The letters on the screen of his phone were an ominous reminder that regardless of how he felt about Chansey, he would have to finish what he'd started. He began reading the first text. Where are you? 
We need to talk ASAP. Meet me at the rendezvous spot tomorrow at our usual time or I will replace you. He began typing a response. Will do. He looked at the next text. It read, You know the rules. I need to know where you are at all times. Contact me immediately. He didn't respond to this one, but turned off his phone and placed it back in the drawer, tucking it underneath the clothes. He stripped off his jeans and shirt, throwing them across the nearby chair. He climbed into bed and lay there, but sleep wouldn't come. He kept seeing the terrified expression on Chansey's face when she learned that Jake had driven by the house. He thought back to when Chansey had told him she thought someone was in the house, and then Susie saw a man in her room. Anger burned through him. If that sleaze bucket knew what was good for him he would stay far away from Chansey and her family. Nothing incensed him more than cowardly men who got their jollies out of scaring women. He closed his eyes, thinking of Chansey and her long blonde hair and full lips. She was a classic beauty, and he'd been drawn to her from that first night they met. He remembered how it felt to have his hand over hers. He could tell from the look in her eyes that she'd wanted him to kiss her, and it had taken every ounce of control he could muster to keep from doing just that. Kissing her would have ruined everything. He could see that she needed time, time to sort things out in her mind. It hadn't even been a year since the poor woman's husband had passed away. He, of all people, knew that the grieving process couldn't be rushed. Who was he kidding? It had been several years since Miriam passed, and he was still grieving. These past few days, he'd felt more human than he'd felt in years. He was surprised that he was capable of feeling anything for another person, but there was no denying that he felt something for Chansey. He clenched his fist, vowing that he wasn't going to let some putts scare her. She'd been through too much already. Christmas was fast approaching. He was close, so close to what he'd been working for. Soon, he would be able to finally put the past behind him. He drifted off to sleep, thinking about Chansey. Soon, he promised himself. Soon, it would all be finished. Gabe awoke early the next morning and left before anyone could see him. He left a note on the kitchen table telling Chansey that he was going out and would be back around ten. She was picking up the supplies for the floor and he could work on it until they left for the concert. It was still dark outside and cold. Spending a few days indoors had made him soft. The neighborhood looked deserted except for the occasional car that passed. He pulled his coat tighter around himself, feeling grateful for the goose-down coat Chansey had loaned him. It was obviously an expensive coat, and he'd thought about grabbing his shabby one instead but wearing this made him feel closer to Chansey. The wind picked up, and he felt the first snowflakes falling from the sky as he quickened his pace. He was near jogging by the time he reached the bus stop. Twenty-five minutes later, he was standing beside the back door of the soup kitchen. Snow was coming down harder, and he huddled close to the building to avoid being pummeled by the storm. He pulled out his phone and checked the time. It was seven o'clock on the dot. As if on cue, a car turned into the parking lot, the cylindrical beams from the headlights highlighting the swirling snowflakes. Harriet would be grateful for the snow because it would keep people from coming out this early. Harriet got out of the car. Gabe stepped forward as she reached the door, and she jumped, startled. I didn't see you there. There was a hint of accusation in her voice. She looked him up and down. The way she appraised him with those expressionless cold eyes reminded him of a reptile, sizing up its prey. You're here. Her voice was flat. I honor my commitments. She arched an eyebrow. Commitment? She pursed her red lips as a trace of amusement flickered across her heavily made-up face. He kept his expression neutral, even though it got under his skin that she was so condescending to the very people she was supposedly trying to help. She jabbed her key in the door and unlocked it. 
Gabe followed her in, grateful for a short reprieve from the cold. Harriet put her purse on the counter and got down to business. We don't have much time. The vans are due to arrive at 7.30. We have to get this stuff out of here before anyone arrives. Too many people have been asking questions. Gabe cupped his hands and blew on them in order to warm them. Okay. Lead the way. Where's your help? Help? You'll need help getting this stuff out to the van. Her words came out clipped. This isn't your first rodeo. I told you last time that you would need someone to help. Yeah. He shoved his hands in his pockets. Wasn't able to find anyone. He gave her an apologetic smile. Sorry. It's just me. She cursed under her breath. It's impossible to get good help these days. You homeless people are all alike. She gave him a scathing look. He was tempted to put this woman in her place here and now, but there was too much at stake, so he acted like she would expect him to. He looked down at the floor, not meeting her gaze, silently enduring her tongue lashing. She called him a few more names before throwing her hands in the air. This is a waste of time. You obviously don't have sense enough to even understand what I'm saying. I'll have to get the van drivers to help. A few minutes later, the vans arrived. The driver, a muscular, heavily tattooed man, backed a couple of feet from the back door. Then, he got out and began helping Gabe load the goods into the van. When it was full, the other driver backed his van to the door and helped Gabe load the remainder of the merchandise into it. Finally, an hour later, they were done. Gabe assumed a casual stance and stood close enough so that he could hear the conversation that was taking place between Harriet and the tattooed man, but far enough away so as not to arouse suspicion. Tell CJ that I'll have another van load for him at the end of the week. She held out her hand. I believe you have something for me. The man handed her a manila envelope. She opened it and looked inside. Tell CJ it's a pleasure doing business with him. The man nodded. Harriet watched the vans drive away, and then she turned. She seemed surprised to see Gabe standing there. Waiting to get paid, I presume, she said dryly. He nodded and looked away. She glanced over her shoulder as if she were afraid someone might be watching them. The snow had stopped, but the wind was picking up. Not here. Let's go inside. Gabe followed her down the hall and to the room off the kitchen where she turned her back to him and reached in the envelope. Then she turned and handed him a couple of folded bills. He took the money and looked at it. Really? She was only paying him $200 for everything he was doing? This is for today. There'll be more after the next job is done. She put the envelope on the counter and reached for her purse. She handed him a scrap of paper. The address for the job tomorrow night. You are to be there at 2 a.m. sharp. He looked at the paper, instantly realizing it was the address of the most exclusive home in Chansey's neighborhood. You know where it is? Yes. This is the big hall, the one we've been waiting for. Her watery eyes glittered with avarice. Harriet didn't have to tell him that. He'd taken one look at the address and realized that it was the Weatherford Mansion. Only one woman lived there, the 70-something-year-old widow of the late Harrison Weatherford. Maxine Weatherford was the sole heiress to one of the largest fortunes in the West. You'll have to be extra careful. This is the last one in this neighborhood, for the time being. People are starting to get suspicious. Harriet was an idiot. It was pure foolishness to hit a series of homes in the same neighborhood. Now that the neighborhood was on alert, the likelihood of being caught was increased a hundredfold. Are you sure about this? What? The Weatherford Mansion? A look of surprise washed over her face, and she looked at him with a new appreciation. You knew from looking at the address, she mused. I know more than you think he countered. 
Her eyes lifted to his, and he could tell that she was amused, intrigued. Well, smart man, did you also know that the house is empty? He looked skeptical. Maxine Wutherford is a recluse. She never leaves the house, even has her groceries brought in. She laughed. You have done your homework. She cocked her head. Tell me again how it was that you ended up homeless? His face went a shade darker. That's none of your business. He has a bite, she giggled. Lovely, she sighed. If you must know, my source tells me that Maxine Weatherford did the unthinkable. She left yesterday for a trip to New York. Evidently, her sister is on her deathbed. We'll never have another chance like this. He shook his head. It's too risky. People in the neighborhood are on edge. They're hyper-vigilant right now. Why risk it? Why not hit another neighborhood until things cool down? Her face went as red as her lips, and her eyes began to blaze. He had the fleeting impression that she was transforming into a wrinkled tomato with very bad hair. You don't know anything about the neighborhood. From the way you talk, it sounds like you live there. She scoffed. Get real. She glared up at him. How dare you question me? I call the shots here. Do you? His voice was amused. Conversational. I'm starting to wonder. It seems to me that you're answering to someone else. A nasty expression smeared over her face. Don't forget where you came from, pretty boy. When I found you, you were digging in a garbage can for your next meal. She snapped her fingers. That fancy new coat you're wearing, those clothes, who do you think paid for them? She pointed to her chest. Me. And I can take it all away so fast it'll make your head spin. Don't cross me, or you'll regret it. What a loathsome creature she was, preying on the helpless. It took effort to keep his expression bland. He eyed the manila envelope. I'm just wondering who the bulk of that money's going to. Something tells me that it isn't you. Who's calling the shots, Harriet? She jutted out her jaw. Just what are you getting at? I don't think you realize just how valuable I am. His eyes flickered over her. How valuable we can be together. I'm thinking that if you could hook me up with your boss, then we could make some real money. Do you now? She gave him an appraising look, her eyes lingering on his broad chest and tapered waist. It seems I might have misjudged you. Her eyes took on a peculiar light. There's always room for an enterprising young man. She took a step closer to him and trailed a long red fingernail down his cheek. He fought the urge to recoil from her touch. Why don't you enlighten me? She said, her voice husky. I have contacts. Contacts that could put us in the big league. No more of these piddly house robberies. I'm talking large-scale operations, investment scams, corporate theft. She let out a throaty laugh and then trailed a finger across his lips. Whoa, boy, let's not get ahead of ourselves. You take care of this job, and then we'll talk. He manacled her wrists, and her breath caught. I like a man who knows what he wants. The door opened and there stood Janet. She took one look at the scene unfolding and put a hand over her mouth. Her eyes were large saucers. I'm sorry, she stammered. I didn't mean to interrupt. Harriet stepped away and smoothed her hair into place. What are you doing here so early? You're not supposed to be here for another hour. I came in to chop some fresh vegetables to add to the soup to make it go further. Well, aren't you just a little angel? How nice. Harriet forced a smile. Yeah. Janet's voice trailed off, and she looked at Gabe, her eyes shooting daggers through him. Harriet gave her a funny look. Do you two know each other? 
Gabe looked at Janet, silently begging her not to give him away. Discreetly, he put a finger to his lips and then removed it before Harriet could see. Janet gave him a long look. No, we don't know each other. He just looks like someone I know. She gave him a withering look. My mistake. If you'll excuse me, I have some vegetables to chop. When she left the room, Harriet turned, her expression speculative. What was that all about? Gabe spread his hands. Beats me. You know, to come to think of it, the owner of this soup kitchen and the neighbor of that woman was asking about you the other day. I didn't think much of it until now. She crossed her arms. He feigned surprise. I don't even know who that woman is, much less the owner of the kitchen. He shrugged. You heard the woman. She said I look like someone she knows. Maybe the other woman mistook me for the same person. Harriet looked doubtful. Maybe. She gave Gabe a pointed look. I can't afford any mistakes. Her voice grew hard. Mistakes are deadly, if you get my meaning. He looked her in the eye. Loud and clear. A feverish excitement burned through Jake. He couldn't believe his luck. He'd suspected from the beginning that Gabe was a fake, and now he could prove it. Last night in the restaurant, he'd nearly come unglued when Chansey broke up with him. Then he drove by her house and saw Gabe taking out the garbage, as though he were the man of the house. Jake had parked at a distance and watched him go into the kitchen. He saw him kneeling by Chansey, taking her hand. Fearing that Gabe would somehow end up staying the night, Jake decided to park in his usual spot and keep watch, in the driveway of the empty home that was for sale. It was only a couple of doors down from Chansey's house. He dozed off sometime in the night. Something, instinct maybe, prompted him to awake in the early hours of the morning. That's when he saw Gabe leaving the apartment. He'd followed him from the bus stop to the soup kitchen and had parked a safe distance away. He watched as the vans pulled up, and Gabe helped the men load what looked to be stolen merchandise into them. He used the zoom lens on his camera to take pictures. On a couple of shots, he'd even gotten close-ups of his face. He was tempted to rush over to Chansey's house and show her the evidence, but he couldn't be that overt. Chansey would then blame him. No, he had to make it look as though he weren't a part of it. He'd lost sight of Gabe when he went into the soup kitchen. He considered waiting for him to come out to see where he would go, but he was tired, hungry, and in desperate need of a shower. He would go home for a few hours and would then resume his surveillance, for he knew as surely as he was breathing in and out that the louse would end up back at Chansey's place before the day was over. Stockton stood when Chansey entered the room, he came around the desk and gave her a hug. It's so good to see you, he said warmly. Thank you. Chansey's gaze took in what used to be Max's office. She noticed that the art had been changed. Max had put up a collection of paintings of various airplanes. Those had been replaced with modern art pieces that were a conglomerate of random splashes of colors and geometrical shapes. Other than that, the office looked almost the same. The back wall was made up of large glass windows, offering a majestic view of the valley. She could see downtown Salt Lake in the distance. The view was what prompted Max to buy the building. I have a bird's eye view of the valley, he'd said. A torrent of emotions assaulted her and her eyes went moist. She blinked rapidly to stay the tears. She willed herself to concentrate on the task at hand. Stockton motioned. Please, have a seat. He leaned back in his chair. So, how have you been? She gave him a sad smile. I have good days and bad days, but overall I'm doing fine. Even behind his wire-rimmed glasses, she could see the compassion emanating from his eyes. He was in his early sixties and a little on the portly side. A shock of white hair framed his square face. 
Max had always said that Stockton knew how to run a foundation better than anyone he'd ever seen. That came as a comfort to her, as he was now the CEO. How are the kids? They're home from school for the holidays, and as you can imagine, they're thrilled. Yes, my grandchildren are off track right now, too. I think they're driving my daughter crazy, but they're loving it. Chansey laughed. How's Mindy doing? Mindy was Stockton's wife and she'd had fragile health for as long as Chansey had known them. She suffered from fibromyalgia and severe allergies. Mindy's hanging in there. As long as she doesn't overdo it, she seems to be able to manage her illness relatively well. They chatted for a few more minutes until Stockton glanced at his watch. Chansey picked up on the nonverbal cue. He was a busy man and probably had other appointments. She scooted to the edge of her seat. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I need to talk to you about the soup kitchen. Sure. What's going on? She told him about Janet's conversation with Harriet, and how Harriet had told her that the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation only paid for the utilities and payroll, not the food. She could see the concern etching its way over Stockton's face as she spoke. When Max and I first opened the soup kitchen, we set up an endowment that would fund it. That endowment included the purchase of food. Yes, you're right. It was my understanding that the endowment has been doing just that. Not according to Harriet Dean, the soup kitchen's manager. Their eyes met across the desk, and she felt the need to make him understand where she was coming from. It may seem that I'm getting worked up over something trivial, but you have to understand that the soup kitchen's very important to me, and it was important to Max. I know that the foundation does much good all over the world, but the intent of the soup kitchen is to help those in our own community. I'm sure you can understand my concern over how the endowment is being managed. Of course. Stockton scratched his head. My right-hand assistant handles the management of that endowment. Let's get him in here and see if we can find out what's going on. Also, I can have the accountant go over the books to see what's happening. I can assure you that I'll get to the bottom of this ASAP. Thank you. I knew I could count on you. He pushed a button on his phone. Drake, can you please come in my office? A few minutes later, the assistant entered the office. Stockton did the introductions. Drake. I'm sure you remember Chansey Hamilton. Drake held out his hand. It's nice to meet you. Drake, have a seat. He sat down. Even though he was polite on the surface, there was a nervous energy about the man that put Chansey on edge. Maybe it was his closely cropped hair, coupled with his pinched expression, or the way his foot was moving back and forth as if he couldn't sit still. Chansey has been asking about the soup kitchen, and I told her that you are in charge of managing that endowment. Yes, I am. What can I do for you? Chansey licked her lips to respond, but Stockton beat her to it. The kitchen has been running out of food repeatedly. Chansey's friend... Janet, she inserted. Stockton gave her an appreciative nod. Janet spoke to the soup kitchen manager, Harriet Dean, and she told her that the endowment only pays for the utilities and the payroll, but not for the food. He looked pointedly at Drake. Do you know anything about that? Drake's eyes went wide and he looked like he wanted to pass out. Chansey could tell that while Stockton's demeanor was kind, he had zero tolerance for ineptitude. It was obvious that he ran a tight ship. Drake started squirming in his seat, and Chansey felt sorry for him. We write the soup kitchen checks every month. There should be ample money to pay for the food, Drake said. I'm not sure what's wrong. His eyes met Chansey's. Are you sure you're getting the correct information? The insinuation was clear, causing the hair on her neck to stand on end, and to think she'd felt sorry for him. I'm absolutely sure, she fired back, holding eye contact with Drake until he looked away. This didn't sit well with Stockton. He peered over his glasses, 
zeroing in on Drake. I know Mrs. Hamilton well enough to know that if she says there's a problem, then there is. His voice was stern. I have assured her that we will get to the bottom of this immediately. Drake's lower lip started flapping as his explanation rushed out. Mrs. Hamilton, I assure you I meant no disrespect. I just don't understand how the soup kitchen could be running out of food. You have my word that if there's a problem, we'll fix it. Stockton looked satisfied. Very good. I want a complete audit done on the books, going back a year, and then I expect to have a full report come Monday. Yes, sir. Thank you, Drake. That'll be all. Realizing he was being dismissed, Drake hurried out the door. When it was just the two of them again, Chansey gave Stockton an appreciative smile. Thanks for checking into this. He nodded. Drake's thorough and the best assistant I've ever had. I'm sure he'll get to the bottom of it. Yes, I'm sure he will. It was a relief to know that the problem would be fixed. Chansey stood. Thank you for holding down the fort. I know I should have come here sooner, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. These last few months... Her voice trailed off, and she tried to hold back the tears. No apologies necessary. Max was like a brother to me. Losing him was a blow. I can't begin to imagine what you and the kids have been going through. A tear trickled down her cheek. She hastily wiped it away. Thank you. She held out her hand to shake his, but he hugged her instead. If you need anything, you let me know. I promise you that we'll get to the bottom of this problem at the soup kitchen. Drake's mind was spinning. Something had to be done immediately. He sat down behind his desk and willed himself to think through the problem methodically. His level head had kept him out of trouble many times before. With any luck, it would serve him well now. The books would show that he'd been paying the designated amount to the soup kitchen that the endowment required. And when that was settled, Stockton would then start looking into the management of the kitchen, which would lead to Harriet. And he knew Harriet well enough to know that if push came to shove, she'd squeal like a stuck pig. Heck, she'd sell her own sister in order to save herself. He'd warned Harriet that something like this could happen, but she insisted that no one would ever be the wiser. The volunteers won't know the difference, and the men coming through the line don't have sense enough to get out of the rain. None of them will talk. I can assure you of that. So they paid as little as they could toward the upkeep of the soup kitchen and pocketed the rest, an even split between the two of them. It was chump change in comparison to their other venture, and he wondered if this were fate's way of punishing them for being greedy. If tonight's haul was as big as they expected it to be, then he could retire. He would no longer be at Stockton's beck and call. He could do what he wanted. Heck, he could buy himself a little home on the coast somewhere and lounge on the beach for the rest of his life. Reluctantly, he dragged his mind away from the fantasy and back to the problem at hand. About six years ago, when Stockton put him in charge of the endowment, he discovered that Harriet was padding the expenses at the kitchen. He confronted her and learned that she was sending the extra money to her son, who was a medical student at Emory University in Atlanta. At first, he was going to turn her in and be done with it, but then he saw a way to use her crime against her. He blackmailed her into using the kitchen as a front for fencing stolen goods. As it turned out, Harriet had a knack for the business and she readily went along with his plan. Together, they'd pulled off over a hundred robberies in the past five years, and they'd largely done it using homeless people to do the dirty work. That way, they had less risk of being implicated if anything went wrong. The soup kitchen provided the perfect cover for the operation, and no one had suspected a thing until now. Drake had taken great pains to ensure that nothing could be tracked to him. What he hadn't counted on was that a friend of Chansey Hamilton would start volunteering at the soup kitchen. Everything was changing quickly, and the only way he could get out of this unscathed was to adapt with it. 
The way he saw it, there were two loose ends, Harriet and that Janet lady Stockton was talking about. He remembered her. She'd seen him in the back parking lot at the soup kitchen talking to Harriet. A cold sweat broke across his forehead. Janet could identify him, and so could Harriet. Harriet was a great partner, probably the best he'd ever worked with. Underneath her ridiculous appearance was a shrewd businesswoman who wasn't afraid to get her hands dirty. He hated to see her go, but putting emotion into the mix could only lead to trouble. The problem had to be examined analytically, devoid of feeling. The bottom line was this. There were two problems that must be dealt with, eliminated. The solution was staring him in the face, but the question was, did he have the stomach to do what had to be done? An hour later, he'd worked up the courage to face the inevitable. Now he just had to figure out how to do it. Janet swiped her hand across her forehead and then mechanically ladled vegetable soup into a bowl before handing it to the outstretched arm of the man standing in front of her. Take a roll, she instructed, and the water is over there in the corner. The man took a roll and moved on without so much as a nod. The men moved mindlessly through the line like cattle. At first, this had bothered her, and she would scope the eyes of the men, trying to find a human element in the never-ending conveyor belt of downtrodden souls that visited the kitchen daily. But after a few days, the experience became normal. She was starting to recognize a few of the men, especially the ones with facial tics, or the babblers that would hold animated conversations with the air. Today, however, she barely noticed them. Her mind was solely focused on the scene she'd witnessed earlier. Had she made a grave error by not telling Harriet that she knew Gabe? Even though she'd seen it with her own two eyes, she still had a hard time believing that Gabe would be interested in Harriet. The woman didn't have an ounce of class, and she was practically old enough to be his mother. Plus, she'd seen the way he looked at Chansey that night when she and Ted had stopped by unannounced. And why had Gabe wanted her to remain silent? And what about Harriet's so-called boyfriend that she'd seen her with the other day? Immediately after she'd seen Gabe and Harriet together, she called Chansey. But Chansey wasn't answering her phone, probably because she was at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. She'd left her a message asking her to call as soon as she could, but she still hadn't heard from her. It tore her up inside to think that she was going to have to tell Chansey about Gabe, but keeping it from her was unfathomable. Chansey wasn't going to take the news well. She'd been practically glowing when she talked about him the day before. She'd love to get a hold of Gabe and wring his neck, or cut out his lying tongue. Chansey had already been through so much, and she was starting to get better. A large part of her improvement was owed to Gabe, and now she was going to have to tell her. She clutched her hand. It wasn't fair. She didn't know how much heartache one person was capable of experiencing before shutting down completely. She handed the man in front of her a bowl of soup, and then she realized that he kept standing there, staring at her. Okay, keep moving down the line. She spoke the words slowly, enunciating every word so that he would understand. She pointed. The rolls are here. Take one. Water over there. He kept standing there. Can I help you? He handed her a folded paper and moved on down the line. Perplexed, she opened it. I need to talk to you. Meet me out back in fifteen minutes. I need to explain what you saw. Gabe. Fury seized her, and she crumpled the paper in her fist and shoved it in her pocket. There was no way she was meeting that man anywhere. Absolutely not. Fifteen minutes went by, and then twenty, and she was still serving soup. When another man kept standing in front of her, she held out her hand. Without a word, he handed her a folded slip of paper. She opened it. It read, Please, I need your help. She blew out a breath and halfway thought about staying put. 
but she owed it to Chansey to find out what was going on. She looked over at Dewayne, who was handing out napkins and silverware. I'm going out back for a few minutes. I need to make a phone call. If I'm not back in 15 minutes, call the police. He rocked back, shocked. It, is everything okay? Sorry, there's no time to explain. He had a horrified expression on his face, and she realized with a jolt that she'd grown fond of this gangly boy. She put a hand on his arm. I think I'll be fine, but you remember, 15 minutes, if I'm not back, I'll call the police, he assured her. She hurried out the back. Thankfully, Harriet was nowhere to be found. She'd left shortly after they began serving, saying that she had an appointment. But Janet was learning that Harriet was rarely at the soup kitchen. Her heart was practically jumping into her throat as she stepped out the back door where Gabe was waiting. She kept a safe distance from him and stayed close to the door so she could bolt back in if she needed to. He held up his hands. I'm not going to hurt you, Janet, I swear. Who are you, and what in the heck were you doing with Harriet? She seethed her hands itching to punch him in the gut, never mind that he was a hulk. It's not what it looked like, I can assure you that. She rolled her eyes. Yeah, well, I was finding it more than a little hard to believe that you have the hots for Harriet. Not hardly. He gave her a meaningful look. I think you and I both know where my affections lie. If you're trying to tell me they're with Chansey, you're going to have to do better than that. That poor girl has been hurt far too much. I won't allow anyone to hurt her again. Her eyes narrowed. No one. He ran a hand across his jaw, wondering how things had gotten so out of control. First of all, you need to know that I would never do anything to hurt Chansey or the kids. His eyes held hers. She's the best thing that's happened to me in a long time and I'll do everything I possibly can to keep her safe. The corners of her mouth went down. Safe from what? What I'm about to tell you has to stay between us. She let out an incredulous laugh. I don't think you're in the position to be demanding anything, mister. Fair enough. But just hear me out. That's all I'm asking. She considered his words. He sounded sincere, but she was coming to realize that people weren't always what they seemed. Okay, she lifted her chin. I'm listening. Chapter 15 Arrange the planks so that the grains flow together, like so. Once you get a plank in place, you nail it down. Gabe was on his knees, fitting the flooring together. He hammered two nails into place and then motioned for Travis to join him. You give it a go. Travis knelt down beside him. He grabbed a hickory plank and placed it beside Gabe's. Gabe handed him a hammer and a nail. Travis began knocking the nail into the wood. Gabe patted him on the back. See, you've got it. That's all there is to it. We'll start at this end and work our way to the front door. As they worked, Gabe kept replaying the day's events over in his mind. It had been touch and go with Janet, and he still didn't know if she trusted him. He hoped the proof he offered her would be enough to stall for time. A clutch of apprehension tugged at him as he thought about the upcoming job the following night at the Weatherford mansion. He truly hoped, for everyone's sake, that Harriet's source was correct. The last thing he wanted was for some 70-year-old woman to get caught in the crossfire. He was so close to bringing it all to a close, but it was starting to wear on him. He just hoped that everything went according to plan. His mind went to his conversation with Chansey the night before, and he kept seeing her frightened expression when she learned that Jake had driven by the house. His fingers itched to get a hold of that coward. He hoped that Jake was out of the picture for good, but the fact that he threatened her was cause for concern. Arguably, people often made idle threats out of anger. 
But what he didn't tell Chansey was that when Jake drove by and saw him, he had a look of pure hatred on his face. He'd seen enough guys like him to know that his kind didn't back down easily. His gut told him that Jake was skulking around in the shadows and waiting to strike when Chansey least expected it. He glanced at Travis. So, your mom tells me she broke it off with Jake. Yeah, thank goodness. I can't stand that man. His face twisted in disgust. I knew he was a phony from the very beginning. What do you mean? Travis thought for a minute. It's nothing I can put my finger on, but I got the feeling that he wasn't the person he was pretending to be. He was so short-tempered and was always expecting everybody to be perfect. Disappointment settled over Gabe. He'd hoped that Travis would offer him something more concrete, rather than vague impressions, although he had to admit that he'd gotten that same impression around Jake the night they met. Why did he look so familiar? He'd seen him before, he was sure of it, but for the life of him, he couldn't remember where. What does Jake do for a living? He's an architect. For which firm? Heck if I know. He gave Gabe a shrewd look. You seem awfully interested in Jake. Does this have anything to do with my mom? Gabe chuckled. Perceptive boy. Travis gave him a sly smile. You like her. He stopped working and looked Travis in the eye. Yes, he admitted. I like her. He could have added a lot, but he didn't want to scare Travis. It had to be hard on the kid to see his mom with another man. Travis grinned broadly. I knew it. Gabe gave him a tentative look. And you're okay with this? A mischievous twinkle lit Travis's eyes. What makes you so sure she likes you back? Gabe laughed, enjoying the verbal sparring. Travis had a keen wit and spunk, two things he admired. You've got me there. She likes you, Travis said quietly. I can tell. A thrill of pleasure went through Gabe. Then he saw the conflicting emotions dueling on Travis's face. Look, this thing with me and your mom, it's all really new, and I'm not sure what, if anything, will happen. But let me clear the air by saying that I would never try and take the place of your dad. From what I've heard about him, he was a fine man. The finest. Travis's eyes grew misty, and Gabe could tell he was trying to keep his emotions in check. Not wanting to make him uncomfortable, Gabe continued working. Travis surprised him when he spoke. She's a lot better off with you. She needs someone. He paused. That night I was attacked by those thugs. I don't think it was an accident that you were there. I don't think it was an accident that you saved me. Emotion welled in Gabe's chest. Me either. I don't believe in coincidences, he said gruffly. Since Miriam's death, he'd kept his feelings bottled up, refusing to unleash that part of himself. But being here, around this family, he was feeling things he hadn't felt in a long time. He was unaccustomed to talking about things of the heart, but it felt good. It was uncomfortable, but good. Silence settled between them until Travis spoke. My mom needs you. His honesty struck a chord with Gabe. He put a hand on Travis's shoulder. We all need each other. Gabe motioned at the floor. Okay, enough of the mushy stuff. We need to bust a move if we're going to get this floor done before the concert. Travis nodded. Let's do it. Gabe tried to think of a clever way to steer the conversation back around to Jake. Finding none, he decided to play it straight. Okay, back to Jake. Help me out by telling me everything I need to know about him. She broke it off with Jake, remember? Yeah, but I figure if I know all of the dirt on him, then I'll know what not to do. Travis considered this. Okay, I'll tell you all that I know.
A feeling of awe settled over Chansey as she looked at the breathtaking decorations that were done in a Charles Dickens theme. What looked to be hundreds of red poinsettias and greenery adorned the large containers immediately behind the pulpit. They were a colorful contrast to the muted colors of the London-style village that had been constructed for the concert. The twinkling lights from the cluster of Christmas trees added the crowning touch. A Christmas Carol was one of her favorite stories, and she was glad it was the premise for tonight's performance. For the first time, she realized that she was starting to enjoy the holidays. Tonight was the first time that she truly felt like it was Christmas. Her heart lifted, and she allowed herself to get caught up in the excitement of the evening. Jill and her family were sitting on Chansey's immediate left, and Gabe was sitting beside her on the right, with Travis on the other side of him. When Gabe had come to the back door dressed for the concert, she'd done a double take. He looked like he'd stepped out of a GQ magazine, making it hard to believe he was the same homeless man she'd taken pity on and let stay in the back apartment. She'd made a point of making sure that Gabe had nice clothes to wear so that he wouldn't feel uncomfortable. Thankfully, he and Max were close to the same size and build. For months, Jill had been after her to get rid of Max's clothes. She'd acquiesced by moving Max's things out of the master closet, but she refused to get rid of them and decided to store them in the basement instead. They'd certainly come in handy tonight. Gabe looked sharp in the black slacks and dark blue sweater. Luckily, Max hadn't worn these particular clothes frequently, so seeing Gabe in them didn't bring back too many painful memories. All she could think about was how handsome Gabe looked. She glanced at him out of the corner of her eye and bit back a smile. Travis was talking his ear off, but Gabe didn't seem to mind. Ever so often, he would look at her and smile, sending a flurry of butterflies through her stomach. She pulled her phone from her purse and glanced at it. The concert was due to start in 15 minutes. She decided that now would be the best time to go to the restroom. That way, she wouldn't have to get up and go during the concert. She turned to Jill. Does anyone need to go to the restroom? Jill shook her head no. They're all settled. I don't want to tempt fate by rousing them up. Chansey glanced at Taylor, who was immersed in the game he was playing on his DS. Wyatt was looking intently. You could take the boys away from video games, but it was a little harder to take the video games out of them. She chuckled. I understand. Jill rolled her eyes. The devices are getting turned off once the concert starts. She shot Wyatt a warning look. No exceptions. He laughed and waved a hand in defeat. Chancy turned to Gabe and Travis. I'm going to the restroom. Be right back. Gabe winked. We'll save your seat. She made a face. How kind. Their eyes met and she was struck by how blue they were. It was like staring into the clearest water imaginable. Heat settled in her cheeks when she walked past him and brushed against his leg in the process. Then she laughed inwardly. This guy was making her feel like a teenager again, all weak in the knees. Not a bad feeling, she decided. Not bad at all. When she got to the main aisle, an elderly missionary pointed the way to the restroom. She maneuvered through the sea of people that were filing into the conference center. She'd just come out of the restroom and was headed back to her seat when she accidentally bumped into someone. Oh, I'm so sorry, she said, and then stopped dead in her tracks when she saw who it was. Her jaw went slack, and she took a step back to recover her balance. He caught hold of her arm to steady her. Jake, she mumbled, what are you doing here? The blood drained from her face. Same as you. I came to watch the concert. A look of reproof came over his features. We were supposed to go together. He gave her a searching look. Remember? It seems that you gave my ticket to someone else. Something flickered in his eyes and then disappeared before she could discern it. She would later question how Jake knew she'd given away his ticket, but at the moment all she could think to say was, Oh. She had the urge to get away as fast as she could. 
She'd spent the last twenty-four hours fretting about what he might do, and now he was here, standing in front of her. She wondered again if it had been Jake that had broken into her house. I have to get back, she mumbled, feeling like a cornered animal. Wait. His voice became earnest. About the other night. She held up a hand. Don't. I owe you an apology for the things I said. An apology? That was the understatement of the century. She arched an eyebrow as he continued. I was upset, and I had no right to insinuate that you were only using me. No, you didn't. She glared at him. She wasn't going to give him an inch, not after the turmoil he'd caused her. I don't like being threatened. He nodded. You have every right to be upset, but maybe we could talk about things. I can come over after the concert. She fought the urge to laugh in his face. Was the guy delusional? Jake, I don't know how else I can say this, but it's over, she said firmly. Do you understand? His jaw went hard. You don't know what you're saying. You're confused. If we could just talk about this. How did you get the code to my alarm system? What? How did you get the code to my alarm system? She repeated. You gave it to me. No, I most certainly did not. Her hand went to her hip. Well, then, I must have gotten it from Travis. Travis would have never given you the code to our home. Well, then I must have seen it when you were opening the door. What are you insinuating? Why did you drive by my house last night? And why did you follow us to Temple Square? Don't try to deny it because Susie saw you by the reflection pool. Have you been in my house, Jake? In my daughter's bedroom? A furrow appeared between his brows, and he gave her a look that suggested she was losing her mind. What? You stay away from me and my family. Fury smoldered in her eyes. I mean it. She turned on her heel and walked away. She was still shaking when she got back to her seat. The concert was starting. Gabe gave her a concerned look. Everything okay? She leaned into him and spoke in a low tone. I saw Jake when I went to the restroom. She felt him go stiff beside her. What? She told him how she'd bumped into him on her way out of the restroom. Tears sprang to her eyes. Do you think he followed us here? Her voice went hoarse. Anger settled in Gabe's eyes. I don't know. He moved to get up but I'm going to find out right now. She caught hold of his arm. There are too many people. You'll never find him, and I need you here with me. She hated how weak and frightened her voice sounded. You're right. He scoped the area around them, trying to catch sight of the culprit. But Chansey was right. It was impossible. There were too many people. I'm starting to get concerned, Chansey whispered. The truth was... She was downright petrified. She didn't think it was a coincidence that he bumped into her tonight. She stared straight ahead, no longer seeing the elaborate decorations, not hearing the beautiful music. All she could think about was Jake. She could feel the sick hammering of her terrified heart and how her pulse was pounding in her temples. Gabe reached for her hand and squeezed it in his. I won't let him hurt you or the kids. She looked into his eyes, wanting so desperately to believe that he could somehow protect her. I promise, he assured her. From the moment Gabe walked into the apartment, he knew that something was wrong. He scoped the room with a practiced eye, looking to see what had been disturbed. He walked into the bedroom and started opening the drawers to the dresser. Someone had been rifling through his clothes through the closet. He was glad that he'd kept his phone on him at the concert, rather than leaving it in the dresser. There was no sign of a forced entry, which didn't mean anything because the simple lock on the door could easily be jimmied with a credit card. Why would someone have come in the apartment? Was it Harriet? He'd been so careful to cover his tracks. Had she followed him? 
Then he thought of something else. Had the person been in Chansey's house as well, or was he the primary target? He went back into the kitchen and stopped when he saw the large envelope resting on the table. He turned it over in his hands. It was blank. He opened it and swore as he pulled out an 8 by 10 photo of him at the soup kitchen, loading merchandise into the van. He turned the photo over. Written in block letters were the words, I know what you're doing. Get out of Chansey's life or I'll turn you in. This is your final warning. He threw the picture on the table and rubbed his neck. Jake. It had to have been him. But how? Had he followed him? Unease trickled down his spine. Had he been watching the house? If so, he would have seen him leave that morning to go to the soup kitchen. This was bad. He had to do something and fast. A part of him wanted to rush into Chansey's home this very instant and take her and the kids to a safe place. Was that psycho watching the house now? Chansey told him that she thought that Jake might have broken into the house previously, and now he knew she was right. He glanced out the window at the black night. Where was he hiding? The thing that angered him the most was that he couldn't even warn Chansey about this. To do so would be to admit that Jake had left the photo in an attempt to threaten him. He let out a dry chuckle. Jake had no idea who he was dealing with, as if a photo would scare him away from Chansey. He'd known his feelings for her ran deep, but tonight, when she came back and took her seat in the concert, when he saw the haunted look on her face, her tight lips, he knew that he would brave the depths of hell to keep her safe. He grabbed the picture and stepped out the front door. Even though he couldn't see anything in the darkness, he knew that the exterior light on the apartment would illuminate him, making him visible if Jake were watching. He lifted the photo and tore it in half, and then stood there, glaring. The message would be clear. He wasn't backing down. After about five minutes of standing there, he realized that Chansey was in the kitchen waving to him. She'd not been in the kitchen when he first came out. He'd made sure of that before he held up the photo, but then he'd been so focused on Jake that he hadn't been paying attention. He held the photo flat to his side. He motioned with his other hand that he was going in the apartment and would be right there. She nodded. He went to the bedroom and placed the picture in the dresser, hidden underneath the clothes. It would be a disaster if Travis were to enter the apartment and see it, but it was the only place he could think to put it for now. Chansey placed the kettle on the stove and turned the knob to high. The concert had been great, but unfortunately, she hadn't enjoyed it. The incident with Jake left her feeling rattled. The only thing that had kept her together during the concert was Gabe's hand over hers. She wondered if she were overreacting about Jake. He seemed genuinely surprised when she accused him of those things. Her mind kept running through the events that had taken place. Someone had broken into her home, and Jake was somehow at the back door at three-something in the morning, telling her that he'd had a feeling that she was in trouble. And he knew the code to the alarm. Had he also gotten a key somehow? It wouldn't be that hard to do, considering how many times he'd been in and out of the house. Susie thought she saw him at Temple Square, and then she saw a man in her room. Jake had threatened her at the restaurant. Well, he sort of threatened her. It had felt like a threat, she conceded. And then he drove by her house that same night. And tonight, the incident at the conference center was the condemning factor. She found it hard to believe that bumping into him was accidental. Admittedly, Jake's demeanor had been mild, except that one time when his face went hard. He couldn't seem to accept that it was over between them. She wondered how far she should let things go before she contacted the police. She regretted not calling the police the night of the break-in. She couldn't very well call them now, after the fact. Plus, 
She didn't have anything concrete, just suspicions and fears. Gabe rapped lightly on the door. She motioned for him to enter. She liked the way he filled the room and how he made her feel safe and secure. In fact, she was halfway tempted to ask him to sleep on the couch, just in case Jake tried anything. But then she thought better of it. No need to rush things with Gabe. I know it's late, but I was making a cup of herbal tea, and when I saw you out back, well, I thought you might like some. He pulled out a chair and sat down. I would love a cup. She liked the way his eyes crinkled when he smiled. She prepared the herbal tea and then handed him a cup. His hand brushed hers when he reached for it, and a tingle ran down her spine. There was an invisible current of energy running between them, and she wondered if he felt it too. She sat down across from him. What were you doing standing out there in front of the apartment? Just getting some fresh air. I know how you feel. Ever since running into Jake at the concert, she'd felt as if a vice were clutching her chest, making it difficult to breathe. She knew it was attributed to anxiety, but she was done taking medication. Tightness or not, she would work through this on her own. My children need me, she told herself fiercely. She had to hold it together. Thanks for tonight, she began. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't been there. I'm glad I could be there. He looked into her eyes, and his piercing expression seemed to stare into her soul. She wondered if he could see the hurt festering there. But you're giving me far too much credit. You're a lot stronger than you think. His comment caught her off guard, and she was struck by the contrast between Gabe and Jake. It hit her then that Jake wanted her to be weak. He wanted her weak so that he could step in and be the hero. No, that wasn't it. He wanted her to be weak so that he could control her. Being around Gabe was good for her. She cocked her head. Am I strong? He reached for her hand. Absolutely. A thrill ran through her. He surprised her when he scooted his chair around so that he was sitting next to her. She instantly became aware of his large stature in comparison to her petite frame. She liked the way his dark hair curled on the nape of his neck. He really was gorgeous, but that's not what was drawing her to him. There was a kindness to him, a gentleness that reminded her of Max. And yet he was different from Max, too. Max's features had been plainer, and his eyes were brown like Travis's. Max's hair was curly and dark brown. Gabe's hair was black and straighter, and it was so thick that it almost spiked on top. Her pulse bumped up a notch when he started rubbing circles over her hand with his thumb. She drew in a quick breath, enjoying the tingles that were running through her. I hate to bring this up, but I need you to tell me everything that happened between you and Jake. I need to know why you're so afraid of him. You mentioned that you thought he'd broken into the house and that Susie thought she saw a man in her room. I need to know why you think this was Jake. I need to know everything. A stab of fear went through her, and she had the urge to go and check Susie's bedroom to make sure she was okay. Then she needed to check Travis's room. Maybe she should insist that they sleep in her room. Stop it, she ordered herself. Stop it. She'd checked on them a few minutes ago, and Wyatt had checked all of the locks on the windows. The locks on the doors had been changed, and the alarm was set with a new code. They were safe. She uttered a silent prayer. Please, Heavenly Father, please keep my family safe. She couldn't stop the tears from streaming down her face. She removed her hand from his. I'm sorry. This thing has me tied in knots. Part of me wonders if I'm making things out to be worse than they are. I was going over everything in my mind before you came in, and I realized that I don't have any proof. Gabe thought about the envelope tucked in the dresser and the look on Jake's face when he drove by the house. 
I don't believe for one minute that you're overreacting. He saw the relief in her eyes. You don't? No. You need to trust your instincts. What do your instincts tell you? To be afraid. The words lifted like a raised knife between them. I want to know everything about this man. How you met him. When you met him. Everything. Chansey nodded. Okay. Let's go in the den. She shuddered. And let's close the blinds just in case he's out there, watching. But first I need to check on the kids. I'll close all of the blinds, and you go and check on the kids. A few minutes later, Chansey returned to the den and found Gabe sitting on the couch. She hesitated, not sure if she should sit beside him or if she should sit in the recliner. He seemed to sense her reticence and patted the spot beside him. She walked to where he was and sat down. Okay. Tell me everything. He implored. She nodded, collecting her thoughts. It all started when I decided to go to a single adult activity at church. Thirty minutes later, her tongue was tired from telling him all that she knew. She told him how she'd left the activity in tears and how Jake had found her outside, how he'd come to her aid and taken care of her all those months. I kind of went on autopilot when Max died, and it was easier to just give control to someone else. She rubbed her forehead. I suppose in that respect I'm partially to blame. It wasn't until I started getting well and when I met you that I... She clamped her mouth shut. Oops. She'd said too much. He gave her a quizzical look. When you what? Oh boy. Heat traveled up her neck. But there was no getting around it now and she wanted to be honest with Gabe. It wasn't until I met you that I realized the difference. She swallowed. I realized that the feelings I had for Jake are not the same as the ones I have for you. She looked down at her hands, too embarrassed to meet his eyes. Her tongue felt like lead in her mouth. This is where he would jump up and run out the door or laugh her to scorn. He scooted into her and cupped her jaw with his hand, forcing her to look at him. Her lips parted when his mouth came down on hers. She let out a soft moan as the kiss deepened, and his tongue touched hers. A thrill of desire raced through her, melting her into the couch. His arms encircled her waist, and she clasped her hands around his neck. When he pulled away, they were both breathing hard. Her first reaction was to be embarrassed that she'd gotten so carried away. She was acting like a lovesick teenager who was wearing her feelings around on her shirt sleeve. And that kiss, wow. It ignited feelings and desires that she never thought she'd feel again. She moved to scoot away from him, but he held her fast. When she gave him a questioning look, he ran his hand through a tress of her long hair. Then he caressed the line of her jaw. Her breath caught when he began tracing her lips with the tip of his finger. I've been having those feelings too, he murmured. His eyes grew soft, and I never thought I'd feel this way again. She reached up and caught his hand, holding it in hers. Then she raised his hand to her lips and planted a kiss on the back of it. In the next instant, he was kissing her again. This time, his lips were hard, demanding. She met him measure for measure, and he kissed her until she thought she would lose her mind in the wonderment of it all. This time, she was the one that pulled away. She let out a shaky laugh. We'd better not get too carried away. He gave her a lopsided smile that accentuated his dimple. Yeah, one of us has to be the responsible one. She chuckled. Unfortunately. He put his arm around her, and she snuggled into the curve of him. They sat there staring at the flickering fire and the twinkling lights of the Christmas tree. The scent of pine from the tree was heavy in the air. Finally, he spoke. That night that I saved Travis. She entwined her fingers in his. I didn't realize it at the time, 
but it was a miracle of sorts. She turned to look at him, liking how the line of his angular jaw was highlighted from the glow of the fire. Yes, he agreed. It was a miracle. She sensed that he wanted to say more, so she remained silent so as to let him have space in which to speak. I didn't want to come in that night. She sat up and turned to him in surprise. Really? Yeah, I saw you and Susie through the window. His voice caught. You looked like an angel. So breathtakingly beautiful. The compliment pleased her immensely, but she was puzzled by the rest. Why didn't you want to come in? Seeing you and the kids, it represented everything I had lost. It was so painful. He lapsed into silence. She wanted to smooth away the tension that had crept into his face. And then I went in. He gave her a small smile. At Travis's insistence. She laughed. Yeah, he can be very persistent. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I didn't want you to come in. No. His jaw dropped in mock astonishment. I can't imagine why you wouldn't have wanted to take in some dirty man off the streets. His voice became reflective. When we ate dinner, sitting there with the kids, it felt so natural. Her eyes met his. So right. He nodded. I felt it too. She didn't know how to broach the next topic but it needed to be addressed. Look, I know there's a lot of judgment associated with a homeless person. At first, I thought you might be crazy. He chuckled. A fair assessment. But after hearing what happened to you, after living through what happened to me, I understand. Her eyes grew moist. Travis and Susie saved me. She choked on the words. Had I not had them, I'm not sure what I would have done. Tears welled in her eyes, and she looked at him and realized that he also had tears in his eyes. She laughed and repeated the phrase he'd once said. Well, aren't we the cheery pair? Evidently. He used his palm to wipe away his tears. Then it occurred to him that he couldn't do it. He couldn't continue the lie. He had to tell her the truth. He touched her hair and looked into her eyes, hoping that she would understand. Chancy, there are some things I need to tell you. Okay. He could see wariness settling into her eyes, but he had to tell her now. He had to get it out in the open before he lost his nerve. That night, when I saved Travis. Mommy! They looked toward the hall and saw Susie standing there clutching a teddy bear in her hands. She was crying. I had a bad dream. Chancy held out her arms. Come here. Susie ran into them and laid her head against Chancy's chest. Chancy began stroking her hair. It's okay, she cooed. Susie nodded and closed her eyes. Gabe scooted back to give them some space. Chancy looked at him. Sorry she mouthed. He waved the apology away. Susie comes first. After a few minutes, Chancy stood holding Susie in her arms. I need to get her to bed. Gabe also stood. It's getting late. I'd better get back to the apartment. I do want to continue our conversation. He forced a smile. Of course. She gave him a radiant smile. Good night. Good night. Chapter 16 Jake watched through his binoculars as Chansey entered the bedroom. Even her shadow was beautiful. The feeling of love that flowed over him was so powerful that it nearly took his breath away. How like Adrian she was in so many ways. She was a fragile butterfly with broken wings, and he tenderly put her back together had taught her to fly again. But she was getting stronger now, and like Adrian was pushing him away. He'd watched as Gabe stepped out of the apartment and ripped the photograph in half, 
and then he'd gone into Chansey's house and closed the blinds. A sneer twisted on his face. So Gabe wanted to play it rough. A thrill ran down his spine. He was a hunter, stalking his prey. So focused was he on his quarry that he scarcely needed sleep and very little food. His vendetta consumed him. He would destroy this man, and then Chansey would be his and his alone. He felt a smolder of desire as he looked again at the bedroom window and watched as Chansey's hair fell over her shoulders. He imagined her lips on his, her smile, how she would gaze into his eyes with appreciation once she realized the great lengths he had gone to in order to ensure that they would be together. Hair like silk, running through his fingers. That tentative smile. She walked to the window and looked out. She seemed to sense that he was there, beckoning him to her. I love you so much, he breathed. Then she closed the blinds and he drew in a ragged breath, feeling like he'd been punched in the gut. Rage rose in his throat and he felt the overwhelming desire to be in her presence. Then a laugh bubbled up in his throat as he thought about how it had ended with Adrian. She'd tried to hide from him, too. Please, Adrian looked at him pleadingly before her face crumbled. Oh, please don't hurt me. It was funny, the things he remembered about that night. How a sliver of white skin shone in the dim light as the collar of her dress fell below her shoulder. A whisper of desire kindled inside him, her thick hair bouncing wildly on her shoulders as she began backing away from him, and then she turned and ran. His control was absolute, exhilarating. Love hurts, Adrian, he'd called after her. Even though you hurt me, I'll always love you. He remembered the sheer thrill that ran through him when he felt her fear, so thick he could nearly taste it. And then he began counting. One, two, three. Ready or not, here I come. Thinking of Adrian always brought back conflicting emotions. Oh, how he'd loved her. But she disappointed him. He thought back to when they first met. He'd been looking for someone like Adrian, someone who had access to a large amount of money, but who wouldn't be overly influenced by her family. She fit the bill in those respects, but he knew that in order for the relationship to work, he would need to find her attractive. When he first saw her picture in the society column, he was not prepared for the tumult of emotions that flooded over him. She was a stunning beauty with her long brown hair and doe-like eyes. The Winders were a high-profile family, and it was widely known that Adrian had a rocky relationship with her blue-bred parents, who did not condone her backpacking trips through Europe, nor her late-night parties with friends. She was too free-spirited to fit into the confining life of a high-society family. Her father's answer to structure was to send her off to a boarding school in her teens, but when she became an adult, Adrian refused to be controlled by him. Her late grandfather had left her a sizable trust fund. The only connection that Adrian had with her family was through a younger brother. Bentley, who was only seven at the time, was an uh-oh baby that was conceived when Mr. and Mrs. Winder took an anniversary cruise to Alaska. He'd not realized it at the beginning, but Bentley had turned out to be a valuable tool. He smiled grimly, remembering all that had happened. Jake was born to be an investor. He knew market trends like the back of his hand. But unfortunately, he didn't have access to the one thing he needed most. Money. Having grown up poor, the only son of an alcoholic father and an uneducated mother, he knew that anything he got in this life would be through sheer determination and prowess. He'd graduated high school with honors and took a few courses at the local community college. That was the last he'd seen of his parents. He erased his shabby upbringing from his persona and took a job at a bank in a distant town. From there, he'd moved on to investment firms in various states, but no matter how hard he worked, 
he could never seem to rise up the ranks. Finally, he realized that he would need to take matters into his own hands, do things his way. That's when he discovered Adrian. Jake spent the next month trailing her and learning her habits. She liked to take long jogs in the park, and she was a fanatic about mint chocolate chip ice cream and romantic movies. He still remembered the day they met like it was yesterday. She'd gone to an Italian restaurant for lunch. He noticed that she often ate alone. Like him, being alone didn't seem to bother her. He sat down at a nearby table where he could have a direct view of her. At some point during her lunch, she looked up and saw him. Their eyes met across the room and locked. Then she smiled and motioned for him to join her. It was like something out of a movie. They had an instant connection. They dated for a few months, and he exhausted his savings taking her to expensive restaurants, plays, and musicals. When Adrian took him home to visit her parents, they took an instant dislike to him. Despite their protests, he and Adrian were married in a small private ceremony at the courthouse. Things had been wonderful at first, until his investments started losing money. And then Adrian had begun to question his background, his education. He could have dealt with that had it not been for Adrian's indiscretions. The corners of his mouth turned down. Why did everything have to eventually turn sour? He brushed aside the negative thoughts and focused instead on Chansey. Things would be different this time. Chansey loved him, and he loved her. Once he rescued her from Gabe's clutches, they could start fresh. Chansey had ten times the amount of money Adrian had. He would invest it wisely for the both of them, so that they would never want for anything again. And tonight, he would see her. He stepped back into the cover of the trees. Anticipation raced through his veins as he thought about how he would enter her house and stand at the foot of her bed, as he'd done so many times before, and watch her sleep. I'll always watch over you, he whispered. Tonight at the concert... When she mentioned that he knew the code to the alarm, it was as if she were reminding him of that. It was her way of letting him know that he could enter her home, that she would be waiting for him. The light went off in her bedroom. He would wait until she was sound asleep before he entered. An hour later, he stealthily made his way to the back door and inserted the key. He'd taken Travis's key a few months ago, the kid was so stupid that he hadn't realized it. And when Travis finally noticed it was missing, Jake came down on him hard so as not to arouse suspicion, lecturing him on responsibility and learning to keep up with things. He turned the key, but it wouldn't budge. His heart dropped, and he felt a rivulet of sweat running between his shoulder blades despite the cold. The key no longer fit. His head felt like it would explode. She'd changed the lock. Had she been taunting him earlier when she mentioned the code, knowing all along that she'd changed the lock? Adrian flashed through his mind, her deviant smile as she flirted shamelessly with the waiter on their honeymoon. He'd asked her not to wear that dress because it was too revealing, exposing her creamy shoulder and slender arm. But she'd only laughed at him calling him a prude. A wave of sadness settled over him as he made his way back to his hiding place, shaking his head. Why, Chansey? Why? Jill tightened her coat as she walked up the steps leading to the Salt Lake City Police Department. Last night, when she saw Chansey and Gabe holding hands and engaged in a serious conversation— she decided that she couldn't wait another day to find out who Gabe really was. While she sympathized with his tragic past, she still found it hard to swallow that he was homeless. She'd seen enough homeless men in her lifetime to know that Gabe didn't fit the profile. She stepped in the front door and felt like she was in a different world. Men and women in police uniforms were walking briskly, and she saw an irate man in handcuffs being escorted down a hall. There was a receptionist desk in the center. 
She approached it. I'm looking for a detective. The older woman barely looked at her as she pointed. That way. Thank you. Jill approached a glass window that had a circular opening in the center. A middle-aged female officer was sitting behind the window. Hi, how may I help you? She said briskly. I'm trying to find out some information about a detective. What's the detective's name? Gabe Jones. The woman frowned. Are you sure he works in this precinct? No, um, I believe he used to work here a few years back. Well, I've worked here for 25 years, and I don't know of anyone by that name. Jill glanced at the woman's name tag. Is there someone I can talk to, Officer Walker? The corners of her mouth turned down in a frown. Why do you need to talk to someone? Here's where it got sticky. My sister is involved with this man, and he claims that he was once a detective on the Salt Lake City Police Force. I just wanted to verify that information, to make sure he is who he says he is. She hated the knowing expression that washed over the officer's face. Oh, one of those. She removed her pencil from behind her ear. Yeah, we get people like you in here from time to time, asking questions about someone who's supposedly a cop. One thing Jill couldn't tolerate was condescending people. She straightened to her full height and eyed the woman. What do you mean, people like me? The officer met her gaze. Take it as you please. It was my understanding that it's against the law to impersonate a police officer. Is that not so? Yes. She scratched her head, annoyance written on her face. She motioned at the paperwork in front of her. Listen, doll, I'd love to sit here and chat, but I have work to do. Doll? Jill felt the blood rush to her head. Excuse me? I did not come down here to be insulted. She spat out the words. The woman started blinking rapidly. I didn't mean any disrespect. It's just that I have a lot of work to do and trying to find some detective, she formed quotation marks in the air, who lied to his girlfriend doesn't rank too high up on the priority list if you get my drift. Jill had not come this far to be turned away now. She flashed a plastic smile. Then let's save us both some time. Find someone who can help, and I'll get out of your hair. The officer rolled her eyes and picked up the phone. Officer Mitchell, I have a woman out here who needs to ask a few questions. Can you please take a few minutes and talk to her? A minute later, she hung up the phone and pointed. Go through those double doors and turn left. Go in the first door you see, and the officer at the desk will help you. The woman smirked. Happy now? Jill lifted her chin in the air and fluffed her short blonde hair. Very. You have a nice day. Thanks so much for your kindness. She turned and sauntered down the hall, seething the entire way. She was relieved to see that it was a man in his twenties sitting behind the desk and not another irate, middle-aged female in need of hormone therapy. He invited her to sit down. I'm Officer Mitchell. How may I help you? Jill told him about Gabe and how he'd said that he was a former detective. The officer listened with an expressionless face, stroking his chin. When Jill finished, she leaned forward. Does that name sound familiar to you? No, it doesn't, but I've only been here a year. This was turning out to be a dead end. Jill wanted to scream. Can you let me talk to someone who's been here for at least ten years? He thought for a minute. Yeah, I could let you talk to Sergeant Landon Scott. He's been here forever, and he's in charge of all the detectives. Finally. Yes, that would be great but you may have to make an appointment for another day. He's a busy man. I'm sure he is, Jill muttered, crossing her arms tightly over her chest. He picked up the phone and punched a few buttons. Sergeant Scott, I have a woman here who's trying to find out some information on a Detective Gabe Jones. She says that he used to be a detective here. Jill watched the officer's eyes go wide, 
And then he nodded. Yes, sir. He looked at Jill. That's a surprise. You must be some sort of VIP. The sergeant says he'll see you. Nope, just a tax-paying citizen who's trying to get a little help. He stood. This way. She followed the officer down a long hall, where they stopped in front of a nondescript door. He knocked once before opening it. Jill stepped inside to what was a spacious office with a wall of bookshelves lining one wall and plaques and pictures lining the other. A large desk rested in the center of the room and the sergeant was sitting behind it. He was a black man in his mid-fifties. He was on the lean side and very distinguished looking with gray dusting his temples. She could tell from the young officer's demeanor that the sergeant was highly respected. He motioned for her to take a seat. The officer closed the door as he left the room. Jill sat down. Thanks for seeing me today, Sergeant. She tried to remember his name. Scott. Landon Scott. He gave her a warm smile. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs, revealing a pair of cowboy boots. Now what can I do for you, ma'am? Jill detected a slight southern accent. He certainly didn't fit the description of a man who was too busy to see anyone. On the contrary, he appeared to be perfectly relaxed, as if he had all the time in the world. For the third time in twenty minutes, she retold the same story. This time, however, she added more detail because Sergeant Scott was willing to listen. She told him how Gabe was supposedly homeless and how he'd saved Travis and that Gabe was staying in the apartment behind Chansey's home. She finished by saying that Chansey had formed a strong attachment to him in a relatively short period of time. My sister is a widow, she explained, and she has been through a tremendous ordeal. I don't want her to get hurt. What is your sister's name? Chansey Hamilton. He cocked his head. The Chancy Hamilton that is the widow of the late Maxwell Hamilton? From the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation? Jill nodded. The same? He let out a low whistle. You can see why I'm concerned. My sister would make an easy target for someone who is looking to ingratiate himself into her life, thereby gaining access to her inheritance. Chancy recently came out of a terrible relationship and I worry that she's jumping into this one too fast. Not that I'm trying to get you involved in her personal problems, she quickly added. I would just like to know if Gabe actually was a detective. If that part of his story checks out, then I think it would be safe to assume that he is who he says he is. If not... I completely understand your concern. Do you recognize the name Gabe Jones? He uncrossed his legs and sat up straight in his chair. Not right offhand, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything, he added when he saw Jill's face fall. It doesn't? She hadn't realized it until this moment, but she really did want Gabe's story to check out. He seemed like such a great guy, and he was obviously making Chansey happy, something she couldn't seem to do no matter how hard she tried. No, it doesn't. There are over 130 law enforcement agencies in the state of Utah employing roughly 4,500 sworn police officers. Are you sure he said he was a detective at the Salt Lake City Police Department? No, I'm not sure, and neither was Chansey. Frustration settled over her. What chance did she have of verifying his story? I can contact all of the departments in the valley, Sergeant Scott said. Chances are he worked for one of those. That would be great. How long will that take? At the rate Chansey and Gabe were going, they'd be married by the time she heard back. A couple of days. A week at the most. Good. Thinking the meeting was over, she was about to stand. But he wasn't finished. Tell me more about Gabe and your sister. What do you want to know? Are they romantically involved? Yes. Why? She asked, 
feeling wary all of a sudden. That was a strange question. I'm just trying to make sure I have a clear picture of the situation. Oh, she relaxed. What type of person is Gabe? He's tall and muscular, with short black hair and blue eyes. I would guess that he's in his mid-thirties. He's very handsome in a movie star sort of way. It felt strange telling the sergeant that Gabe was handsome, but she wanted him to have a complete description. I'm sorry I don't have a picture. Why had she not thought to snap a picture of him with her phone? But I can email you one if that would help. Yes. He reached in his pocket, pulled out a card, and handed it to her. A physical description always helps. He shifted in his seat. But what kind of person is he? A homeless person. Supposedly. She wasn't sure what answer he was looking for. He smiled. Does he seem like a nice guy? Oh, you were wanting to know about his qualities. She tried to think of the best way to describe Gabe. He's very guarded and private, but there's a kindness about him. He seems like he genuinely cares about my sister. So from what you can tell, he seems to be an upstanding guy. She hesitated. Yes, from what I can tell. What are your main reservations about him? That he's homeless, or at least he claims to be. He doesn't strike me as the homeless type, though. He's far too confident and sophisticated. Plus, after the ordeal with Jake, Chancey's ex-boyfriend, I just want to be sure she's not getting into another bad relationship. The sergeant frowned. So from what I'm getting, you're suspicious of Gabe because of Chancey's bad relationship with this other guy, Jake. Yeah, I suppose you're right. She'd never thought about it that way, but the sergeant did have a point. Had Jake not turned out to be a loser, she probably wouldn't be that worried about Gabe. Maybe you should tell me about this Jake, the sergeant prompted. When she made a face, he spread his hands. That way I'll have all of the facts. Where did she even start? Chansey first met Jake at a church activity. An hour later, when Jill left the police department, she felt a measure of relief, knowing that Sergeant Scott had all the facts and that he was looking into Gabe. His questions about Chansey and Gabe had been more personal and probing than she would have expected. But then again, she was no police officer, and she'd watched enough cop shows to know that it was often the insignificant tidbits of information that solved the case. If nothing else came out of the experience today, at least she could rest knowing that she'd done everything she could to protect her sister. Harriet pulled into her driveway, turned off the engine, and grabbed the bag of groceries from the passenger seat. She was looking forward to relaxing for the evening. A long, hot soak in the tub was sounding better and better. She couldn't wait to get inside and wash the stink from the soup kitchen off of her. How she hated that grimy place and the never-ending throng of filthy men looking for a handout. If all went well tonight with the Weatherford job, then she would be one step closer to getting away from that wretched place for good. Although she really couldn't complain. Heaven knows, she'd worked with what she had, getting everything she could from that dump, legally and illegally. Her thoughts went to Gabe and how he'd questioned who was getting the bulk of the money for the jobs. Drake, of course. She was getting tired of that man ordering her around and calling all of the shots. With a man like Gabe by her side, Harriet could sway the tide in her favor. She thought about the look of determination in Gabe's eyes when he'd manacled her wrists. A tingle went through her. A man like that could have multiple uses. She stumbled, nearly turning her ankle on a loose chunk of concrete as she walked up the sidewalk, leading to the front porch. She cursed. This house was falling apart, but she wasn't going to sink a nickel into it. After tonight, she hoped to have enough money to buy a new house or one of those ritzy high-rise apartments above City Creek. Benny was in his last year of medical school. Soon... 
she'd be the wealthy mother of a prominent doctor doing volunteer work like Chansey and Janet. A vulgar laugh escaped her throat. There was no way she'd ever do volunteer work. She had to admit, it gave her great pleasure to leave Janet, working in the soup kitchen while she went out Christmas shopping. The corners of her mouth turned down. Janet was starting to get on her nerves, questioning everything and acting like she was the one in charge. She'd even insisted that Harriet meet her at 8 o'clock the following morning so they could do an assessment of the food and plan the meals for the following week. Harriet was going to meet her there, but the assessment would be done on her terms. She was going to give that snooty busybody an ultimatum. Stay out of her business or leave. It was dark and hard to see, reminding her that she needed to replace the burned-out light bulb on the front porch. She thought of the conversation she'd had with Janet about Drake. Janet had acted like there was no way someone like Drake would consider dating her, when in reality it was the opposite. There was no way Harriet would ever consider dating Drake. A noise came from the far side of the porch, just as she started to unlock the door. She turned as the object of her thoughts stepped up. Drake! Disgust was heavy in her voice. What are you doing here? I told you everything was set for tonight. She shook her head. Go home. Then he lifted his arm, and she saw the glint of metal from the snow shovel she kept beside the front door. Her eyes widened, and she opened her mouth to scream, but no sound would come. The pain was blinding as he hit her in the head, and she crumpled to the ground. The crimson blood streaming from her head was a stark contrast to the puffy white snow on the porch. It was 2 a.m. on the dot. Gabe looked up at the dark mansion. He hoped, for all of their sakes, that Harriet's guy had disabled the alarm system. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw movement and turned to see two men approaching. Judging by their clothes, they were homeless. One of them stepped forward. You, Gabe? He nodded in the affirmative. The man smiled, revealing a missing tooth. His hair was tangled and matted to his head. I understand that you're the man in charge. You will need to do everything I say. Is that understood? He said briskly. Yes, they said. Come on, stay behind me, he ordered. He led them around to the back praying all the while that the lady of the house, Maxine Weatherford, was really out of town, as Harriet said. The good news was that the yard was heavily treed, a rarity in Utah. They were leaving tracks in the snow, but there wasn't much he could do about that. When they got to the back door, he retrieved the lock-picking tools from his pocket and got to work. A few minutes later, they were inside the house, he breathed a sigh of relief when the alarm didn't go off. It seemed that Harriet's man had done his job. He looked at the grungy men and fleetingly wondered if they had the mental capacity to do what was required of them. Your job is simple. You stay here until I tell you. A black van will pull around the back and then you'll help load goods into it. Do you understand? They nodded. As far as Gabe could tell, the house was empty. A good sign. Jake watched from a distance as Gabe and the men entered the mansion. This was the moment he'd been waiting for. He pulled out his phone and dialed 911. I'd like to report a robbery, he said in a hushed tone. Yes, it's going on right now. Gabe was in the bedroom, shoving Maxine's jewelry into a bag when a voice from behind caused him to jump. Hold up your hands and turn around slowly. He turned to see a police officer pointing a gun at him. Put down the bag, the man ordered. Gabe dropped the bag and held up his hands in defeat. You are under arrest. He briefly thought about running, but chances were he wouldn't get very far, and the man was pointing a gun at his chest. Gabe offered a contrite smile. You've got me. I'll go peaceably. In the next second, the officer rushed at him, shoved him to the ground, and was handcuffing him. You have the right to remain silent, 
Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So much for peaceably, Gabe muttered as the officer hauled him to his feet. Not surprisingly, when Janet arrived at the soup kitchen at 8 a.m., Harriet was nowhere to be found. Figures, Janet mumbled. Goosebumps rose on her arms, and she looked at the empty parking lot. She had the unsettling sensation that she was being watched. She unlocked the back door. When she got inside, she shoved it closed and locked it behind her. A person couldn't be too careful in this neighborhood. Harriet had a key and could let herself in. Duane was scheduled to arrive at 8.30, and he also had a key. She went to work, busying herself with rearranging the pots and pans. The place was a disorganized mess. She pulled out a pad from her purse and began listing all of the items that were needed. Dish soap, garbage bags, paper towels. The list went on and on. She glanced down at her knuckles, which were cracked and bleeding from scrubbing pots and pans the day before. She'd intended on putting some lotion on them before she darted out the door, but in her haste to get here on time, she'd forgotten. Ted kept teasing her about her infatuation with the soup kitchen, but she could see the pride written on his face. He was glad that she'd found something, other than him, to occupy her time. She laughed at the thought. She glanced at the clock on the wall, 8.10. She blew out a breath. Still no sign of Harriet. Her thoughts went to Gabe. She wasn't happy about keeping Chansey in the dark, but Gabe assured her that it was for the best. She certainly hoped he was right. Gabe asked her to keep track of Harriet and to make detailed notes about her comings and goings and the people she spoke to. Yesterday, she'd seen Harriet off to the side, talking quietly to two homeless men. Janet watched as she handed each man what looked to be a $20 bill. On the surface, it looked like Harriet was being generous to the poor, but if there was one thing that Janet knew, Harriet Dean didn't voluntarily give anyone anything. Chancy had told her about her conversation with Stockton and how he promised to get to the bottom of the problems at the soup kitchen. That was all well and good, but it didn't take a brainchild to know that Harriet was the biggest problem of all. She hated to come right out and say that to Chancy because Max had been so fond of the woman. Boy, she certainly pulled the wool over his eyes. When Harriet did show up, she was going to give her a piece of her mind for being so late. It was now 8.20. Duane would be here any minute now, she hoped. There was something unnerving about being in this place alone. Janet wrapped her arms around herself and suppressed a shiver. The heat in the building didn't work right half the time. Something else she planned to discuss with Harriet. It was too quiet, and Janet couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Then again, she was probably just paranoid due to all of the robberies in her neighborhood. She shook off the uneasy thought and focused instead on Duane. She'd grown quite fond of the gangly boy. Yesterday, he'd worked all day long, and she had to force him to take a lunch break. It had been a long time since she'd seen anyone that young with so much compassion for other people. She suspected that his upbringing had instilled that in him. Unlike most kids his age, he'd not had the luxury of becoming spoiled. Her next step would be to talk to him about his education. He'd dropped out of high school, so he would need to take his GED, but there were classes available to help him study. She heard a noise followed by light footsteps. Her heart began to pound. Duane, is that you? Silence. Duane, Harriet? The lights went out, and panic, swift and paralyzing, racked her body. She went weak in the knees. The windows in the kitchen area had been painted black, so she couldn't see a thing. She made her way to the counter and clutched her purse. She needed to get to her phone and use the flashlight app. She thrust her hand into her purse and pulled out her phone. She pressed the button, and the screen came to life.
before she could turn on the flashlight, she saw movement. A man was walking toward her. She pressed the flashlight button. Duane, is that you? No one can hear you in here. A man's voice penetrated the darkness. Who are you? What do you want? We don't have any money here. This is a soup kitchen. She shined the light on him and gasped. It was the man she'd seen in the back parking lot, talking to Harriet. She took a step back. Harriet's not here if that's who you're looking for. He laughed. I know where Harriet is. The last time I saw her, she was lying face down in her own blood. He gave her a polite smile as if they'd been discussing the weather. I'm looking for you, Janet. Terror clawed at her as she backed away from him. For a second, she thought she would faint, but she knew her only chance was to keep him talking. What do you want with me? Her voice felt small in her ears, and she looked down at her phone. She fumbled to dial 911. The flashlight cast morbid shadows across his face as he shook his head. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Her eyes darted around, looking to see if she could get around him, but he was blocking her only way out. I don't understand. He shrugged. It's a simple case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You saw me with Harriet, and your friend Chansey is asking questions. I won't say anything, please. You don't want to do this. He took a step closer to her. Her heart dropped when he picked up the heavy stockpot from the counter. A scream tore through her throat. She tried to dodge out of his grasp, but he was faster. Help! Help! She cried. Her reaction seemed to amuse him. Don't worry, it will be over soon. He lifted the pot in the air. On instinct, she raised her arms to protect her head from the onslaught. Thoughts of Ted and the kids raced through her mind as he crashed the heavy object into her head. She fell to the floor, moaning as warm liquid began flowing from her head. He lifted the pot, and she tried to roll out of its way, but it came down again, this time harder. She went still. He raised the pot to hit her again when something tackled him from behind. Sounds and voices came at Janet from a distance, and she caught a glimpse of two men rolling on the floor and trading blows before everything went black. Duane was kneeling over Janet, holding the bloody butcher knife in his hand and crying hysterically when the 911 operator answered his call. There's a woman here. She's hurt. Help her. A sob wrenched his throat. Please, hurry. Chancy hummed as she stirred the pancake batter and poured it onto the griddle. Sunlight was splashing in through the windows and dancing off the wooden floor. It was a bright, snowy day, a day that was full of new possibilities. She glanced at the apartment, trying to see if Gabe were up yet. But from what she could tell, there was no movement. She glanced at the clock on the microwave. 9.15. It wasn't like Gabe to sleep in. He was normally up early. A smile crept across her face. Maybe the late night had tired him out. It had felt so right to be in his arms, almost as though they'd been together for a lifetime already. No, that wasn't right, for Max was the central figure of her past, and she would always hold the memories of him dear to her heart. But she was realizing that she was capable of loving someone else, too. Her eyes widened. Had she just thought the word love? Oh, dear. It was too early for that. How about intense like? Yes, that sounded better. She intensely liked Gabe. She intensely liked his wonderful lips and playful smile, those startling blue eyes, those muscles. She shook her head, grinning. Enough of that. She was a grown woman, not a teenager. She looked up as Travis bounded down the steps. Hey, Mom. Good morning, she chimed. Have you looked outside? It's a beautiful day out there. The sun is shining. I see a blue sky, snow. What more could we ask for? He gave her a funny look. 
Are you okay? She paused. Yes, I'm great. Why? He made a face. You seem awfully happy this morning. She laughed, noting his ruffled hair and the sleep lines still etched across his face. She wondered how long he'd stayed up either watching a movie or playing a video game. Probably pretty late, considering the looks of him. What's wrong with being happy? He went to the refrigerator and retrieved a jug of milk. Chancy could tell that for a split second he thought about drinking straight from the jug, until he realized she was watching him. Instead, he went to the cabinet and reached for a glass. Nothing's wrong with it. He waved a hand in the air. Be happy, Mom. We should all be so happy, he said sarcastically. She shook her head and flipped the pancakes. Teenagers. Then she realized he was looking at her. What? A sly smile stole across his face. Does your good mood happen to have anything to do with Gabe? Color blotched up her neck. What? He chuckled. Mom, you're so obvious. There was a hint of mischief in his eyes. And I saw the two of you holding hands at the concert. She felt like she was ten again and had gotten her hand caught in the cookie jar. I do like him, she said softly. I know, Travis answered. She gave him a tentative look. How do you feel about that? He reached for a banana. About Gabe? Yes. Oh, I think he's a great handyman. We're almost finished putting down the floor, and Gabe's even promised to help me build a ping pong table. He's a great guy. What do you think about me and Gabe? Travis gave her a dubious look. Well, I guess I could talk to Gabe and see if he'll let you help build the ping pong table, if that's what you're asking, he finished, a twinkle in his eyes. He could be so impossible. She burst out laughing and then pointed the spatula in his direction. You got me. Travis grew serious. I'm good with you and Gabe. He's a good guy, and you deserve to be happy. Her eyes grew misty. Really? Really. He paused, and she could see his jaw working. I think Dad would have liked him, too. A tear trickled down her cheek. Me, too. She wiped it away with a chuckle. Okay, enough of that. Speaking of Gabe... Would you please go rouse him out of bed and tell him to get in here before the pancakes get cold? Travis saluted. Yes, ma'am. Susie came hopping into the kitchen. She'd been in the den watching SpongeBob. Mommy, I'm hungry. Breakfast is almost ready. Be a big girl and go and wash your hands. Okay, Mommy, Susie said in a sing-song voice her blonde curls bouncing as she skipped to the bathroom. A few minutes later, Travis returned, a look of concern on his face. Mom, he's not there. Chancy stiffened. What? I knocked several times and even banged on the door, but he's not there. Her mouth went dry. Maybe he's still asleep. Travis shook his head. I don't know. I don't think he could sleep through that. He looked at her. Do you think he went out? I'm not sure. Apprehension pricked at her. Gabe had been about to tell her something when Susie came into the den. It hadn't seemed important at the time, but now she wondered what it was he was going to say. The next thought that tumbled over her nearly took her breath away. Had Gabe left because of last night? Was he afraid to get close to anyone? Panic rippled through her, and she caught hold of the back of the chair to steady herself. Mom, are you okay? You look pale. She gave him a weak smile. I'm fine. And she was fine. It was ridiculous to get this worked up over something silly. For all she knew, Gabe had gone out for a walk. He was a grown man. It wasn't as if she were keeping him prisoner in the apartment. He was free to come and go as he pleased. But where had he gone? Travis seemed to read her mind. Do you think he'll come back? He was afraid to. She could hear it in his voice. 
It hit her then that they'd become very dependent on this man they knew so little about. Susie grabbed Chansey's hand and began swinging it back and forth. Mommy, I'm hungry. Let's get you a pancake. What should we do? Travis asked. Chansey retrieved three plates from the cabinet. The first thing we're going to do is eat this food before it gets cold. Should I go inside the apartment? What if he's sick or something? Travis was right. Chansey hadn't thought of that. What if his leg hadn't healed up as well as they thought? Here she was thinking that he'd left in the middle of the night, and he was probably in the apartment needing their help. Her tension ebbed a little. Let me get Susie's plate fixed, and then you and I will go back there and check on him. I'll get the spare key. Chancy cupped her hands and peered through the blinds. No sign of Gabe. They knocked a few more times, and when he didn't answer, she unlocked the door and pushed it open. Gabe, she called. Are you in here? No answer. I'll check the bedroom, Travis said. She caught his arm. No, let me. This whole thing was making her uneasy, and she felt the need to protect Travis. Exactly what she was protecting him from, she didn't know. But she was the mother and needed to go first. She walked into the bedroom and felt a mixture of disappointment and relief when she saw that the bed was neatly made. Next, she went to the bathroom. It was also tidy. Gabe was nowhere to be found. The last time he went out, he left us a note on the kitchen table. Travis went to check. He shook his head. No note. Chancy looked at Travis's panicked expression and knew she had to remain calm. I'm sure he just went out for a little while. He'll be back soon. Mom, we'd planned to work on the floor today. We talked about it after the concert. Her breath caught. Maybe he had left because of what happened between them the night before. Should we check the closet and dresser to see if his things are there? The irony of Travis's question hit her full force. Gabe didn't have material items. Everything, even the very clothes he'd been wearing, had come from her. What did Travis expect to find? At least it would give him something to do. Sure, go ahead, she said mechanically. She pulled out a kitchen chair and sat down. Numbness settled over her. Part of her felt stupid for getting so worked up. For all she knew, Gabe would walk through the door any minute, and then she would have to explain why they were in the apartment and why Travis was searching the bedroom. Mom? Travis walked back into the room, and when she saw his stricken expression, she felt her throat constrict. She forced herself to remain calm. What is it? she asked, careful to keep the panic out of her voice. This. He handed her a manila envelope. She opened it and pulled out the contents. A ripped 8x10 photo. She frowned. It was a photo of Gabe, loading something into a van. That building. It looked familiar. Then she gasped when she realized it was the soup kitchen. Turn the pieces over, Travis instructed. She turned them over. Tears sprang in her eyes as she read the words. I know what you're doing. Get out of Chansey's life, or I'll turn you in. This is your final warning. The words blurred and she saw bright lights shooting around her. She forced herself to breathe in through her nose and out through her mouth. It was working. She felt her body relax. Her hands were still shaking, but otherwise she was fine. Mom, what does this mean? Red streaks were running across Travis's pale cheeks, and he looked like he was about to break down. She put a hand on his arm. I'm not sure, but we'll get to the bottom of it. She looked him in the eye. We'll get to the bottom of it, she repeated. I promise. He nodded. When they got back into the house, Travis turned to her. What should we do? Chensi began pacing back and forth. I don't know. Let me think. 
The realization of what was happening was slowly sinking in, even though her mind didn't want to believe it. From what she could gather, it looked like someone was blackmailing Gabe with that picture. But what could he possibly have been taking out of the soup kitchen? There was nothing of value in the building. She thought back to the evening when she and Janet had gone to the soup kitchen. She'd thought she saw Gabe talking to Harriet. Her mind raced to the next step. Who had written the block letters? Even as she thought the words, the answer came like a sucker punch to the gut. Jake. Was Jake the one blackmailing Gabe? It had to be him. The wording of the threat was peculiar. Personal. The blackmailer had warned Gabe to get out of Chansey's life. A wave of dizziness hit her, and she tried to figure out what to do. She needed to call the police. But first, she needed to talk to Jill. Jill would know what to do. She picked up her phone to call and then realized that she was getting a call from a number she didn't recognize. She answered it. Hello? Chancy. Yes? This is Ted Marsh. Hi, Ted. She couldn't remember Ted ever calling her before. Is everything okay? There was a pause. She gripped the phone tighter. Ted, what's going on? His voice broke and she could tell he was crying. Panic gripped her like a vice. What's wrong? It's Janet. She's in the ICU. She was attacked at the soup kitchen this morning. Oh, no! What's wrong? Travis said. Chancy shook her head in disbelief, still speaking into the phone. Ted, I'm so sorry, she whispered hoarsely. Is she okay? She has severe head trauma. She's in a coma. The doctors aren't sure what's going to happen. He broke down. Which hospital is she in? She went through the motions of writing the information down, feeling detached from the situation, as if she were in a dream, a nightmare. She ended the call and looked at Travis. Janet has been in an accident. I've got to go to the hospital to check on her. Is she okay? I hope so. She called Jill, praying that she would answer. She couldn't remember what Jill's work schedule was for the week. Jill answered on the first ring, and the words rushed out. Something has happened to Janet. She got attacked at the soup kitchen. Even as she spoke the words, the horror of it settled over her. I'm going to leave Travis here with Susie. Would you mind keeping your phone close by in case they need anything? Sure. But what happened? I'm not sure. I'll let you know as soon as I find out the details. Bye. She turned to Travis. I'm going to run to the hospital and check on Janet. Jill has her phone. Call her if you need anything. But what about Gabe? We'll discuss it when I get back. Travis looked like he might argue, but she gave him a warning look, so he clamped his lips shut. Janet's in bad shape, she explained. I have to make sure she's okay. Ted's beside himself. Her phone began ringing. She looked down and realized it was stocked in Sanderson. He'd probably found out something about the soup kitchen, but she didn't have time to talk to him now. She clicked the button on the top to silence the ringer. After you eat breakfast, get Susie dressed, she instructed Travis. Don't forget to put the food away. I'll be back soon. Okay, he rolled his eyes. Her phone rang again. Stockton Sanderson. She clicked off the ringer. He was persistent. She was putting on her coat and about to dash out the door when the phone rang a third time. Stockton. Again. Geez, the man wasn't giving up. It must be important. Hello, this is Chansey. She hoped her hurried voice would let him know she didn't have much time. Chansey, I'm so glad I caught you. Stockton Sanderson here. Hi, Stockton. I just want you to know that I'm so sorry about what happened. She was confused. About Janet? How had he known about the attack? Yes, about her and everything else. I'm running out the door to go to the hospital now. 
Her husband says she's in a coma. She stopped, just now realizing what he'd said. What did you mean by everything else? He hesitated. I can assure you that I had no idea what Drake was doing. His voice went hard. I will see to it that he's prosecuted to the fullest extent. When I think about what he was doing behind my back, it makes my blood boil. The words were coming at her too fast. She leaned against the wall and raked her hair out of her face. Drake? Who was Drake? Stockton, I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. You haven't heard. I'm sorry. I just assumed you knew. I know that Janet was attacked this morning at the soup kitchen, but that's all I know. The day's events were beginning to take their toll as irritation coated her voice. What is going on here? Wow, okay. Let me start from the beginning. You were right to come to me with concern about the soup kitchen. As it turned out, my assistant Drake and Harriet were in cahoots together. Rather than taking care of the needs of the soup kitchen, they were skimming money off the top for themselves. She drew in a ragged breath. A surge of anger ran through her. I can't believe they would do such a thing, she spat. Max trusted Harriet. He gave her a job when no one else would. He cared about her. He grunted. No good deed goes unpunished. I trusted Drake, too. He was my right-hand man. What does this have to do with Janet? From what I gather, when you came into the office asking questions, Drake knew that I wouldn't stop until I got to the bottom of the problem. He also knew that the trail would lead straight to Harriet. Where is Harriet? She'd like to tell her a thing or two. Silence. Stockton? She's dead. Chancy gasped. Dead? How? One of her neighbors found her on the front porch, bludgeoned to death. She put a hand over her mouth. Drake? Yes. Drake is in custody, and he confessed to killing her. He went to the soup kitchen this morning intending to kill Janet. Why? She saw him talking to Harriet, and he knew that Janet could identify him. Dwayne, the boy that works at the soup kitchen, came up on the scene. He fought with Drake and stabbed him with a butcher knife. Drake fled the scene, and Dwayne called 911. His swift reaction saved your friend's life. Yeah, if she lives. Tears were flowing down Chansey's face. Even as she was listening to Stockton describing the events that had taken place, they seemed surreal. Something out of a horror movie. Not real life. Then she realized that Stockton was still talking. She forced herself to concentrate on what he was saying. Drake was severely injured by the stab wound and didn't get far before the police picked him up. The whole thing is horrible, she uttered. Yeah, it's bad. He paused. But I'm afraid there's more. More? What else could there possibly be? Drake and Harriet weren't only embezzling money. They were also using homeless people to rob houses. What? They were using the soup kitchen as a front to store the merchandise. In fact, your neighborhood has been one of their primary targets. Last night, they robbed the Wutherford Mansion. Thankfully, the thieves were apprehended while the robbery was taking place. Someone called in an anonymous tip. Three homeless men were arrested. Oh, no. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. It all came together in one cruel twist. Gabe. The picture of him loading the van. Her seeing Gabe at the soup kitchen, talking to Harriet. Gabe had been robbing the homes, and somehow Jake had found out. She slumped to the ground, not able to muffle the sob that was building in her chest. Chancy, are you okay? Another sob. I... I'm fine. 
she squeaked. I've got to let you go. Chancy, if there's anything I can do... She ended the call and wept. Jill turned on the television. The local news was on, and she was halfway watching it as she cleaned the kitchen. Then she heard the reporter mention a robbery at the Weatherford mansion. Knowing it was in Chancy's neighborhood, she stopped what she was doing and looked at the screen. The reporter was saying how they'd apprehended the three homeless men who were responsible. Her jaw dropped when she saw the familiar face. Heaven help us, she said, dropping what she was doing. She had to get to Chancy. I don't care what you say. I'm going. Jill looked at the stubborn teenager with his lower lip thrust out. Travis was sitting at the kitchen table with his arms crossed. He was trying to be tough, but she could tell that underneath that rough exterior she would find a devastated little boy. How she hated Gabe at this moment. She wanted to get in his face and claw his eyes out, or pummel his face until it resembled hamburger meat. No wonder Sergeant Scott hadn't recognized his name. It seemed that Gabe had left the police force some years back and embarked on a life of crime. Chancy and Travis were his greatest victims. And now Travis was insisting that they go down to the police station so that he could talk to Gabe face to face. I know you feel the need to confront this horrible man, this criminal, but I don't think it's a good idea. He shook his head. I'm going. Angry tears filled his eyes. I trusted him, he said hoarsely. And Mom! His voice broke, and he was unable to continue. He buried his head in his arms, and she could tell from the way his shoulders were heaving that he was sobbing. Maybe it would do him some good to confront Gabe. Heck, she wanted to confront him too. But tromping to the jail and demanding they let them see him wasn't the answer. She'd learned how futile that was. She sat down beside Travis and put a hand on his arm. Hey. He dodged away from her. Hey, she said more firmly. I'm not the enemy here. Look at me. He kept his head buried. Look at me, Travis. Finally, he looked up at her, his face red and blotchy and his eyes swollen. I'll take you to the police station. You will? Yes, but we're going to do this my way. She stood and went to the counter. She retrieved her phone from her purse. She held out a card and began punching in the number. Hello, Sergeant Scott. This is Jill Nichols. I met with you the other day. There have been some new developments since we last spoke. I have a favor to ask. A few minutes later, she ended the call and fluffed her short hair. Okay, you and I are going down to the station to talk to Sergeant Scott. I'll get Wyatt to stay here and watch the kids. But what about Mom? She might want to go, too. Chancy was borderline hysterical when Jill arrived, so she'd given her a sedative and put her to bed. This is a lot for your mom to take in. She's resting. She gave him a slight smile, tinged with sadness. I don't think she's up for this. Travis nodded glumly, and Jill could read him like a book. He was worried that Chancy would fall back into the funk she was in before she met Jake. How she wanted to assure Travis that it wasn't true, but she herself was also worried about that same thing. Excuse me, I'll decide whether or not I stay or go. Jill looked up to see Chancy standing in the doorway. I thought you were resting. I gave you a sedative. Chancy gave her younger sister a reproving look. Yes, you did, but I spit it out. What? I'm not going down that path. She shook her head. Never again. The relief she saw come over Travis's face caused fresh tears to well in her eyes. She'd cried so much over the past few hours that she was surprised she had any tears left. I'm upset about Gabe, too. She gave Travis a sad smile. He's not the man we thought he was. Her breath caught, and she hiccuped 
to hide the sob that was building in her chest. I think Gabe owes us an explanation, and by golly, we're gonna get it. Chapter 17 Jake watched as Chansey, Jill, and Travis left the house. He could tell from Chansey's strained expression and her wounded eyes that she'd taken the news about Gabe harshly. He longed to take her in his arms and comfort her, the same as he had when she was mourning the loss of Max. When would she learn that he was the only one she could trust? He suspected that her preoccupation with Gabe stemmed from the fact that he resembled Max, same build and same demeanor. Also, Gabe had tricked her into believing that he was someone he wasn't. Now that Gabe was out of the picture, it was time for the two of them to start thinking about their future. He shivered, the cold penetrating through his coat. Maybe they would go to Palm Springs or Rosemary Beach. He laughed inwardly. Heck, with the money Chansey had, they could even live somewhere like Hawaii. He would buy her a bungalow on the beach. Nothing too showy. He got in his car and started the engine. When Chansey's Lexus passed by, he started his car and pulled out, keeping a safe distance behind them. He wondered where they were going. When they arrived at the police station and approached the window with the hole cut out of the center, Jill recognized the same middle-aged female officer who'd been there before. She was expecting a scowl or a rude comment, but couldn't have been more surprised when the woman smiled. Mrs. Nichols, Sergeant Scott told me that you would be coming. Wait one minute and I'll call an officer to escort you in. Travis looked impressed. He gave her a thumbs up. Aunt Jill, you rock. She gave him a courtesy smile and then turned her attention to Chansey. Her face was as pale as the snow outside her lips drawn in a tight line. You sure you're up for this? Yeah, I need to do this. Chansey spoke the words as if she were trying to convince herself. A young officer escorted them down the hall to Sergeant Scott's office. He stood when they entered the room. He walked around his desk and shook Jill's hand. Ms. Nichols, it's a pleasure. Jill did the introductions. This is my sister Chansey and her son Travis. Please, call me Landon, he said warmly. Have a seat. And then, realizing that there were only two seats and three of them, he motioned at the young officer. We need another chair in here, please. He nodded and hurried to get it. Two seconds later, he was back with another chair. They sat down. Landon gave Chansey an appraising look. So you're the one. I'm sorry, I don't understand. She looked at Jill. I thought he knew why we are here. Jill's forehead scrunched in frustration. Sergeant Scott, earlier when we spoke on the phone, I told you... Landon, please call me Landon. Okay, Landon. This conversation was getting stranger by the minute. Why he was acting like this was a social call, she had no idea. I told you about the history that Chansey had with Gabe. As I told you on the phone this afternoon, Gabe was arrested for the Wutherford robbery. He told Chansey he'd been a detective at one time. That's why I came to your office before to talk to you. She felt like she was spelling things out for a two-year-old. Was the man a complete imbecile? He smiled broadly. Yes, you did. He winked at Chansey. Jill about fell out on the floor. Did you just wink at my sister? She leaned forward in her chair, eyeing him. This isn't some joke. My sister has been hurt by this criminal, and we want to talk to him. She came out of her seat. You told me over the phone that you would let us talk to him. Landon held up a hand. And so I will. Sit back down. I'm not trying to insult your sister. On the contrary, I have great respect for her. She's done something that I never would have thought possible. He looked at Chansey. Regardless of how this ends, I want to thank you for that. Chansey shook her head. Thank me for what? 
Jill made a face. What is going on here? She glared at Landon. Are you going to let us see Gabe or not? He motioned with his hand, and they turned to see the young officer who'd escorted them in standing at the door. He opened the door and left the room. Jill could feel the blood rushing to her face. What in the world was going on? Hold your horses. There's something you need to see, Landon said. The door opened, and there stood Gabe. He looked surprised to see them. His gaze seemed to rest on Chansey a second longer than on anyone else. Landon waved him in. Detective Michaels, these folks are wanting to talk to you. Jill's jaw dropped, and Chansey looked like she was going to fall out on the floor. Travis just sat there, stunned. Jill was the first to speak. Detective Michaels? No, that's not Detective Michaels. That's Gabe Jones, the man I was telling you about, and the man that was arrested for the Weatherford robbery. Landon looked at the young officer. I think we're going to need another chair. So you're not a criminal but a detective? Wonderment shone in Travis's eyes. That's right, Travis. I'm a detective, Gabe repeated, his eyes fixed on Chansey. I wanted to tell you so many times, but I couldn't. The night before the robbery, I was going to break the rules and tell you the truth. But Susie came into the den, she finished. He nodded. So, that night you saved Travis, it wasn't fate bringing us together. It was all part of some elaborate plan. Chansey's eyes glistened. How could you sit there in the den and tell me a bold-faced lie. The hurt just wouldn't stop. She felt like she was being stabbed in the heart over and over again. Travis looked horrified. Did you hire those thugs to attack me so that you could save me? Landon let out an uneasy laugh. Whoa, now, let's not jump the gun here. He looked at Gabe. You'd better start from the beginning so that there won't be any misunderstandings or lawsuits, he mumbled. Gabe took a deep breath. Travis, I really did save you that night. His eyes met Chansey's. And I didn't lie to you. Fate did bring us together. A tear dribbled down her cheek, and she lifted her chin in the air defiantly. Some fate. Start from the beginning. Landon prompted. Gabe ignored everyone else in the room and directed his comments to Chansey. Everything I told you about my past was correct. Except for the part where you were homeless, she snapped. I never told you I was homeless. You just assumed I was, and I went along with it. That's right. He'd had that strange expression on his face when she mentioned that he was homeless. Still, he'd obviously misled her. She thought about telling him as much, but instead clamped her mouth shut and hugged her arms tightly. Tell them about Andy, Landon said. Gabe took a deep breath, and he hesitated like he didn't know where to start. Finally, he began. I have a younger brother named Andy. From the time he was a teenager, he was in and out of trouble. My parents didn't know what to do with him. Andy started smoking pot, but before long that wasn't enough. He eventually became addicted to cocaine. My parents aren't wealthy people, but they exhausted all of their savings, putting Andy into every rehab center and program they could find. He would get clean for a month or so and would then go back to his old ways. The day he stole from our mother to buy drugs was the last straw. Not knowing what else to do, Dad kicked him out of the house. By this time, I was newly married with a life of my own. Andy came to me for help, but I... His voice grew shaky. I turned him away. I told him he was a no-good drug addict 
and that I wouldn't allow him to wreck my life like he'd wrecked our parents. He clenched his fists and rubbed them on his jeans. That was the last time I saw my brother. He paused, remembering. I was working on a series of robberies, robberies that were being conducted through the use of homeless people. Chancy drew in a quick breath and put a hand over her mouth. The robberies that Harriet and Drake were orchestrating. Yes, Gabe paused, letting that bit of information settle in before continuing. My father's watch was found on the scene of one of the robberies. He'd given that watch to Andy a month before he threw him out. I didn't know if that meant that Andy was one of the homeless people doing the robberies or if he'd pawned the watch and someone else ended up with it. He rubbed his neck. I searched high and low for Andy, working like a madman to solve the case. My wife Miriam was pregnant with our first child at the time. She was upset because I was spending so much time at work and very little time at home. We had an argument. She took off in the car and I went after her. Pain flickered in his eyes turning them a shade darker like the turbulent sea before a storm. That's when she had the accident, Chancy said. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Jill began shaking her head back and forth. An oppressive silence filled the room until Gabe spoke. I became obsessed with solving the robberies. I knew they were somehow being facilitated using the homeless but I never could discover the point of operation. I went into deep cover, practically living on the streets myself. I figured that if I became one of them, then they would start to open up to me, to tell me things they wouldn't tell a normal person. He told Chansey that he'd nearly lost himself when his wife died. Part of what drew her to Gabe to begin with was the loss that they both shared. Now she wondered if that part of his story had been a fabrication to gain her sympathy. And your plan worked, Jill said. Yes, a man on the streets led me to Harriet and the soup kitchen. It took me eight months to convince her to let me start working the robberies. My plan was to get close enough to her so that I could learn who was controlling Harriet. Drake, Chancy said. Yes. Unfortunately, I just learned that today, due to Janet's... Attack. The word was spoken accusingly, and Chansey's eyes were dripping venom as she glared at Gabe. Gabe looked at Travis. That night I saved you. I was working as usual. I saw a boy in trouble and reacted. It wasn't until I went into your home and heard Susie talking that I realized that Max Hamilton was your father. He looked at Chansey, your late husband. He caught her eyes and held them until she looked away. By this time, I knew that the point of operation was the soup kitchen. He paused, knowing the next part wouldn't sit well with Chansey. What I didn't know, however, was if you had any connection to the robberies. At first... Chancy wasn't sure she'd heard him correctly. She arched an eyebrow. You suspected me? The notion was ridiculous, absurd. So did you really fall off the roof and injure your leg? Or was that just another lie that you made up to ingratiate yourself into my life? Oh no, the wound was real, I can vouch for that, Jill piped in. Chancy gave her an incredulous look. Whose side are you on? She hissed. Yours, she said, squeezing Chansey's arm. Always yours. Chansey moved to stand. I believe I've heard enough. Jill caught hold of her arm. Let the man finish. Fine. She gave, gave a scathing look. Go ahead. Finish this. He spread his hands in defeat. What can I say? Living in the apartment provided the perfect cover and was a great opportunity to get to know you and your family. So how long did it take for you to realize that I'm not a criminal? A ghost of a smile flitted over his face. About as long as it took your sister to figure out I wasn't homeless. 
You've got that right, Jill said. Chansey rubbed a hand across her forehead. She was tired of the whole charade and wanted to get to the end so they could get out of here and go home. If she never again saw the likes of Gabe Jones or whatever his name was, it was fine with her. He'd caused her enough heartache in a day to last a lifetime. So you were working the case, getting closer to Harriet, but you still didn't know who was calling the shots. No, I never could figure that part out. Drake was smart. He made sure that Harriet did all of the dirty work and that no one ever connected him. But that all changed when Janet started working at the soup kitchen. Really? How so? Despite herself, Chancy found herself growing interested in his narrative. I discovered today, through Duane, that Janet saw Harriet and Drake talking behind the soup kitchen. He motioned at Chancy. When you went to the foundation and started asking questions about the food shortages, Drake got scared. That's when he went on a rampage. She'd unknowingly poked the hornet's nest, and the results had been horrific. We already know that part, Chancy huffed. Gabe looked surprised. How? Stockton Sanderson called her earlier today, Jill explained. Her eyes sparked. Congratulations, detective. You solved your case. Good job. Can we go now? The words were spoken cuttingly, and Chancy could tell from the wounded look on Gabe's face that they'd hit their mark. I never meant to hurt you he said quietly. All of those things I told you last night were real. His voice went hoarse. When Miriam died, I shut down. I didn't think I could go on. It wasn't until I met you and the kids that I felt a sliver of hope returning. Chancy wanted to believe him. She really did. But how could she? He'd deceived her once. How could she ever trust him again? I can attest to that, Landon said. I was sick with worry. He smiled at Chansey. I know you're angry, and you have every right to be, but this guy here, he's one of the finest men I know, and the fact that he thinks so highly of you, well, that speaks volumes to me. Chansey just shook her head, not sure what to believe. The feelings I have for you are real. I never meant to fall in love with you, but that's what happened, Gabe said earnestly. Love. He said he loved her. She realized at that moment that she'd had the beginnings of the same feelings for him, too. If he'd told her the truth last night, then they might have had a chance. But now? This time, Chansey couldn't stop the tears from falling. She jerkily brushed them away. I don't even know you. You're not the man I thought you were. Travis's eyes went wide. So he's not homeless. What's the big deal? He loves you. Don't you hear what he's saying? The two of you are good together. This won him a look of appreciation from Gabe. I'm sorry, Travis, she sniffed. I'm sorry about everything. She looked at Gabe and could feel the chasm between them growing. There would be no repairing this. Then it occurred to her that she'd been dealt with some hard blows today and she was still functioning. She'd refused to take a sedative, even when Jill was trying to shove it down her throat, and she was here, facing this thing head on. Despite all that had happened, she could find a smidgen of comfort in that, although at the moment it felt like a hollow victory. Gabe rubbed his hand across his jaw. I'm afraid there's more. More? Chansey's eyes were icy. It was the moment of truth. The moment that could either make or break their relationship. If they had any hope of working through this, then Gabe wanted to come clean, so that there wouldn't be any more secrets between them. I met your husband. The floor seemed to fall out from underneath Chansey, and she caught hold of the arms of the chair. Her world was spinning out of control, and she was powerless to stop it. What? She managed to squeak. When my investigations first led to the soup kitchen, I set up an appointment with Max. Of course, at this time, 
I wasn't aware that Harriet was involved. All I knew was that the soup kitchen was somehow connected. Even though I only met him once, I could tell that he was a good man. He offered his full cooperation. Chancy started shaking her head. No, that's not true. If Max had known something was wrong, then he would have told me. Not if he didn't want to worry you, Gabe said gently. I didn't have anything concrete at the time, just suspicions. Maybe he wanted to reserve judgment, find out the facts before he burdened you with them. This couldn't be happening. Her chest was tight, and she felt like she was being stuffed into a coffin, and each piece of forthcoming information was another nail being pounded into the lid. She drew in a breath, trying to gain some composure. Finally, she stood. This conversation is over. She hurried to the door, but before she could leave, Gabe went after her and caught hold of her arm. Chancy, wait. Don't leave like this. She jerked her arm away from him. Then she thought of something else. She reached in her purse and shoved the manila envelope at his chest. He caught it before it fell to the floor. Travis found this in the dresser. You and I both know the threat came from Jake. You weren't even going to tell me. His face fell. That's not fair. I was only trying to protect you. Protect me? She let out a harsh laugh. Really? Protecting me would have been telling me about this. You're right. What? I said, you're right. I should have told you. And he's still out there. We need to talk about this to make sure you're protected now. We need to know if this was an idle threat or if Jake represents a danger to you and your family. Even as we speak, we have people in the department running a check on him. Until we find out more, you don't need to be alone. A small part of her knew that he was right, but the other part, the hurting part of her, was so consumed with his betrayal that she couldn't think straight. I can't think about this tonight. He gave her a long look. Fine, but I'll stop by tomorrow so we can discuss this. She rolled her eyes. Whatever. She looked at Jill and Travis, who were still sitting wide-eyed in their seats. Well, come on, she barked, giving Gabe a withering look. I've had enough of this place for one night. Chapter 18 Well, I think that went pretty well, considering, Landon said after Chansey and her party had left his office. Gabe shook his head. I know you're an optimist, but were you listening to the same conversation I was? I don't know if Chansey can forgive me for this. Landon dismissed the comment with a wave of his hand. Ah, uh, she was just blowing off steam. He chuckled. That's a woman for you. She'll come around. He gave Gabe a speculative look. Only a woman who loves you could get that angry. Trust me. I know. When Doreen gets angry, I just stay out of her way. Chancy cares about you, man. That's obvious. Gabe felt an inkling of hope. You think so? I know so. Landon sat up in his chair. Gabe recognized this as a sign that they needed to discuss more important matters. Okay. Let's talk about Jake Allen. We ran the tag information that you gave us and were able to get his birth date and social security number. Good. There was one good thing that came from Jake's late-night drive past Chansey's house. Since Gabe was by the road, putting out the garbage cans, it gave him the opportunity to memorize his tag. Have you heard anything yet from the background check? No, but they've had plenty of time. He punched a button on his phone picked up the receiver, and held it to his ear. Hello, Samantha, this is Sergeant Scott. I understand your department has been doing a check on one Jake Allen. I need to know what you've got so far. Uh-huh. Well, I understand that these things take time, but I need it now. I'll expect to see you in my office in ten minutes. You can run me through what you have so far. Thank you. He hung up the phone. 
She's got his credit information and address of residence, but is still waiting to hear about his employment. She'll go over everything when she gets here, but she did tell me that he has a clean criminal record. Travis told me that Jake was the lead architect, working on an assisted living home in Draper. How hard could it be to track down that information? According to Samantha, the Hendricks architectural firm is the one overseeing the construction of the assisted living home. Samantha said that her assistant put in a call to the personnel office requesting information about Jake. The personnel manager is on vacation until the day after Christmas. And since Christmas is knocking on the door, it's hard to catch people in the office. Gabe swore under his breath. This is important. Why didn't Samantha send someone over to check? You and I both know how these things work. If we sat around and waited for these yeehaws to do their jobs, we'd never solve any cases. If we want that information, we'll have to get it ourselves. He began drumming his fingers on his desk. Then he turned to his computer and started typing on the keyboard. A moment later, he pulled up the website for the Hendricks Architectural Firm. Gabe walked around the desk and stood behind him, looking over his shoulder. Landon pointed. There's the number for the firm. It looks like it's a family business that's run by two brothers, Lewis and Milton Hendricks. Landon dialed the number and then put the phone on speaker. A woman's voice came over the line. Hendricks Architectural Firm, how may I direct your call? Yes, I would like to speak to Lewis Hendricks, please. I'm sorry, sir, but Lewis is out of town for the holidays. Would you like for me to connect you with his assistant? No. What about Milton Hendricks? Is he available? He is in the office today. I'll connect you. One moment. Before Landon could respond, she'd transferred him. Elevator music came on the line and they waited. A minute later, a woman answered in a crisp tone. Milton Hendricks's office. This is Cindy. How may I help you? Yes, this is Sergeant Landon Scott from the Salt Lake City Police Department, and I need to speak to Mr. Hendricks, please. The woman's voice grew anxious. Uh, okay. Is everything all right? This does involve police business, so I need to speak to him at once. Right away, came the hasty reply. A man's voice came on the line. Milton Hendricks speaking. Yes, Mr. Hendricks, this is Sergeant Landon Scott from the Salt Lake City Police Department. I need to speak to you about one of your architects. Okay, his voice was leery. How can I help you? I'm trying to gather information on a Jake Allen, and I need... I'm sorry, what name did you say? Jake Allen. He's a person of interest in a case that we're working on. We don't have an architect by the name of Jake Allen here. Landon shot Gabe a concerned look. Are you certain? I was told he's one of the lead architects working on the Ravenwood Assisted Living Home in Draper. I'm not sure where you got your information, but we don't have anyone here by that name. And your firm is the one in charge of the Ravenwood Assisted Living Facility? Yes, absolutely. Do you know by chance if there's another assisted living home being built in Draper? No, I don't know of any other home. Okay, we must have gotten some incorrect information. Landon was about to end the call and then thought of something else. Do you mind if I email you a picture of Jake Allen? Then you could look at his photograph to make sure that this man isn't working under another name. I can assure you that we do a thorough check on our personnel before hiring them. Oh, I'm sure you do. Landon's voice was smooth. I just want to make sure I cover all of the bases. Very well, then. Send it over. He gave Landon his email address, and then Landon thanked him for his time and ended the call. Landon looked at Gabe. That was interesting. He pushed another button on his phone. I need you to send a picture of Jake Allen to the following email address. Five minutes after you send it, I want you to call this number and talk to a Mr. Hendricks. I need to know if he recognizes Jake Allen. Gabe began absently rubbing circles over his chin. 
Something about Jake's employment was pricking at him. He kept rolling it around in his mind, trying to figure out why Jake looked so familiar. But for the life of him, he couldn't come up with an answer. There was a knock on the door. Come in, Landon called. An older lady with short gray hair stepped inside the door. Thanks for coming so quickly. Have a seat. You know Detective Michaels. She gave him a curt nod and sat down. Gabe walked around Landon's desk and sat down as well. Tell us what you've got. Landon leaned back in his chair and propped his hands behind his head. I've checked all of the official databases. As I told you over the phone, according to the National Crime Information Center, Jake Allen has a clean record. Not even a traffic ticket. He's been renting a home in Sugar House for the past year and a half. I spoke to his landlord, an elderly lady. She lives a few doors down from him. She says he's quiet and keeps to himself. He paid the deposit and final month's rent in advance. He'd been paying his rent on time up until two months ago. He's a month late at present, and... Landon interrupted her. Did you ask her for a copy of the rental application? He would have put his employment history and references on it. Her deer-in-the-headlights expression let him know that she hadn't done that. Landon shot Gabe a knowing look that said, If you want something done, you've got to do it yourself. As soon as I get back to my desk, I'll call the landlord and ask for a copy of the rental application, she said quickly. He nodded and motioned for her to continue. Using his name and social security number, which I obtained from matching his driver's license number to what shows up in the database, I checked with the three standard credit agencies and discovered that he has four credit cards, three of which are maxed out. He pays the minimum balance on these cards each month. We're still waiting to hear back about his employment at the... She glanced down at her notes. The Hendricks firm. She pushed her glasses up on her nose. I can't access his bank or phone records without a subpoena. Other than that, that's all I have. I know he owns a Nissan Pathfinder. Did you find any information about that? Gabe asked. No, I'm not showing any payments here or a lien holder of any sort. Gabe looked thoughtful. He must have paid for it with cash. He's been living off the credit cards, Samantha said. From what I can tell, he paid his last four rent payments with cash advances from the cards. So he's running out of money, Landon said, and then switched gears. What about his past? Nothing. Samantha looked down at the papers in her hand. The first record I have of him was 18 months ago when he started renting the house. It's as if he just appeared that day. Landon gave Gabe a pointed look, and Gabe caught the meaning instantly. They'd seen this one too many times. A person didn't just appear one day, not if they were operating under a legitimate identity. But if Jake had assumed a false identity, then it would look as though he'd suddenly appeared out of the blue, and it certainly wasn't looking as if he were employed. Employment. Why was that bugging him? He started methodically going over all of the cases he'd worked on during the last 18 months. Only a handful. He'd spent the bulk of the time working on the robberies and checking out the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. Was Jake somehow connected to the Foundation? Thank you, Samantha, Landon said. The woman nodded and got up to leave. Before she walked out the door, Landon stopped her. Could you please make me a copy of the information you have there? You can have this. I have it all on my computer. She handed him the papers. Let me know when you get a hold of that rental application. Will do. She left the room. Landon glanced at the papers in front of him. We have this address, but we would need a search warrant in order to check his place. And we can't get a search warrant without probable cause. The guy's trouble, Landon. I can feel it. 
I agree, something's not adding up here. Landon scratched his head. The phone rang. Hello. Really? Is that so? Very interesting. Thank you. He looked at Gabe. That was Officer Pelt. She just received confirmation from Milton Hendricks' office that they do not know Jake Allen. They don't recognize that picture, and he has never worked for them. Even though he already knew the answer, Gabe asked the question aloud. So the guy fabricated his employment status, is in debt up to his eyeballs. Clearly he was pursuing Chansey because of her money. What recourse does she have? Very little at this point, I'm afraid. Being a sleaze does not constitute breaking the law. Unless Jake breaks the law, which, to my knowledge, he hasn't thus far. He's been stalking her, and he tried to blackmail me. But you have no proof. Chancy suspects he's broken into her home several times. He could see the rebuttal in Landon's eyes. But she never filed a report, he said mostly to himself. To even get a stalking injunction, we would have to be able to show evidence of him doing offenses that would qualify as stalking, such as following her, threatening her, taking pictures. He waved a hand. You get the idea, and then he has to do it twice, he held up his fingers, for it to be considered stalking. Until he does something that warrants suspicion, then we don't have the authority within the law, to do anything. Gabe's head shot up. Within the law. Landon was trying to tell him something. What would you do if this were happening to Doreen? I'd hightail my butt over there and watch over her myself to make sure she's safe. I would do everything in my power to keep her safe, he repeated. Take a few days off if you need to. Goodness knows you've earned it. Trying to solve the robberies. How in the heck am I supposed to keep her safe? At this point, she won't even let me in the door. Heck, man, I don't know. You've got to figure that part out yourself. I can't do everything for you. Gabe held up a hand. Okay, I got you. Back to the legal aspect. We only need probable suspicion, and then we can check his home and subpoena his phone and bank records. Exactly. Landon snapped his fingers. You give me something, and we'll be on him like a tick on a hound dog, I can promise you that. Okay, he said mechanically. He was missing something. It was right there, and he couldn't grasp it. He stood. I'm going to go home and get a shower, and then I'm going to head over to Chansey's and see if she'll let me in the door. Landon chuckled. Good luck. I'll need it, Gabe said dryly. Then he thought of something else. He handed Landon the manila envelope containing the photo. Could you check this for fingerprints? If this Jake is as smart as I think he is, I don't think you'll find any. Yeah, you're probably right, but we have to cover all of the angles. You're right. Gabe was to the door when Landon spoke. Hey. He turned. I know things are rough right now with your woman but it's good to see you caring. Caring? Gabe raised an eyebrow. For a time there, when you lost Miriam, well, I wasn't sure you were gonna pull through. You kind of went off the grid there for a while. He paused. I care about you, man. He cleared his throat to hide his emotion. Welcome back to the world of the living. You're a good friend, Landon. You've stood by me all of these years, even when I didn't deserve it. Landon winked. You know how it is, partner. I got your back. And I yours. It was a phrase they'd often repeated when they were actually partners. Long before Landon had been promoted to sergeant and before Gabe's life had fallen apart. Landon was from Texas, and Gabe had always appreciated his open manner and plain speech. He was Gabe's closest friend, and he was grateful to have him in his corner now. Gabe closed the door behind him. He'd worked so hard to solve the robberies. The culprit was behind bars and would hopefully stay there for a long time. 
But he felt no elation, only relief that it was finally over. He still had no idea where his brother Andy was, or if he was even still alive. The trail had gone cold, and he had little hope of finding him. A good woman, Janet, was in the hospital fighting for her life, and Chansey was living in fear of some stalker. Chansey. She'd consumed his thoughts from the moment he'd met her, and he knew that no matter what happened between them romantically, he had to make sure she was safe. So let me see if I'm understanding you. You liked Gabe when you thought he was homeless, but now that you realize he's a gainfully employed detective, you're not so sure about him. Chancy threw up her hands. That's not what I'm saying. Then you'd better explain it to me because you're not making a whole lot of sense here. Chancy rolled her eyes. She and Jill were in her kitchen. Travis and Susie, along with all four of Jill's children, were in the den watching the Polar Express and eating popcorn. Jill had piped in Christmas music through her iPhone, and it was playing on the sound system above the refrigerator. When they'd returned from the police station, Jill picked up her kids and hauled them to Chansey's house. Then she insisted that they start their yearly tradition of baking Christmas cookies. Chansey hedged, saying that she was worn out and needed to rest, but her complaint fell on deaf ears. They were now on their third batch of chocolate chip cookies and had already made oatmeal raisin. I never did get to the hospital to visit Janet. Maybe I should head over there now. You can visit her tomorrow, Jill countered. But I want to make sure that Ted knows how much I care. Ted knows, but if you're that worried about it, then call him and find out how she's doing, and tell him you're coming tomorrow. He'll understand. Chansey knew from experience that arguing with her sister did little good, so she called Ted as Jill instructed. He assured her that Janet's vitals were stable and that the doctors were expecting her to come out of the coma very soon. She fervently hoped he was right. I'll be there tomorrow, she assured him. The oven timer went off. Jill grabbed a mitt and removed the cookie sheet. Then she turned to Chansey. Back to Gabe. Chansey groaned. Let it go, would you? I need time to sort this out. What's there to sort out? He cares about you, loves you, and you care about him. See? Sorting done. Maybe I should have gone into counseling instead of nursing. More reasonable hours. It's not that simple. Chansey dragged a hand through her hair. Jill used the spatula to scoop up a cookie. She took a bite. Mmm, that's good. Want one? Sure, why not? She scooped up another and handed it to Chansey on a napkin. Nothing like a warm chocolate chip cookie, Jill said appreciatively. Why don't we call Gabe and invite him over? I saw him give Travis his number, and Wyatt's coming by as soon as he gets off work. We'll make some hamburgers and enjoy the evening. Sometimes talking to Jill felt like talking to a stump. She gritted her teeth. I'm not calling Gabe. The words flew out of her mouth louder than she'd intended, and she saw Jill flinch at the outburst. Why? I told you, I can't trust him. Her voice was rising, but she didn't care. It felt good to get it all out in the open. He lied to me. He pretended to be someone he's not. Max would have never done that to me, she finished. Why couldn't she find someone like Max? She'd thought that Gabe was somewhat like him, but how wrong she was. Jill crossed her arms and leaned back against the counter. She eyed Chansey. You know, Max wasn't the saint you make him out to be. Chansey's face went ashen. A blinding anger seized her. What are you talking about? He was a good man, but he wasn't perfect. I'm not acting like he was perfect. Oh, yes, you are and no one can measure up to the saint you're making Max out to be. Why are you doing this? Max was good. Tears sprang in her eyes. He helped people. Yes, he did help people. And, if you'll remember, 
he was a bit selfish when you first met him. He was a normal guy who'd inherited a great deal of money, and he didn't know what to do with it. So he did what every guy would have. He spent it on himself and toys. And then you came along and helped him become the man he was. You're the one who convinced him to start the foundation, the soup kitchen. You guys worked through it together. Tears were rolling down Chansey's face. You don't know Max like I did. You can't imagine what I've been through, how it feels to be alone. Jill's eyes filled with tears. I love you, sis. And you're right. I can't even begin to imagine what you've been through. The only reason I even brought up Max was to help you understand that you need to stop comparing Gabe to this fantasy you've concocted in your head. You have the capacity to love again. I've seen the way you look at Gabe, the way he looks at you. Now don't think for one minute I'm saying that you need to let Gabe off the hook. I'd make him pay. Her eyes sparked. Oh, you'd better believe I'd make him pay for what he did, but don't cut him off. Love is not perfect, Chansey. Love is imperfect and messy and wonderful. She gave Chansey a tender look. You deserve to be happy. She considered the things that Jill was saying. Part of it was making sense. Had she made Max out to be more than he was? Even as she asked the question, she knew the answer. She had. She'd done it out of self-preservation to give her something to cling to when she was alone. When Jake came along, he didn't rock her world like Gabe did because she didn't love him. She'd cared about the man she thought he was, but he never made her feel the way Gabe did. Gabe had brought the color back into her drab world. Her defenses were crumbling, piece by piece, thanks to her bossy sister. I suppose I can kind of see why Gabe did what he did. Jill's face brightened. Yeah, that's right. Kind of, Chansey said, giving her a warning look. Okay, it's a start. And I am glad he's not homeless. It was refreshing to see Gabe dressed in his own clothes today rather than Max's old things. Jill laughed. Amen. She shook her head. I knew he wasn't homeless. Knew it from the beginning. Yeah, I guess deep down I knew it too. Well, it took a lot of courage for him to tell you that he'd met Max. Yeah, Chansey's eyes widened. I thought so too. She still wasn't sure how she felt about the whole thing and it stung that Max hadn't told her Gabe's suspicions. Then again, according to Gabe, they were only suspicions at the time. Max probably didn't want to burden her with it. Jill's phone started buzzing. Hey. Yeah, we're at Chansey's. Are you still at work? Come here when you get off. I thought we'd make some hamburgers. Her face fell. What? I thought that was next week. She blew out a breath. Okay. I'll load up the kids and meet you at the house. Love you too. Bye. She shook her head, a disgusted look on her face. We have to go to Wyatt's parents' house. Oh. A laugh bubbled in Chansey's throat. Judging by your expression, I thought something terrible had happened. She let out a dramatic sigh. No, I was just looking forward to chilling tonight. Now I have to make sure the kids look decent, and I have to make sure they're on their best behavior. Wyatt's mom is making a pre-Christmas dinner, and Wyatt's siblings and their families are coming. I forgot all about it. Sorry we can't do the burgers. A part of Chansey was relieved. She was looking forward to getting some rest. No problem. I'll take a rain check. She looked at the mounds of cookies. There was no way she, Travis, and Susie could eat all of them. Do you want to take some of these with you? Yeah, I guess I should. That way I'll have something to take to the dinner tonight. She craned her neck toward the den. Kids, get your stuff together. We've got to go. Jake selected the largest bouquet he could find. It contained over 20 long-stemmed red roses, tucked into a massive explosion of greenery and baby's breath. He looked at the price tag. 
It was a whopping $125, but Chansey was worth every penny. And soon money wouldn't be an obstacle. He'd already picked up a box of truffles and some balloons. This was the last item on his list. He placed the bouquet on the counter. The sales clerk, a girl in her early twenties, smiled brightly. Wow, this is the most beautiful bouquet in the store. Are you buying it for someone special? He hated making small talk. Yes, my fiancé. She's a lucky girl. He gave her a polite smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. Red roses are my favorite, although I like the yellow ones, too. But those are harder to find this time of year. He tuned her out as she kept blabbering on. When she told him the total, he handed her a credit card. As soon as she swiped it, she frowned. She shifted uncomfortably. I'm sorry, sir, but this card has been declined. His face darkened. There must be some mistake. A problem with your machine. Run it again. Okay. She tried again and then shook her head, handing him back the card. I'm sorry. Do you have another card? The idiocy of this girl was unbelievable. He scowled. This is unacceptable. I will not be humiliated by some stupid sales clerk who doesn't know how to operate the machine. Her face went blotchy, and she looked as though she might cry. I'm sorry, sir. He didn't have time for this. He pulled out another card and thrust it at her. Try this one, he ordered. He noticed that her hand was shaking as she swiped it. She looked relieved when the charge went through. Her smile was restored to its former position on her plain face as she handed him the receipt. I'm sorry about the inconvenience, she began but clamped her lips shut when he snatched the receipt from her hand. I won't be shopping here again, he barked as he grabbed the bouquet and stormed out. Chapter 19 Chansey had just gotten Susie dressed from her bath when the doorbell rang. She ran a hand down her wet hair. Okay, toots, you're done. Can I go and play Barbies, Mommy? Yes, but it's almost bedtime. Okay, she chimed, skipping off. The doorbell rang again. She came out of the bathroom and saw that the door to Travis's room was closed. He'd been holed up there ever since Jill and her kids had left. He was still sulking over the fact that she'd not been willing to forgive Gabe of his every transgression right there at the station on the spot. It was astonishing that Gabe could deceive her and break her heart, but somehow Travis managed to turn it around and blame her. She raked her hair out of her face. Teenagers, she mumbled. The doorbell rang again. Don't worry, she called out loudly, hoping Travis would hear it through the closed door. I'll get it. She hurried down the stairs. It rang a third time. She looked through the peephole, but all she could see were red roses. Her heart skipped a beat. Gabe was coming to apologize. She'd had some time to think about what Jill had said, and she was planning on forgiving Gabe, but she'd make him work for it first. She smoothed down her hair and adjusted her clothes. Too bad she'd not taken the time to change into something other than jeans and a sweatshirt. Oh well, this was as good as he was going to get tonight. She opened the door and stepped back so that he could enter. Hey, she said, keeping her voice neutral. He walked in. Hello, Chansey. She stumbled back, nearly falling in the process. Jake, she managed to utter as a sinking feeling settled in the pit of her stomach. He smiled and held out the roses. Hi, beautiful. I've missed you. He spoke nonchalantly, as if they were a couple and he'd spoken to her only yesterday. Rather than taking the roses, she just stood there, gaping at him. Her heart went into panic mode when she realized that he'd closed the door behind him. I'll just put these on the counter. He moved to walk into the kitchen, but she blocked him. No, she blurted. He cocked his head sideways, giving her a funny look. No, just put them on the table, over there. He frowned. Okay. 
He tied the balloons around the base of the bouquet and handed her the box of chocolate. I got you truffles, your favorite. A thousand thoughts were racing through her head, the first being that she'd left her phone on the counter. Then she thought of Susie in the den and Travis in his room. Her heart felt like it was trying to claw out of her chest. She clasped her hands together to keep them from shaking. What are you doing here? I wanted to see how you were doing. I saw on the news where Gabe was arrested, and I was worried. Anger took hold, crowding out the fear. You were worried? This guy was too much. He'd sent Gabe the photo with the threat on the back, and now he was coming here acting like he was worried? Yes. They were still standing by the front door. He motioned to the couch. May I sit down? His voice was polite, courteous. No. His jaw fell a notch, and he leaned forward slightly as if he couldn't believe he'd heard her correctly. He wet his lips. What? No, she repeated, trying to keep her voice even. Jake, I told you, we're through. He ran a hand through his hair. Chancy, I know you're upset about Gabe, but he was no good for you. For a split second, the mask slipped away, and she saw what could only be described as malice trickle into his eyes. Then it was gone, making her wonder if she'd only imagined it. His expression was solicitous. I warned you about him from the get-go. You should have listened to me. I need you to leave. Now. She was near yelling. He rocked back, confused. Why are you so angry? I only came to bring you flowers. His voice became wistful. Remember the fun times we had, our first date to the drive-in? How we held hands and laughed through the movie? Or the night we went to the play together? Remember? You love me. I don't love you, Jake. I never loved you. His eyes went hard. Don't say that. Don't ever say that. He took a breath, and she could tell he was fighting for composure. No, he said in a calmer voice. You're confused. You need to sit down and let me take care of you. Why are you saying these things? Gabe's no longer here. There's no need to pretend. I don't need you to take care of me, and I'm not pretending. Panic was clawing at her. I need you to leave. Get out before I call the police. He grabbed her arm. You don't know what you're saying. Tears pooled in her eyes. Let go of me. A peculiar look lit his eyes, and she sensed in some instinctual way that her terror pleased him. She uttered a silent prayer. Please help me. The doorbell rang. Jake went stiff and dropped her arm. He took a step back from her. Come in, she screamed. The door opened, and there stood Gabe. Chansey's knees went weak with relief, and she clutched her arm. Gabe looked at Chansey's stricken face. Did he hurt you? Thank goodness you're here, she exclaimed, breathless. Has he given you any cause to feel threatened? Gabe continued. I'm okay, she said, her voice shaky. Gabe stepped up to Jake, who cowered back and held up his hands. What are you doing here? Gabe demanded. I was bringing her flowers. His eyes narrowed. The question is, what are you doing here? You were arrested. He became animated and pointed. Chancy, this guy's a robber. He's the one that robbed the Weatherford mansion. Is that why you tried to blackmail me? His face drained. I don't know what you're talking about. Gabe balled his fist, and Chancy could tell from the furious expression on his face that he was going to punch Jake. She stepped up behind him and caught his arm. Don't. He's not worth it. Jake's face seemed to fold into itself as he looked at Chansey in disbelief. You're choosing him over me? His eyes began darting wildly back and forth between Chansey and Gabe. I told you to get out, she yelled. If you ever come near me or my family again, I'll get a restraining order against you. A sardonic smile twisted over Jake's face. I would never hurt you, Chansey. 
His voice became pleading. Listen to me. He's deceiving you. Why can't you see it? Gabe glowered at him. If you so much as look in her direction again, I'll put you so far under the jail that you'll never see sunlight again. Jake opened the door and backed out. He zeroed in on Chansey. You're making a mistake. You know that, don't you? His voice grew deadly calm. Is that a threat? Gabe countered. No, Jake said quietly. No threat. I would never threaten the woman I love. Chancy is a grown woman and she can make her own decisions, although I must say I'm very disappointed in you, Chancy. Jake began shaking his head back and forth slowly. Very disappointed. Gabe walked out and watched Jake get in his pathfinder and drive away. He had a half a mind to go after him, but he needed to take care of Chansey first. When he went back inside, Chansey was sitting on the couch, hugging herself. She was pale as a ghost and trembling all over. He sat down beside her. Hey. When he brushed a stray lock of hair from her face, she let out a cry and fell into his arms. He held her and let her get it all out. A few minutes later, she pulled away from him, somewhat embarrassed. What did he do to you? He implored, rubbing her arm. She shook her head. What did he do? That's just it. He didn't do anything except for bring me gifts. Did he touch you? He grabbed my arm. She shuddered. It wasn't so much what he did or even what he said. It was the look in his eyes. He's crazy. I've had enough of this. He stood and retrieved his phone from his pocket. Landon? Hey, it's me. I believe we have our probable cause. I just got to Chansey's house and Jake was here. Yes, he was in the house. No, he rang the doorbell and Chansey let him in. Is she pressing charges? Well, no, she's not pressing charges. He didn't do anything per se, just shook her up pretty badly. Listen, I need to get a restraining order to keep him from coming near Chansey or the kids again. Hey, could you get a squad car over here to watch the home? I'm thinking for about 48 hours, give or take. Yeah, I know it's unorthodox, but under the circumstances... Thanks, man. I knew I could count on you. He ended the call and sat down. That was Landon. The sergeant? Yeah, he's sending a squad car over to watch the house. Relief went through her and she felt a well of gratitude overflowing for Gabe. Thank you. He blew out a breath. I just wish there was more we could do. As much as I'd like to go after that jerk and pound him to the ground, the law won't allow it. He shook his head. He's smart. And dangerous, he added mentally. If Jake hadn't point-blank stated that he wasn't threatening Chansey, there might have been something he could do. As it was, his hands were tied. The only thing we can do right now is to get a restraining order against him. That way, if he so much as steps a foot near you, then we can lock him up. Now, if you want to press charges, then that's a different story. Charges for what? Bringing me flowers? She threw her hands in the air. He grabbed your arm. I hardly think that's cause to lock a man up. Yeah, you're probably right. Even if they locked him up, the charges wouldn't stick and he'd be out within 24 hours. And as much as he longed to do it, locking up someone for personal reasons wouldn't sit well with the department. They had to find more on him before they could do anything. She put her head in her hands and groaned. He began rubbing her back. Hey. She shook her head. Hey, he repeated. Her eyes met his, and he winced at the fear he saw in them. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay here with you for as long as it takes. She gave him a weak smile. Thank you. It's the least I can do, considering. Uh-huh, you owe me big time. He was relieved to see a slight smile come over her face. 
Then she surprised him by shoving his arm. Yeah, I suppose I do. I figure it'll take... He feigned thinking. Oh, a lifetime or more to make it up to you. She caught her eyes at him. At least. I'm sorry about everything, he whispered. I know, she whispered back. He leaned in to kiss her, and in the instant before her lips met his, the thought ran through her mind that Jill would be disappointed in her. She'd not made him grovel nearly enough. His lips touched hers, and she felt that familiar tingle that she was starting to crave. She melted into him, wrapping her arms around his neck. She allowed herself to get lost in the moment, for here in his arms, in this one tiny fraction of time, she felt safe. Jake watched as the cop car pulled up and parked in front of Chansey's house. Then Gabe came out and began talking to him. As he watched the interaction between Gabe and the other cops, a burning anger took hold, and he knew that his earlier assumption had been correct. Gabe was some sort of police officer. Of course it hadn't been that hard to piece it all together. First of all, he was walking around free after the robbery. Then there was his unusual use of language. Has he given you any cause to feel threatened? He'd worked in security long enough to recognize the catchphrases. The telltale part came when he caught a glimpse of Gabe's gun, tucked in the back of his jeans, the biggest giveaway of all. He swore under his breath. He'd not counted on this complication. But he was in too far to turn back now. He trembled slightly, thinking of Chansey's expressive eyes and the way her hair fell softly on her shoulders. Adrian's eyes were expressive, too. They'd been so happy when they first married— but then she wouldn't listen to him. She wouldn't stay home like he wanted her. She spent too much time out partying with her friends, wearing clothes that would cause other men to desire her. He'd asked her to change, to stay home with him, but she refused. They had an argument. She told him he was crazy. Big mistake. And then she'd run from him. But he tracked her down, he tracked her across six states, as if she thought she could escape him. A grim light flickered in his eyes as he thought about how it had ended. Things were coming to a head now, too. This time, things would be different. Although he was starting to lose faith in Chansey, too. She'd said such hateful things to him, even after he bought her the gifts. But then she'd redeemed herself when she told Gabe that he'd not hurt her. With a few simple words, she could have had him arrested, but she hadn't. We'll be together soon, Chansey. You have my word. He glowered at Gabe, hatred pulsing through his veins. Nothing or no one would come between him and the woman he loved. But he would need to be more cautious. He was sure they were already checking out his background. They would have realized by now that he'd never worked as an architect. He wondered if they realized that he'd worked at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. He'd never worked security a day in his life before he started working there, but he'd needed a job and was too afraid to look for work in his field, the field of finance. He'd been worried that someone might make a connection between him and what happened in Boston. At the same time he'd applied for the job at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation, he'd also applied for a security job at another company. He'd been offered both jobs within a day of each other, and he'd chosen the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. The first time he saw Chansey walk into the building, he knew why. It was a summer day, and she was wearing white linen pants and a light blue short-sleeved shirt, simple yet tasteful. He was working the front area and opened the door for her when she approached. She gave him an appreciative glance, followed by a nod and a thank you. And then their eyes had connected. He felt a bolt of electricity run through him, and from that moment on, he was smitten. He started learning everything he could about her. Most suitors would have given up when they realized that she was the wife of the owner of the foundation. But for Jake, that made the deal even sweeter. Fate had brought them together. He could have just as easily fallen for a woman with no wealth or means, 
but Chansey had it all. With her money and his investment background, they would be unstoppable. Of course, he hadn't counted on Travis and Susie, two hindrances that would need to be dealt with. But first things first, he told himself. His supervisor, Hobbs, had seen him snapping a picture of Chansey with his iPhone, and then the old man became curious. He went snooping in his locker and found the camera, containing digital pictures of her. Chansey in her kitchen, taking care of the home. How he loved that about her. Unlike Adrian, Chansey valued the home and knew what it meant to take care of it. She would know how to take care of him as well. Hobbs saw pictures of Chansey picking up Susie from school. Chansey and Susie at the park. Chansey shopping for clothes with Travis. Chansey in her bedroom, getting ready for bed. If Hobbs had taken the camera to Max Hamilton, Jake would have been done for. But Hobbs had come to him with the information. Of course, Jake denied any wrongdoing and assured Hobbs that he meant no harm to Chansey or her family. He told the old man that Max Hamilton had given him the private assignment to look after his family. Hobbs wasn't convinced, but because Jake was a model employee with no prior write-ups on his record, Hobbs agreed to keep him on while he investigated the matter rather than suspend him. Knowing that Hobbs would eventually turn him in, Jake had taken care of the problem immediately. He followed Hobbs to the track station that very afternoon. It was a busy time of the day, and easy for an old man to lose his footing. One hard shove, and he'd fallen into the path of an oncoming train. It was a tragic event, one that could have been avoided if Hobbs had minded his own business. He'd liked Hobbs. In fact, Hobbs was the closest thing Jake had to a friend since coming to Salt Lake. Hobbs not only worked security during the day, but also made a hobby out of studying the art of surveillance and collecting spy gadgets. He'd taught Jake a few things about security that had come in handy, and Jake felt sure that he would utilize at least one of those skills during the next 48 hours. Everything was coming to a head. He could feel the energy building and knew that time was of the essence. He wondered if it was safe to go home or if the cops were already there. He had to act fast. That was his only chance of catching them unaware. His one consolation was that very soon, he and Chansey would be reunited, and this time, he would not let her stray out of his reach. Travis was beside himself with excitement when he realized that Chansey and Gabe had patched things up. Chansey made hamburgers for everyone, while Travis fired a barrage of questions at Gabe about his job. On the surface, all was normal. That is, until Chansey peered out the front window and saw the cop car, an ever-present reminder that all was not well. They decided that Gabe would sleep in the guest room. It gave Chansey comfort to know that he was a cop that carried a badge and a gun. They double-checked the security alarm before going to sleep, and for safety's sake, Chansey got Susie to sleep in her room with her. She'd thought about asking Travis if he wanted to sleep on the floor in her room, but knew he'd balk at the idea. They watched a movie and then turned in for the night. When Gabe lay down on the bed, he kept seeing Jake's contemptuous smirk as he backed out the door and got into his car. He berated himself for not going after him, even though his rational mind knew there was nothing he could do. Finally, he drifted off into an uneasy sleep. He dreamed he was at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation, sitting in Max Hamilton's office and talking to him about the soup kitchen. Max was showing him the pictures of the planes on the wall. They were walking into the front of the building and up to the security desk. Max was telling him about the security at the foundation. He was walking him through the security process, introducing him to the guards, and then the scene changed. Max was flying in his plane high above the clouds. Gabe was in a field, shielding his eyes and looking up. The plane got closer, so close he could see Max inside the cockpit. Then Max's expression became panicked. The plane did a nosedive. It was headed straight toward him. 
Gabe tried to move out of its path, but his feet were like concrete. He shielded his head. The blast was deafening, and he felt the scorching heat of the fire. A horrible way to die. Gabe sat up in bed, a sheen of perspiration across his forehead. He lay back down, his mind racing. Methodically, he went through the dream. The meeting with Max at the foundation. The security of the building. The plane crash. His mind ran through it over and over. Then it hit him. The peace that had been eluding him. He sat up in bed again, a feverish excitement coming over him. He discovered the missing link, the thing that had been nagging him about Jake. Now he only had to wait for daylight to arrive, so he could check out his suspicion. Landon, do we still have access to the employment records for the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation? Yes? Why? A thrill of anticipation pulsed through Gabe. Can you pull it up? Hold on, let me get back to my office. Gabe could hear his boots clicking against the hard marble floor. Okay, I'm here. Hang on a sec. All right, what do you need? Pull up the database for the employees, the security personnel. There was a pause. What's this about? You solved the case. We're getting ready to close this one out. Yeah, I know. Something totally unrelated. Okay. He could hear the wariness in Landon's tone, and considering his past obsession with this case, he didn't blame him. Type in Jake Allen. What? Just do it, Gabe urged. Jake Allen, Landon said aloud as he typed in the letters. A minute later, he let out a low whistle. Man, oh man. Gabe wished he could see what Landon was seeing. He was a security guard, wasn't he? Yep, sure was. Let me pull up his picture. Do you have it? Hold your horses. Let me check something. The suspense was killing Gabe. Yep, it's him. He has a beard in this photo. I just wanted to double check because on his license he's clean shaven. But I'm comparing the two side by side and it's definitely him. Let's see. He was hired on October 5th and his last date of employment was February 19th. Hmm, this might mean something. What? It says here that Jake was terminated. The reason? Failure to show up for work. According to the notes on his termination report, he was last seen leaving work after his shift on February 15th, and he never went back. What date was that? February 15th. Gabe made a mental note. He didn't know yet if it meant anything, but he would find out. There was a knock on the guest room door. Hang on a sec, Landon. He looked up. Come in? Travis opened the door. Hey, Mom sent me to tell you that breakfast is ready. She made pumpkin waffles and bacon. Thanks. I'll be right down. He waited until Travis had closed the door to resume his conversation. Sorry about that. Landon chuckled. Well, I guess that answers my next question. What's that? You obviously patch things up with Chansey. I take it you're staying at her house? Yeah. After the incident with Jake yesterday, I thought it would be better to stay here and keep watch over things. Good idea. He rubbed his neck. Hey, I know this is asking a lot, but someone needs to go to the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation to find out more about Jake and why he left. The fact that he worked at the foundation concerns me. Chansey said that she met him at a church activity, but I'm starting to suspect that Jake orchestrated the meeting. I'm pretty sure that Chansey has no idea that Jake used to work at the foundation. I would go there myself, but I don't feel like I can leave right now. Chansey needs me, and I promised to take her to the hospital to see her friend Janet. Say no more. I'll get right on it. 
Landon paused, thinking. You know what? I'm going to call this one. I say this gives us probable cause to subpoena his phone and bank records. And I'm going to send a couple of officers over to question Jake. I'd like to know why he never told Chansey about his previous work experience at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. Thanks, man. You bet. Gabe was about to end the call when Landon spoke. Gabe? Yeah. Watch your back. I'm getting a bad feeling about this one. Jake had run to McDonald's to get a biscuit. He was about to turn onto his street when he saw the police car pull in front of his house. The officers got out of the car and went to the front door. He pounded the steering wheel and swore. He'd known they were coming, but he hadn't figured on them coming this soon. It would be too risky to go back to his house now, especially considering he didn't know how much the cops knew. On the off chance that they'd somehow found out about his past, things could get hairy. He was glad he'd listened to his instinct, which had prompted him to put all of the tools and devices he would need in the back of the Pathfinder, along with a change of clothes. His one regret was that he would have to leave the pictures of Chansey and Adrian behind. Then again, maybe it was for the best. He would be with Chansey soon, and it was time to finally put Adrian to rest. Today is the start of a new life. Just saying the words out loud helped him to feel better, more empowered. A part of him dreaded what he needed to do next, but Chansey had left him no choice. They would have to go through the ugly before they could get to the good. It was obvious that Gabe wasn't going to leave her side, and the squad car was watching the house 24-7. Did they really think they could outwit him? Excitement bubbled in his chest at the thought of pitting his intellect against theirs. He would triumph and eventually win the prize. He always won. Chansey was clearing off the remains of breakfast. Gabe stood to help her. Susie had run off to play, and Travis was sitting at the kitchen table, his arms folded, a deep frown on his face. I don't understand why I have to stay in the house all day. I wanted to go over to Brent's house to check out the new video game he just got. It irked her that Travis was doing this now in front of Gabe. Then again, if Gabe were going to be a part of her life, then he would have to get used to the drama that sometimes went on in her home. I told you, Travis, until we know what's going on with Jake, I don't feel comfortable letting you go off to a friend's house. Do you not see the patrol car sitting outside our house? This is serious. She shook her head and blew out a breath. I hate Jake. He pounded a fist on the table. He's keeping us prisoners in our own house. This is my Christmas break, and I want to enjoy it. He gave Chansey a wounded look. She felt herself soften. She understood Travis's frustration all too well. Jake was wrecking their holiday. And as thrilled as she was to be starting a relationship with Gabe, it was Jake that kept consuming her thoughts. She worried about where he might be, what he was doing, and if he was going to bother them again. Every time her cell phone rang, she prayed it wouldn't be him. It was ridiculous. She wished she could relent and let Travis go to Brent's house. But for safety's sake, they really did need to stay put for at least the next 24 hours. Please, Mom, can I go? Travis had picked up on her hesitation, something he frequently did. Sometimes she swore that boy could read her mind. She blew out a breath. I wish I could tell you yes, but I just can't. She turned to the sink before he could see the tears in her eyes. Gabe saw them, though. He touched her arm. Travis scooted back in his chair, causing a loud grating sound on the floor. He was about to run up to his room when Gabe stopped him. Hey, can you wait a minute? Chansey went still. She gave Gabe a questioning look. She'd just gotten rid of Jake and wasn't about to have another man ordering her son around. Travis had complied with Gabe's request and was standing, waiting to see what he was going to say. I know this is a rough time. I promise you it won't last forever. No, just my entire Christmas break. 
Travis said bitterly. Yeah, it sucks, Gabe agreed. A look of surprise washed over Travis's face, and it was obvious he couldn't believe Gabe had used that word. A hint of a smile touched his lips. Yeah, it sucks. How about this idea? Your mom and I will stop by the store and buy you the game you were going to play at Brent's house. He scrunched his face like he couldn't believe it. Really? Gabe looked to Chansey for permission. She had a look on her face that said, Are you sure you want to go down this road? It's just this once, he said. He's having a rough time right now. If a simple game makes it better, then so be it. She blew out a breath. Okay, but I need you to keep a good eye on Susie while we're gone. You're not to leave the house under any circumstance. Yes, Mom, he said. There was a sparkle in his eyes. Thanks, Gabe. He winked. You're welcome. When Travis left the room, Chansey turned to him, a hand on her hip and an eyebrow raised. Gabe chuckled. Ouch, I think I'm getting the look. Begrudgingly, she smiled. You know, bribing him will only work for so long. I know, I just hate to see his holiday get ruined. Yeah, me too. All I can think about is that Jake's out there. I keep wondering what he might do. She couldn't stop the tears from filling her eyes. Gabe put his arms around her. I notice that you keep looking at the squad car outside. It's there for a precaution not to cause you added stress. There's a good chance that we'll never see the likes of Jake Allen again. She looked hopeful. You think so? I certainly hope so. His gut told him that not only had they not seen the last of Jake, but that he was just getting started. Come here. He gathered her in his arms, and she buried her head in his chest. I'm so glad you're here. After a minute, she lifted her head and looked up at him. I'm really glad you saved Travis that night. Not only because of the obvious, but also because it brought you into my life. I never thought I'd find someone that I feel such strong feelings for. I know that you're here right now because you're keeping us safe, but I hope... She gave him a tentative smile. I want you in my life. Our life. He was looking at her with such a tender expression that she felt like her heart expanded two sizes. I love you, Chansey. I think I must have loved you from the first moment I saw you. I know we got off to a rocky start, and heaven knows I have a lot to make up for. But I promise that I'll never leave you. That's good enough for me, she murmured. She took in his rugged features and the way his shirt stretched over his taut muscles. He was so devastatingly handsome that he nearly took her breath away. A spark ignited in her when she saw his expression change. Then she saw the need in his eyes. Her breath caught as his lips came down on hers. She let out a sigh and pulled him closer. Fire raced through her, making her go weak in the knees, and for a second... She got lost in the urgent demand of his lips and the feel of his strong arms around her waist. But then she remembered where they were. She didn't want the kids to come in the kitchen and see them making out. She pulled back from him with a shaky laugh. The kids. He chuckled. I'm sorry. He leaned in and nipped her ear, causing tiny shivers to circle down her spine. She laughed. Gabe, stop. Reluctantly, he loosened his grip. He held her hands and linked his fingers through hers. He leaned in and whispered in her ear, I guess we'll have to pick this up tonight after the kids are in bed. She looked at the tantalizing promise in those piercing eyes and felt a quiver run down her spine. I like the way you think, she said, her voice husky. Gabe and Chansey were on the way to the hospital when Chansey gave voice to her concern. Do you think Travis and Susie will be okay at the house while we're gone? She'd hoped that Jill would be able to come over, but she was working a shift at the hospital today. Yes, I told the officers and the squad car to be extra vigilant. She nodded and then looked out the window. 
A part of her almost told him to turn around this instant and take her home. But she really did need to go and check on Janet. Ted was counting on her visit, and they would only be gone for a short while. Gabe was driving his Ford F-150. Chancey told him he could drive her Lexus, but he'd missed his truck. It felt good to be behind the wheel of it again. He glanced over at Chansey's worried expression. As much as he hated it, he needed to tell her that Jake worked at the foundation. He'd planned on telling her in the kitchen, but then he'd gotten distracted with other things. A smile curved his lips as he thought about their kiss. He'd forgotten how wonderful it was to love someone heart, body, and soul. He almost wanted to pinch himself to make sure he wasn't dreaming. He never thought he'd be capable of feeling this way again. They were only a few minutes away from the hospital. His hand tightened around the steering wheel. There's something we need to discuss. She turned to look at him. Okay. When I first met Jake, I had the feeling that I'd seen him somewhere before. Concern etched over her face. It has been bothering me because I couldn't remember. This morning, I realized where I knew him from. Where? He pulled the truck into a space in the parking lot and turned off the engine. He turned to look at her. Jake used to work as a security guard at the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. The only sound in the truck was her quick intake of breath. Her eyes went wide, and she put a hand to her mouth. Are you sure? Yes. But he told me he was an architect. That was a lie, he said flatly. Landon called the Hendricks architectural firm and Draper, and they'd never heard of him. He even sent them a picture to confirm it. Her face went white as her lips drew together in a tight line. Oh my gosh, what does this mean? He let out a breath. He didn't want to add insult to injury by telling her his fears, but he'd promised her that from here on out, he would be completely honest. She caught hold of his arm. What does it mean? His eyes met hers. It means that he knew you, Chansey, before he actually met you. It means that he probably targeted you. When you met him at the church activity, he was not there by accident. He orchestrated that meeting and used it as a way into your life. Her hands started to shake, and she clasped them together in her lap. Tenderly, he placed a hand over them. Are you okay? She nodded biting her lower lip. Then she saw the look on his face. There's more, isn't there? The words came out ragged. I'm not sure. I do need to ask you a question, though. She nodded, and he could tell from the way she went stiff that she was bracing herself for it. I need to know the date that Max's plane went down. Fear settled into her eyes. What? Do you think Jake had something to do with Max's death? I don't know. I need to know the date of... February 16th, she blurted. It was Gabe's turn to be surprised. He closed his eyes. She grabbed his arm and shook him. What? Tell me! The last time anyone at the foundation saw Jake, he was leaving after his shift on February 15th. That was the last day he ever showed up for work. She was hearing the words, but they didn't seem real. She turned to Gabe. Do you really think Jake is capable of murder? That he killed Max? The idea seemed preposterous. She thought about how kind Jake had been, how he'd helped her through those dark months. I don't know at this point. I'm just trying to gather the facts. Landon is sending someone over to the Foundation to find out more about Jake. The fact that Jake worked there and never told you is suspicious. Add to the mix that he leaves for work on the 15th of February, never to be seen again, one day before Max's plane goes down, and then meets you at a church activity and enters your life. That's a little too coincidental, don't you think? She nodded her expression stricken. I don't believe in coincidences. Neither do I. 
He told her about the maxed-out credit cards and how there was no record of his existence, dating past a year and a half ago. A crazed look came into her eyes. Do you think he's really even Jake Allen? Or someone else? That's what I'm trying to find out. Look, you and I both know that he's the one that sent me that photo. And broke into my house. But we have no proof that he did those things. I'm just looking for something on the man, something that will allow us to search his home and put a tail on him. That way, we won't be sitting here wondering where he is and what he's up to. The upside is that now we have enough on him to subpoena his phone and bank records. And Landon sent a couple of officers over to his house to question him and find out why he never said anything about working at the foundation. An involuntary shudder went down her spine. If he's been operating under a false identity all this time, then we don't know who it is that we're really dealing with, do we? Her eyes filled with dread. Or what he's capable of, he finished quietly. Chapter 20 Chansey did a double take when she walked into Janet's hospital room. Not only had she come out of the coma, but also she was coherent. She let out an exclamation of joy and rushed to her side. You're awake! Oh my gosh, I've been so worried. Janet gave her a slight smile. Her eyes had a film of grogginess over them, and the right side of her head was bandaged. Her left hand had an IV hooked up to it. Ted was sitting in a chair beside the bed. His face went red. I'm sorry, he began. I should have called you when she woke up. It happened at 2 a.m., and in all of the commotion, I forgot. His voice trailed off. Chancy shook her head. No worries, Ted. You've had a lot on your mind. Even though she couldn't move her head easily, Janet cut her eyes at Ted. You didn't call her? I'm sorry, hun. I forgot. Janet let out a loud sigh. Chancy smiled inwardly. It hadn't taken long for her spunk to return. Did you call the kids? Janet asked. He rolled his eyes. Yes, dear, I told you that already. Anita's flying in this afternoon, and Mark will be here first thing in the morning. They're both coming. That's good, Janet said. It's so good to see you. Chancy stepped up to the bed and caught hold of Janet's hand. It hurt to see her closest friend looking so fragile. The lines around her eyes and mouth were more pronounced, and her normally robust complexion had a papery look to it. She gulped. I'm so sorry about what happened. Emotion welled in her chest, and she began blinking rapidly to stay the tears. This is my fault. If I hadn't talked you into going to the soup kitchen with me that first time, then none of this would have happened. Her voice broke. When I think that I could have lost you, Don't beat yourself up. This wasn't your fault. I'm just glad that Drake will get his due. I sure did hate to hear about Harriet. Now, mind you, she wasn't my favorite person on the planet, but she didn't deserve to die. A tear trickled down Janet's cheek. If it hadn't been for Duane, I wouldn't be here today. Her eyes fluttered as she attempted to look at Ted. Where is Duane? You didn't run him off with that loud snoring, did you? Ted's snoring sounds like a bullhorn. Chancy couldn't help but laugh. Ted rolled his eyes and made a face. He went home to take a shower. The poor boy's been here since they brought you in. He'll be back in a few hours. I gave him some money to pick us up some decent food. Hospital food gives Ted gas, Janet added. Ted's face went scarlet, and Chancy felt sorry for him. Then she saw the twinkle in Janet's eyes, reminding her that bantering was the core of Janet and Ted's relationship. So how was the soup kitchen today? Janet said. For a second, Chansey was at a loss for words. She'd not even thought about the soup kitchen. With Harriet gone, there would be no one to run it. The short answer was that the soup kitchen had not opened since Janet was attacked. It's closed until we can sort everything out. We'll need to find a new manager and get things reorganized. Janet looked horrified. Closed? 
this close to Christmas? You can't close it. Ted patted her hand. Now don't get your panties, uh, your hospital gown in a wad. Things will get back to normal soon. Yes, Chansey piped in. I'll make sure of it. Dwayne counts on his salary from the soup kitchen, Janet said. Don't worry, he'll still get paid. It struck Chansey then that Janet had grown intensely attached to the soup kitchen and Dwayne. An idea was forming in her head. She gave Janet a speculative look. You know, Janet, I'm going to be looking for someone capable to manage the kitchen. Someone who can run a tight ship. Janet's eyes lit up. Really? Really? She looked at Ted to see how he was taking the news. He seemed pleased. It'll keep her from making me her project, he whispered. I heard that, Janet said dryly. She looked at Chansey. If you're asking me if I'll take the job, the answer's yes. That place needs some improvements. We need better cookware, and the serving area needs to be revamped. And that lighting, dreadful. I'll be sure and make you a list. She paused. Once I get out of this getup. Ted was amused. Chancy, are you sure you know what you're doing? You do realize you're unleashing the beast, don't you? She'll keep you hopping, that's for sure. Oh, quit your blubbering, Ted, Janet growled. Chancy laughed. I think Janet will be perfect for the soup kitchen. New energy is just what that place needs. Janet smiled. See, Ted, Chancy knows a good fit when she sees it. Then she realized that Gabe was in the room. Hey there, don't be shy. Gabe stepped up beside Chansey. When he casually draped an arm around her shoulders, Janet chuckled. I see a lot has happened since I've been asleep. That's good. You two look good together. Gabe squeezed Chansey. Yes, I'm happy to say that this wonderful woman has given me the honored privilege of being her boyfriend. Chansey arched an eyebrow. Boyfriend, huh? Is that what you are? A smile played on his lips. For now. He looked at Janet and grew serious. I don't know how to thank you for all that you've done. You believed in me when you didn't have to, and it's because of you that Drake was brought to justice. You're welcome. It nearly cost me my life, but I'm glad I could be of service, she said dryly. You've helped more than you know, Gabe said sincerely. Janet looked back and forth between Chansey and Gabe, a question forming on her face. What? Chansey asked. Gabe smiled. She knows. Janet let out a sigh of relief. Good, I didn't like keeping secrets from my friend. Chansey made a face. She knew about you? Gabe nodded sheepishly. But how? Janet patted her hand. That's a long story for another time. She seemed to be sinking deeper into the pillow. You're tired. We need to go, Chansey said. Yes, I think I need to get some sleep. She closed her eyes. It's the pain medication, Ted explained. She gets tired easily. Thanks for coming, Janet said dreamily. The doctor says that I should be out of here in a week or less. Chansey thought of something. She looked at Ted. I'm covering all of the hospital costs. A look of surprise washed over his face. No, that's not necessary. Our insurance will cover most of it. No, Chansey countered. It's the least I can do. He was moved. Thank you. You're a wonderful friend to Janet. She's a wonderful friend to me. Travis heard the sirens and then looked out the front window at the smoke that was billowing out of the empty house that was for sale a few doors down. The cops got out of their car. They were talking rapidly and pointing at the burning house. Susie was in the den, watching Frozen. He watched for a minute until he got a text from Brent. Hey man, are you watching the fire? It's sick. You've got to see this. 
When the neighbors started coming out of their houses to get a better look, Travis couldn't resist. He opened the door and punched in the code to disable the alarm. Then he stepped out onto the front porch. Susie was watching Frozen. She especially liked the part about Olaf, the snowman. She jumped as she heard a loud noise at the back door. Then she looked up as Jake walked into the den. His expression was friendly. Hey, Susie, whatcha watchin'? Frozen? It's a movie about Anna and how she has to save her sister. She wrinkled her forehead in consternation. You shouldn't be here, Jake. Mommy's mad at you. I know. I need to make things up to her. He pulled a shiny gold package from behind his back. It had a red ribbon wrapped around it. I have a present for you. Susie jumped off the couch. I like presents. There's more in the car. He took her hand. Come on, let me show you. Her feet stayed rooted to the floor, and she began shaking her head. Mommy says I can't go outside without my shoes, coat, and hat. Jake squatted down so that he was her height. I'll tell you what. You get your shoes on, and I'll get your coat and hat from the closet. Susie eyed the package. Can I have the present then? Jake smiled. I'll even let you carry it. How about that? Chansey and Gabe were in the lobby, leaving the hospital, when she got the call from Travis. Hello, are you guys okay? We're leaving the hospital now. We're going to stop by the store and pick up your game, and then we'll be home. She stopped when she realized that he was sobbing. Mom! Panic rose thick in her throat. She clutched the phone. What's wrong? It's Susie. His voice broke. I stepped outside to see the fire, and when I came back in, she was gone. It was her worst nightmare, the one that every mother lives in fear of. The world around her started to spin, and she was trapped in a tunnel of black. Oh my gosh. She went weak in the knees. Gabe reached for her. What's wrong? Travis was gulping and sputtering for breath as he attempted to form the words. There's a note here. Jake took her, Mom. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. What are we going to do? He broke down, weeping. Another voice came on the line. Mrs. Hamilton, this is Officer Peterson. I can assure you that we will do everything in our power to find your daughter. Her throat closed. She was clutching for air. The world went black as she crumpled to the floor. The minute Landon heard the news, he jumped into action. He obtained a search warrant for Jake Allen's home in record time and sent two officers over to search it. Then he posted a picture of Susie and Jake on every available network. An Amber Alert went out immediately throughout the state of Utah, listing the description of Jake's Pathfinder. As if the news of the kidnapping weren't terrible enough, the devastating blow came when the officers entered Jake's house and saw the room. The walls were plastered from floor to ceiling with pictures of Chansey dating back at least a year. He could tell from the voice of the officer that he was shaken. Sergeant, I've never seen anything like this before. This guy is a psycho and obsessed with Chansey Hamilton. They found a briefcase, tucked in the back of the closet. It contained pictures of another girl, a dark-haired beauty, who looked to be in her mid-twenties. In addition to the pictures, they found a lock of dark hair tied with a red ribbon. Landon ordered them to bring in the briefcase immediately, at which point he took them to the conference room for inspection. He'd called in his best personnel, some of them uniformed officers and others on specialized assignments, to help telling them that holidays or not, they would do nothing else until they found Susie Hamilton. They set up shop in the conference room. The pictures from the briefcase were spread across a large table. The whiteboard contained all known information about Jake Allen. Landon eyed the team of professionals sitting in the conference room. I don't have to tell you how serious this is. We know that Jake Allen is operating under a false identity. These pictures... Maybe the only chance we have of finding out who he really is 
and what his behavioral patterns are. We need to know what this man is capable of. Time is working against us, folks. I don't have to tell you that the first 24 hours of a kidnapping case are critical. We have a team working with dispatch on the hotline, sorting through tips that have been coming in through the Amber Alert. So far, we haven't gotten any substantial leads. He formed a steeple with his hands and brought them to his lips. Detective Gabe Michaels is one of the finest officers we have. He has given his heart and soul to this department, despite his personal losses. Let's bring this little girl home safely. Let's do it for Chancey Hamilton, and let's do it for Gabe. His jaw formed a hard line. This one's personal. The team began combing through the photos, looking for something that would give a clue as to where the pictures had been taken. Landon sat down at a desk in the corner and opened his laptop. He pulled up the image that Gabe had sent him. It was the note that Jake had left. It read, My dearest Chansey, I'm so sorry to be causing you pain, but you left me with no other choice. I have Susie with me and rest assured, providing that you do everything I instruct you to do, to the letter, then you will find her safe and sound at the end of this adventure. Consider this our own personal game of hide-and-seek, my love. I will be waiting for you at the end with open arms. Jake. Clue number one. This place marks the spot where my world changed forever on the day we first met. P.S. No cops, especially Gabe, or Susie dies. As Landon read over the note several times, a sense of dread formed in the pit of his stomach. The more they learned about this guy, the stronger his impression grew that they were dealing with a psychotic individual who had no scruples or morals, the worst sort of perpetrator, the kind that followed no rules. Was Susie still alive? He hoped with all of his heart that she was. They were in the living room, and Chansey was pacing back and forth in front of the sofa, wringing her hands. Her face was chalky white with red tear streaks, and Gabe could tell that she was on the verge of a complete breakdown. Over and over, she kept saying that she should have listened to the feelings she had and not left Travis and Susie alone. He wanted to tell her that it wasn't her fault, and that no one, not even him, could have predicted this outcome. He'd been so focused on keeping Chansey safe that he'd overlooked the obvious. But voicing the words wouldn't help find Susie. His first instinct was to unleash his anger on the two officers that had been watching the house but he knew berating them wouldn't do anyone a bit of good. He would wait until after Susie was found to address the topic of their negligence and how they could let Jake swoop in under their noses and take Susie, but now he had to focus on getting Susie back alive. According to the officers and Travis, Susie's abduction time was somewhere between 3.55 and 4.10. He pulled out his phone. It was now 4.40. Time was of the essence. Officer Cynthia Stacy caught Gabe's eye and motioned for him to get Chansey under control so they could go over the plan. Cynthia had been at the precinct longer than anyone Gabe knew. Her specialty was kidnappings, and if anyone could bring Susie home, it would be Cynthia. Gabe caught Chansey's hand. We need to talk about the plan. She nodded and sat down on the couch. He took a seat beside her and put a protective arm around her shoulders. Cynthia looked at Chansey. We have a team working at the precinct, going over Jake's information and trying to find out everything they can on their end. We hope they will uncover something useful, but in the meantime, we have no choice but to play Jake's game and run down these clues. Her eyes met Chansey's. I know this is hard for you, but you've got to be strong for your daughter. Tears spilled out of Chansey's eyes. She bit her lower lip and nodded. One alternative is to get a female officer to pose as you. She paused, eyeing Chansey. The risk is that if Jake realizes it's not you... I'll do it, Chansey blurted. 
Getting someone else is too risky. I won't jeopardize Susie's life. Gabe tightened his arm on her shoulders. Are you sure you're up for this? He searched her face, and the haunted expression in her eyes chilled him to the core. He felt partly responsible for the kidnapping because he'd assured Chansey that the children would be okay alone with the patrol car parked out front. Never could he have imagined that Jake would do something like this. Yeah, most definitely. She slung her head, causing her hair to fly back. Her eyes grew hard. We've got to stop that monster and get my daughter back. If it's me Jake wants, it's me he'll get. Gabe was relieved to see that there was still some fire left in her. Okay, Cynthia said. Here's how this will work. We're going to put a wire on you so that we can hear everything that's going on. You'll wear this piece in your ear so that you can talk to us. You will drive your car. Gabe and I will follow behind. We'll have two additional cars following as backup. We'll keep a safe distance away from you so that if he's watching, he won't see us. Chansey nodded. Okay, let's do it. But first, I need to speak to Travis. We don't have time, Cynthia countered, giving Gabe a worried look. The first few hours are crucial. I need to speak to him, Chansey said firmly. Her eyes were resolute, telling them that she'd made up her mind and it was not up for negotiation. Travis was right about Jake from the very beginning. If only I'd listened. Regret tinged her voice. I need to tell him this wasn't his fault. Her voice quivered, and she swallowed hard. In case I don't come back, I need him to know how much I love him. Cynthia's eyes grew moist. Okay, just make it quick. Chancy drove to the church building where she and Jake had first met. As she pulled into the empty parking lot, she scoped the area for any sign of him. She got out of the car. Thick clouds were gathering overhead and the wind was picking up, but she hardly noticed. She walked to the steps. This was where she was sitting when Jake first approached her. Her heart sank when she realized that the steps were empty. She looked in the bushes. Nothing on the one side. She looked on the other side. Nothing. She walked around the building, looking for something, anything. The building was locked, and no one was inside. After five minutes of searching, she got back in the car and sat there numbly. There was nothing there, she said, as a feeling of hopelessness shrouded her. Don't panic. Gabe's calm voice was coming through the earpiece. We knew that was a possibility. The church would have been too easy. Jake wasn't referring to the place where you thought the two of you first met. He was referring to the place where we actually met. A charge raced through Chansey. She looked at the clock. 5.12. With traffic, it would take at least 15 minutes to get to the foundation. Then she thought of an easier way. I'm going to call the front desk to see if he left anything. Do you really think he would be so bold as to have something delivered? Gabe asked. It's worth a try. Chancy picked up her phone and dialed Stockton Sanderson's cell. When she told him what was going on, he was floored. I'll do anything I can to help, he assured her. I'll contact Gilbert Masterson, the head of security. But first, I'll call the front desk to see if anything was delivered. I'm heading your way now. Call me the minute you know something. Chancy got five minutes down the road when Stockton called. He sounded out of breath. I'm holding an envelope that was dropped off at the front desk this morning. Your name is written on it. I've got Gilbert checking the surveillance footage to see who delivered it. Just open it and read me what it says, Chancy said impatiently. He began reading. Congratulations. You found it, Chancy. I knew you would. I could tell from the look on your face when we first met that it meant something to you, too. You're getting closer. Clue number two. We danced, and I held you in my arms. Was there anything else? Chansey asked. No, that's all. 
She ended the call. They had danced? She and Jake had never gone dancing. Fresh tears welled in her eyes as she thought about Susie. She uttered a silent prayer. Please, Heavenly Father, please keep my little girl safe. I can't lose her, too. Please. A sob escaped her throat. Then, an inexplicable feeling of warmth came over her, and knowledge flowed into her mind. She knew exactly what Jake was talking about. Back in the summer, they'd gone to Ruth's Diner at Emigration Canyon. They'd sat out on the back patio and listened to a band that was performing. As they were walking to their table, Jake took her hand and swirled her around a couple of times. The couples sitting at the nearby tables had clapped. That had to be what he was referring to. It's Ruth's Diner at Emigration Canyon, she said. It was starting to snow by the time Chansey made it to the diner. She knew Gabe and Cynthia were there, somewhere, but she couldn't see them, which meant that hopefully Jake couldn't either, if he were watching. And she knew that he would be there at the end. A shudder slithered up her spine, but then she forced herself to think of Susie. Each step closer to Jake would mean getting to Susie. She didn't bother going inside the restaurant, but went around to the deserted pavilion in the back, she tried to remember where they'd sat. It had been one of these two tables. Then she saw it, the cream envelope weighted down with a rock. She clutched the envelope and heard a movement from behind. She whirled around, her pulse beating wildly. There was no one. Then she heard the sound of a door closing and the laughter of a woman. A couple was walking into the diner. She glanced around the empty space and surrounding woods, looking for any sign of Jake. Nothing. Hastily, she went back to the car and ripped open the envelope and read the words aloud so that Gabe and Cynthia could hear. Clue number three, where you broke my heart. Are you okay? Gabe said. She let out a breath and ran a hand through her hair. I'm fine except for the fact that some psycho has my daughter and is leading me on some wild goose chase while time is ticking away. I'm fine, she repeated mechanically. We don't see any sign of Jake from where we are. Any sign of him on your end? No, just the envelope. We've got officers combing the surrounding area to see if they can spot him. He paused. Okay, what does this clue mean to you? This one was easy. He's talking about the Cheesecake Factory at City Creek, where I broke up with him. I seriously doubt if Jake's at City Creek. He would never risk going around that many people. It's another clue that leads to somewhere else. I suggest that we call and see if he left anything. And then we can send officers there to check it out. But what if you're wrong? What if he's there and sees the police officers? Susie will die. That's what Jake's note had said. I don't want to risk it. I think I need to go there myself. It poses a greater risk to go all of the way to City Creek. It could take an hour to get in there and out with traffic, and the weather is working against us. Chansey mentally played out the options. She'd never felt so helpless, not even when Max first died. Susie was out there with a madman. She had to get to her. Let me call the restaurant and send some officers over there to check it out, Gabe urged. We'll head in that direction, but we could sure save a lot of time if we called. Do it, Chansey barked. Landon held up the photo of the brown-haired girl in front of the lighthouse. She was posing for the camera and smiling happily, obviously aware that her picture was being taken. From the looks of these photos, it appeared as though she'd been with Jake voluntarily. He pulled aside three photos with distinguishing characteristics. One had a lighthouse in it, another a historical brick building with a chimney, and the third was a large white spiral staircase. Okay, we need to do a check on all lighthouses in the U.S., and then there's this staircase. Officer Logan Anderson absently twirled a pen in his fingers as he studied the photographs. 
At 22, Logan was by far the youngest person at the table, and he considered it an honor to be called in on such an important assignment. His keen sense of observation and ability to remember seemingly insignificant details had served him well during his short tenure as a police officer, and he was getting the reputation of being something of a boy genius. As he looked at the photos in front of him, he kept getting the nagging feeling that he'd seen that staircase before. When he was a teenager, he'd traveled the U.S. extensively with his parents. By the time he was 15, they'd visited every state with the exception of Alaska. Judging from the large trees in the background of the photos, he'd narrowed down the place to somewhere on the East Coast. He looked at the picture. Williamsburg, Virginia, maybe? No, that wasn't it. His eyes went to dome-like designs around the top of the ceiling surrounding the staircase, distinguishing features. Those were what looked familiar. Sergeant Landon, I know this is a strange request, but would you mind if I snapped a shot of that staircase and sent it to my mother? The corners of Landon's mouth went down in a frown. Why? I could swear I've been there before, but I can't remember where it was. My mother has a memory like an elephant. If we've been there before as a family, she'll remember it. Landon waved a hand in the air. Whatever it takes. Five minutes later, Logan received a call back from his mother. He spoke to her for a minute or so. When he ended the call, there was a look of triumph on his face. That staircase is a historical landmark in Boston, Massachusetts, It was once the residence of Nathan Appleton, a prominent businessman in early Boston, whose son-in-law was none other than the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I knew I recognized that staircase. My Aunt Sophie lives outside of Boston, and my family visited her two summers in a row during my teens. This caused a flurry of action. A minute later, they'd identified the lighthouse and the brick building, which was commonly known as the First African Baptist Church. It was the oldest black church edifice in the United States. Landon stroked his chin, thinking, Okay, we know these were taken in Boston. Let's check with the law enforcement agency in that area to see if we can discover the identity of the girl in the picture. If she's alive, then we have little hope of finding her. But if she's missing or dead, then she'll be listed in the crime database. Something told him that they would learn the identity of the girl and that it wouldn't be pretty. The officers just found clue number four at the restaurant, Gabe said through the earpiece. A bouquet of flowers was delivered there this morning when the restaurant first opened. The employees put it aside, trying to find out whom it was for. It was addressed to Chansey. Clue number four says, Our movie was divine, and I didn't mind the drive. Almost there, my love. Chansey thought for a minute. The drive-in theater in Tuella. Are you sure? That's a long way out there. Gabe looked out the car window at the swirling snow. It was starting to come down hard. A storm was moving in. Not good the elements would be working against them. Yes, I'm sure. That's where he is, Gabe. I can feel it. The warm feeling that she'd felt earlier after praying was still with her, and she felt sure that the drive-in was where he would be. Gabe thought about it. It made sense. He would want to get Chansey in an isolated location, a location that was outside of Salt Lake City proper. I think you're right. I think this may be where Jake is. It was now 7.03, a few minutes after sunset. It would be dark by the time they arrived, and he figured that Jake had planned it that way. He'd planted the clues so that he would have time to get out of town and get set up at his location. Are you sure you're up for this? It's not too late to get an officer to impersonate you. Cynthia was sitting in the passenger seat of his truck. She gave him a look that said, Have you lost your mind? Of course it's too late to make other arrangements. He ignored Cynthia and made a point of avoiding eye contact with her. 
he didn't want to pressure Chansey into doing anything she didn't want to do. This was Chansey's life they were dealing with, and he didn't want to lose her. He couldn't lose her. And she couldn't lose Susie. I'm sure, was Chansey's reply. There wasn't the slightest bit of hesitation in her voice. Okay, let's get this over with. A minute later, his phone rang. It was Landon. Hey, we've got some information for you. We identified the girl in the pictures. Her name was Adrian Rainey. She was married to one Walter Rainey. They were married for 13 months, and then she left him. According to the report, her family suspected that Walter was beating her, but she was too afraid of him to come forward. Walter hunted her down and murdered her in cold blood. Adrian's maiden name was Winder, and her family is wealthy. They come from a long line of prominent Bostonians. There's a warrant out for Walter's arrest, but he fled and hasn't been found. It appears that immediately after Adrian was murdered, Walter Rainey disappeared. Jake is Walter Rainey, Gabe uttered. Yep, that's right. He paused. I'm afraid there's more. Gabe could tell from the tone of Landon's voice that whatever it was, it was bad. When Adrian finally worked up the nerve to leave Jake, uh, Walter, she used her father's resources to disappear. She might have made it, too, had Jake not kidnapped her younger brother, Bentley. He used him as bait to lure Adrian out of hiding, where he raped her and then shot her. Tentacles of horror clawed around Gabe, nearly taking his breath away. That's exactly what Jake was doing now. He was toying with them, luring Chansey out. And the boy? He survived, barely. They found him stuffed in a dumpster. He'd been beaten within inches of his life. The officer I spoke to on the phone said that nearly every bone in the boy's face was crushed. He said to this day, he's never seen a beating that bad. Susie, beautiful, trusting Susie. A shudder ran through him. Heaven help us, he uttered. He told Landon where they were headed. Landon assured him that he would alert the local authorities in Tuella. Gabe, Landon said before he ended the call. Yes. Be careful. Chapter 21 Big, puffy snowflakes were falling and splattering against the windshield. The whole world seemed to be covered with a blanket of snow, washing away all of the ugliness, leaving only softness and light. Jake wished he could have been there to see Chansey hunting down his clues. He imagined that her expression was pleased when she read the first clue and realized that he remembered the day they'd first met. He bumped the palm of his hand along to the beat of the Christmas song by George Michael. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart, but the very next day, you gave it away. This year, to save me from tears, I'll give it to someone special. He frowned. Is that what Chansey was doing? Giving her heart away to Gabe? No, she loves me, he told himself fiercely. It would be ugly tonight, but tomorrow things would be fresh and new. Tomorrow they would start their life together. It had been easier than he thought to get Susie away from the house. He'd started the fire in the empty home, knowing that the smoke would draw attention. And it had, just as he'd planned. He'd been ready to deal with Travis if necessary, but luckily Travis was being a dope, as usual. He'd walked out of the house to see the fire giving Jake a window of opportunity to break in through the back door. He wished that he could have seen Chansey's face when she realized that Susie was missing. Priceless. She should know by now that an army couldn't keep him away from her. Susie's sobbing from the back seat cut into his thoughts. He glared at her through the rearview mirror. Shut your mouth, you spoiled brat, before I give you something to cry about. 
He reached back and whacked her hard on the leg. Susie's eyes widened in terror as she attempted to scuttle out of his reach. She couldn't stop the crying, but she clamped her mouth shut, her shoulders heaving up and down as she tried to sob quietly. That's better, he said, pulling into the parking lot of a gas station. He hated the way that Susie controlled Chansey with the slightest flick of her finger. He and Chansey needed their own children, not some dead guy's kids. Susie would serve her purpose, and then he'd be forced to get rid of her. Chansey would be sad at first, but he'd console her. He was good at that. I have to go to the bathroom, Susie said timidly. Of course you do, he scowled. Thanks to the approaching storm, they were running behind schedule, but the last thing he wanted was for Susie to pee all over the car. He got out and opened the back door. He grabbed her arm and held it in a vice grip. He got in her face. You listen here, you little brat. I'm going to let you go to the bathroom. But if you do anything stupid, I'll hurt you. I won't. I just need to go to the bathroom. She sniffed. He yanked her out, just as a car pulled up beside them. An older man with silver hair got out. He nodded at Jake. Good evening he said with a heavy southern accent. Jake gave him a curt nod and maneuvered Susie toward the door of the gas station. The man was walking close on his heels, causing the hair on the back of his neck to rise. You sure are a cute little girl, the man was saying to Susie when they reached the door. She sniffled. Are you ready for Santa? He continued. Susie just looked at him. The man got a look at Susie's face. Are you all right? You've been crying. It can't be all that bad now, can it? Jake had all he could take. If there hadn't been other people around, he would have knocked the old man down. We're in a hurry, he huffed. The man nodded and walked past Jake to the men's restroom. Jake stopped when they got to the women's restroom. I'll be right out here waiting for you. Don't do anything stupid or I'll hurt you and kill your family. Her lower lip began to tremble and she backed away from him. I mean it, Susie. She nodded. By the time Susie came out of the restroom, Jake was livid. Precious time was ticking away. He glanced around the store to be sure the old man wasn't watching before ushering Susie back to the car. Snow was coming down in drifts when Jake and Susie returned to the parking lot, and the windshield was now covered with a thick layer of white. He would be lucky if he made it to the drive-in before the roads were impassable. He pushed Susie into the back seat and slammed the door. Then he began clearing off the snow from the windshield. The Pathfinder was four-wheel drive, but the Honda Civic they were in wasn't. He hated getting rid of the Pathfinder, but he knew that it would be too easily recognized. He'd heard the Amber Alert on the radio, and it gave him a jolt of satisfaction to know that, as usual, he was a step ahead. He'd gone to a fly-by-night used car lot and traded the Pathfinder for the Honda. No money had exchanged hands, and the car lot owner had gotten the better deal because the Pathfinder was worth considerably more than the Honda. Trading in the Pathfinder was a small sacrifice to make, but it certainly would have come in handy during this snowstorm. I want my mommy, Susie cried when they got on the road. Shut up, Jake yelled. This only made her cry louder. The thought of hearing the screaming girl made his skin crawl. Threatening wasn't working, so he tried another tactic. Susie, he said in a kinder voice, if you promise to stop crying, I'll take you to your mom right now. She looked at him doubtfully. You promise? He looked back at her through the rearview mirror and gave her a placating smile. I promise. Visibility was near zero when Jake realized something was wrong with the front tire on the passenger side. He pulled over and got out to examine it. It was completely flat. Rage engulfed him. The owner of the used car lot had given him a lemon. He kicked the tire while cursing at the top of his lungs. Then he went to the trunk to retrieve the jack and spare tire. 
He could hear Susie starting up again with the crying. A few minutes later, he'd just finished replacing the tire when a vehicle pulled up behind him. When the man got out, he realized it was the same silver-haired man he'd seen at the gas station. Looks like you're having a bit of trouble, the man said. It's dangerous to be out here on the side of the road during this kind of storm. Everything's fine, Jake said, trying to keep the frustration out of his voice. The car door opened and Susie started getting out of the back seat. Jake pointed. Get back in that car. Now. Susie just stood there. The man got a look at Susie's petrified expression. Honey, you're shaking like a leaf. He looked back and forth between Jake and Susie, suspicion filling his eyes. What's going on here? Is that child yours? I want my mommy, Susie cried. Mind your own business. Clutching the jack, Jake walked around the car to where Susie was. Before he could reach her, she ran to the man and grabbed hold of his leg. Is this your daddy? No. Susie shook her head and tried to hide behind him. Take your hands off her, Jake yelled. Before the man could react, he hit him across the face with the jack. The man fell to the ground. That will teach you to mind your own business. He hit him again. Jake turned to put Susie back into the car, but she was gone. Come back here, he yelled. Snow was whirling around him, making it so that he couldn't see two feet in front of him. He strained his eyes, trying to see. It was just like Chansey to get Susie a white coat and hat. Everything seemed to be hedging against him, even Chansey. Jake spent five minutes stomping through the deep snow, searching for her, but it was impossible. Everything was white. There was nothing but snow-covered fields for miles around. It was dark, and he had an appointment to get to. When he got back to his car, the old man and his car were gone. Panic raced through him. The old man would tell them where he was. He had to leave now. Susie was a lost cause. She wouldn't last long in this storm, and it was her own dumb fault. Chansey would be sad, but he would be there to console her. He and Chansey could have a daughter of their own. Yes, that would ease the sting of losing Susie. It was coming a blizzard by the time Chansey made it to the deserted drive-in. The entire place was blanketed with a thick layer of snow. A feeling of desperation sank into her heart. Even if Jake had left a clue, she'd never find it now. She tried to remember where it was that they'd parked when they came here. The front corner. Yes, that was it. Gabe's voice came through the earpiece. Chancy, I don't think you should get out in this. We can't see you, and we certainly can't see Jake. I don't have a choice, she mumbled, getting out of the car. She pulled her coat tighter around herself and ducked her head to avoid being pelted by the snow. She trudged through it, thinking of Susie. From a distance, Jake was watching the unfolding scene. His jaw clenched when he saw her talking to someone. Gabe. He knew that Gabe was somewhere close by. He would not have let Chansey come alone. Chansey got out of the car and then Jake saw movement a few yards to her right. He watched as Gabe ran toward her. Stupid move, he said. Then he lifted the rifle and began firing. Gabe heard the shots and felt a bullet whiz past his ear. He instinctively fell to the ground. He could tell that the shots were being fired from somewhere behind the projection screen. He kept his body crouched low, making his way to Chansey. He heard Cynthia yell, We have you surrounded! Come out and put your hands up! Another shot was fired, and Cynthia let out a surprised groan. Anger pulsed through Gabe. Jake had shot her. Hearing the shots, Chansey began running for the car. But before she could get far, Jake tackled her to the ground. She struggled, but he held her fast. 
If you want to see Susie again, then stop, he hissed into her ear. A few seconds later, when Gabe made it to Chansey, Jake was standing directly behind her, pointing the rifle at her back. Call off your goons or I'll kill her. Even in the almost complete darkness, Gabe could see the fear in Chansey's eyes. Do what he says, Gabe, her voice broke. Please, he has Susie. Drop your gun, Jake ordered. Gabe looked at Chansey, his expression pleading. You know if you leave with him, he's not going to let you live, don't you? Her eyes filled with tears. I have to find my little girl. I have to get to Susie. He nodded and made a show of putting his gun on the ground. Then he looked at Jake. He had another gun, tucked in his jeans. If he could only distract him long enough to pull it, then they might have a chance. He kept his voice conversational. You know, you're a lot smarter than I gave you credit for. Jake looked surprised, and then his eyes narrowed. Save your flattery. I'm serious. The clues were a nice touch. To think, you worked for the Maxwell Hamilton Foundation. Jake began backing up and dragging Chansey with him. He used her as a shield, waving the rifle back and forth. Gabe figured that he had a car parked in the back and would try to exit there. Snow was falling softly around them, and they seemed to be suspended in a cocoon of white. The soft, billowy world around them was incongruent with the life-or-death situation that was taking place. Gabe eased his way toward them. Jake clutched Chansey around the neck and aimed the rifle at Gabe. Stop where you are. His voice was like a bullwhip cracking through the snow. Gabe saw movement from behind. The other officers were filing around the back. I am curious about one thing. What's that? How did you do it? How did you get rid of Max Hamilton? Chansey was looking at Gabe with wild eyes, like she didn't understand what he was doing. He held her eyes for a brief moment, willing him to trust her and then he focused his attention on Jake. Seriously, how did you do it? He lifted an eyebrow. Or maybe I'm giving you too much credit. His voice was musing, taunting. Jake scoffed. Cut the crap. You and I both know I did it. Chansey let out a gasp. It seemed to get trapped in the air in the instant before it got swept away with the falling snow. Max Hamilton was a fool. It was easy enough to get rid of him. A chance meeting at the airport. He chuckled. We sat at the table in the diner, talking about planes, the weather, and every other inconsequential thing. And when Max got up from the table to take a phone call from Chansey, I slipped a slow-acting sedative into his drink. Chansey was now crying softly her breath coming out in puffs against the cold. Anger flickered over Jake's face. See what you did. You made her cry. His mouth turned into a hard line. Enough talk. It's time for you to die. He leveled the rifle at Gabe. Put down your weapon. We have you surrounded, the officer in the back yelled. In the instant that Jake pulled the trigger... Chansey elbowed him as hard as she could. He grunted in surprise as the rifle shifted, narrowly missing the intended target. This gave Gabe the precious second he needed to pull his gun. He fired, hitting Jake square in the chest. Jake went down to the ground. There was a stunned expression on his face as he clutched his chest and looked down at the dark blood flowing out. Then he let out a groan and fell backwards. Chansey threw herself down beside him. Where is Susie? She clutched his arm, shaking him. Where is Susie? She demanded. Jake looked at her face. He lifted his hand and brushed a strand of hair. I love you, Adrian. Tell me! She screamed. Snow, he gurgled, and then his eyes filmed over. He was gone. No, 
Chansey began crying hysterically and shaking him. Where is my daughter? Tell me! Her screams nearly wrenched Gabe to pieces. He stepped up and put his arms around her, helping her to her feet. She turned and buried her face in his chest. He stood there, letting her cry. Finally, she looked up at him. I'm never going to find her, am I? He shook his head and looked away. There was nothing he could say. No words could ease her pain. Gabe helped her to the car. He put her in the passenger seat. The minute he sat down in the driver's seat, he remembered Cynthia. He blasted the heat and turned to Chansey. I've got to check on Cynthia. Jake shot her. Chansey had a blank expression on her face. He touched her arm. Do you understand what I'm saying? He asked gently. She nodded. He got out of the car and went to find Cynthia. Relief washed over him when he saw her standing beside the car, holding her arm. She'd found the emergency blanket he kept in the cab of the truck and had wrapped it around the wound. You're alive, he breathed when he saw her. Thank heavens. He gave her a hug. Careful, she winced. Nothing like being shot the day before Christmas Eve. You're lucky. It could have been worse. Much worse, she agreed. Any word on Susie? No. Jake died before we could get it out of him. The stricken look on Cynthia's face mirrored his feelings. What are we going to do? Pray, Gabe said. All we can do is pray for a miracle. His practical side took over. We need to get you to a hospital. Don't worry about me. An ambulance is on its way. Go and take care of Chansey. She needs you. He didn't have to be told twice. He turned and trotted back to the car. When he opened the driver's door and got in, he was alarmed to see that Chansey was still sitting there, staring off into space. He was afraid she was going into shock. He put his arms around her and began rubbing them up and down. I'm so sorry. She just sat there, tears pooling in her eyes. He wondered briefly if he should get the medics to take a look at Chansey when they arrived. His phone buzzed. He looked down at it. It's Landon. I need to get this. Gabe? Yeah. They found Susie. Gabe held his breath waiting for the rest. She's alive, Landon said joyfully. She's okay. Thank God. Tears formed in his eyes, and he lifted his hands in the air. Chancy, did you hear that? They found Susie. She's alive. She turned slowly as if awakening from a deep sleep. He shook her arm. Did you hear me? She's alive. It's a miracle. Tears were rolling down his face. At that, she burst into tears. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! She put her trembling hands over her mouth. She's alive! Susie's alive! It was like she had to keep repeating it over and over in order to believe it. Then Gabe realized that Landon was still on the phone. Where is she? At a gas station in Tuella, about six miles from your location. If you hurry, you'll get there before the local police arrive. The moment they pulled into the parking lot, and before Gabe could get the car completely stopped, Chansey jumped out and ran inside. Gabe had to hurry to catch up. She stepped inside the door and rushed to Susie. They fell into each other's arms. Chansey was laughing and crying at the same time. Oh, my big girl, I love you so much. She began slathering her with kisses. I love you too, Mommy. Susie squeezed her tight. They stayed that way for a few moments until finally Susie released her grip. Chancy held her at arm's length, inspecting her. The clerk behind the counter stepped up. I don't mean to interrupt, she said timidly, but I need to tell you what happened. Chancy stood, not wanting to let go of her mother 
Susie was hugging her tightly around the waist. The clerk began her narrative. The snow was coming down like crazy. I went out back to take out the garbage when I saw something and heard a crunching sound. I looked over and saw a little girl in white walking alone through the snow. She was looking up. I also looked up to see what she was looking at, but all I could see was the falling snow. I admit that a part of me thought she was an angel at first, but when I got closer, I realized it was a little girl. I ran over to her, brought her inside, and put a blanket around her. I made her a cup of hot cocoa from the machine and kept rubbing her arms and holding her close to get her warm. I didn't know where she'd come from. She told me her name was Susie and that her mother's name was Chansey Hamilton. I called 911 and they put me in touch with Sergeant Landon. Thank you, Chansey said. You saved Susie's life. I'm not so sure. Chansey cocked her head. What do you mean? Here's the interesting part. When I asked Susie what happened, she told me about this silver-haired man, how he saw them in the store, and how he was talking to her before she went to the restroom. Chansey nodded, not sure where this was going. Gabe had stepped up beside her and put a protective arm around her shoulder. He, too, was listening intently to the clerk. You see, I saw Susie and that man. Jake is what Susie called him. I saw them come into the store earlier. I saw Jake standing outside the door of the women's restroom, waiting for Susie to come out. He looked angry. Her eyes grew moist. I wish I would have realized then that Susie had been kidnapped and that Jake wasn't her father, but I didn't. It's okay. Chancy touched her arm. The clerk continued. Here's where it gets strange. I never saw a silver-haired man. There was no one in the store except for Jake and Susie, and Susie told me that the tire went flat on Jake's car and he had to pull along the side of the road to fix it. She said that the same silver-haired man from the gas station stopped to help. He realized that Jake wasn't Susie's father. Jake hit him in the face, and Susie took off running through the snow. Chancy looked down at Susie. Is this true? She nodded vigorously. Yes, Mommy. The man helped me. I was lost in the snow and he told me to look for the star, that it would help me to get home. I looked up in the sky and followed the star, just like the man said. She looked at the clerk. And that's when Maggie found me. See what I mean? Maggie said. When I spoke to Sergeant Landon, I asked him if they'd found the silver-haired man. I asked him if anyone had called in. She looked bewildered. They hadn't. She pointed outside at the falling snow. There's not a star in sight out there. Nothing. She leaned forward, speaking in a low tone. Do you know what the odds are of Susie finding her way to safety? A little girl, alone in a snowstorm? And if that weren't bad enough, She's wearing a white coat and hat, making her nearly impossible to spot. Her voice became earnest. She was looking up when I saw her. Mommy, I told you, I was following the star like the man said. Susie sounded impatient, as if she were stating the obvious and the adults were too thick-headed to understand her. Chancy looked at Gabe. He shrugged as if he weren't sure what to think. It was a Christmas miracle, Maggie said, clasping her hands. A real, live Christmas miracle. Chensey looked at Gabe to get his thoughts. His jaw was working, and she could tell he was wrestling with his emotions. He looked at her, his eyes shining. We prayed for a miracle. She started crying. Yes. She hugged Susie tightly. Yes, we did. Chapter 22 It was Christmas Eve, and they made a cozy picture, all gathered in the den beside the roaring fire and the twinkling lights of the Christmas tree. A part of Chansey was still reeling from the horrific events that took place the day before. 
she was still finding it hard to reconcile the Jake that she'd known all those months with the same Jake that had killed Max and kidnapped Susie. But then, she'd never really known the real man behind the mask, the man that was capable of killing his wife and changing his identity. She shuddered and forced herself to put aside those dreadful thoughts and focus on the here and now. Her prayers had been answered. Susie was safe, and Jake could no longer hurt her or anyone else. She looked at Susie, who was laughing and catching hold of Gabe's arm so that he would tickle her again. She giggled in delight and made a half-hearted attempt to dodge as he caught her in his arms and began tickling her until she begged him to stop. The silver-haired man that had saved Susie remained a mystery. No one except Susie had seen him. The words of Maggie, the clerk in the gas station, kept coming back to her. Maggie claimed the experience was a Christmas miracle. Chancy was inclined to agree. That Susie made it through the storm to safety was indeed a miracle. She'd asked Susie several times about the incident, and Susie kept stubbornly insisting that she had followed the star, just as the old man told her to do. Tears glistened in her eyes as she thought of the Christmas star and how in a few minutes... They would continue the tradition that Max had started when the kids were little. Every year, they waited until Christmas Eve to place the star on the tree. This time, the ritual brought added meaning. A chapter was closing in her life, and a new one was beginning. Gabe caught her eye and gave her a lopsided smile that sent her pulse bumping up a notch. Despite all of the horrors this holiday season had brought, it had also brought her Gabe, and for that she would be forever grateful. Mom, are we ready to place the Christmas star on the tree? Travis's brown eyes were sparkling with excitement. We're ready, Mommy, Susie said, jumping up and down. Chancy reached for the box and handed it to Travis. She gave him a tender smile. Would you do the honor? He looked surprised. Putting the star on top had always been Max's job. I'm proud to do it, he said. The expression on his face told her that he recognized the significance of what she was asking him to do. He was representing his dad. Travis placed the box on the coffee table and removed the lid. He lifted the shimmering star out of the box and held it up for all to see. He looked at Gabe, who was now sitting on the couch beside Chancy. Every year we place the star on the tree on Christmas Eve, Travis explained. He pulled the coffee table as close to the tree as he could. Then he stepped up on it and stretched on his tiptoes to reach the top of the tree. After some effort, he managed to place the star on top. Chancy began clapping. Great job. Travis gave her a slight bow. Thank you, Mom. He pulled a slip of paper from out of the box. Before he could start reading, Chansey interrupted him. Why don't you tell Gabe the significance of the poem? He saluted Chansey. Sure thing. My dad wrote this poem as a reminder that we never forget the things that are important to us. His voice cracked, and he cleared his throat. Every year we would put together a big box of stuff and deliver it to some needy family... We called it Ding Dong Ditch because we would leave the box, ring the doorbell, and then run. Dad always made sure that we included this poem. Chansey looked over at Gabe to get his reaction. His muscles were taut, and he had a strange expression on his face. Before she could question him, Travis began reading the poem. On that most important of all nights, in an event never to be forgotten... The star was placed to point the way to the greatest gift the world was ever given. A babe lying in a manger, a mother kneeling by his side. Some call it the North Star, but there are those who know its real name, the Christmas Star, given on that special night to light the way for all to see. Travis paused and gave Chancy a concerned look. He rolled his eyes toward Gabe. 
Chancy realized that tears were streaming down Gabe's cheeks. He had a faraway look on his face. She caught his arm, but he only shook his head. Travis continued reading. If you ever lose your way, look up to the Christmas star, your friend in the night, the one that will give you sight. You'll never stray too far to catch sight of the star. If you look to it long enough, it will lend you strength to be that flicker in the night, guiding those around you. So be fixed like the star and remember who you are. No matter where you roam, it will always guide you home. All you have to do is believe, and its peace from you will never leave. By the time Travis had finished the poem, Gabe's lower lip was trembling, and he was wiping at the tears. Are you okay? Chancy said. He nodded and reached in his back pocket. He opened his wallet and pulled out a folded piece of paper. It was worn and tattered around the edges. Gabe opened it. When Chancy saw the writing, she gasped. It was the same poem that Travis had just read. How? she stammered. Gabe drew in a breath in an effort to compose himself. It was almost Christmas, and I was in bad shape. I hit rock bottom. I was alone, and the pain of losing Miriam and the baby had become too much for me to take. He paused. This particular day was extremely black, and I had just about decided to throw in the towel. His eyes met Chancy's, and she caught the meaning of his words, but knew he didn't want to say it out loud in front of the kids. Then the doorbell rang, interrupting me. His face twisted. I went to the door and found a box on the front porch, a box full of Christmas goodies. I dragged the box inside and looked to find some sort of tag or other identifier that would let me know who sent it. At first, I thought it had been placed at my door by mistake. He made a choking sound and then blew out a breath. I'm sorry. He offered Chancy a slight smile. I've never told anyone this before. Tears were now flowing down her face, too. She nodded for him to continue. Then I saw the wrapped box. The Christmas star, Travis said, a trace of awe in his voice. Gabe nodded. I pulled out the envelope with my name on it. He looked up to the ceiling in an attempt to halt the tears, but they kept coming. I read the poem about the Christmas star. That poem literally saved my life, and I've kept it ever since. A comfortable silence settled over them as they each pondered what the experience meant. Finally, Chancy spoke. Max was the one who determined where the boxes went. He must have found out that you were having a tough time. But I only met him once, Gabe countered. She gave him a tender smile. Once was all it took. As he looked into her eyes... She had the feeling that she'd finally come home, home to a man that she could share her life with, a man that would love not only her, but her children as well. And in that moment, she felt Max's presence, watching over her. She knew that he would be pleased. Travis was beaming. Wow, that's some coincidence. To think that of all the people in Salt Lake, Dad picked you to give that box to? And now, here you are with us. A ghost of a smile flickered over Gabe's lips. I don't believe in coincidences, he said slowly, his eyes never leaving Chancy's. She smiled through her tears. Me neither. Well, then it must be a Christmas miracle, Travis said. Susie flashed an angelic smile. I like Christmas miracles. Me too, Chancy said. She reached for Gabe's hand, and he linked his fingers through hers. It's the best Christmas miracle a family could ever hope for. About the Authors Jennifer loves reading and writing clean romance. She believes that happily ever after is not just for stories. 
Jennifer enjoys interior design, rollerblading, clogging, jogging, and chocolate. In Jennifer's opinion, there are few ills that can't be solved with a warm brownie and scoop of vanilla bean ice cream. Jennifer grew up in rural Alabama and loved living in a town where everybody knows everybody. Her love for writing began as a young teenager when she wrote stories for her high school English teacher to critique. Jennifer has a B.A. in English and Social Sciences from Brigham Young University, Hawaii, where she served as Miss BYU Hawaii. Before becoming an author, she worked as the owner and editor of a monthly newspaper named The Senior Times. She now lives in the Rocky Mountains with her family and spends her time writing and doing all of the wonderful things that make up the life of a busy wife and mother. Sandra grew up in a small community in northeast Alabama called Alder Springs, the setting of Sandra and Jennifer's first novel, Livin' in High Cotton. It was there that she developed a deep love for literature in a two-classroom country school. She recalls that every afternoon the teachers would bring their classes together and read such classics as Rip Van Winkle, Moby Dick, The Headless Horseman, and The Taming of the Shrew, while all their students sat on the floor. Sandra has worked in the administrative field for over 25 years. She worked her way through college while her daughters were very young and completed a four-year degree in three years. Later, she earned a master's in business administration. Her experience has ranged from being an executive secretary and human resource manager for Fortune 500 companies to being an assistant to one of the vice presidents at the university where she eventually retired. She now works in the education field. For Sandra, writing is a continual journey of discovery. She has so many ideas for other books running through her mind that it's hard to focus on one at a time. This has been False Identity, written by Jennifer Youngblood and Sandra Poole, narrated by Majel Connery, copyright 2014 by Jennifer Youngblood, production copyright by Jennifer Youngblood.